31. The first day out from Mars and Phobos. The thousand-foot-long Moravec-built atomic spaceship Queen Mab moves up out of Mars gravity well with a series of brilliant explosions literally kicking it in the butt. Escape velocity from the moon Phobos is a mere ten centimeters a second, but the Queen Mab quickly kicks herself up to twenty kilometers a second acceleration in order to start the process of climbing up and out of Mars gravity. While the three hundred meter long spacecraft could travel to Earth at that velocity, it's too impatient to do so. The Queen Mab plans to keep accelerating until its thirty eight thousand tons of mass are moving at a brisk seven hundred kilometers a second. On the pulse unit storage decks, well oiled chains and ratchets and chutes guide the Coke can sized forty five kiloton bombs down and into the ejector mechanism that runs out through the center of the pusher plate at the rear end of the spacecraft. During this part of the voyage, a bomb can is ejected every 25 seconds and is then detonated 600 meters behind the Queen Mab. On each pulse unit ejection, the muzzle of the ejection tube is sprayed by anti-ablation oil, which also coats the pusher after each detonation. The heavy pusher plate is driven backward into the ship on 33-meter-long shock absorbers, and then its huge pistons drive it back into place for the next plasma flash. The Queen Mab is soon moving toward Earth at a comfortable and steady 1.28 Gs, its actual acceleration increasing with every blast. The Moravex, of course, could withstand hundreds or even thousands of times that G-force for short periods. But there is one human aboard, the Shanghai Odysseus, and the Moravex were unanimous in not wanting him to end up as raspberry jam on a deck floor. On the engineering level, Orfu of Io and other technical vex watch steam pressure and oil level gauges, while also monitoring voltage and coolant levels. With atom bombs going off behind it every thirty seconds, the spacecraft has much use for lubricant so oil reservoirs the size of small ocean-going oil tankers from the lost era ring the bottom ten decks. The engine room deck, with its myriad of pipes, valves, meters, reciprocating pistons, and huge pressure gauges, still looks to all concerned like something out of an early twentieth-century steamship. Even with its gentle 1.28 G load, the Queen Mab will be accelerating briskly enough for long enough and then decelerating quickly enough that it plans to reach the Earth-Moon system in just a little over thirty-three standard days. Monmouth is busy this first day out, checking systems in his submersible The Dark Lady. The sub is not only fitted snugly into one of the holds of the Queen Mab, but is also attached to a winged re-entry shuttle for its drop into the Earth's atmosphere in a month or so and Monmouth is making sure that the new controls and interfaces for these new parts are all in working order. Although a dozen decks apart while they work, Monmouth and Orfu chat with each other via private tight beam while they watch on separate ship video and radar links as Mars falls farther and farther behind. The cameras showing Monmouth this stern view require sophisticated, computerized filters to be able to peer through the near-continuous flash blast of the constantly erupting pulse units, a.k.a. bombs. Orfu, while blind to the visible spectrum of light, watches Mars recede through a series of radar plots. It feels weird to be leaving Mars after all the trouble we went through to get there, sends Monmut on the tight beam. Indeed, answers Orfu of Io. Especially now that the Olympian gods are warring so furiously together. To illustrate his point, the deep space Moravec zooms Monmut's video of retreating Mars, focusing on the icy slopes and green summit of Olympus Mons. Orfu of Io sees the activity as a series of infrared data columns, but Monmut can see it clearly enough. Bright explosions flash here and there, and the caldera, a lake only twenty-four hours ago, now glows yellow and red on the infrared, showing that it is filled with lava once again. Astig Chai Retrograde Sinapesan Choli, General Bay Bin Adi, and the other prime integrators seemed actively frightened, says Monmut, as he runs checks on the submersible's power systems. 
their explanation to Huckenberry about the gravity of Mars being wrong, how whoever or whatever changed it to near-Earth normal also frightened me. This is the first time that he and Orfu have found to speak privately since the launch of the Queen Mab, and Monmouth welcomes the chance to share his anxiety. That's not even the tip of the mared iceberg, sends Orfu. What do you mean? Monmouth's organic parts feel a sudden chill. That's right, rumbles Orfu. You were so busy shuttling around Mars and Ilium, you didn't hear all of the Prime Integrator's commission findings, did you? Tell me. You'll be happier not knowing, my friend. Shut up and tell me. You know what I mean. Talk. Orfu sighs. An odd noise over the tight beam, sounding like the entire 1,030 feet of the Queen Mab has suddenly depressurized. First of all, there's the terraforming. So? In their many weeks of traveling across Mars by submersible, felucca, and balloon, Monmouth had grown accustomed to the blue sky, blue sea, lichen, trees, and abundant air. All that water and life and air wasn't there a mere century and a quarter ago, sends Orfu. I know. Astig Che explained that during our first briefing on Europa, almost a standard year ago. It almost seemed impossible that the planet could have been terraformed that quickly, so? So it was impossible, sends Orfu of Isle. While you were schmoozing with the Greeks and Trojans, our science vex both five moons and belt have been studying terraformed Mars. It wasn't done by magic, you know. Asteroids were used to melt the ice caps and free the CO2. More asteroids were targeted on the huge underground frozen water deposits and crashed into the Martian crust to set H2O flowing on the surface after millions of years. Lichen, algae, and earthworms were seeded to prepare the soil for larger plants, and all that could happen only after fusion-fired oxygen and nitrogen-generating plants had thickened the Martian atmosphere by a factor of ten. In his submersible control crash, Monmouth quits tapping at his computer screen. He unjacks from virtual ports and lets the schematics and images of the sub and its re-entry shuttle fade away. That would mean, he sends hesitantly. Yep. That means that it took almost 8,000 standard years to terraform Mars to its present stage. But, but... Monmouth is sputtering on the tight beam line, but he can't help it. Astigche had shown them astronomical photos of the old Mars, the airless, cold, lifeless Mars, taken from Jupiter and Saturn space only a standard century and a half ago. And the Moravex themselves had been seeded in the outer system by human beings less than 3,000 years earlier. Mars certainly hadn't been terraformed then, except for a few domed Chinese colonies on Phobos on the surface, it was exactly as the early probes from Earth had first photographed it in the 20th or 21st century or whenever. But, sends Monmouth again, I love it when you're speechless, sends Orfu. But there is none of the accompanying rumble that usually means the hardvac moravac is amused. You're saying that we're either talking magic or real gods here, a god-type god, or... Monmouth's tone on the tight beam is approaching anger. Or... That's not the real Mars. Exactly, sends Orfu. Or rather, it's the real Mars, but not our real Mars, not the Mars that's been in our solar system for lo these billions of years. Someone, something swapped our Mars for another one? It appears that way, sends Orfu. The prime integrators and their top science vex didn't want to believe it either, but that's the only answer that fits the facts. The Salde thing cinched it. Monmouth realizes that his hands are shaking. He clasps them, shuts off his vision and video feed so he can concentrate, and sends... Salde thing? A small matter, but important, sends Orfu. Did you happen to notice during your travels through the brain hole between Mars and the Earth with Ilium that the days and nights were the same length? I guess so, but... Monmouth stops. He doesn't have to access his non-organic memory banks to know that the Earth rotates once every 23 hours and 56 minutes. Mars, 
every 24 hours and 37 minutes. A small difference, but one whose disparity would have accumulated during the months of their stay on both Mars and the whole connected Earth, where the Greeks were battling the Trojans. But it hadn't. The days and nights on both worlds had been the same length, synchronized. Jesus Christ, whispers Monmouth on the tight beam. Jesus Christ. Maybe, sends Orfu, and this time the rumble is there. Or at least someone with comparable god powers. Someone or something from Earth punched holes in multidimensional Kalabi Yao space, connected brains across different universes, swapped our Mars for theirs, whoever and wherever theirs is, and left that other Mars, the terraformed Mars, with gods on top of Olympus, still connected to the Ilium Earth with quantum brain holes. And while they were at it, they changed the gravity and rotational period of Mars. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and holy crap! Yes, sends Orfu. And the prime integrators now think that whoever or whatever did this little trick is on Earth or in near-Earth orbit. Still want to go on this trip? I, I, if I, begins Monmouth and falls silent. Would he have volunteered for this trip if he'd known all this? After all, he already knew how dangerous it was, had known since he'd volunteered to go to Mars after being briefed on Europa. Whatever these beings were, these evolved post-humans or creatures from some other universe or dimension, they'd already shown themselves capable of controlling and playing with the very quantum fabric of the universe. What's a couple of moved-around planets and altered rotation periods and gravitational fields compared to that? And what the hell was he doing on the Queen Mab, hurtling toward Earth and its waiting god-monsters at a velocity of 180 kilometers a second and climbing? The unknown enemy's control of the quantum underpinnings of the universe, of all universes, made this spaceship's puny weapons and the thousand sleeping Rockvec soldiers on board seem like a joke. This is sort of sobering, he finally sends to Orfu. Amen, sends his friend. At that moment, alarm bells begin ringing all over the ship while alarm lights and klaxons override tight beams and flash and clang across all other shared virtual and comm channels. Intruder! Intruder! sounds the ship's voice. Is this a joke? sends Monmouth. No, replies Orfu. Your friend Thomas Hockenberry just appeared on the deck of the engine room here. He must have quantum teleported in. Is he all right? No, he's bleeding profusely. There's already blood all over the deck. He looks dead to me, Monmouth. I've got him in my manipulators, and I'm moving toward the human hospital as fast as my repellers can get me there. The ship is huge, the gravity is greater than anything he's operated in before, and it takes Monmouth several minutes to get out of his submersible, then out of the hold, and then up to the decks that he thinks of as the human levels of the ship. Besides, enough sleeping and cooking quarters and toilets and acceleration couches to accommodate five hundred human beings, besides an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere set at sea-level pressure to be harmonious for humans, Deck 17 has a working medical infirmary, outfitted with state-of-the-art, early 22nd century surgical and diagnostic equipment, ancient, but based on the most updated schematics that the five moons Moravex had on file. Odysseus, their reluctant and angry human passenger, has been the only occupant of Deck 17 for this first day out from Phobos. But by the time Monmouth arrives, he sees that a majority of the Moravex on the ship have gathered. Orfu is here, filling the corridor, as is the Ganymedean Prime Integrator, Summa IV, the Callistan Cho Li, Rockvec General Bay Binardi, and two of the pilot techs from the bridge. The door to the medlab surgery is closed, but through the clear glass, Monmouth can see Prime Integrator Astig Chai, watching as the spidery Amalthean Prime Integrator Retrograde Cinepesson works frantically over Hockenberry's bloody body. Two smaller tech vex are taking Cinepesson's orders, wielding laser scalpels and saws, connecting tubes, fetching gauze, and aiming virtual imaging equipment. There is blood on Retrograde Cinepesson's small metal body, 
and elegant silver manipulators. Human blood, thinks Monmouth, Hockenberry's blood. There is more blood spattered here on the floor of the wide access corridor, some on the walls and more on the pitted carapace and broad manipulators of his friend Orfu of Io. How is he? Monmouth asks Orfu, vocalizing the words. It is considered impolite to tight-beam in the company of other Vex. Dead when I got him here, says Orfu. They're trying to bring him back. Is Integrator Sinepesson a student of human anatomy and medicine? He's always had an interest in lost-era human medicine, says Orfu. It was his hobby, sort of like you with Shakespeare's sonnets and me with Proust. Monmouth nods. Most of the Moravecs he'd known on Europa had some interest in humanity and their ancient arts and sciences. Such interests had been programmed into the early autonomous robots and cyborgs seeded in the asteroid belt and outer system, and their evolved Moravec descendants retained the fascination. But does Sinapesson know enough human medicine to bring Hockenberry back from the dead? Monmouth sees Odysseus emerging from the cubby where he's been sleeping. The barrel-chested man stops when he sees the crowd in the corridor, and his hand automatically goes to the hilt of his sword, or rather, to the empty loop on his belt, for the Moravex had relieved him of his sword while he was unconscious on the hornet trip up to the ship. Monmouth tries to imagine how strange this all must look to the son of Laertes. This metal ship they've described to him sailing on the ocean of space he cannot see. Now this motley assortment of Moravex in the corridor. No two Vex are quite the same in size or appearance, ranging from Orfu's two-ton hulking presence to the blackly smooth Summa Four to the chitinous and warlike rock Vec General Bey Binadi. Odysseus ignores all of them and goes straight to the med lab window to stare in at the surgery his face expressionless. Again, Monmouth wonders what the bearded, barrel-chested warrior is thinking, seeing this long-legged silver spider and the two black-shelled Tekvex hunched over Hockenberry, a man whom Odysseus has seen and spoken to many times in the last nine months. Odysseus and the group of Moravex in the corridor, all staring at Hockenberry's blood and opened chest and spread ribs, splayed like something in a butcher shop. Will Odysseus think that retrograde Sinopesson is eating him? wonders Monmouth. Without turning his gaze away from the operation, Odysseus says to Monmouth in ancient Greek, Why did your friends kill Hockenberry, son of Duane? They didn't. Hockenberry suddenly appeared here on our ship. You remember how he can use the gods' abilities to travel instantly from place to place? I remember, says Odysseus. I've watched him transport Achilles to Ilium, disappearing and appearing again as do the gods themselves. But I never believed that Hockenberry was a god or a son of a god. No, he's not, and has never claimed to be, says Monmouth. And now it looks as if someone has stabbed him, but he was able to QT, to travel like the gods travel here for help. The silver Moravec you see in there and its two assistants are trying to save Hockenberry's life. Odysseus turns his grey-eyed gaze down on Monmouth. Save his life, little machine man? I can see that he is dead. The spider is lifting out his heart. Monmouth turns to look. The son of Laertes is right. Unwilling to distract Sinopes and Monmouth contacts Astigche on the common channel. Is he dead, irretrievably dead? The prime integrator standing near the surgical table watching the procedure does not lift his head as he answers on the common band. No, Hockenberry's life functions ceased for only a little over a minute before Sinopesson froze all brain activity. He believes that there was no irreversible damage. Integrator Sinopesson informs me that normally the procedure would be to inject several million nanocytes to repair the human's damaged aorta and heart muscle, then insert more specialized molecular machines to replenish his blood supply and strengthen his immune system. The integrator discovered that this is not possible with Skolik Hockenberry. Why not? asks the Callistan integrator Cho Lee. Skolik Hockenberry's cells are signed. Signed? says Monmouth. He'd never had much interest in biology or genetics, human or Moravac, 
Although he had long studied the biology of kraken, kelp, and other creatures of the European ocean where he'd driven his submersible for the last standard century and more, Signed, copyrighted, and copy-protected, sends Astig Chai on the common band. Everyone on the ship except Odysseus and the unconscious Hockenberry is listening. This Skolik was not born, he was built. Retro-engineered from some starter DNA and RNA. His body will accept no organ transplants, but more important than that, it will not accept new nanocytes, since it is already filled with very advanced nanotechnology. What kind? asked the bucky carbon-sheathed Ganymedon Summa IV. What does it do? We don't know yet. This answer comes from Sinopesson himself, even as his thin fingers wield laser scalpel, sutures, and micro-scissors, while one of his other hands holds Hockenberry's heart. These nanomemes and microsites are much more sophisticated and complex than anything this surgery has or anything we've designed for more of that use. The cells and subcellular machinery ignore our own nano-interrogation and destroy any alien intrusion. But you can save him anyway? asked Cho Li. I believe so, says retrograde Sinopesson. I'll finish replenishing Skolik Hockenberry's blood supply— complete the cell repair and sewing up, allow neural activity to resume, initiate of key field stimulus to accelerate recovery, and he should be all right. Monmouth turns to share this prognosis with Odysseus, but the Achaean has turned and walked away. The second day out from Mars and Phobos, Odysseus walks the hallways, climbs the stairways, avoids the elevators, searches the rooms, and ignores the Hephaestan artifices called Moravex as he seeks a way out of this metal-hauled annex to Hades. Oh, Zeus, he whispers in a long chamber, empty and silent except for humming boxes, whispering ventilators and gurgling pipes. Father wide ruling over gods and men alike. The father whom I disobeyed and rashly warred with. He who hast thundered forth from starry heaven for all the length of my life. He who once sent his beloved daughter Athena to favor me with her protection and love. Father, I ask thee now for a sign. Lead me out of this metal Hades of shadows and shades and impotent gestures to which I have come before my time. I ask only for my chance to die in battle, O Zeus, O Father who rules over the firm earth and the wide sea. Grant me this final wish, and I shall be thy servant for all the days remaining to me. There is no answer, not even an echo. Odysseus, son of Laertes, father of Telemachus, beloved of Penelope, favorite of Athena, clenches his fists and teeth against his fury and continues to pace the metal tunnels of this shell, this hell. The artifices have told him that he is in a metal ship sailing the black sea of the cosmos, but they lie. They have told him that they took him from the battlefield on the day the hole collapsed because they seek to help him find his way home to his wife and son, but they lie. They have told him that they are thinking objects like men with souls and hearts like men, but they lie. This metal tomb is huge, a vertical labyrinth, and it has no windows. Here and there Odysseus finds transparent surfaces through which he can peer into yet another room, but he finds no windows or ports to look out onto this black sea of which they speak. Only a few bubbles of clear glass that show him an eternally black sky, holding the usual constellations. Sometimes the stars wheel and spin as if he's had too much to drink. When none of the Moravec machine toys are around, he pounds the windows and the walls until his massive, war-calloused fists are bloody. But he makes no marks on the glass or metal. He breaks nothing. Nothing opens to his will. Some chambers are open to Odysseus. Many are locked, and a few, like the place called the Bridge, which they showed him on that first day of his exile in this right-angled Hades, are guarded by the black and thorny artifices called Rockvex or Battlevex or Belt Troopers. 
He has seen these black-thorned things fight during the months they helped protect Ilium and the Achaean encampments against the fury of the gods, and he knows that they have no honor. They are only machines using machines to fight other machines, but they are larger and heavier than Odysseus, armed with their machine weapons and armored with their built-in blades and metal skin. Whereas Odysseus has been stripped of all his weapons and armor, if all else fails, he will try to wrest a weapon away from one of the battle vex, but only after he has exhausted all his other choices. Having held and wielded weapons since he was a toddler, Odysseus, son of Laertes, knows that they must be learned, practiced with, their function and form understood as any artist understands his tools. And he does not know these blunt, scalloped, heavy, pointless weapons that the rock vex carry. In the room with all the roaring machines and the huge plunging cylinders, he talks to the huge metal crab of a monster. Somehow Odysseus knows the thing is blind, yet somehow he also knows it finds its way around without the use of its eyes. Odysseus has known many brave men who were blind and has visited blind seers, oracles, whose human sight has been replaced with second sight. I want to go back to the battlefields of Troy, monster, he says. Take me there at once. The crab rumbles. It speaks Odysseus' language, the language of civilized men, but so abominably that the words sound more like the crash of harsh surf on rocks or the plunge and hiss of the huge pistons above rather than true human speech. We have long trip in front of me, us. Noble Odysseus, honored son of Laertes. When that is dead, finished, over, we hope to remove you, return you to Penelope and Telemachus. How dare this animated metal hulk touch the names of my wife and child with its hidden tongue, thinks Odysseus. If he had even the dullest of swords or the crudest of clubs, he would bash this thing to pieces tear open its shell, and find and rip out that tongue. Odysseus leaves the crab monster and seeks the bubble of curved glass where he can see the stars. They are not moving now. They do not blink. Odysseus sets his scarred palms against the cold glass. Athena, goddess, I sing the glorious power with azure eyes, Pallas Athena, tameless, chaste, and wise, Hear my prayer. Tritogenia, goddess, town-preserving maid, revered and mighty, from his awful head whom Zeus himself brought forth, in warlike armor dressed, golden, all radiant, I beseech thee, hear my prayer. Wonder, goddess, strange possessed, the everlasting gods that shape to see, shaking a javelin keen, impetuously rush from the crest of Aegis-bearing god Father Zeus. So fearfully was heaven shaken, and did move beneath the might of the cerulean eyed. Hear my prayer. Child of the Aegis-bearer, third-born, sublime Pallas, whom we rejoice to view, wisdom personified, whose praise shall never unremembered be, hail to thee. Please hear my prayer. Odysseus opens his eyes. Only the unblinking stars and his own reflection return his gray-eyed gaze. The third day out from Phobos and Mars. To a distant observer, say someone watching through a powerful optical telescope from one of the orbital rings around Earth, the Queen Mab would appear as a complicated spear shaft of girder-wrapped spheres, ovals, tanks, brightly painted oblongs, many belled thruster quads, and a profusion of black, bucky carbon hexagons, all arranged around the core stack of cylindrical habitation modules, all of which, in turn, are balanced atop a column of increasingly brilliant atomic flashes. Monmouth goes to see Hockenberry in the infirmary. The human is healing quickly, thanks in part to the Grosovki process, which fills the ten-bed recovery room with the smell of a thunderstorm. Monmouth has brought flowers from the Queen Mab's extensive greenhouse. 
His memory banks had told him that this was still proper protocol in the pre-Rubicon 21st century, from which Hockenberry, or at least Hockenberry's DNA, had come. Muskolik actually laughs at the sight of them and allows that he's never been given flowers before, at least as best he can recall, but Hockenberry adds that his memory of his life on Earth, his real life, his life as a university scholar rather than as a Skolik for the gods, is far from complete. It's lucky that you QT'd to the Queen Mab, says Monmouth. No one else would have had the medical expertise or the surgical skills with which to heal you. Or the spidery Moravec surgeon, says Hockenberry. Little did I know when I met retrograde Sinopessin that he'd end up saving my life within twenty-four hours. Funny how life works. Monmouth can think of nothing to say to that. After a minute, he says, I know you've talked to Astigche about what happened to you, but would you mind discussing it again? Not at all. You say that Helen stabbed you? Yes. And the motive was just to keep her husband, Menelaus, from ever discovering that it was she who betrayed him after you quantum teleported him back to the Achaean lines? I think so. Monmouth was not an expert at reading human facial expressions, but even he could tell that Hockenberry looked sad at the thought. But you told Astig Che that you and Helen had been intimate. Were once lovers, yes. You'll have to excuse my ignorance about such things, Dr. Hockenberry, but it would appear that Helen of Troy is a very vicious woman. Hockenberry shrugs and smiles, albeit sadly. She's a product of her era, Monmouth, formed by harsh times and motives beyond my understanding. When I used to teach the Iliad to my undergraduate students, I'd always emphasize that all of our attempts to humanize Homer's tale, to make it into something explicable by modern humanist sensibilities, were destined to fail. These characters, these people, while completely human, were poised at the very beginning of our so-called civilized era, millennia before our current humanist values would begin to emerge. Viewed in that light, Helen's actions and motivations are as hard for us to fathom as, say, Achilles' almost complete lack of mercy or Odysseus' endless guile. Monmouth nods. Did you know that Odysseus is on this ship? Has he come to see you? No, I haven't seen him. But Prime Integrator Astigche told me he was aboard. Actually, I'm afraid he'll kill me. Kill you? says Monmouth, shocked. Well, you remember you used me to help kidnap him. I was the one who convinced him that you had a message from Penelope for him, all that garbage about the olive tree trunk as part of his bed back home in Ithaca. And when I got him to the Hornet, zap, Mapahu cold-cocked him and loaded him aboard the Hornet. If I were Odysseus, I'd sure carry a grudge against one Thomas Hockenberry. Cold-cocked, thinks Monmouth. He loved it when he encountered a new English word. He runs it through his lexicon finds it, discovers to his surprise that it isn't an obscenity, and files it away for future use. I'm sorry I put you in a position of possible harm, says Monmouth. He considers telling the Skolik that in all the confusion of the hole closing forever, Orfu had tight-beamed him an order from the prime integrators, Get Odysseus. But then he thinks better of using that as an excuse. Thomas Hockenberry, Ph.D., had been born into the century when the excuse of I was only following orders went out of style once and for all. I'll talk to Odysseus, begins Monmouth. Hockenberry shakes his head and smiles again. I'll talk to him sooner or later. In the meantime, Astigche posted one of your rock vex as a guard. I wondered what the belt Moravec was doing outside the med lab, says Monmouth. If worse comes to worse, says Hockenberry, touching the gold medallion visible through the opening in his pajama tops. I'll just QT away. Really? says Monmouth. Where would you go? Olympus is a war zone. Ilium may have been put to the torch by now. Hockenberry's smile disappears. Yeah. There is that problem. I could always go look for my friend Neitenhauser, where I left him, in Indiana, circa 1000 B.C. Indiana, Monmouth says softly. On which earth? Hockenberry rubs his chest where, less than seventy-two hours earlier, retrograde Sinopessin had been holding his heart. Which earth, repeats the Skolik. You have to admit that sounds odd. Yes, says Monmouth. 
but I suspect we'll all have to get used to thinking that way. Your friend Neitenhauser is on the Earth you QT'd away from. Ilium Earth, we might call it. This spacecraft is headed toward an Earth that exists three thousand years after you first lived and, um, died, says Harkenberry. Don't worry, I'm used to that concept. It doesn't bother me too much. It's amazing that you were able to visualize the engine room of the Queen Mab so clearly after you were stabbed, says Monmouth. You arrived here unconscious, so you must have activated the QT medallion just as you were on the verge of passing out. Miskolik shakes his head. I don't remember twisting the medallion or visualizing anything. What's the last thing you remember, Dr. Hockenberry? A woman standing over me, looking down at me with an expression of horror, says the man, a tall woman, pale skin, dark hair. Helen? Hockenberry shakes his head. She'd left already, gone down the steps. This woman just appeared. One of the Trojan women? No, she was dressed strangely in a sort of tunic and skirt, more like a woman of my era than like any female outfit I've seen in the last ten years on Ilium or Olympus. But not like my era, either, he trailed away. Could she have been an hallucination? asks Monmouth. He doesn't add the obvious that Helen's knife blade had nicked Hockenberry's heart, spilling blood into his chest and denying it to the human's brain. She could have been, but she wasn't. But I had the strangest sense when I stared at her and saw her looking back at me. Yes? I don't know how to describe it, says Hockenberry a sense of certainty that she and I were going to meet again soon, somewhere else, somewhere far away from Troy. Monmouth thinks about this, and the two, Moravec and human, sit in comfortable silence for a long moment. The thud of the great pistons, a pounding that went through the very bones of the ship every thirty seconds, followed by half-felt, half-heard hisses and sighs of the huge reciprocating cylinders, has become accustomed to background noise like the soft hiss of the ventilation system. Marmot, says Hockenberry, touching his chest through the gap in his pajama shirt. Do you know why I didn't want to come along on your voyage to Earth? Monmouth shakes his head. He knows that Hockenberry can see his own reflection in the polished black plastic vision strip that runs around the front of Monmouth's red metal alloy skull. It's because I understood enough about the ship this Queen Mab, to know her real reason for going to Earth. The Prime Integrators told you the real reason, says Monmouth, didn't they? Hockenberry smiles. No. Oh, the reasons they gave are true enough, but they're not the real reason. If you Moravex wanted to travel to Earth, you didn't have to build this huge monstrosity of a ship to make the voyage in. You had sixty-five combat spacecraft in orbit around Mars already, or shuttling between Mars and the asteroid belt. Sixty-five, repeats Monmouth. He'd known there had been ships in space, some of them hardly larger than the shuttle hornets, others large enough to haul heavy loads all the way from Jupiter or space if necessary. He had no idea there were so many. How do you know there were sixty-five, Dr. Hockenberry? Centurion leader Mapahu told me while we were still on Mars and Ilium Earth. I was curious about the ship's propulsion. He was vague. Spacecraft engineering isn't his specialty. He's a combat vec. But I got the impression these other ships had fusion drives or ion drives, something much more sophisticated than atomic bombs in cans. Yes, says Monmouth. He didn't know much about spacecraft either. The one that had brought Orfu and him to Mars had been a jury-rigged combination of solar sails and disposable fusion thrusters all flung initially across the solar system by the two-trillion-watt Moravec-built trebuchet of Jupiter's accelerator scissors. But even he, a modest, submersible driver from Europa, knew that the Queen Mab was primitive and much larger than its stated mission would demand. He thought he knew where Hockenberry was headed with this, and he wasn't sure he wanted to hear it. An atom bomb going off every thirty seconds, the human says softly, behind a ship the size of the Empire State Building, as all the prime integrators and Orfu were eager to point out. And the Mab doesn't have any of the exterior stealth material that even the Hornets are covered with. 
So you have this gigantic object with a bright, what do you call it, albedo, atop a series of atomic blasts that will be visible from the surface of the Earth in daytime by the time you arrive in Earth orbit. Hell, it might be visible to the naked eye there now, for all I know. Which leads you to conclude, says Monmut. He is tight-beaming this conversation to Orfu, but his Ionian friend has remained silent on their private channel. Which leads me to believe that the real purpose of this mission is to be seen as soon as possible, says Hockenberry, to appear as threatening as possible so as to evoke a response from the powers on or around Earth. Those very powers who you claim have jiggery pokered the very fabric of quantum reality itself. You're trying to draw fire. Are we? says Monmut. Even as he says it, he knows that Dr. Thomas Hockenberry is right, and that he, Monmut of Europa, has suspected this all along, but not confronted his own certainty. Yes, you are, says Hockenberry. My guess is that this ship is just loaded with recording devices, so that when the unknown powers in orbit around Earth, or wherever they're hiding, blast the Queen Mab to atoms, all the details of that power, the nature of those superweapons, will be transmitted back to Mars, or the Belt, or Jupiter space, or wherever. This ship is like the Trojan horse that the Greeks haven't yet thought to build back on Ilium Earth, and may never build since I've screwed up the flow of events, and since Odysseus is your captive here on the ship. But this is a Trojan horse that you know, or are fairly certain that the other side is going to burn with all of us in it. On the tight beam, Monmut sends, Orfu, is this the truth of it? Yes, my friend, but not all of it, comes the grim reply. To the human, Monmut says, Not with all of us in it, Dr. Hockenberry. You still have your QT medallion. You can leave at any time. The scholic quits rubbing his chest. The scar is just a line on his flesh, livid still, but fading where the molecular glue is healing the incision. And now he touches the heavy QT medallion hanging there. Yes, he says. I can leave at any time. 32. Demon had selected nine other people at Ardis, five men and four women, to help him with the warning trip, faxing to all 300 known fax node portals to see if Setabas had been there and to warn the inhabitants there if Setabas had not. But he decided to wait until Harmon, Hannah, and Pater returned with the Sony. Harmon had told Ada that they'd be back by the lunch hour or shortly after. The Sony wasn't back by lunchtime or by an hour after that. Demon waited. He knew that Ada and the others were nervous. Scouts and firewood teams had noted shadowy movement of many Voiniks in the forests north, east, and south of Ardis, as if they were gathering for a major attack and he didn't want to pull ten people off their duties before Harmon and the other two returned. They didn't return by mid-afternoon. Lookouts on the guard towers and palisades kept glancing toward the low gray clouds, obviously hoping to see the Sony. Demon knew that he should leave, that Harmon had been right, that the fax reconnaissance and warning trip had to be done quickly, but he waited another hour, then two. However illogical it might be, he felt that he would be abandoning Ada if he left before Harmon and the Sony returned. If something had happened to Harmon, Ada would be devastated, but the community at Ardis might survive. Without the Sony, the fate of everyone might well be sealed during the next Voynich's attack. Ada had been busy all afternoon, only coming outside occasionally to stand alone on Hannah's cupola tower to watch the skies. Demon, Tom, Ceres, Loise, and a few others stood nearby but did not speak to her. The clouds grew grayer and it began to snow again. All of the short afternoon felt more and more like some terrible twilight. Well, I have to go in to work in the kitchen, said Ada at last, pulling her shawl higher around her shoulders. Demon and the others watched her go. Finally he went into the house, up to his small third-floor cubby under the eaves, and dug through his clothing chest until he found what he needed. The green thermskin suit and osmosis mask given to him by Savi more than ten months earlier. The suit had been ripped and soiled, rent by Caliban's claws and teeth, 
smeared by his blood and Caliban's, then by the mud of their forced Sony landing the previous spring. And while cleaning had removed the stains, the suit had tried to heal all of its own rips and tears. It had almost succeeded. Here and there the green insulating overfabric was all but invisible, revealing the silver sheen of the molecular layer itself. But its heating and pressure sealing faculties were almost intact. Demon had faxed to an empty node at 14,000 feet above sea level, an uninhabited, wind-ravaged, snow-pelted node known only as Pike's Pick to test it. The thermskin had kept him alive and warm, and the osmosis mask had also worked, providing him with enough enhanced atmosphere to breathe easily. Now, in his room under the eaves, he laid the almost weightless thermskin and mask in his pack next to the extra crossbow bolts and water bottles, and went downstairs to assemble his waiting team. A cry went up from outside. Demon ran outdoors at the same time Ada and half the household did. The Sony was visible about a mile away. It had come out through the clouds smoothly enough, circling around from the southwest, but suddenly it wobbled, dived, righted itself, then wobbled again, suddenly diving steeply toward earth just beyond the stockade on the south lawn. The silvery disc pulled up at the last minute, actually struck the top of the wooden palisade, making three guards there throw themselves to the ground to avoid the machine, and then it plowed into the frozen ground, bounced thirty feet, hit again, threw sod high in the air, bounced once more, and slid to a halt, plowing a shallow furrow into the rising lawn. Ada led the rush from the front porch as everyone ran to the downed machine. Demon reached it just seconds after Ada. Pater was the only person in the machine. He lay stunned and bleeding in the forward center position. The other five cushioned passenger niches were filled with... guns. Demon recognized variations on the flechette rifles that Odysseus had brought back, but also handguns and other weapons he'd never seen before. They helped Pater out of the Sony. Ada tore a clean strip of cloth from her tunic and pressed it against the young man's bleeding forehead. I hit my head when the force field went off, said Pater. Stupid, I should have let it land itself. I said manual when it came off autopilot. Just after it came out of the clouds, thought I knew how to fly it. Didn't. Hush, said Ada. Tom, Sirius, and others helped support the wobbly man. Tell us about it when we get you in the house, Pater. You guards, back to your posts, please. The rest of you, back to whatever you were doing. Lois, perhaps you and some of the men could bring in those weapons and ammunition magazines. There may be more in the Sony's storage compartments. Put everything in the main hall. Thank you. In the parlor of Artis Hall, Sirius and Tom brought disinfectant and bandages, while Pater told his story to at least thirty people. He described the Golden Gate under Voynich's siege in the meeting with Ariel. Then the bubble went dark for several minutes, the glass gone opaque to sunlight, and when the bucky glass became transparent again, Harmon was gone. Gone where, Pater? Ada's voice was steady. We don't know. We spent three hours searching the whole complex, Hannah and I, and we found the weapons in a sort of museum room in a bubble she'd never been in before. But there was no sign of Harmon or this green thing, Ariel. Where is Hannah? asked Demon. She stayed behind, said Pater. He was bent over, holding his bandaged head. We knew we had to get the Sony and as many of the weapons back to Artis as quickly as possible. Ariel had said that he, she, had reprogrammed the Sony to return more slowly than we'd gone. It took about four hours on the return trip. Ariel had said that Odysseus would be out of his crash in seventy-two hours if the machine could save his life, and Hannah said she was going to stay there until she knew knew whether he'd made it or not. Besides, we found scores more weapons. We'll have to go back with the Sony. And Hannah said we could pick her up then. Were the Voynichs on the verge of getting into the bubbles? asked Lois. Pater shook his head and then grimaced at the pain. We didn't think so. They slid right off the bucky glass, and there were no exits or entrances functioning except the semi-permeable garage door that sealed behind me when I flew out. Demon nodded thoughtfully. He remembered both the friction-free bucky glass of the crawler canopy during their drive into the Mediterranean basin with Savi, 
and the semi-permeable membrane doors up on Prospero's orbital aisle. Anyway, Hannah has about fifty flechette weapons, said Pater with a wry grin. We carried them out of the museum in chests and blankets. She could kill a lot of Voynichs if they do get in. Plus, the room that Odysseus crashes in is sort of hidden from the rest of the complex. We're not sending the Sony back tonight, are we? asked the woman named Salas. I mean, she glanced out the window at the dimming afternoon. No, we're not sending the Sony back today, said Ada. Thank you, Pater. Go on to the infirmary and get some rest. We'll bring the Sony up to the house and inventory the weapons and ammunition you brought back. You may have saved Artis. People went about their business. Even out on the far lawn there was the buzz of excited conversation. Lois and others who had fired the flechette guns originally brought back by Odysseus tested the new weapons. All those flechette guns they tried worked, and set up an ad hoc firing range behind Artis where they could begin training others. Demon himself oversaw the brushing off of the Sony. It hummed back to life when the controls were reactivated and resumed its hover three feet off the ground. Half a dozen men walked it back to the house. The storage compartments at the rear and sides of the machine, where Odysseus had once stored his spears while going on a hunt for terror birds, had indeed been filled with more guns. Finally, by late afternoon, with the winter twilight fading the day from the sky, Demon went out to see Ada where she was standing by Hannah's flaming hearth tower. He started to speak, then found he didn't know what to say. Go, said Ada, good luck. She kissed Demon on the cheek and pushed him back toward the house. In the last gray light of the snowy afternoon, Demon and the nine others loaded their packs with more crossbow bolts, biscuits, cheese, and water bottles. They considered taking some of the new flechette pistols, but decided to stay with the crossbows and knives, weapons they were familiar with, and then they quickly walked the mile and a quarter of road between the Artist Hall stockade and the fax pavilion. At times they jogged. Shadows were moving within the deeper shade of the forest, although the ten couldn't see any Voynichs in the open. There was no bird sound from the trees, not even the sparse flutters and calls common in deep winter. At the Fax Pavilion stockade, the nervous men and women keeping guard there, twenty of them, first welcomed them as their relief come early, then showed their displeasure when they learned the group was faxing out. No one had faxed in or out in the past twenty-four hours, and the guard team had seen Voynichs, scores of them moving west in the forest. They knew the Faxnode Pavilion was not really defensible should the Voynichs attack en masse, and all of them wanted to be back at Ardis before nightfall. Demon told them that Ardis was not the place they wanted to be this night, that a relief crew might not make it down to the Fax Pavilion before nightfall because of the Voynichs activity, but that someone would fly down in the Sony and check on them within the next few hours. If there was an attack here at the pavilion, and the defenders here could get one messenger back to Ardis, the Sony could bring in reinforcements five at a time. Demon looked at the team he'd put together. Ramus, Kamen, Dorman, Call, Adide, Kara, Simon, Oko, and Ele. And then he briefed the nine volunteers on their mission a final time. Each had been assigned a list of thirty fax node codes, codes simply rising in numerical order since distance from artists made no difference in the fax world, and explained again how they were to flick to all thirty sites before returning. If there was sign of the blue ice web and the many-handed setabas, they were to note it, see what they could from the fax pavilion there, and get the hell out. Their job was not to fight. If the community there looked normal, they were to spread the word to whoever was in charge, then fax on to the next node as quickly as possible. Even with delays in delivering their messages, Demon hoped that each could complete his or her mission in less than twelve hours. Some of the nodes were sparsely inhabited, little more than a cluster of homes around a fax pavilion, so the stays should be short, even shorter if the humans had fled. If any of the messengers didn't return to Artis Hall in twenty-four hours, he or she would be presumed lost and someone sent in his or her place to notify those thirty nodes. They were to return early, before completing their circuit of thirty nodes, only if they were seriously injured, 
or if they learned something that was important to the survival of everyone at Ardis. In that case, they were to come straight back. The man named Simon looked anxiously at the surrounding hills and meadows. It was already growing dark. The man said nothing but Demon could read his mind. What chance would they have trying to make the mile and a quarter in the dark with the Voynix on the move? Demon called the Fax Pavilion defenders into their circle. He explained that if any of these people faxed back with important news and the Sony was not available, fifteen of the guard troop would accompany the messenger back to Ardis Hall. In no case was the Fax Pavilion to be left undefended. Any questions? he asked the group. In the dying light, their faces were white ovals turned toward him. No one had a question. We'll leave in fax code order, he said. He did not waste time wishing them luck. One by one they faxed out, tapping the first of their codes onto the disc plate pad on the column in the center of the pavilion and flicking out of sight. Demon had taken the last thirty codes, primarily because Paris Crater was one of these high numbers, as were the nodes he'd checked. But when he faxed out, he tapped none of these codes in. Instead, he set in the little-known high-number code for the uninhabited tropical isle. It was still bright daylight when he arrived. The lagoon was light blue, the water beyond the reef still a deeper color. Storm clouds were piled high on the western horizon, and morning sunlight illuminated the tops of what he'd recently learned were called stratocumulus. Glancing around to make sure he was alone, Demon stripped naked and pulled on the therm skin, allowing the hood to lie loose at his neck and the osmosis mask to hang on a strap beneath his tunic. Then he pulled on his trousers, tunic, and shoes, stuffing his underwear into his pack. He checked the other items in his rucksack, strips of yellow cloth he'd cut up at Ardis, the two crude claw hammers he'd had Raymond forge. Raymond was the best iron worker at Ardis when Hannah was gone. Coils of rope, extra crossbow quarrels. He wanted to go back to Paris Crater first, but it was the middle of the night there, and to see what he had to see, Demon needed daylight. He knew that he had about seven hours before sunrise at Paris Crater, and he was pretty sure that he could visit most of his other twenty-nine nodes by then. Some of those on his list were the ones he'd faxed to after fleeing from Paris Crater last time. Kiev, Bellenbad, Ulenbat, Chom, Loman's Place, Dreed, Fuego, Cape Town Tower, Devi, Mantua, and Saddle Heights. Only Chom and Ulanbat had been infected with the blue ice then, and he hoped it would still be that way. Even if it took a full twelve hours to warn the people in the other cities and nodes, it would be full daylight when he faxed last to Paris Crater. And Paris Crater is where he planned to do what he had to do. Demon tugged on his heavy pack, lifted the crossbow, walked back to the pavilion, said a silent goodbye to the tropical breezes and rustle of palm fronds, and tapped in the first code on his list. 33. Achilles has carried the dead but perfectly preserved corpse of the Amazon Penthesilea more than thirty leagues, almost ninety miles up the slope of Mount Olympus, and is prepared to carry her another fifty leagues more, or a hundred more if it comes to that, or a thousand. But somewhere on this third day, somewhere around the altitude of sixty thousand feet, the air and warmth disappear completely. For three days and nights, with only short breaks for rest and catnaps, Achilles, son of Peleus and the goddess Thetis, grandson of Aeacus, has climbed within the glass-shrouded tube of the crystal escalator that rises to the summit of Olympus. Shattered on the lower slopes in the first days of fighting between the forces of Hector and Achilles and the immortal gods, most of the escalator had retained its pressurized atmosphere and its heating elements. Until the sixty-thousand-foot level. Until here. Until now. Here some lightning bolt or plasma weapon has severed the escalator tube completely, leaving a gap of a quarter mile or more. It makes the crystal escalator on the red volcanic slope look like nothing so much as a snake chopped in half with a hoe. Achilles presses through the force field on the open end of the tube and crosses that terrible openness, carrying his weapons, his shield, 
and the body of Penthesilea, the Amazon's corpse anointed in Pallas Athena's preserving ambrosia and bound in once white linen he'd taken from his own command tent. But when he does reach the other side, his lungs bursting, eyes burning, and ears bleeding from the low pressure, his skin scored by the burning cold, he sees that the tube beyond is shattered for miles more, the wreckage rising up over the ever-receding curving slope of Olympus, its interior without air or heat. Instead of a staircase he can climb, the escalator is now a series of shattered shards showing jagged metal and twisted glass for as far as he can see. Airless, freezing, it does not even offer shelter from the howling jet stream winds. Cursing, gasping, Achilles staggers back down the open slope, presses back through the humming force field at the opening to the crystal tube, and collapses on the metal steps, setting his wrapped burden gently on the stairs. His skin is raw and cracked from the cold. How can it be cold this close to the sun, he wonders. Fleet-footed Achilles feels sure that he has climbed higher than Icarus flew, and the wax on the wings of the boy who would be bird had melted from the heat of the sun, had it not? But the mountain tops in the land of his childhood, Chiron's land, the country of the centaurs, were cold, windy, inhospitable places where the air grew thinner the higher one climbed. Achilles realizes that he expected more from Olympus. He takes a leather bag from his cape, removes a small wineskin from the pouch, and squirts the last of his wine between his parched and cracked lips. Achilles ate the last of his cheese and bread ten hours earlier, confident that he would soon reach the summit. But Olympus seems to have no summit. It seems now like months since the morning of the day he'd begun this quest three days earlier, the day he'd killed Penthesilea, the day the hole closed, sealing him away from Troy and his fellow Myrmidons and Achaeans, not that he cared that the hole was gone, since he had no intention of going back until Penthesilea lived again and was his bride. But he hadn't planned this expedition. On that morning, three days earlier, when Achilles had set out from his tent on the battlefield near the base of Olympus, he'd carried only a few scraps of food into the battle with the Amazons, not planning to be gone for more than a few hours. His strength that morning had seemed as limitless as his wrath. Now Achilles wonders if he has the strength to descend the thirty leagues of metal staircase. Maybe if I leave the woman's corpse behind. Even as the thought slides through his exhausted mind, he knows that he won't do it. He can't do it. What had Athena said? There is no release from this particular spell of Aphrodite. The pheromones have spoken and their judgment is final. Penthesilea will be your only love for this life, either as a corpse or as a living woman. Achilles, son of Peleus, has no idea what pheromones might be, but he knows that Aphrodite's curse is real enough. The love for this woman he so brutally killed chews at his guts more fiercely than the hunger pangs that make his belly growl. He'll never turn back. Athena had said that there were healing tanks at the summit of Olympus, the god's secret, the source of their own physical repair and immortality, a secret path around the inviolate line between the light and dark that is death's teeth's barrier. The healing tanks. This is where Achilles will take Penthesilea. When she breathes again, she will be his bride. He defies the fates themselves to oppose him on this mission. But now his exhaustion makes his powerful, Tanned arms shake, and he leans forward, resting those arms on his bloodied knees just above his greaves. He looks out through the crystal roof and sides of the enclosed metal staircase and, for the first time in three days, really takes in the view. It is almost sunset, and the shadow of Olympus stretches far out over the red landscape below. The hole is gone and there are no longer any battlefield campfires visible on the red plain below. Achilles can see the winding line of the crystal escalator for much of the thirty leagues he has climbed, its glass catching more light than the dark slopes beneath it. Farther out, 
The shadow of the mountain falls across shoreline, distant hills, and even the blue sea that rolls in so tepidly from the north. Farther to the east now, Achilles can see the white summits of three other tall peaks rising above low clouds, catching the red sunset glow. The edge of the world is curved. This strikes Achilles as a very strange thing, since everyone knows that the world is either flat or saucer-shaped, with the far walls curving upward, not downward, as the edge of this world is now in the evening light. This is obviously not the Mount Olympus in Greece, but Achilles has been aware of this for many months. This red soil, blue sky world with this impossibly tall mountain is the true home of the gods, and he suspects that the horizon can curve downward here or do anything else it pleases. He turns to look back uphill just as a god QTs into sight. He's a small god by Olympian standards, a dwarf just six feet tall, bearded, ugly, and, as he staggers around viewing the damage to his escalator, Achilles can see that he is crippled, almost hunchbacked. As familiar with the Olympian pantheon as the next Argive hero, Achilles knows at once who this is, Hephaestus, god of fire and chief artificer to the gods. Hephaestus appears to be almost finished surveying the damage to his artificing. Standing out there in the freezing cold and howling jet stream, his back to Achilles, scratching his beard and muttering while he surveys the wreckage, and it looks as if he hasn't noticed Achilles in his linen-wrapped bundle. Achilles doesn't wait for him to turn, Running through the force field at top speed, the fleet-footed man-killer tackles the god of fire and uses his favorite wrestling moves on him, first using the famous body hold that has won Achilles countless prizes in wrestling games, grabbing the god by his burly waist, flipping him upside down and hurling him headfirst into the red rock. Hephaestus howls a curse and tries to rise. Achilles grabs the gnome god by his burly forearm and uses the flying mare move, hurling Hephaestus over his shoulder in a complete flip and slamming him to the ground on his back. Hephaestus moans and shouts a truly obscene curse. Knowing that the god's next move will be to teleport away, Achilles throws himself on the shorter, bulkier figure, wrapping his legs around Hephaestus's waist in a rib-crunching scissors hold. Setting his left arm around the bearded god's neck, and pulling the short god-killing knife from his belt and holding it under the fire god's chin. "'You fly away, I go with you and kill you at the same time,' hisses Apollo in the artificer's hairy ear. "'You can't kill a fucking god!' gasps Hephaestus, using his blunt calloused god fingers to try to pry Achilles' forearm away from his throat. Achilles uses the Athena blade to draw a three-inch cut long but shallow under Hephaestus' chin. Golden Icor spills onto the ratty beard. At the same instant, Achilles closes his legs tighter around the god's creaking ribs. The god shoots electricity through his body and into Achilles' thighs. Achilles grimaces at the high voltage but does not release his grip. The god exerts superhuman strength to escape. Achilles counters with even more superhuman strength and holds him tight increasing the pressure of his scissoring legs. Achilles brings the blade up more sharply under the red-faced god's chin. Hephaestus grunts woofs and goes limp. All right, enough, he gasps. You win this match, son of Peleus. Give me your word that you will not flick away. I give you my word, gasps Hephaestus. He groans as Achilles tightens his powerful thighs. And know that I will kill you when you break your word, growls Achilles. He rolls away, aware that the air is too thin for him to stay conscious more than a few more seconds. Grabbing the fire god by his tunic and tangled hair, he drags him through the force field into the warmth and thick air of the enclosed crystal staircase. Once inside, Achilles throws the god down on the metal steps and wraps his legs around Hephaestus' ribs again. He knows through watching Hockenberry and the gods themselves that when they QT away to wherever they're going, they transport with them anyone who is in physical contact. Wheezing, moaning, Hephaestus glances at the linen-wrapped body of Penthesilea and says, 
What brings you up to Olympus, fleet-footed Achilles? Bringing your laundry up to be washed? Shut up, gasps Achilles. The three days without food and the exertions of climbing 60,000 feet on an airless mountain have taken too much out of him. He can feel his superhuman strength ebbing like water out of a sieve. Another minute, and he'll have to release Hephaestus or kill him. Where did you get that knife, mortal? asks the bearded and ichor bleeding god. Pallas Athena entrusted me with it. Achilles sees no reason to lie, and unlike some, crafty Odysseus for one, he never lies anyway. Athena, eh? grunts Hephaestus. She is the goddess I love above all others. Yes, I have heard this, says Achilles. Actually, what Achilles has heard is that Hephaestus pursued the virgin goddess for centuries, trying to have his way with her. At one point he came close enough that Athena was batting Hephaestus' turgid member away from her thighs, and Greeks coyly used the word for thighs to mean a woman's pudenda. When dry-humping for all he was worth, the bearded cripple of a god ejaculated all over her upper legs, just as the more powerful goddess shoved him away from her. As a child, Achilles' stepfather, the centaur Chiron, had told him many tales in which the wool, Arion, that Athena used to wipe away the semen, or the dust in which that semen fell, all played interesting roles. As a man and the world's greatest warrior, Achilles had heard the poet minstrel sing of bridal dew, Harsi or Drosos in the language of his home isle, but these words also met a newborn child itself. It was said that various human heroes, some included a pollen, had been born of this semen-impregnated wool or dust. Achilles decides not to mention either tale right now. Besides, he's almost out of strength. He needs to conserve his breath. Release me and I will be your ally, says Hephaestus, gasping again. We are like brothers anyway. How are we like brothers, manages Achilles. He has decided that if he has to release Hephaestus, he will drive the god-killing Athena dagger up through the god's underjaw and into his skull, skewering the artificer's brain and pulling it free like spearing a fish from a stream. When I was flung into the sea not long after the change, your enemy, daughter of Okeanos, and your mother Thetis, received me on their laps, gasped the god. I would have drowned had not your mother, dearest Thetis, daughter of Nereus, caught me up and cared for me. We are like brothers. Achilles hesitates. We are more than brothers, gasps Hephaestus. We are allies. Achilles does not speak, because to do so would be to reveal his approaching weakness. Allies, cries Hephaestus, whose ribs are snapping one after the other like saplings in the cold. My beloved mother Hera hates the immortal bitch Aphrodite, who is your enemy. My adored beloved Athena sent you on this task, you say, so it is my will to aid you in your quest. Take me to the healing tanks, manages Achilles. The healing tanks? Hephaestus breathes deeply as Achilles relinquishes the pressure a bit. You'll be found out there now, son of Peleus and Thetis. Olympus is in the thrall of chaos and civil war this day. Zeus has disappeared, but there are still guards at the healing tanks. It is not yet dark. Come to my quarters, eat, drink, refresh yourself, and I will then take you directly to the healing tanks in the dead of night, when only the monstrous healer and a few sleepy guards are there. Food, thinks Achilles. It's true, he realizes that he will hardly be able to fight, much less command others to bring Penthesilea back to life, unless he gets something to eat soon. All right, grunts Achilles, pulling his legs from around the bearded god's middle and pushing the Athena blade back in his belt. Take me to your quarters on the summit of Olympus. No tricks now. No tricks, growls Hephaestus, scowling and feeling his bruised and broken ribs. But it is an ill day when an immortal can be treated this way. Take hold of my arm and we will QT there now. A minute, says Achilles. He can barely lift Penthesilea's body to his shoulder. He is so weak. All right, he says, grabbing the god's hairy forearm. We can go now. 34. The Voynix attacked a little after midnight. 
After helping to make and serve dinner to the artist's hall multitudes, Ada had joined in the evening heavy outside work of reinforcing artists' defenses. Despite requests from Pein, Lois, Pater, and Isis, all of whom knew she is pregnant, she stayed outside in the cold and light snow, helping to dig the ditches about a hundred feet inside the fences of the palisade. It had been Harmon and Demon's idea, fire ditches filled with their precious lantern oil and ignited if the Voynichs managed to break through the palisade, and Ada wished that Harmon and Demon were there that night to help dig. The earth was frozen, and Ada found that she was too weary to break through the soil, even though she had one of the sharper shovels. This frustrated her so much that she had to wipe away the tears and snot as she waited for Greogi and Eme to break through the frozen dirt before she could lift and shovel it away. Luckily it was dark and no one was looking at her. The embarrassment of being seen crying would have made her blubber harder. When Pater came from where he was working in the hall to finish first-floor defenses, and asked her again to come in the house, at least, she told him truthfully that she loved working on the line out here with the hundreds of other laborers. The manual labor and the proximity of so many made her feel better, and kept her from thinking about Harmon, she said. It was the truth. Sometime after ten p.m. the ditches were finished. They were crude things at best, five feet across, less than two feet deep, lined with plastic bags scavenged from chome in previous weeks. Cans of the precious lamp oil, kerosene, Harmon had called it, were in the hallway, ready to be carried out, poured and ignited if the palisade defenders had to fall back. What happens after we use a year's worth of lighting fuel in a few minutes, Anna had asked. We sit in the dark, had been Ada's response, but we'll be alive. In truth, she had reservations about that assessment. If the Voynichs got past the outer perimeter, she doubted if a little wall of flame, if they even had time to ignite it, could hold them back. Harmon and Demon had helped draw up the plans for reinforcing Artis's doorways and attaching the heavy shutters on the inside of all the first and second floor windows. The work had been going on for three days and was almost completed, according to Pater. But Ada had her doubts about that line of defense as well. When the ditches were finished, guards doubled on the palisades, cans of kerosene set in the outer hall, and people assigned to deliver them to the trenches in case of attack, the new flechette rifles and pistols distributed. There were enough to arm one out of every six persons at Ardis, a far cry from the two flechette rifles they'd had before, and Greogi was circling overhead in the Sony keeping watch. Ada went inside to help Pater with the interior defenses. The heavy shutters were almost finished. Large, solid planks of wood set deep into the ancient oak frames of Ardis Hall's windows and ready to be swung shut and latched with iron locks forged in Hannah's cupola out back. It looked so ugly that Ada just nodded her approval and then turned away to weep. She remembered how beautiful and gracious Ardis Hall had been less than a year ago, part of a tradition that stretched back almost two thousand years. It had always been a wonderful place to live and to entertain, sophisticated, gracious, elegant. Less than a year ago they had celebrated Harmon's ninety-ninth birthday here in comfort with a huge feast out under the spreading elm and oak trees, lighted lanterns in the trees, food from all over the planet being served by floating servitors, docile voynichs, pulling carrioles and droshkies up the crushed stone drive to the lighted front porch. With men and women from everywhere showing up in their finest robes and linens and elegant hairdos, looking around at the scores of people in rough tunics milling in the cluttered main parlor, lanterns hissing and spitting in the dark, bedrolls on the floor and flechette rifles and crossbows stacked close to hand, fires burning in the fireplace not for ambience but for survival warmth, with a score of exhausted and grimy men and women snoring near the hearth, muddy boot prints everywhere and heavy wooden shutters where her mother's beautiful drapes once hung, Ada thought, has it come to this? It had. There were four hundred people living in and around Ardis now. It was no longer Ada's home, or rather now it was the home to everyone willing to live here and fight for it. 
Pater showed her the shutters and other additions. Slits cut into the first and second floor window shutters through which the defenders could continue to fire arrows, crossbow bolts, and flechettes at the Voiniks if they made it through the palisade into the grounds. Boiling water in huge vats on the third floor and raised by winches to the high gable terraces above, from which last-ditch defenders could pour the hot liquid down on the Voiniks. Harmon had sigled that idea from one of his old books. Now the large vats of water and oil bubbled and boiled on makeshift stoves, hauled up into Ada's family's former private quarters. It was all ugly, but it looked as if it might work. Grayogi came in. Lasoni asked Ada. Up on the Jinker platform, Reeman and the others are preparing to take it up with archers. What did you see? asked Pater. They'd quit sending reconnaissance parties out into the forest after sunset. The Voinix could see better than humans in the dark, and it was just too risky on such a cloudy night without moonlight or ring light, so the Sony forays had become their eyes. It's hard to see in the dark and sleet, said Grayogi, but we drop flares into the woods. There are Voinix everywhere, more than we've ever seen before. Where do they come from? asked the older woman named Uru rubbing her own elbows as if cold. They're not faxing in. I was on guard duty yesterday, and— That's not our worry right now, interrupted Pater. What else did you see, Grayogi? They're still carrying rocks up from the river, said the short, red-headed man. Ada winced at this. The foot patrols had reported that as early as midday, Voinix were seen carrying heavy stones and stacking them in the woods. It was a behavior the people of Ardis had never seen before, and any new behavior from the Voinix made Ada sick with anxiety. "'Do they seem to be building something?' asked Kasman. His voice sounded almost hopeful. "'A wall or something? Shelters?' "'No, just stacking the rocks in rows and heaps near the edge of the woods,' said Grogi. "'We have to assume they'll use them as missiles,' Ceres said quietly. Ada thought of all the years, centuries, that the Voiniks were powerful but passive, silent servants, doing all the tasks that old-style humans had abandoned, herding and slaughtering their animals for them, standing guard against A.R. any dinosaurs and other dangerous replicant creatures, pulling droshkis and carryalls like beasts of burden. For centuries before the final facts fourteen hundred years earlier, it was said that Voiniks were everywhere but were immobile unresponsive, simply headless statues with leathery humps and metal carapaces. Until the fall nine months earlier, when Prospero's Isle came flaming down from the E-ring in ten thousand meteoric pieces, no one in living memory had ever seen a Voinix do something unexpected, much less act on its own initiative. Times had changed. How do we defend against thrown rocks, asked Ada? Voinix had powerful arms. Common, one of Odysseus' earliest disciples, stepped forward closer to the center of the circle that had formed here in the second-floor parlor. I sigled a book last month that told of ancient siege engines and pre-lost-era machines that could fling huge rocks, boulders for miles. Did the book have diagrams? asked Ada. Common chewed a lip. One, it wasn't all that clear how it worked. That's not a defense, anyway, said Pater. It would allow us to throw rocks back at them, said Ada. Common, why don't you find that book and get it to Riemann, M.A., Louise, Call, and some of the others who help Hannah with the cupola, and who are especially good at building things? Call's gone, said the woman with the shortest hair at artist, Salas. He left today with Demon and that group. Well, get it to everyone left good at building things, Ada said to Common. The thin-bearded man nodded and jogged toward the library. "'We going to throw their rocks back at them?' asked Pater with a smile. Ada shrugged. She wished Demon and the nine others weren't gone. She wished Hannah had come back from the Golden Gate. Most of all, she wished Harmon were home. "'Let's go finish our work, people,' said Pater. The group broke up, with Grayogi leading some people upstairs to the Jinker platform to relaunch the Sony. Others went off to bed. Pater touched Ada's arm. You have to get some sleep. Stand guard, mumbled Ada. 
There seemed to be a loud buzz in the air, as if the cicadas of summer had returned. Pater shook his head and led her down the hall toward her room. Harmon in my room, she thought. You're exhausted, Ada. You've been going for twenty hours straight. All the day shift people are asleep now. We have extra people on the walls and watching from above. We've done all we can do for today. You need to get some sleep. You're special. Ada pulled her arm away in shock. I'm not special. Pater stared at her. His eyes were dark in the flickering lantern light of the hallway. You are, whether you acknowledge it or not, Ada. You're part of artists. To so many of us, you're the living embodiment of this place. You're still our hostess, whether you admit it or not. People wait for your decision on things, and not just because Harmon's been our de facto leader for months. Besides, you're the only pregnant woman here. Ada couldn't argue with that. She allowed herself to be led off to her bedroom. Ada knew she should sleep. She had to sleep if she was to be any good to Ardis or herself. But sleep evaded her. All she could do was worry about the defenses and think of Harmon. Where was he? Was he alive? Was he all right? Would he return to her? As soon as this current Voynich threat was passed, she was flying to the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu. No one could stop her, and she would find her lover, her husband, if it was the last thing she ever did. Ada got up in the dark room, crossed to her dresser, and withdrew the Turin cloth, carrying it back to bed with her. She had no urge to use a function to interact with the images again, her memory of the dying man in the tower looking up at her. Seeing her was too terribly fresh, but she did want to see the images of ancient Troy again. A city under siege. Someone's home under siege. It might give her hope. She lay back, set the embroidered micro-circuits in the cloth to her forehead, and closed her eyes. It is morning in Ilium. Helen of Troy enters the main hall of Priam's temporary palace, Paris and Helen's former mansion, and hurries to join Cassandra, Andromache, Herophily, and the huge Lesbos slave woman Hypsipyle, who stand in a cluster of royal women to the left and rear of King Priam's throne. Andromache shoots Helen a glance. We sent servants to search for you in your quarters, she whispers. Where have you been? Helen has just had time to bathe and put on clean clothes since she escaped Menelaus and left the dying Hockenberry in the tower. I was walking, she whispers back. Walking, says beautiful Cassandra in the inebriated tone that often accompanies her trances. The blonde woman smirks. Walking... With your blade, dear Helen, have you wiped it off yet? Andromache hushes Priam's daughter. The slave woman Hypsipyle leans closer to Cassandra, and now Helen can see that Hypsipyle has a grip on the prophetess's pale arm. Cassandra winces from the pressure. Hypsipyle's fingers are sinking into the pale flesh upon the command of Andromache's nod. But then Cassandra smiles again. We'll have to kill her, thinks Helen. It seems like months since she has seen the other two surviving members of the original Trojan women, as they had called themselves, but it has been less than twenty-four hours since she said goodbye to them and was kidnapped by Menelaus. The fourth and final surviving secret Trojan women, Herophily, beloved of Hera, the oldest sibyl in the city, is here now in the cluster of important women, but Herophilus' gaze is vacant, and she looks to have aged twenty years in the past eight months. As with Priam, Helen realizes Herophilus' day is done. Returning her thoughts now to the mindset of Ilium's internal politics, Helen is amazed that Andromache has allowed Cassandra to stay alive. If Priam and the people learn that Andromache and Hector's baby Astyanax is still alive, that the death of the child had been only a ruse for war with the gods, Hector's wife would be ripped limb from limb. In fact, Helen realizes, Hector would kill her. Where is Hector? Helen realizes that this is whom everyone is waiting for. Just as she is about to whisper the question to Andromache, Hector enters, accompanied by a dozen of his captains and closest comrades. 
even though the king of Troy, ancient Priam, is sitting on his throne, Queen Hecuba's throne empty next to him, it is as if the true king of all Ilium has just entered the room. The red-crested spearmen, standing guard, snapped to even greater attention. The weary war captains and heroes, many still covered with dust and blood from the night's battle, stand straighter. Everyone, even the women of the royal family, hold their heads up higher. Hector is here. Even after ten years of admiring his presence and heroism and wisdom, even after ten years of being a plant curling toward the sunshine that is Hector's charisma, Helen of Troy feels her pulse race for the ten thousandth time as Hector, son of Priam, true leader of the fighters and people of Troy, enters the hall. Hector is wearing his battle armor. He is clean, obviously risen from a bed rather than a battlefield. His armor is freshly polished, his shield unmarked. Even his hair is freshly shampooed and plated. But the young man looks tired, wounded by a pain of the soul. Hector salutes his royal father and sits easily in his dead mother's throne, while his captains take their place behind him. "'What is the situation?' asks Hector. Deiphobus, Hector's brother, bloodied by the night's fighting, answers, looking at King Priam, as if reporting to him, but actually speaking to Hector. "'The walls and great sea and gate are secure. We were almost taken by surprise by Agamemnon's sudden attack, and we were undermanned with so many of the fighters away through the hole fighting the gods.' but we repulsed the Argives, drove the Achaeans back to their ships by dawn. But it was a close thing. And the hole is closed? asks Hector. Gone, says Deiphobus. And all of our men made it back through the hole before it disappeared? Deiphobus glances at one of his captains, receives some subtle signal. We believe so. There was much confusion as thousands retreated back to the city. The Moravec artifices fled in their flying machines, and Agamemnon launched his sneak attack. Many of our bravest fell outside the walls, caught between our archers and the Achaeans. But we believe that no one was left behind on the other side of the hole except Achilles. Achilles did not return? asks Hector, raising his head. Deiphobus shakes his head. After slaying all the Amazon women, Achilles stayed behind. The other Achaean captains and kings fled back to their own ranks. Penthesilea is dead, asks Hector. Helen realizes now that Priam's greatest son has been out of touch for more than twenty hours, sunk in his own misery and disbelief that his war with the gods had ended. Penthesilea, Clonia, Bramusa, Euandra, Thermodoa, Alcibia, Dermachia, Dorione, all thirteen of the Amazons were slaughtered, my lord. What now of the gods? asks Hector. They war amongst themselves most fiercely, says Deiphobus. It is like the days before, before our war against them. How many are there? asks Hector. For the Achaeans, says Deiphobus. Hera and Athena are their principal allies and patrons. Poseidon, Hades, and a dozen more of the immortals have been seen on the battlefield this night, urging on Agamemnon's hordes, casting bolts and lightning at our walls. Old Priam clears his throat. And why do our walls still stand, my son? Deiphobus grins. As in the old days, my father, for every god who wishes us ill, we have our protectors. Apollo is here with his silver bow. Ares led our counterattack at dawn. Demeter and Aphrodite, he stops. Aphrodite, says Hector. His voice is cold and flat like a knife dropped on marble. Here was the goddess Andromache had said had killed Hector's babe. Here was the name that forged the alliance between the greatest enemies in history, Hector and Achilles, and began their war against the gods. Yes, says Deiphobus. Aphrodite fights alongside the other gods who love us. Aphrodite tells us that it was not she who slayed our beloved Scamandrius, our Astyanax, our young lord of the city. Hector's lips are white. Continue, he says. Deiphobus takes a breath. Helen looks around the great hall. The scores of faces are white, intense. 
rapt with the force of the moment. Agamemnon and his men and their immortal allies are regrouping near their black ships, says Hector's balding brother. They got close enough in the night to throw their ladders against our walls and send many a brave son of Ilium down to Hades. But their attacks were not well coordinated and came too soon, before the bulk of their captains and men were back through the hole, and with Apollo's help and Ares' leadership, we threw them back beyond Thicket Ridge, back beyond their own trenches and the abandoned Moravec revetments. For a long moment, there is total silence in the hall as Hector sits there, gaze lowered, seemingly lost in thought. His polished helmet in the crook of his arm gleams and throws a distorted reflection of the nearest watching faces. Hector stands, walks to Deifibus, clasps his brother's shoulder a second, and turns to his father. Noble Priam, beloved father, Deifibus, dearest of all my brothers, has saved our city while I sulked in my apartments like an old woman lost in sour memories. But I ask now that I may be forgiven and that I might enter the ranks again in the defense of our city. Priam's roomy eyes seem to gain a faint glimmer of life. You would put aside your fight with the gods who help us, my son? My enemy is the enemy of Ilium, says Hector. My allies are those who kill the enemies of Ilium. You will fight alongside Aphrodite, presses old Priam. You will ally yourself with the gods you've tried to kill these last many months? Kill those Achaeans, those Argives, whom you've learned to call friend? My enemy is the enemy of Ilium, repeats Hector, his jaw set. He lifts the golden helmet and sets it on. His eyes are fierce through the circles in the polished metal. Priam rises, hugs Hector, kisses his hand with infinite gentleness. Lead our armies to victory this day, noble Hector. Hector turns, clasps Deiphobus' forearm for a second, and speaks loudly, addressing all the ranked and weary captains and their men. This day we bring fire to the enemy. This day we roar with war cries all together. Zeus has handed us this day, a day worth all the rest in our long lives. This is the day we seize the ships, kill Agamemnon, and end this war forever. The silence echoes for a long pause, and then suddenly the great hall is filled with a roar that frightens Helen, makes her step back behind Cassandra, who is smiling ear to ear in a sort of death rictus. The hall empties then as if the people in it have been carried off by the roar, a roar that does not die, but that begins anew, and then grows even louder as Hector leaves Helen's former palace and is cheered by his thousands of men waiting outside. Thus it begins again, whispers Cassandra, her terrible grin frozen in place. Thus the old futures come round again to be born in blood. Shut up, hisses Helen. Get up, Ada, get up. Ada threw the turn cloth aside and sat up in bed. It was Emma in her room shaking her. Ada raised her left palm and saw that it was only a little after midnight. Outside there came shouts, screams, the rip-crack of flechette rifles and the twang thud of heavy crossbows firing. Something heavy smashed into the wall of Artis Hall, and a second later a window in the room next door exploded inward. There were flames lighting the window, flames outside and below. Ada jumped out of bed. She hadn't even taken her boots off, so she tugged her tunic straight and followed M.A. out into a hallway filled with running figures. Everyone had a weapon and was heading for his or her assigned positions. Pater met her at the base of the stairs. They've broken through the west wall. We have a lot of people dead. The Voinix are in the compound. 35. Ada emerged from Ardis Hall into confusion, darkness, death, and terror. She and Pater and a group of others had rushed out through the front door onto the south lawn, but the night was so dark that she could see only torches on the palisades and the vague shapes of people running toward the hall, hear only shouts and screams. 
Raymond jogged up to them, the powerfully built bearded man, one of the earliest of those who came to artists to hear Odysseus' teachings while he was still teaching, was carrying a crossbow with no bolts left in it. The Boynicks came in over the north wall first. Three or four hundred of them at once concentrated en masse. Three or four hundred? whispered Ada. The previous night's attack had been the worst, and they'd estimated that no more than a hundred and fifty of the creatures spread out had attacked all four sides of the compound. There are at least a couple of hundred coming over each wall, gasped Freeman. But they came over the north wall first, behind a fusillade of stones. A lot of our people were hit. We couldn't see the rocks in the dark, and when our numbers on the ramparts dropped, we had to keep our heads down. Some ran. The Voiniks came leaping over, using each other's backs as springboards. They were in among the cattle before we could bring up the reserves. I need more quarrels with a crossbow and a new spear. He started to brush past them into the foyer where the weapons were being dispensed, but Pater caught his arm. Did you get the injured back from the wall? Raymond shook his head. It's crazy up there. The Voiniks butchered those that fell, even those with just light head wounds or bruises from the rocks. We couldn't... We couldn't get to them. The big man turned away to hide his face. Ada ran around the house toward the north wall. The huge cupola was on fire and the flames illuminated the confusion. The temporary wooden barracks and tents where more than half the people at Ardis slept were also on fire. Men and women were running back toward Ardis Hall in total panic. The cattle were lowing as shadowy, flick-fast shapes of Voynix slaughtered them. That was what Voynix once did, Ada well knew. Slaughter animals for humans, and they still had their deadly manipulator blades at the ends of those powerful steel arms. More cows went down in the mud and snow as Ada watched in horror. And then the Voynix began hopping and leaping her way, quickly covering the hundred yards toward the house in giant grasshopper bounds. Pater grabbed her. Come on, we have to fall back. The fire trenches, said Ada, pulling out of his grasp. She made her way across the current of running people until she reached one of the torches along the back patio, caught it up, and ran back toward the nearest trench. She had to dodge and weave her way against the crowd of men and women running toward the house. She could see Riemann and others trying to stem the flight, but the panicked, defeated mob ran on, many of them throwing down their crossbows, bows, and flechette weapons. The Voiniks were past the burning cupola now, their silvery forms leaping across the burning scaffolding, striking down men and women, trying to put out the fire. More Voiniks, scores of them, were hopping, scuttling, and running toward Ada. The trench was fifty feet away, the Voiniks less than eighty. Ada! She ran on. Pater and a small group of men and women followed her to the trenches, even as the leading Voiniks leaped across the first ditch. The kerosene drums were in place, but no one had poured the fluid into the trench. Ada pried the top off and kicked a heavy drum over, then rolled it along the edge of the trench as the strong-smelling fuel poured sluggishly into the shallow ditch. Pater, Salas, Pain, M.A., and others seized more of the heavy drums of lamp oil and began tipping and pouring them. And then the Voiniks were on them. One of the creatures leaped the ditch and slashed M.A.'s arm off at the shoulder. Ada's friend did not even scream. She looked down at her missing arm in silent astonishment, her mouth hanging open. The Voinix raised its arm, and its cutting blades flashed in the light. Ada dropped the torch into the trench, picked up a fallen crossbow, and fired a bolt into the Voinix's leather hump. The creature turned away from M.A. and coiled, crouching, ready to leap at Ada. Pater sloshed half a can of kerosene across its carapace at almost the same time that Loey's threw his torch at the thing. The Voinix exploded into flame and staggered in circles, its infrared sensors overloaded, metal arms flapping. Two men near Pater fired clouds of flechettes into it. Finally it fell into the ditch and ignited that entire section of the trench. M.A. collapsed and Raymond caught her, lifting her easily and turned to carry her back to the house. A fist-sized rock came hurtling out of the darkness, fast as a flechette and almost as invisible and smashed in the back of Riemann's head. Still holding M.A., he tumbled backward into the burning ditch. Their bodies burst into flame. Come on, shouted Pater, grabbing Ada's arm. A Voinix leaped through the flames and landed between them. 
Ada fired the remaining crossbow bolt into the Voynix's belly, grabbed Pater's wrist, dodged past the staggered Voynix, and turned to run. There were fires all over the compound now, and Ada could see Voynix everywhere. Many passed the flame trenches already, all of them within the walls. Some fell to flechette fire or were slowed by well-placed crossbow bolts and arrows. Others were flung back when hit by flechette bursts. But the human firing was sporadic, individual, and poorly aimed. People were panicked. Discipline was not holding. The hail of flung rocks from the unseen Voynix beyond the walls, on the other hand, was incessant, a constant and deadly barrage out of the darkness. Ada and Pater tried to help a very young red-headed woman to her feet before the Voynix overran them all. The woman had been struck in the side by a rock and was coughing blood onto her white tunic. Ada threw down her empty crossbow and used both hands to help the woman get to her feet and begin staggering back toward the hall. Flame trenches were being ignited on all four sides of Ardis Hall now by the retreating humans, but Ada saw the Voynix run through the fire or leap over it. Wild shadows leaped everywhere on the lawn, and the temperature rose a dozen degrees or more in a few seconds. The woman sagged against Ada and almost pulled her down as she fell. Ada crouched next to her, amazed at the amount of blood the red-headed girl was vomiting onto her tunic. But Pater was trying to pull her to her feet, guide her away. Ada, we have to go. No. Ada bent low, got the bleeding girl over her shoulder, and managed to stand. There were five Voynichs surrounding them. Pater had lifted a broken spear from the ground and was holding them back with feints and stabs, but the Voynichs were faster. They dodged back and lunged forward more quickly than Pater could turn and thrust. One of the creatures grabbed the spear and wrenched it out of his hands. Pater fell onto his stomach, almost at the Voynichs' feet. Ada looked around wildly for any weapon she could grab or use. She tried to set the girl on her feet so she could free her own hands, but the redhead's knees buckled and she fell again. Ada rushed at the Voynich, standing over Pater, ready to use her bare hands on it. There came a rip of flechette fire, and two of the Voynichs, including the one ready to behead Pater, went down. The other three creatures whirled to meet the attack. Pater's friend Lehman, who had lost four fingers on his right hand in the last Voynich's attack, was firing a flechette pistol with his left hand. His right arm held up a wood and bronze shield, and rocks ricocheted off it. Behind Lehman came Salas, Olo, and Lois, all friends of Hannah's and disciples of Odysseus, also using shields for defense and flechette weapons to kill. Two of the Voynichs went down, and the third leaped back across the flaming ditch. But dozens more were running, leaping, and scrabbling around Ada's group. Pater staggered to his feet, helped Ada lift the girl, and they headed toward the house, still more than a hundred feet away, with Lehman leading the way, and Lois, Salas, and the petite Olo giving them protection on each side with their shields. Two Voynichs landed on Salas's back, driving her into the muddy, churned-up soil and tearing her spine away. Lehman turned and shot the Voynichs in the hump with a full spread of flechettes. The creature was blasted sideways across the frozen ground, but Ada could see that Salas was dead. At that instant, a rock caught Lehman in the temple and he fell lifeless. Ada let Pater support the girl's weight while she snatched up the heavy flechette pistol. A solid volley of rocks came flying out of the darkness, but the humans crouched behind Lois's and Olo's shields. Pater grabbed the fallen layman's shield and added it to the defensive barricade. One of the larger stones smashed Olo's left arm through the wooden leather shield, and the woman, the absent demon's close friend, threw back her head and screamed with the pain. There were scores. Hundreds of Voynichs around them now, scrabbling, leaping, killing the wounded humans on the ground with more rushing toward Artis Hall. We're cut off, cried Pater. Behind them, the flames in the trenches had lost much of their intensity, and the Voynichs were leaping across without problem. The ground was littered with more human bodies than Voynichs' corpses. We have to try, shouted Ada. One arm around the unconscious girl, firing the flechette pistol with her right hand, she yelled for Olao to raise her shield with her right arm and to set it next to Lois's. 
Behind that flimsy barricade, the five of them ran toward the house. More Voynichs saw them coming and leaped to join the twenty or thirty blocking the way. Some of the creatures had crystal flechette darts lodged in their carapaces and leather humps. The light from the flames caught the crystal and danced in red and green flashes. A Voynix grabbed Olo's shield, pulled her off her feet, and cut her throat with a powerful slash of its left arm. Another pulled the girl away from Ada, who set the muzzle of the flechette pistol against the thing's hump and squeezed the trigger four times. The blast blew out the front of the Voynix's carapace, and it collapsed on top of the unconscious girl in a flood of its own blue-white blood fluid. But Ada could hear the pistol click on an empty chamber as a dozen more Voynichs leapt closer. Pater, Loise, and Ada were kneeling now, trying to protect the fallen girl with the shield. Loise firing with the one remaining flechette gun, Pater holding out the shortened broken spear against the next attack. But there were scores of Voynichs converging. Harmon, Ada had time to think. She realized that she said his name with a mixture of total love and total anger. Why wasn't he here? Why had he insisted on going away on her last day of life? Now the child growing in her belly was as doomed as Ada was, and Harmon was not here to protect either of them. At that second, she loved Harmon beyond words and hated him at the same time. I'm sorry, she thought, not to Harmon, not to herself, but to the fetus inside her. The closest Voynichs leaped at her, and she threw her empty flechette pistol at its metal carapace. The Voynichs flew backward, smashed to bits. Ada blinked. The five Voynichs on either side either fell or were flung backward. The dozen Voynichs around them crouched, raising their arms as a withering hail of flechette fire rained down on them from the Sony. There were at least eight humans on the disc, overloading it, firing wildly. Grayogi brought the machine lower, chest height. Foolish, thought Ada. The Voynichs could leap on it, drag it down. If they lost the Sony, Ardis was lost. Hurry, shouted Grayogi. Loise shielded them with his body as Pater and Ada extricated the unconscious, red-headed girl from the Voynich's carcass and tossed her into the center of the crowded Sony. Hands pulled Ada up. Pater crawled on. Rocks were pelting around them. Three Voynichs leaped higher than the heads of the people on the Sony, but someone, the young woman named Pain, fired a flechette rifle, and two of them were knocked aside. The last one landed on the front of the disc, directly in front of Grayogi. The bald pilot stabbed the thing in the chest. The Voynichs pulled the sword with it when it fell away. Lois turned and jumped aboard. The Sony wobbled from the weight, staggered, dropped, hit the frozen earth. The Voynichs were rushing from all sides now, and they seemed much larger than usual from Ada's perspective, lying on the bloodied surface of the downed Sony. Grayogi did something with the virtual controls, and the Sony bobbed, then rose vertically. Voynichs leaped at them, but those with rifles in the outer niches blasted them away. We're almost out of flechettes, shouted Stoneman from the rear. Are you all right? asked Pater, leaning over Ada. Yes, she managed. She'd been trying to stem the girl's bleeding, but it was internal. Ada couldn't find a pulse on the girl's throat. I don't think, she began. The rocks hit the underside and edges of the Sony like a sudden hailstorm. One caught Payne in the chest and knocked her backward across the girl's body. Another caught Pater behind the ear, snapping his head forward. Pater! cried Ada, rising to her knees to grab him. He lifted his face, looked at her quizzically, smiled slightly and fell backward off the Sony, dropping into the scuttling mass of Voynichs fifty feet below. "'Hang on!' cried Grayogi. They circled high once, flew around Ardis Hall. Ada leaned out to see the Voynichs at every door, scuttling over the porch, beginning to climb every wall, smashing at every shuttered window. The hall was surrounded by a giant rectangle of flame, and the burning cupola and barracks added to the light. Ada was never good at numbers and estimating, but she guessed that there were a thousand Voynichs inside the walls down there, all converging on the main house. I'm out of flechettes, cried the man at the right front of the Sony. Ada recognized him, Bowman. He'd cooked breakfast for her yesterday. 
Graugi looked up, his face white behind streaks of blood and mud. We should fly to the fax note pavilion, he said. Artis is lost. Adis shook her head. You go if you want, I'm staying. Let me out there. She pointed at the ancient jinker platform up between the gables and skylights on the roof. She remembered the day when she was a young teenager, leading her cousin Demon up the ladders to show him that platform. He'd peeked up her skirt and discovered that she didn't wear underwear. She'd done it deliberately, knowing what a lecherous boy-man her older cousin was in those days. Let me out, she said again. Men and women, hunched shadows like lean and leaning gargoyles, were firing down from the gables. Broad gutters and the jinker platform itself, firing flechettes and bolts and arrows into the growing mob of skittering voinix below. Ada realized that it was like trying to stop an ocean's tide by throwing pebbles at it. Graogi hovered the Sony over the crowded platform. Ada jumped out and they lowered the girl's body to her. Ada couldn't tell if she was alive or dead. Then they handed her the unconscious but moaning Pain. Ada lowered both bodies to the platform. Bowman jumped down just long enough to throw four heavy bags of flechette magazines into the Sony and clamber back aboard. Then the machine pivoted silently on its axis and dived away, Graogi's hands working the virtual controls gracefully, his face wrapped with attention, reminding Ada of her mother's focus when she used to play the piano in the front parlor. Ada staggered to the edge of the jinker platform. She was very dizzy, and if someone in the dark hadn't steadied her, she would have fallen. The dark figure who'd saved her moved away, back to the edge of the platform, and continued firing a flechette rifle with its heavy funk, funk, funk. A rock flew up out of the darkness, and the man or woman fell backward off the jinker platform, the body sliding down the steep roof and dropping away. Ada never saw who it was who had saved her. Now she stood at the edge of the platform and looked down with a detachment almost approaching disinterest. It was as if what she was watching now was part of the turncloth drama, something vulgar and unreal she would view on a rainy autumn afternoon to pass the time away. The Voiniks were climbing straight up the outside walls of Ardis Hall. Some of the window shutters had been smashed inward and the creatures were scrabbling in. Light from the front doors spilled down the Voinik's crowded front steps and told Ada that the main doors had been breached. There must be no human defenders left alive in the front hall or foyer. The Voinik's moved with impossible insect speed. They'd be up here on the roof in seconds, no minutes. Part of the west wing of Ada's home was on fire but the Voiniks were going to reach her long before the flames would. Ada turned, groping in the dark along the jinker platform, feeling wet bodies there, searching for the flechette rifle her savior had dropped. She had no intention of dying with empty hands. Thirty-six. Demon had expected it to be cold when he faxed to the Paris crater node, but not this cold. The air inside the guarded lion fax pavilion was too cold to breathe. The pavilion itself was sheathed in cords of thick blue ice, the strands overlapping and attached to the circular fax node structure like tendons wrapped tight to a bone. It had taken him more than thirteen hours to fax to the other twenty-nine nodes and warn them of the coming of Setabas and the Blue Ice. Rumors had preceded him. People from other warned nodes had faxed in ahead of him, filled with panic, and everyone had questions. He told them what he knew and then faxed on as quickly as possible. But there were always more questions. Where was it safe? All of the node communities had Voinix gathering. Several had suffered small raiding attacks, but few had experienced the kind of serious attack that Ardis had fought off the night before Demon left. Where to go? They all wanted to know where was safe. Demon told them about what he knew of Setabas, Caliban's many-handed god, and about the blue ice, and then he faxed on, although twice he'd had to brandish his crossbow to get away. Chum, seen from its hilltop fax pavilion half a mile away, was a dead blue bubble of ice. 
The circles at Ulaanbaat were now completely enclosed in the strange blue strands, and Demon had faxed away at once before the cold seized him there, tapping in the code for Paris Crater, not knowing what to expect there. Now he knew. Blue cold. The guarded lion fax node buried in Setabas' strange ice. Demon hurriedly pulled up his thermskin hood and fixed the osmosis mask in place. And even then, the air was so cold that it burned his lungs. He slung the crossbow over a shoulder already burdened with his heavy rucksack and considered his options. No one, not even himself, would blame him for turning back now, faxing back to Ardis and reporting what he'd seen and heard. He'd completed his work. This fax pavilion was entombed in blue ice. The largest opening of the dozen or so visible was not more than thirty inches across, and it curved away in an ice tunnel that might well lead nowhere. And if he did enter this ice labyrinth that Setabas had created over the bones of a dead city, what if he didn't get back? They might need him at Ardis. They certainly needed the information he'd gathered in the past thirteen hours. Demon sighed, unslung his pack and crossbow, crouched by the largest opening it was low near the floor, shoved the pack in ahead of him, nudged it forward with the cocked crossbow, and began crawling on the ice, feeling the deep space cold through his therm-skinned hands and knees. The shuffling along was tiring and eventually painful. Less than a hundred yards in, the tunnel forked, Demon took the left branch because there seemed to be more sunlight in it. Fifty yards beyond that, the tunnel dipped slightly, widened considerably, and then continued almost straight up. Demon sat back, feeling the cold reaching his butt through his clothing and therm skin, and then took a water bottle from his backpack. He was exhausted and dehydrated after his hours of faxing and the anxious confrontations with frightened people. He'd rationed his water but he still had half this bottle left. It didn't matter, though, because the water was firmly frozen. He set the bottle inside his tunic next to the molecular therm skin and looked at the ice wall. It wasn't perfectly smooth. None of the blue ice was. All of it was striated. And here some of the striations ran horizontally or diagonally in such a way that he thought he might find finger holds or footholds on it but it continued rising for at least a hundred feet, angling slowly away from the vertical until it pitched out of sight above. But the sunlight seemed stronger up there. He withdrew from his pack the two ice hammers he'd had Riemann forge for him the long day before this one. Until he'd sigled the word from one of Harmon's old books, Demon had never heard the word hammer. If he had heard the word before the fall, the idea of such a tool would have bored him silly. Human beings did not use tools. Now his life depended upon these things. The twin hammers were each about fourteen inches long, with one side of the ice hammer straight and sharp, the other curved and serrated. Raymond had helped him tightly wrap the handles with cross-hatched leather, something he could find a grip with even through his thermskin gloves. The points had been sharpened as well as Hannah's grindstone at Ardis had permitted. Standing, craning his head back, setting the osmosis mask more firmly in place over his mouth and nose, Demon shouldered his pack again, made sure the crossbow strap was firmly secure over his left shoulder, the heavy weapon lying diagonally over the pack on his back, and then he raised one of the hammers, slammed it into the ice, slammed it again, and pulled himself four feet up the wall. The tunnel was not much wider than the main chimney at Ardis, so Demon braced himself across it with a straight leg while he set his left knee on the ice wall to rest there a minute. Then he raised the second hammer as high as he could reach and slammed it into the ice, pulling himself until he was hanging there from one hammer, supporting his weight on the other. Next time, he thought, I'm going to rig some sharp spikes for my boots panting, laughing at the idea of ever doing this a second time, his breath icing the air even through the filtering osmosis mask, his pack threatening to pull him off his precarious perch. Demon hacked and chipped toeholds, lifted himself, wedged the tips of his boots in, slammed the right hammer in higher, 
pulled himself up, hacked footholds with the left. After another twenty feet gained, he hung from both hammers, embedded in the ice, and leaned back to look up the ice chimney. So far so good, he thought, only ten or fifteen more moves like that, and I'll reach the bend a hundred feet up. Another part of his mind whispered, and find that it's a dead end. An even darker part of his mind muttered, or you'll fall and die. He shook all of the voices out of his head. His arms and legs were beginning to shake from the tension and fatigue. Next stop, he'd chip in a deeper foothold so he could rest more easily. If he had to come back down the ice chimney, he had the rope in his rucksack. Soon he'd find out if he'd packed enough. Above the ice chimney, the tunnel leveled out for sixty feet or so, forked twice more, and then opened up to a canyon-wide crevasse in the blue ice. Demon packed away the ice hammers with shaking hands and unlimbered his crossbow. When he reached the opening into the wide crevasse, he looked up and saw bright afternoon sunlight and blue sky. The crevasse stretched away to his right and left, the striated floor sometimes dropping away thirty, forty feet and more, the bottom of the gap connected only by ice bridges, the walls riddled with stalactites and stalagmites, and spanned here and there above him by bridges of thick ice. Sections of buildings emerged from the icy blue matrix and then were swallowed again. He could see protruding segments of masonry, broken windows and windows blind with frost, bamboo three towers and bucky fiber additions to the older, lost-era buildings below, all equal now in the grip of the blue ice. Demon realized that he was on the Rue de Rambouillet, near the guarded lion fax node. But six stories above the street, he'd walked down and ridden on in Voynich's pulled droshkies and carryalls his whole life. Ahead to the northwest, the floor of the crevasse descended slowly until it was almost down at the original street level. Demon fell twice on the slippery slope, but he'd taken one of the ice hammers out of the pack and both times he arrested his fall with the curved iron claw. Lower now, the light bright and the air still burning his lungs at the bottom of a two-hundred-foot crevasse whose ice walls were made of countless strands of what demon began more and more to think were some sort of living tissue. He saw a second crevasse tunnel crossing his on the diagonal, and he recognized it at once. Avenue Dominique. He knew this area well. He'd played here as a child, seduced girls here as a teenager, taken his mother for countless walks here as an adult. If he followed the other crevasse to his right, the southeast, it would take him away from the crater and the city center, out toward the forest called Bois de Vincennes. But he didn't want to head away from the center of Paris crater. He'd seen the hole appear to the northwest, very near his mother's Domai Tower, right on the crater. To go that way, he would have to head up the Avenue Dominil, crevasse, toward the Bamboo Three marketplace called the Opera Bastel, just opposite an ancient heap of overgrown rubble called the Bastille. He'd had rock fights there as a boy, with the few children from his Domai Tower flinging rocks and clods at those boys from the west kids that his neighborhood group had always insultingly called the radioactive Bastilites, for some reason known to no one, adults or children. The blue ice seemed thicker and more ominous in the direction of the Opera Bastel, but Demon realized he had no choice. He'd caught that first glimpse of Cetabas in that direction back toward the crater. The trench he was in angled around to the east again before intersecting Avenue Dominil. This larger crevasse was too deep to enter directly, so Demon crossed it on an ice bridge. Looking down, he saw the bamboo three and Everplace sealed ruins of the street and avenue he'd known his whole life, but the trench continued lower than that, revealing layers of ruins of some old steel and masonry city beneath the Paris crater he was familiar with. 
He had the horrible image of the grey and pink brain Setabar scrabbling in the earth with its many hands, uncovering the bones of the city under the city. What was he hunting for? And then an even more horrible thought occurred to Demon. What could he be burying? The ropes and stalagmites of blue on regular street level were too thick to allow him to proceed northwest up Avenue Dominil itself. But amazingly, there was a stretch of green pathway down there paralleling the avenue. He rigged a bent quarrel driven into the blue ice to secure his thirty-foot descent, looping a rope over it and lowering himself carefully, knowing that a broken leg now would probably mean his death. There was an icy overhang near the bottom, and he had to swing free, then slide down the rope the last ten feet to the absurdly grassy floor of the trench. There were a dozen Voiniks waiting in the darkness under the overhang. Demon was so surprised that he let go of the rope at the same instant he started fumbling for the crossbow strung across his back. He fell four feet, lost his footing on the grass, and tumbled backward without extricating the heavy crossbow. He half lay there on his back, hands empty, looking at the raised steel arms, sharp killing blades, and emerging carapaces of the mob of Voiniks frozen in the act of leaping at him from only eight feet away. Frozen. All twelve of the creatures were mostly entombed in the blue ice, with only bits of blade or arm or leg or shell protruding. None of their peds were fully on the ground, and it was obvious that the ice had caught them in the act of running and leaping. Voiniks were fast on their peds. How could this blue ice form quickly enough to catch them thus? Demon had no answer, only thankfulness that it had. He got to his feet, felt his back and ribs ache where he'd fallen on the crossbow and lumpy pack, and pulled the rope down. He could have left it fixed in place. He had more than a hundred feet more, and he might need to ascend that ice cliff quickly on his return, rather than laboriously chipping footholds with his ice hammers. But he might need all the rope before this day was done. Heading northwest now, parallel to the Avenue Dominil, on what he still thought of as the Promenade Plante, the familiar bamboo three elevated walkway frozen in ice sixty feet above him now, Demon freed the crossbow, made sure again that the heavy weapon was cocked and ready, and followed the impossible path of green grass toward the heart of Paris Crater. Promenade Planté. Everyone in Paris Crater had called the walkway above. It was one of those rare old names and words that seemed to predate the world's common language, and no one Demon knew had ever asked its meaning. He wondered now, as he followed the green strip down the darkening and ever-deeper canyon through blue ice and excavated ruins, if the walkway he'd known had been named after this older, forgotten path buried until Setebos had seen fit to dig it up with his many hands. And Demon advanced cautiously and with a growing sense of anxiety. He didn't know what he thought he'd find here. His main goal had been to get one clear look at Setebos, if Setebos it was, and perhaps be able to report to everyone at Ardis Hall on just what this blue-eyed city was like after its invasion. But as he saw other things frozen in the organic blue ice on either side of the promenade, half a dozen more Voiniks, stacks of human skulls, more ruins that had not seen the light of day for centuries, his palms grew more moist even as his mouth dried up. He wished he'd taken one of the flechette pistols or rifles that Pater had brought back from the bridge. Demon clearly remembered Savi firing a full cloud of flechettes into Caliban's chest at almost zero range up there in the subterranean grotto on Prospero's orbital isle. It hadn't killed the monster. Caliban had howled and bled, but had also lifted Savi in his long arms and bitten through her neck with one horribly audible snap of his jaws. And then the creature had hauled her body away, diving into the swamp and carrying her corpse off through the system of sewage pipes and flooded tunnels. I came to find Caliban, thought Demon, clearly acknowledging that as fact for the first time. Caliban was his enemy, his nemesis. Demon had learned the word only the previous month and knew at once that in his life the term nemesis applied only to Caliban. And after his trying to kill the creature up there on Prospero's Isle, then leaving it to die there after maneuvering the orbiting black hole machine into the island, 
It was all too possible that Caliban considered Demon his nemesis. Demon Hupsa, though the thought of fighting the creature again made his mouth drier and his palms wetter. But then Demon would remember holding his mother's skull, remember the taunting insult of that pyramid of skulls, an insult that could have come only from Caliban, Sycorax's child, Prospero's creature, worshipper of that god of arbitrary violence, Setebos. And he kept on walking, his crossbow with its two inadequate but sharpened and barbed bolts cocked and ready. He was in the deep shadow of another larger overhang when he saw the forms emerging from the blue ice. These weren't frozen Voynix. They appeared to be humans, giants heavily muscled and contorted, with blue-gray flesh and vacant, upturned eyes. Demon had his crossbow leveled and was frozen in his tracks for thirty seconds before he understood what he was looking at. Statues. He'd first learned the real meaning of the word from Hannah, stone or some other material shaped into human form. There had been no statues in the Paris crater and Fax world of his youth, and the first time he'd actually seen one had been at the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu just ten months or so before. That place, or at least the green habitation globes clinging to it like ivy, was a museum more than a bridge, but it had taken Hannah always interested in making and pouring molten metal into shapes, to explain that the human forms they were looking at there were statues, works of art, also an alien idea. Evidently, these statues had no other reason for existence than to please the eye. Demon had to smile even now at one memory from the bridge. They'd thought that Odysseus, no man now, had been one of those museum statues until he'd moved and spoken to them. These shapes weren't moving. Demon stepped closer and lowered the crossbow. The figures were huge, more than twice life-sized, and leaning out of the ice because the ancient building they were part of had tilted forward. Each stone or concrete gray shape was the same, a man, beardless, with curls around the gray mass that stood for his hair, nude except for a small sleeveless shirt that was pulled up above his midriff. The figure's left arm was raised and bent, its hand set on the back of his head. The right arm was massive, muscular, bent at elbow and wrist, with his huge right hand resting on the man's bare belly, just under its chest, actually pushing up the gray concrete folds of the shirt. The man's right leg was the only other limb visible, curving out of the façade of the building, a shelf or ridge of some sort above small windows, running through the line of identical male statues like something piercing their hips. Demon stepped closer, his eyes adapting to the darkness under the blue ice overhang. The man's, the statue's, head was tilted to the right, the gray cheek almost touching the gray shoulder, and the expression on the sculpted face was hard for Demon to describe. Eyes closed, bow of lips pursed upward, was it agony, or some sort of orgasmic pleasure? It could be either, or perhaps some more complicated emotion known to humans then, and lost to demon's era. The long line of identical shapes emerging from both the façade of the ancient ruin and the wall of blue eyes made demon think of a dancing line of simpering men undressing for some unseen audience. What had this building been? What use had the ancients put it to? Why this decoration? Nearby, on the façade, were letters. Demon recognized them as such now after his months with Harmon and his own learning the sigil function. Sejai, M. Yunes, Yanowski, 1991. Demon had never learned to read, but out of habit he set his therm-skinned hand on the cold stone, and brought up the mental image of five blue triangles in a row. Nothing. He had to laugh at himself. You couldn't sigil stone, only books, and only certain books at that. Besides, would the sigil function work through molecular thermskin? He had no way of knowing. However, Demon could read the numerals. One, nine, nine, one. No fax node code ran that high. Could it be some sort of explanation of the statues? 
or some ancient attempt to set the figures more firmly in time, just as the human likenesses had been set in stone? How does one number time, he wondered. Demon tried for a moment to imagine what 1991 might stand for in years. The years since the reign of some ancient king, such as Agamemnon or Priam in the Turin drama? Or perhaps it was part of the way the artist of these disturbing statues proclaimed his or her own identity. Was it possible that everyone in the lost era identified themselves through numerals rather than names? Demon shook his head and left the blue ice grotto. He was wasting time on the strangeness of these things, these buildings and statues that should have remained buried, these thoughts of people unlike those he'd always known, of someone trying to put a numerical value to time itself, were as alien and unsettling to him as the memory of Setebos coming through the hole, a swollen, disembodied brain being carried by scuttling rats. If he was to find Caliban and Setebos, or allow them to find him, he'd find them in this dome cathedral. It was not a true cathedral, of course. Demon had only known that word cathedral for a few months, sigling it in a book of harmons from which he'd learned many words and understood almost nothing. But the inside of this huge dome seemed much like Demon imagined a cathedral to be. But certainly no cathedral like this had ever stood in the city now called Paris Crater. That was after dark. While the light still lasted, he'd followed the green slash of the Promenade Plante along the trench of the Avenue Dominil until that dead ended in an ice mass he guessed to be the Oper Bastel. Although the crevasse had closed overhead, he followed a tunnel that seemed to follow the Rue de Lyon up to the juncture that was the Bastille. Here, more tunnels and open, narrow crevasses in one he could extend his arms and touch both ice walls at once, led to his left toward the Seine. In Demon's lifetime, and for a hundred five-twenty lifetimes before him, the Seine had been dried up and paved with human skulls. No one knew why the skulls were there, only that they always had been. They looked like white and brown paving stones from any of the many bridges one would cross in a droshky, barouche, or carriole. And no one in Demon's experience had ever wondered where the water in the river had disappeared to, since the mile-wide crater itself bisected the old riverbed. Now there were more skulls, skulls recently liberated from living human bodies, lining the walls of the crevasse he was following toward the Ile de la Cité and the east rim of the crater. According to what little legend remained in a culture largely devoid of history, oral or otherwise, Paris Crater was said to have gained its crater more than two millennia ago, when post-humans lost control of a tiny black hole they'd created during a demonstration at a place called the Institut de France. The hole had bored its way through the center of the Earth several times, but the only crater it had left in the planet's surface was right here between the Invalid's Hotel fax node and the Guarded Lion node. Legends persisted that right where the north rim of the crater was now, a huge building called the Love, or sometimes the Lover, had been sucked down to the center of the earth with the runaway hole, taking with it a lot of old-style human art. Since the only art the demon had ever encountered with these few statues. He couldn't imagine that the loss of the love amounted to much if everything in it had been as stupid as the dancing naked man in the Avenue Dominique crevasse now behind him. Demon couldn't see anything from the one open crevasse leading to Ile Saint-Louis and Ile de la Cité, so he spent the better part of an hour climbing an ice wall, laboriously chipping steps, driving in heavy bolts to loop his rope around, frequently hanging from one or both of his ice hammers to let the sweat run out of his eyes and to allow his pounding heart to slow. One good thing about the incredible exercise of the climb, he was no longer cold. He came out atop the blue ice crust over the city 
right about where the west end of Ile de la Cité used to be. The ice was a hundred feet deep here, and Demon had expected to look west across the crater and see at least the tops of the skyline he was used to. The tall bucky lace and bamboo three dome eye towers ringing the crater itself, his mother's tower just across the way, and farther west the thousand-foot-high La Putain Enorme, the giant naked woman made of iron and polymer. A statue, just a big statue, he thought now, but I never knew the word before. None of these things were visible. Straight ahead of Demon, looking west, an enormous dome of organic blue ice rose at least two thousand feet above the level of the old city. Only corners, edges, shadows, and an occasional extruding terrace showed where the ring of once proud towers had circled the crater. His mother's tall dome eye was not visible, nor was the Putain farther west. Besides the huge blue dome itself, both blocking and absorbing what Demon realized was late evening light, the area around the crater was now a mass of airy ice towers, flying buttresses, complex tessellations, and blue ice stalagmites rising a hundred stories and more. All these soaring towers and protrusions surrounding the dome were connected through the air by webs of the blue ice that looked delicate, but which, Demon realized, must each be wider across than any of the city's broad avenues. Everything glittered in the rich low sunlight, and there appeared to be jolts and jots of light moving within the towers and webs and the dome itself. Jesus Christ, whispered Demon. For all the scrotum-tightening impressiveness of glowing ice towers leaping sixty, eighty, a hundred stories above the lower cap of ice covering the old city, the dome was most impressive of all. At least two hundred stories tall, Demon could judge its height and staggering mass only by the glimpses of the old dome eye towers low on the dome's flank. The dome stretched more than a mile in radius from his position here on the Ile de la Cité, south to the huge garbage dump his mother used to call the Luxembourg Gardens. North past the greensward called Boulevard Haussmann, enveloping the Domai Tower at Gare Saint-Lazare, where his mother's most recent lover used to live, and then west almost to the Champ de Mars, where the straddle-legged Putain was always visible. But not visible this day. The dome blocked even a thousand-foot-tall woman from view. If I'd faxed into the invalid hotel note, I would have ended up inside the dome, he thought. The idea made his heart pound more wildly than the ice climb had. But then he had two more terrifying thoughts in rapid succession. His first thought was, Setabas built this thing across the crater. That was impossible, but it had to be true. In fact, with the orange sunset glow lessening slightly on the towers and dome itself, Demon could now see a red glow coming up through the ice, a red pulsing that could be coming only from the crater. His second thought was, I have to go in there. If Setabas was still here in Paris Crater, there is where he would be waiting. If Caliban was here, the dome is where he would be. Hands shaking from the cold, from the cold, he told himself, Demon went back to the wall of ice, secured the rope around a bamboo three girder emerging from the blue ice, and lowered himself back into the waiting crevasse. It was already dark at the bottom of the narrow ice canyon. He could look up and see stars in the paling sky, and the only way forward from Ile de la Cité was into one of the many small tunnels opening like eyes in the ice, tunnels in which it would be darker still. Demon found one tunnel opening about chest high above the floor of the crevasse, and he crawled in, feeling the even deeper cold come up through the ice into his knees and palms. Only the therm skin kept him alive here, only the osmosis mask kept his breath from freezing in his throat. Scooting on his knees when he could, his rucksack scraping the lowering ice ceiling above him, his crossbow extended before him, 
He crawled on his belly toward the red glow in the dome cathedral ahead. 37. Hockenberry comes to the astrogation bubble to confront Odysseus, perhaps to be beaten up by him, but he stays to get drunk with him. It has taken Hockenberry more than a week to work up the courage to go talk to the only other human being on board, and by the time he does, the Queen Mab has reached its turnaround point, and the Moravex have warned him that there will be twenty-four hours of zero gravity before the ship rotates stern first toward the Earth. The bombs begin detonating again, and the 1.28 Earth gravity will return during the deceleration phase. Monmut and Prime Integrator Astig Chai both came by to make sure that his cubby would be free-fall proofed, i.e. all sharp corners padded, loose things stowed so they wouldn't float away, Velcro slippers and mats provided. But no one warned Hockenberry that a common reaction to zero-g is to get violently seasick. Hockenberry does. Repeatedly. His inner ear keeps telling him that he is falling out of control, and there certainly is no horizon to focus on. His cubby doesn't have a window or a porthole or anything to peer out of. And while the bathroom facilities were designed to operate in the predominant 1.28g gravity environment, Hockenberry soon learns how to use the in-flight bags that Monmut brings him whenever he announces that he's beginning to feel sick again. But six hours of nausea is enough, and eventually the Skolik begins to feel better and even starts to enjoy kicking around the padded cubby floating from his bolted-down couch to his well-secured writing desk. Finally, he asks permission to leave his room, Permission is granted at once, and then Hockenberry has the time of his life, floating down long corridors, kicking down the broad ship's stairways that look so silly now in a truly three-dimensional world, and pulling his way from one handhold to the next in the wonderfully Byzantine engine room. Monmut remains his faithful assistant during all this, making sure that Hockenberry doesn't grab an unfortuitous lever in the engine room, or forget that things still have mass here even while they show no weight. When Hockenberry announces that he wants to visit Odysseus, Monmut tells him that the Greek is in the forward astrogation bubble and leads him there. Hockenberry knows that he should send the little Moravec away, that this is to be a private apology and conversation, and possible beating between the two men, but perhaps it is the craven part of the Skolik that lets Monmut tag along. Surely the Moravec won't let Odysseus tear him limb from limb, whatever right the kidnapped Greek might have to do so. The astrogation bubble consists of a round table anchored amidst an ocean of stars. There are three chairs connected to the table, but Odysseus merely uses one to anchor himself, hooking his bare foot between the slats. When the Queen Mab spins or pivots, which it seems to be doing a lot of in its twenty-four hours without thrust. The stars swing past in a way that would have sent Hockenberry running for the zero-g bag a few hours earlier, but which now doesn't bother him. It's as if he has always existed in free fall. Odysseus must feel the same way, Hockenberry thinks, for the Achaean has emptied three wine gourds of the nine or ten tied to the table by long tethers. He passes one to Hockenberry by propelling it through the air with a flick of his fingers, and even though Hockenberry's stomach is empty, he can't refuse the wine offered as a gesture of reconciliation. Besides, it's excellent. The artifactoids ferment it and put it up somewhere here on this godless ship, says Odysseus. Drink up, human artifact. Join us, Moravec. This last is to Monmut who has pulled himself down into one of the chairs, but who declines the drink with a shake of his metallic head. Hockenberry apologizes for deceiving Odysseus, for bringing him to the Hornet so that the Moravex could shanghai him. Odysseus waves away the apology. I thought of killing you, son of Duane, but to what purpose? Obviously the gods have ordained that I come on this long voyage, so it is not my place to defy the will of the immortals. You still believe in the gods? asks Hockenberry, 
taking a long sip of the powerful wine. Even after going to war with them? The bearded war planner frowns at this, then smiles and scratches his cheek. Sometimes it may be difficult to believe in one's friends, Hockenberry, son of Duane. But one must always believe in one's enemies, especially if you are privileged to count the gods amongst your enemies. They drink a minute in silence. The ship rotates again. Bright sunlight blots out the stars for a moment, and then the ship turns into its own shadow once more, and the stars reappear. The powerful wine hits Hockenberry in a wave of warmth. He's happy to be alive. He raises his hand to his chest, touching not only the QT medallion there, but the thin line of disappearing scar under his tunic. And he realizes that after ten years of living amongst the Greeks and Trojans, this is the first time he's sat down to drink wine and schmooze with one of the serious heroes and major characters of the Iliad. How strange, after teaching the tale to undergraduates for so many years. For a while the two men talk about the events they'd seen just before leaving Earth and the base of Olympus, the hole between the worlds closing, the one-sided battle between the Amazons and Achilles' men. Odysseus is surprised that Hockenberry knows so much about Penthesilea and the other Amazons, and Hockenberry doesn't find it necessary to tell the warrior that he'd read about them in Virgil. The two men speculate on how quickly the real war will resume, and whether the Achaeans and Argives under the leadership of Agamemnon again will finally bring down the walls of Troy. Agamemnon may have the brute strength to destroy Ilium, says Odysseus, his eyes on the turning stars. But if strength and numbers fail him, I doubt he has the craft. The craft? repeats Hockenberry. He has been thinking and communicating in this ancient Greek for so long that he rarely has to pause to consider a word, but he does so now. Odysseus has used the word dolos for craft, which could mean cleverness in a way that would draw either praise or abuse. Odysseus nods, Agamemnon is Agamemnon. All see him for what he is, for he is capable of nothing more. But I am Odysseus, known to the world for every kind of craft. Again, Hockenberry hears this dolos, and realizes that Odysseus is bragging of the very same character trait of cleverness and guile that made Achilles say of him. Hockenberry had been there to hear this during their embassy to Achilles months ago. I hate that man like the very gates of death who stoops to peddling lies. Odysseus had obviously understood Achilles' implied insult that night, but had chosen not to take offense. Now, after four gourds of wine, the son of Laertes was showing pride in his cleverness. Not for the first time, Hockenberry wonders. Will they be able to bring down Troy without Odysseus' wooden horse? He thinks of the layers of this word dolos, and has to smile to himself. Why are you grinning, son of Duane? Did I say something funny? No, no, honored Odysseus, says the scolic. I was just thinking about Achilles. He lets his voice drift off before he says something that will anger the other man. I dreamt of Achilles last night, says Odysseus, rotating easily in the air to look at the near sphere of stars around them. The astrogation bubble looks both ways along the Queen Mab's hull, but the metal and plastic there mostly reflect the starlight. I dreamed that I talked to Achilles in Hades. Is the son of Peleus dead, then? asks Hockenberry. He opens another gourd of wine. Odysseus shrugs. It was just a dream. Dreams do not accept time as a boundary. Whether Achilles breathes now or already shuffles amongst the dead, I do not know. But it's certain that Hades will some day be his home, as it will be all of ours. Ah, says Hockenberry. What did Achilles say to you in the dream? Odysseus turns his dark-eyed stare back on the scolic. He wanted to know about his son, Neoptolemus, about whether the boy had become a champion at Troy. And did you tell him? I told him I did not know, that my own fate has carried me far from the walls of Ilium, 
before Neoptolemus could enter battle there. This did not satisfy the son of Peleus. Hockenberry nods. He can imagine Achilles' petulance. I tried to comfort Achilles, continues Odysseus, to tell him how the Argives honored him as a god now that he was dead, how living men would always sing of his feats of bravery, but Achilles would have none of it. No? The wine was not only good, it was wonderful. It sent liquid heat blossoming out from Hockenberry's belly and made him feel as if he were floating more freely even than Zero G would allow. Now, he told me to stuff those songs of glory up my ass. Hockenberry splutters a sort of laugh. Bubbles and beads of red wine float free. The scolic tries to bat them away, but the red spheres burst and make his fingers sticky. Odysseus still stares out at the stars. The shade of Achilles told me last night that he'd rather be a peasant sodbuster, his hands covered with calluses not from the sword, but from the plough, staring up an oxen's ass ten hours a day, than to be the greatest hero in Hades, or even the king there ruling over the breathless dead. Achilles doesn't like being dead. No, says Hockenberry, I could see that he would not. Odysseus pirouettes in zero-g, grabs the back of the chair, and looks at the scolic. I've never seen you fight, Hockenberry. Do you fight? No. Odysseus nods. That's smart. That's wise. You must come from a long line of philosophers. My father fought, says Hockenberry, surprised at the memories flooding in. As far as he can tell, he's not thought of or remembered his father in the last ten years of his second life. Where? asks Odysseus. Tell me the battle. I may have been there. Okinawa, says Hockenberry. I don't know of this battle. My father survived it, says Hockenberry, feeling his throat tightening. He was very young, nineteen. He was in the Marines. He came home later that same year, and I was born three years after that. He never spoke of it. He didn't brag of his bravery or describe the battle to his boy? asks Odysseus, incredulous. No wonder you grew up to be a philosopher rather than a fighter. He never mentioned it at all, says Hockenberry. I knew he was in the war, but I found out about his actions on Okinawa only years later by reading old letters of commendation from his commanding officer, a lieutenant not much older than my father when they fought. I found the letters and medals in my father's old marine trunk after he died. I was already close to having my Ph.D. in classics then, so I used my research skills to learn something about the battle in which my father received a purple heart and a silver star. Odysseus doesn't ask about these odd-sounding prizes. Instead, he says, Did your father do well in battle, son of Duane? I think he did. He was wounded twice on May 20th, 1945, during a fight for a place called Sugarloaf Hill on the island of Okinawa. I don't know this island. No, you wouldn't, said Hockenberry. It's far away from Ithaca. Were there many men in this fight? My father's side had 183,000 men ready to be thrown into the battle, says Hockenberry. He is also looking out at the stars now. His army was carried to the island of Okinawa in a fleet of more than 1,600 ships. There were 110,000 of the enemy waiting for them, dug into rock and coral and caves. No city to lay siege to? asked Odysseus, looking at the scolic with an expression of interest for the first time since their conversation began. No real city, no, says Hockenberry. It was just one battle in a bigger war. The other side wanted to kill our people to prevent an invasion of their home island. Our side ended up killing them any way they could. They poured flame into their caves and tombed them alive. My father's comrades killed more than a hundred thousand of the hundred and ten thousand Japanese on the island. He takes a drink. The Japanese were our enemies then. A glorious victory, says Odysseus. Hockenberry makes a soft noise. The numbers involved, men, ships, reminds me of our war for Troy, says the Argive. 
Yes, very similar, says Harkenberry. As was the ferocity of the fighting, hand to hand in rain and mud, day and night. Did your father return with much plunder, slave girls, gold? He brought home a samurai sword, the sword of an enemy officer, but put it away in a trunk and never even showed it to me when I was a boy. Were many of your father's comrades sent down to the house of death? Counting both the men fighting on land and at sea, 12,520 Americans were killed, says Hockenberry, his scholar's mind and his son's heart, having no trouble recalling the figures. There were 33,631 wounded on our side. The enemy, as I said, lost more than 100,000 dead. Thousands and thousands burned to death and entombed in the caves and holes where they dug in to fight. We Achaeans have lost more than 25,000 comrades in front of the walls of Ilium, says Odysseus. The Trojans have built funeral pyres to at least that many of their own. Yes, says Hockenberry with a slight smile, but that's over a period of ten years. My father's battle on the island of Okinawa lasted only ninety days. There is a silence. The Queen Mab rotates again, as smoothly and majestically as some giant marine mammal rolling over as it swims. Brilliant sunlight pours over them briefly, causing each man to raise his hand to shield his eyes, and then the stars return. I'm surprised I've never heard of this war, says Odysseus, handing the scolic a fresh gourd of wine. But still you must be proud of your father, son of Duane. Your people must have treated the victors in that battle like gods. Songs will be sung of it for centuries around your hearths. The names of the men who fought and died there will be known to the grandsons of the grandsons of the heroes, and the details of every individual combat will be sung by minstrels and poets. Actually, says Hockenberry, taking a long drink, almost everyone in my country has forgotten that battle already. Are you hearing this? sends Monmut on tight beam. Yes. Orfu of Io is outside on the hull of the Queen Mab, scuttling around with the other hardvac Moravex during the twenty-four hours that the ship is not under acceleration or deceleration, doing inspections and carrying out repairs on minor damage from micrometeorite hits, solar flares, or the effects of the fission bombs they have been detonating behind them. It is possible to work on the hull while the ship is underway. Orfu has been outside several times in the last two weeks, moving along the system of catwalks and ladders rigged for that purpose. But the big Ionian is already on record as saying he prefers the zero gravity to what he's described as working on the face of a hundred-story building while under acceleration, with an all-too-real sense of the stern and pusher plate of the ship being down. Hockenberry sounds quite drunk, sends Orfu. I think he is, responds Monmut. This wine that Astig Chai had the galley replicate is powerful stuff, based on a sample of Median wine from an amphora borrowed from Hector's wine cellar. Hockenberry has been drinking lesser versions of this red Median for years with the Greeks and Trojans, but almost certainly in moderation. The Greeks mix more water than wine into their cups. Sometimes they add salt water or perfumes like myrrh. Now that sounds barbarous, tight beams Orfu. At any rate, sends Monmut, the Skolik hasn't eaten since he was space sick earlier today, so his empty stomach isn't any help in keeping him sober. It sounds as if he'll be space sick again later today. If he is, sends Monmut, it's your turn to bring him more space sickness bags. I've held his head over them enough for one twenty-four hour cycle. Darn, sends Orfu of Io. I'd really love to take my turn at that, but I don't think the doorways there and the human cubby level of the ship are wide enough for me. Wait, sends Monmut, listen to this. Do you like to play games, son of Duane? Games? said Hockenberry. What kind of games? The kinds of game one would play during a celebration or a funeral, says Odysseus. The games we would have had at Patroclus' funeral if Achilles had acknowledged his friend's death 
and allowed us to put on a funeral after Patroclus' disappearance. Hockenberry is quiet for a minute and then says, You mean discus, javelin, that sort of thing? Aye, says Odysseus, and chariot races, foot races, wrestling and boxing. I've seen your boxing matches there at your camps near where the black ships are drawn up, says Hockenberry, slurring only slightly. The men fight with just drawhide thongs wrapped around their hands. Odysseus laughs. What else should they wear on their hands, son of Duane? Great soft pillows? Hockenberry ignores the question. Last summer in your camp I watched a Pierce beat a dozen men bloody, smashing their ribs, breaking their jaws. He took on all comers and fought from early afternoon to late after moonrise. Odysseus is grinning. I remember those matches. No one could stand up to Penopia's son that day, although many men tried. Two men died. Odysseus shrugs and sips more wine. Diomedes was training and backing Euryalus, son of Mesistius, third in command of the Argolid fighters. He had him out running every morning before dawn, hardening his fists by slugging oxen halves fresh from the slaughter pens. But Apius cold cocked him that evening in only twenty rounds. Diomedes had to drag his man out of the circle with poor Euryalus' toes, leaving ten furrows in the sand. But he lived to fight another day, and the next time he won't drop his fucking guard, that's for sure. Boxing is a filthy enterprise, quotes Hockenberry, and if you stay in it long enough, your mind will become a concert hall where Chinese music never stops playing. Odysseus brays a laugh. That's funny. Who said it? A wise man by the name of Jimmy Cannon. But what is Chinese music, asks Odysseus, still chuckling, and what exactly is a concert hall? Never mind, says Hockenberry. You know, in all the years of watching the war, I don't remember your boxing champion, Apius, ever distinguishing himself in Aristea, single combat for glory. No, that's true, agrees Odysseus. Apius himself acknowledges that he's no great man of war. Sometimes the courage it takes to face another man bare-fisted is not the kind required to run an enemy through the belly with your spear point and then twist the blade out spilling the man's guts like so much awful in the dirt. But you can do that. Hockenberry's voice is flat. Oh, yes, laughs Odysseus. But the gods have willed it so. I'm of a generation of Achaeans whom Zeus has decreed, from youth to old age, must wind down our brutal wars to the bitter end, until we ourselves drop and die down to the last man. Odysseus is quite the optimist, sends Orfu. A realist, says Monmut on the tight beam. But you were talking about games, says Hockenberry. I've seen you wrestle and win, and you won camp foot races as well. Yes, says Odysseus. More than one time I've carried off the cup at the running race while Ajax has had to settle for the ox. Athena has helped me there tripping up the big oaf to let me cross the finish line first, and I bested Ajax in wrestling as well, clipping the hollow of his knee, throwing him backward and pinning him before the dull-witted giant noticed that he'd been thrown. Does that make you a better man? asks Hockenberry. Of course it does, booms Odysseus. What would the world be without the Argon? The agonistics of one man against another to show everyone the order of precedence among men, just as no two other things on earth are alike. How could any of us alive know quality of competition and personal combat did not let all the world know who embodies excellence and who merely manages mediocrity? What games do you excel in, son of Duane? I went off a track my freshman year at college, says Hockenberry. I didn't make the team. Well, I have to admit that I'm not half bad in the world of games where men compete, says Odysseus. I know how to handle a well-carved, fine-polished bow, 
and will be the first among my comrades to hit my man in a moving mass of enemies, even with my friends jostling against me, everyone trying to take aim at once. One reason I was willing to follow Achilles and Hector into a war with the gods was my eagerness to test my prowess as an archer against Apollo's skill, although in my heart I knew this was folly. Whenever mortal man rivals the gods in archery, look at poor Eurytus of Echalia. That man can bet he'll die a sudden death, not pass away from old age within the halls of his own home. And I don't think I'd go up against the Lord of the Silver Bow unless I had my best bow with me, and I never take it to war when I sail off in the black ships. That bow is on the wall of my great hall even now. Iphitus gave me that bow as a sign of friendship when we first met. The bow belonged to his father, the archer Eurytus himself. I liked Iphitus a lot, and I'm sorry I gave him only a sword and rough-hewn spear in exchange for the finest bow on earth. Heracles murdered Iphitus before I really had time to get to know the man. As for spears, I can fling a lance as far as the next man can shoot an arrow. Now, you've seen me box and wrestle. As for sprinting, yes, you saw me beat Ajax, and I can run for hours without vomiting up my breakfast. But in the short sprint, many runners will leave me behind in the dust unless Athena intervenes on my behalf. I could have qualified for track, says Hockenberry, almost muttering to himself now. Long distance was my thing. But there was this guy named Brad Maldorf, the duck we used to call him, who squeezed me out for the last position on the team. Failing tastes of bile and dog vomit, says Odysseus. Shame on any man who gets used to that taste. He gulps some wine, throwing his head back to swallow, then wipes droplets from his brown beard. I dream of talking to dead Achilles in the shaded halls of Hades. But it's my son Telemachus whom I really want to know about. If the gods are going to send me dreams, why not dreams of my son? He was a boy when I left, timid and untested, and I'd like to know if he's turned into a man or become one of those patty wastes who hang around better men's halls, seeking a rich wife, buggering boys, and playing the lyre all day. We never had any children, says Hagenberry. It rubs his forehead. I don't think we do. Memories of my real life are mixed up and murky. I'm like a sunken ship that someone refloated for their own reasons, but didn't bother to pump all the water out, just enough to make it float. Too many compartments are still flooded. Odysseus looks at the scolic, obviously not understanding and obviously not interested enough to ask a question. Hockenberry looks back at the Greek Captain King, his gaze suddenly focused and intense. I mean, answer me this if you can. I mean, what does it mean to be a man? To be a man, repeats Odysseus. He opens the last two gourds of wine and hands Hockenberry one. Yes, excuse me, yes, to be a man, to become a man. In my country, the only rite of passage is when you get the car keys or get laid for the first time. Odysseus nods. Getting laid for the first time is important. But certainly that can't be it, son of Laertes. What does it take to be a man or a human being, for that matter? This should be good, Monmouth sends to Orfu on the tight beam. I've wondered this myself more than a few times, and not just when I'm trying to understand Shakespeare's sonnets. We've all wondered it, replies Orfu. All of us obsessed with things human, which is to say, all of us Moravex, since our programming and designed DNA lead us back to studying and trying to understand our creators. Being a man, repeats Odysseus, his voice serious, almost distracted. Right now, I have to piss. Do you have to piss, Hockenberry? I mean continues the scolic. Maybe it has something to do with consistency. He has to try the word twice before getting it right. Consistency. I mean, look at your Olympics versus ours. Just look at that. 
That other Moravec told me how to piss in that latrine in the room. It has some sort of vacuum that sucks it in, even in this floating time. But I find it damned hard not to send blobs everywhere, don't you, Hockenberry? Twelve hundred years, you ancient Greeks kept your games going, says Hockenberry. Five days of games every four years for twelve hundred years until some... Pissant Christian Emperor of Rome abolished them. Twelve hundred years, through drought and famine, pestilence and plague. Every four years the wars would be brought to a halt, and your athletes would travel from all over their world to Olympia to pay homage to the gods and to compete in the chariot races, foot races, wrestling, discus and javelin, and Pancration, that weird mixture of wrestling and kickboxing that I've never seen, and I bet you haven't either. Twelve hundred years, son of Laertes. When my own people brought the games back, they couldn't keep them going for much more than a hundred years without three of them being cancelled for war, countries refusing to show up because they were pissed off by this or that slight or offense, and we even had terrorists killed Jewish athletes. Pissed off, yes, says Odysseus, releasing the gourd on its tether and spinning around, ready to kick back to his cubby. Have to piss. Be right back. Maybe the only thing that's really consistent is what Homer said. Dear to us ever is the banquet and the harp and the dance and changes of raiment and the warm bath, and love, and sleep. Who's Homer? asks Odysseus, pausing in midair at the irised door to the astrogation bubble. No one you'd know, says Hockenberry, drinking more wine. But you know what? He stops. Odysseus is gone. Monmouth goes out through the medical deck airlock, tethers himself even though he has reaction thruster fuel in his backpack, and follows catwalks, ladders, and ship lines around and up the Queen Mab. He finds Orfu of Io welding a patch on the cargo bay doors in which the Dark Lady is stored, cradled under the folding wings of the re-entry shuttle. That could have been more enlightening, says Monmouth, on their private radio frequency. Most conversations share that particular quality, says Orfu. Even ours. But we're not usually drunk during our conversations. Since Moravecs don't ingest alcohol for stimulative or depressive purposes, you are technically correct, says Orfu. His shell, legs and sensors brightly illuminated by the shower of sparks from his welding, but we've discussed things while you've been hypoxic, drugged with fatigue toxins, and, as the humans would say, scared shitless. So Odysseus and Hockenberry's disjointed conversation did not sound unfamiliar to my ears. If I had ears. What would Proust say about what it takes to be human, or a man for that matter, asked Monmouth. Ah, Proust, that tiresome fellow, says Orfu. I was reading him again just this morning. You once tried to explain to me his steps to truth, says Monmouth. At first you said he had three steps, then four, then three, then back to four. I don't think you ever told me what they were either. In fact, I think you lost track of what you were talking about. Just testing you, says Orfu with a rumble, seeing if you were listening. So you say, says Monmouth. I think you were having a Moravec moment. It wouldn't be the first, says Orfu of Io. Data overload from both their organic brains and cybernetic memory banks was an increasing problem as Moravex moved into their second or third century. Well, says Monmouth, I doubt if Proust's ideas about the essence of being human connect too well with Odysseus. Four of Orfu's multiply jointed arms are busy with the welding, but he shrugs two others. You remember that he tried friendship, even as a lover, as being one of those paths, says the Ionian. 
so he has that in common with both Odysseus and Arscolic in there. But Proust's narrator discovers that his own calling to truth is writing, examining the nuances wrapped within the other nuances of his life. But he'd rejected art earlier as a path to the deepest humanity, says Monmouth. I thought you told me that he decided that art wasn't the way to truth after all. He discovers that real art is an actual form of creation, says Orfu. Here, listen to this passage from an early section of the Germant Way. People of taste tell us nowadays that Renoir is a great 18th century painter. But in so saying, they forget the element of time and that it took a great deal of time, even at the height of the nineteenth century, for Renoir to be hailed as a great artist. To succeed thus in gaining recognition, the original painter or the original writer proceeds on the lines of the oculist. The course of treatment they give us by their painting or by their prose is not always pleasant. When it is at an end, the practitioner says to us, Now look! And lo and behold, the world around us, which was not created once and for all, but is created afresh as often as an original artist is born, appears to us entirely different from the old world, but perfectly clear. Women pass in the street different from those we formerly saw, because they are Renoirs. Those Renoirs we persistently refuse to see as women. The carriages, too, are Renoirs and the water and the sky. We feel tempted to go for a walk in the forest which is identical with the one which, when we first saw it, looked like anything in the world except a forest. Like, for instance, a tapestry of innumerable hues, but lacking precisely the hues peculiar to forests. Such is the new and perishable universe which has just been created. It will last until the next geological catastrophe is precipitated by a new painter of original talent. And he goes on to explain how writers do the same thing, Monmouth, bring new universes into existence. Surely he doesn't mean that in a literal sense, says Monmouth, not bringing real universes into existence. I think he is speaking literally, replies Orfu his tone on the radio band as serious as Monmouth has ever heard it. Have you been following the quantum flux sensor readings that Asti Che has been putting on the common band? No, not really. Quantum theory bores me. This isn't theory, says Orfu. Every day we've been making this Mars-Earth transit, the quantum instability between the two worlds within our entire solar system has grown larger. The Earth is at the center of this flux. It's as if all of its space-time probability matrices have entered some vortex, some region of self-induced chaos. What does that have to do with Proust? Orfu shuts off the welding torch. The large patch plate on the cargo bay doors is perfectly joined. Somebody, or something, is screwing around with worlds, perhaps with entire universes. Break down the math of the quantum data flowing in, and it's as if different quantum Kalabi Yao spaces have somehow attempted to coexist on one brain. It's almost as if new worlds are trying to come into existence, as if they've been willed into existence by some singular genius, just as Proust suggests. Somewhere on the Queen Mab, invisible thrusters fire and the long, inelegant but beautiful black bucky carbon and steel spacecraft rotates and tumbles. Monmouth grabs a clutch bar, his feet flying out away from the ship as three hundred meters of atomic spacecraft twist and tumble like a circus acrobat. Sunlight slides across the two Moravex and then sets behind the bulky pusher plates at the stern. Monmouth readjusts his polarized filters, sees the stars again, and knows that while Orfu can't see them on the visible spectrum, he's listening to their radio squawks and screeches. That thermonuclear choir, the Ionian once had called it. 
Orfu, my friend, von Mutt says, are you getting religious on me? The Ionian rumbles in the subsonic, if I am. And if Proust is right and real universes are created when those rare, almost unique genius-level minds concentrate on creating them, I don't think I want to meet the creators of this current reality. There's something malignant at work here. I don't see why this begins Monmouth and then pauses, listening to the common band. What's a 1201 alarm? The mass of the Mab has just decreased by 64 kilograms, says Orfu. Waste and urine dump? Not quite. Our friend Hockenberry has just quantum teleported away. Monmouth's first thought is, Hockenberry's in no condition to QT anywhere. We should have stopped him. Friends don't let friends teleport drunk. But he decides not to share this with Orfu. A second later, Orfu says, Do you hear that? No, what? I've been monitoring the radio bands. We just brought the high-gain antenna around to aim it at Earth, or actually the polar orbital ring around Earth, and it's just picked up a modulated radio broadcast being masered right at us. What does it say? Monmouth feels his organic heart beginning to pump faster. He doesn't override the adrenaline, but lets it pump. It's definitely from the polar ring, says Orfu, about 35,000 kilometers above Earth. The message is in a woman's voice, and it just says over and over, Bring Odysseus to me. Thirty-eight. Demon entered the blue ice dome cathedral to an echoing susurration of whispers and chants. Thinketh he made it with the fire to match, one fire eye in a ball of foam that floats and feeds. Thinketh he hath watched hunt with that slant white wedge eye by moonlight, and the pie with the long tongue that pricks deep into oak warts for a worm, and says a plain word when she finds her prize, but will not eat the ants, the ants themselves that built a wall of seeds and settled stalks about their hole. He made all these and more, made all we see and us in spite how else. Demon recognized the voice at once, Caliban. The sibilant whispers echoed off blue ice wall and blue ice tunnel, seeming to come from everywhere, reassuringly distant, terrifyingly close. And somehow that single Caliban voice was a chorus, a choir, a multitude of voices in terrible harmony. More frightened than he thought he'd be, much, much more frightened than he'd hoped he would be, Demon bent his head low and moved forward out of the ice tunnel into the ice mezzanine. After an hour's crawling, often backtracking, as some blue ice tunnel narrowed and closed at a dead end, sometimes emerging into corridors ten yards across, only to come up against a wall or vertical shaft far too high to climb, sometimes crawling on his belly so that his back scraped the ice ceiling, shoving his pack ahead of him along with the crossbow. Demon had emerged into what he thought of as the center of the ice dome cathedral. Demon had none of the ancient words to describe this space he had stepped out into, standing as he was on one of what looked to be hundreds of shadowy ice mezzanines in the inner curved wall of the vast structure. But if he had sigled the words, he would have fumbled through them now. Spires, dome, arches, flying buttresses, apse, nave, basilica, choir, loft, porch, chapel, rose window, alcove, pillar, altar. They all would have applied to one or more parts of what he was looking at now, and he would have needed more words, many more words. As best as Demon could estimate, the interior of this space was just a little over a mile across and about two thousand feet from the red glowing floor to the blue ice apex of the dome. As he'd guessed earlier from the outside, Setebos had covered over the entire crater at the heart of Paris Crater, and the vast circle now glowed red, pulsing as if from some huge heartbeat. 
Demon had no idea whether this was due to some natural volcanic activity in the crater, some magma rising from miles below where the black hole had once torn at the heart of the earth, or whether Setabas was somehow summoning and using that heat and light. The rest of the dome glowed in shades of colors Demon could not describe, from all the varieties of red at the base, through iridescent and then subtle oranges along the periphery of the crater and lower reaches of the dome. Veins of red branching up through orange-yellow buttresses and stalagmites, and then the hotter colors fading into the cool glow of the immense blue pillars. The blue ice walls, columns, tendons, and towers were shot through with pulses of green light and yellow sparks, ordered columns of red pulses moving along hidden channels like surges of electricity, open sparks connecting brachiated sections of the cathedral, like dendrites firing. The shell of the dome was thin enough in places that the last evening light from outside illuminated rose circles on the west side. The highest point on the ceiling was as thin as glass and showed an oval of darkening sky and an only slightly blurred view of the emerging stars. Most curious, though, low on the inner walls of the dome were hundreds of cross-shaped impressions, each about six feet high. They circled the space, and by leaning out from his rough mezzanine slab, Demon could see more of these cross niches below him, indented as if burned into the blue ice. They seemed to be made of metal and were empty, their steel interiors reflecting the red glow from the center of the crater. The red-hued floor of the crater itself was not empty. Everywhere rose-thorned stalagmites and craggy spires, with some rising all the way to the ceiling, creating neat rows of blue ice pillars, while others remained freestanding. Nor was the floor of the crater smooth. Everywhere were smaller craters and raised fumaroles. Gases, steam, and smoke curled out of most of these, and Demon caught the stink of sulfur on the tepid, overheated air currents. In the center of the red-glowing circle was a raised and raw-rimmed crater ringed with blue ice stairways and lesser fumaroles. This crater, above the crater, appeared to be filled almost to the rim with round white stones, until Demon realized that the stones were the tops of human skulls. Tens of thousands of human skulls, most lying beneath the mass that almost filled the crater. This raised crater looked very much like a nest, and the impression was reinforced by the thing that filled it. Gray brain tissue, convoluted ridges, multiple pairs of eyes, mouths, and orifices opening and shutting in no unison, a score of huge hands beneath it. These hands occasionally rearranging the huge form's mass on its nest, settling it more comfortably, and he saw their hands each larger than the room demon occupied at Ardis Hall that had emerged from the brain on stalks and were pulling themselves and their trailing tentacles across the glowing floor. Some of the hands were close enough that Demon could see a myriad of curved, barbed, black hair spikes or hooks emerging from the ends of those huge fingers. Each barb, some sort of evolved hair, was longer than the killing knife that Demon wore on his belt, and the fingers used the filaments to sink into the blue ice. The hands could climb anywhere, pull themselves along any surface, masonry, ice, or steel, by sinking those black, hooked blades into whatever lay underhand. The brain shape of Setabas itself was much larger than Demon remembered from its emergence through the hole in the sky less than two days before. If that thing had been a hundred feet along its axis, it was now at least a hundred yards long and thirty yards high in the center, where the convoluted tissue was separated by a deep, glowing groove. It filled its nest, and whenever it resettled its bulk, there came the crunch of skulls, like the snapping and settling of straw. Thinketh, such glory shows nor right nor wrong in him, nor kind nor cruel, he is strong and lord, saith, he is terrible, watch his feats in proof. 
Caliban's sibilant hiss slid off the dome in some show of perfect acoustics, echoed off fumaroles and ziggurats, echoed again down the labyrinth of ice tunnels, and seemed to come at Demon from front, back, and side, a murderous whisper. As Demon's eyes adjusted to the red glow gloom and the scale of the vast hollowed-out dome, he could see smaller objects moving now, scuttling around the base of Setabos' nest, scurrying on all fours up the blue ice steps to the base of the brain shape, and then trudging back down on hind legs only, carrying large oval pods that glowed with a sick and slick milkiness. For a minute Demon thought they were Voynix. He'd seen the remains of dozens of Voynix during his long crawl in through the ice maze. Not Voynix frozen in the ice as he'd encountered in the outside crevasse, but gutted remains of Voynix. A hollowed-out carapace here, a torn pad or lacerated leather hump there. A set of claw hands lying alone. But now, looking through the stream and fog from the fumaroles, he could see that these attending shapes were not Voynix. They had the form of Caliban. Calabani, thought Demon. He'd encountered them in the Mediterranean basin with Savi and Harmon almost a year earlier, and he realized now the significance of the cross shapes in the wall of the dome. Recharging cradles, Savi had called the hollowed-out crosses, and Demon himself had stumbled across a single naked Calabani lolling in one such vertical cross, arms spread, and he'd thought it dead until the yellow cat's eyes had flickered open. Zavi had told them that Prospero and the unmet biosphere entity named Ariel had evolved a strain of humanity into the Calabani in order to stop the Voynix from invading the Mediterranean basin and other areas Prospero wanted to keep private. Demon thought now that this was either a lie or Savi's own mistake. The Calabani weren't evolved from any human strain, but rather cloned from the original and much more terrible Caliban, as Prospero had admitted up on his orbital isle. But at the time, Harmon had asked the old Jewish woman why the post-humans had created the Voynix in the first place if they, or Prospero, then had to create some other form of monster to contain them. Oh, they didn't create the Voynix, the old woman had said. The Voynix came from somewhere else, serving someone else with their own agenda. Demon did not understand then, and he understood less now. These Calabani he watched, scuttling like obscenely pink ants across the crater floor, carrying those milky eggs, were clearly not serving Prospero. They served Setapos. Then who brought the Voynix to Earth, he wondered. Why are the Voynix attacking artists and the other old-style human communities if they're not serving Setabas? Who do the Voynix serve? All Demon knew for sure right now was that the coming of Setabas to Paris Crater had been a disaster for the Voynix here. Those not frozen in the rapidly expanding blue ice had been caught and shelled like tasty crabs. Shelled by whom? Or by what? Two answers came to mind, and neither one was reassuring. The Voynix had been crunched open either by the teeth and claws of the Calabani, or by Setabas' own hands. Demon realized now that what he'd thought were gray-pink ridges running along the floor of the crater were actually more arm stalks emanating from Setabas. The fleshy stalks disappeared into openings in the dome wall, and... Demon whirled around raising his crossbow, finger on the trigger. There had been a sliding sound in the ice tunnel behind him. One of Sitabas's hands, three times my size, squeezing through the tunnel behind me. Demon crouched there, waiting, arms finally shaking from holding the weight of the raised crossbow. But no silent hand emerged. But the corridor of ice hissed and slithered to echoed noises. The hands are in the walls and probably outside in the crevasses by now, thought Demon, trying to slow his hammering heart. It's dark in the tunnels and outside. What do I do if I run into one or more of the hands in there? He'd seen the pulsing, feeding orifice in the palms of the hands below. 
A group of Calabani had been feeding them large chunks of raw red meat, either Voinix or human. Finally, he lay back on his belly on the blue ice balcony, feeling the cold of the ice, a substance he now believed to be living tissue extruded by Setabos himself, flow up through his therm skin. I can get out of here now. I've seen enough. Lying there on his belly, the silly crossbow ahead of him, keeping his head down as a group of Calabani scuttled across the crater floor on all fours, not a hundred yards below and in front of him. Demon waited for strength to return to his cowardly arms and legs, so he could get the hell out of this unholy cathedral. I need to report back to Ardis, came the reasonable voice in his mind. I've done all I can here. No, you haven't, answered the honest part of Demon's mind, the part that would get him killed some day. You have to see what those slick gray egg shapes are. The Calibani had stowed some of those gray pods in a steaming fumarole not a hundred yards from him, below and to the right of his low mezzanine. I can't possibly climb down there. It's too far. Liar. It's less than a hundred feet. You still have most of your rope and the spikes and the ice hammers. Then it would just be a fast sprint out to look at the pod shapes, grab one to bring back if you can, and then back to your balcony here and out. That's crazy. I'd be exposed the whole time I was on the crater floor. Those Calabani were between me and that nest. If I'd been out there when they appeared, they would have grabbed me, eaten me there, or taken me to Setabos. They're gone now. Now is your chance. Get down there now. No, said Demon, realizing that he'd whispered the terrified syllable aloud. But a minute later he was driving a spike into the blue ice floor of his balcony, tying the rope securely around it, setting the crossbow over his shoulder next to his pack, and beginning the laborious process of lowering himself to the crater floor. This is good. You're showing some courage for a change, and shut the fuck up, Demon ordered that brave, totally stupid part of his mind. His mind obeyed. Conceiveth all things will continue thus, and we shall have to live in fear of him, came the hymn-chant hiss of Caliban. Not from the Calabani, Demon was sure, but from Caliban himself. The original monster must be somewhere here in the dome, perhaps on the other side of Setabas and the crater nest. Thinketh this, but some strange day, Setabas, Lord, he who dances on dark nights, shall come to us like tongue to eye, like teeth to throat, or suppose grow into it as grub grow butterflies. Else here are we, and there is he, and nowhere help at all. The demon continued sliding down the slippery rope. 39. The first thing Dr. Thomas Hockenberry, Ph.D., had to do after quantum teleporting into Ilium was find an alley he could puke in. That wasn't hard. Even in his inebriated state, since the ex scolic had spent almost ten years in and around Troy, and he'd QT'd back to a minor street off the square near Hector and Paris's apartments, where he'd been a thousand times. Luckily, it was night in Ilium. The shops, market stalls, and little restaurants around the square were closed and shuttered. But no spearman or night guard noticed his silent arrival. Still, he needed an alley and found it fast, was sick until the dry heaves passed, and then he needed an even darker and less traveled alley. Luckily, the lanes were many and narrow near the dead Paris's palace, now Helen's home and the temporary palace of Priam, and Hockenberry quickly sought out the darkest and narrowest lane, barely four feet across, where he curled up on some straw, wrapped the blanket he'd brought from his cubby on the Queen Mab around him, and slept heavily. He awoke a little after dawn, aching, surly, profoundly hungover, and acutely aware of both the noise in the square near the palace and the fact that he'd brought the wrong clothes from the Queen Mab. He was dressed in a soft gray cotton jumpsuit and zero-G slippers, something the Moravex had thought suitable for a twenty-first-century man. 
The outfit didn't blend in too well with the robes, leather greaves, sandals, tunics, togas, capes, furs, bronze armor, and rough homespun seen in Ilium. When he did get to the public square, brushing off the worst of the alley filth, even while noticing the real difference between the 1.28 g acceleration load he'd been living under and the single gravity of Earth, he felt bouncy and strong now despite his hangover. Hockenberry was surprised to see how few people were in the square. Just after dawn was the busiest time in this market, but most of the stalls were attended only by their owners. Tables at the outdoor eating establishments were all but empty, and the only people at the far side of the square in front of Paris's, Helen's, and now Priam's palace were the few guards by the doors and gates. He decided that proper clothes should precede even breakfast, so he stepped into the shadows under the loggia and began bartering with a one-eyed, one-toothed ancient in a red rag turban. This old man had the largest cart with the widest variety of goods, mostly discards or rags stolen from fresh corpses, but he haggled like a dragon, loath to part with his gold. Hockenberry's pockets were empty, so all he had to bargain with were the ship clothes and the blanket he'd brought along, but these were exotic enough he had to tell the old man that he'd come all the way from Persia, that he ended up with a toga, Hiley's sandals, some unlucky commander's fine red wool cape, a regular tunic and skirt, and underlinens. Hockenberry chose the cleanest ones in the bin, and when he couldn't manage clean, he settled for louse free. He left the plaza with a broad leather belt that held a sword that had seen much action but was still sharp, and two knives, one that he'd carry tucked into the belt, and the other that slipped into a specially sewn fold inside the red cape. He also received a handful of coins. One glance back at the old man's gaping, one-toothed grin let Hockenberry know that the geezer had made out well, that the unusual jumpsuit would probably trade for a horse or gold shield or better. Ah, well. Hockenberry hadn't asked the old man or the few other drowsy merchants what was going on, why the mostly empty square, why the absence of soldiers and families, why the strange quiet over the city, but he knew he'd find out soon enough. When he'd been changing clothes behind the seller's cart, the old man and two of his neighbors had offered him gold for his QT medallion. The fat man behind the fruit cart, topping the bidding at two hundred weight of gold and five hundred silver Thracian coins. But Hockenberry had said no, glad that he'd taken possession of the sword and two daggers before stripping. Now, after spending some of his new coins for a stand-up breakfast of fresh bread, dried fish, some cheese, and a hot tea sort of substance infinitely less satisfying than coffee, he stepped back into the shadows and looked at Helen's palace across the way. He could QT into her private chambers. He'd certainly done it before. And if she's there, then what? A fast thrust with his sword and then QT away again? the perfect invisible assassin? But who was to say that the guards wouldn't see him? For the ten thousandth time in the last nine months, Hockenberry mourned the loss of his morphing bracelet, the gods' essential basic for all of their scolics, allowing them to shift quantum probability to the point that Hockenberry, Neitenhelzer, or any of the other ill-fated scolics could instantly displace any man or woman in or around Ilium not only taking their form and clothing, but truly replacing them on the quantum level of things. This had allowed even the massive Neitenhelzer to morph into a boy a third his weight, without defying the rule that one of the scientific-oriented scolics years ago had described to Hockenberry as the conservation of mass. Well, Hockenberry had no morphing capability now. The morphing bracelet had been left behind on Olympus along with his taser baton, shotgun microphone, and impact armor. But he still had the QT medallion. Now he touched that gold circle against his chest and hesitated. What would he do when he faced Helen of Troy? Hockenberry had no idea. He'd never killed anyone, much less the most beautiful woman he'd ever made love to, the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen, 
a rival to the immortal goddess Aphrodite, so he hesitated. There was a commotion toward the Sean Gate. He walked that way, nibbling on the last of his bread, a newly purchased goat skin of wine slung over his shoulder, thinking about the situation here in Ilium. I've been gone more than two weeks. On the night I left, on the night Helen tried to kill me, it appeared that the Achaeans were going to overrun the city. Certainly Troy and its few allied gods and goddesses, Apollo, Ares, Aphrodite, lesser deities, didn't seem capable of defending the city against the determined attack by Agamemnon's armies, supported by Athena, Hera, Poseidon, and the rest. Hockenberry had seen enough of this war to know that nothing was certain. Of course, that had been Homer's vision. The events here in this real past, on this real earth, in and around this real Troy, had usually paralleled, if not always, directly followed Homer's great tale. Now, with events diverging so dramatically in the past months, thanks he knew to the meddling of one Thomas Hockenberry, all bets were off. So he hurried to follow the tail end of crowds that obviously were headed straight toward the main city gates at first light. He found her on the wall above the Sean Gate, with the rest of the royal family and a bunch of dignitaries all crowded onto the wide reviewing platform where he'd watched her match faces to names during the gathering of the Achaean army for the Trojans ten years earlier. That day she'd whispered the names of the various Greek heroes to Priam, Hecuba, Paris, Hector, and the others. Today Hecuba and Paris were dead, along with so many thousand others, but Helen still stood at Priam's right, along with Andromache. The old king had been standing for the review of the armies ten years ago, but now he was half reclining in the throne cum litter in which he was carried these days. Priam looked a lot more than ten years older than the vital king Hockenberry had watched here a mere decade ago. The old man was a shrunken, wizened caricature of powerful Priam. But today the mummy seemed happy enough. Until this day I had pitied me, cried Priam, addressing the dignitaries around him and a few hundred royal guardsmen on the stairs and plain below them. There was no army in sight. Thicket Ridge and the approaches to Ilium were clear of soldiers, but by straining and following Helen's gaze, Ockenbury could see a huge mob almost two miles away, where the Greek black ships were drawn up. It looked as if the Trojan army had surrounded the Achaeans, overrun their moat and horse-staked trenches, and reduced the miles of Achaean camps to a rough semicircle hardly more than a few hundred yards across. If this was so, the Greeks had their backs to the sea and were surrounded by a powerful Trojan force just waiting to pounce. I pitied me, repeated Priam, his cracked voice growing stronger and asked too many of you to pity me as well. Since my queen's death by the hands of the gods, I have been but a harrowed, broken old man marked for doom. Worse than old, past the threshold of decrepitude, certain that Father Zeus had singled me out to be wasted by a terrible fate. In the last ten years I had seen too many of my sons laid low, and I was certain that Hector would join them in the halls of Hades even before his father's spirit traveled there. I was prepared to watch my daughters dragged away, my treasure vaults looted, the Palladion stolen from Athena's temple, and helpless babies hurled from our parapets to the red-blooded end of barbarous war. A month ago, friends and family, warriors and wives, I waited to watch my son's wives be hauled off by the Argives' bloody hands. Helen, struck down by murderous Menelaus, my daughter Cassandra raped, so that I would be willing, nay eager, to greet the Argive dogs before my doors, urge them to eat me raw, after the spear of Achilles or Agamemnon, or crafty Odysseus, or unforgiving Ajax, or terrible Menelaus, or powerful Diomedes, would bring me down, splitting me with a spear, wrenching and tearing my old life out of my old body, feeding my guts to my own dogs, yes, those faithful hounds who guarded my gates and chamber door, letting these suddenly rabid friends lap their master's blood and eat their master's heart in front of everyone. 
Yes, this was my lament ten months ago, two weeks ago. But look at the world born anew this morning, my beloved Trojans. Zeus took away all the gods, those who wished to save us, those who wished to destroy us. The father of the gods struck down his own Hera in a blast of his thunder. Mighty Zeus has burned the Argives' black ships and ordered all immortals to return to Olympus to face his punishment for disobedience. With the gods no longer filling the days and nights with fire and noise, my son Hector led our troops to victory after victory. Without Achilles to stop the noble Hector, the Achaean pigs have been driven back to the burned hulls of their black ships, their southern camps shredded, their northern camps put to the torch, and now they are bound in tight from the west by Hector and our Ilium-born, by Aeneas and his Dardanians, by Antenor's two surviving sons, Achimus and Archilochus. To the south they are shut off from retreat by the shining sons of Lycaon, and our faithful allies from Zelia, under the foot of Ida where Zeus oft makes his throne. To the north the Greeks are stymied by Adrestus and Amphius, trim in their linen corsets, leading the Apesians and the Edestrians, marvelous in their new acquired gold and bronze, wrenched from the dead Achaeans who fell in their panicked flight. Our beloved Hippothous and Pileus, who survived the ten years of carnage and were ready to die this month with us, with their Trojan friends and brothers. But instead, this day, who lead their dark-skinned Pelasgian warriors alongside the captains of Abydos and gleaming Arispe. Instead of ignoble death and defeat this day, our sons and allies are but hours away from seeing the head of our enemy Agamemnon lifted high on a spike while our Thracians and Trojans and Pelasgians and Sicanes and Peonians and Paphlagonians and Halazonians have lived to watch the end of this long war at last, and soon will be raking up the gold of defeated Argives, soon will be sweeping up the well-earned armor of Agamemnon and his men. This day, unable to flee to their black ships, all the Greek kings who came to kill and loot, will be killed and looted. This day, all the gods willing, and Zeus has already spoken it into being, let my friends and family and our foes witness our final victory. Let us see the end to this war. Let us prepare now, before this beginning day ends, to welcome home Hector and Deiphobus in a victory celebration that will last a week, no, a month a party of celebration and deliverance that will let your faithful servant Priam of Ilium die a happy man. So spake Priam, king of Ilium, father of Hector, and Hockenberry couldn't believe his ears. Helen slipped away from the side of Andromache and the other women, then descended the wide steps back down to the city with only Andromache's warrior slave woman, Hypsipyle, at her side. Hockenberry hid behind the broad back of an imperial spearman until Helen was out of sight on the steps, and then he followed. The two women turned down a narrow alley almost in the shadow of the west wall, then east up an even more narrow lane, and Hockenberry knew where they were going. Months ago, during his jealous phase after Helen had quit seeing him, he'd trailed Andromache and her here, discovering their secret. This was where Hector's wife Andromache kept her secret apartment, where Hypsipyle and another nurse watched over Andromache's son, Astyanax. Not even Hector knew that his son was alive, that the baby's murder by the hands of Aphrodite and Athena was a ruse by the few Trojan women to end the war between the Argives and Trojans, turning Hector's wrath toward the gods themselves. Well, Hockenberry thought now, staying back at the head of the smaller alley so the two women would not notice they were being followed. That ruse had worked wonderfully well, but now the war with the gods was over and it looked as if the Trojan War was in its final hour. Hockenberry didn't want them to reach the apartment itself. There had been male Sicilian guards there as well. 
Now he bent and lifted a heavy, smooth oval stone, just the size of his palm, and curled his fist around it. Am I really going to kill Helen? He had no answer to that. Not yet. Helen and Hypsipyle were pausing at the gate that led into the courtyard to the secret house, when Hockenberry moved up quietly behind them and tapped the big Lesbos slave woman on her brawny shoulder. Hypsipyle whirled. Hockenberry hit her in the jaw with a roundhouse uppercut. Even with the heavy rock in his fist, the big woman's bony jaw almost broke his fingers. But Hypsipyle went backward like a toppled statue, her head striking the courtyard door on the way down. She stayed down, clearly unconscious, her big jaw looking broken. Great, thought Hockenberry, after ten years in the Trojan War, you finally joined the fighting by sucker-punching a woman. Helen stepped back, the little hidden dagger that had once found Hockenberry's heart already sliding down from her sleeve into her right hand. Hockenberry moved fast, clutching Helen's wrist, forcing her hand and arm back against the rough-hewn door, and, his bleeding, bruised right hand barely working, pulling his own long knife from his belt and thrusting the point of it into the softness under her chin. She dropped her knife. Hockenberry, she said, her head back, but his knife drawing blood already. He hesitated. His right arm was shaking. If he was going to do this, he needed to do it quickly before the bitch began to speak. She had betrayed him, stabbed him in the heart, and left him for dead. But she had also been the most amazing lover he'd ever had. You are a god, whispered Helen. Her eyes were wide, but she showed no fear. Not a god, gritted Hockenberry, just a cat. You took one of my lives. I'd already been given one extra. I must have seven left. Despite the knife point cutting into her underjaw, Helen laughed. A cat having nine lives. I like that conceit. You always did have a way with words. For a foreigner. Kill her or not. But decide now. This is absurd, thought Hockenberry. He pulled the point of the blade away from her throat, but before Helen of Troy could move or speak, he grabbed a fistful of her black hair in his left hand, held the dagger to her ribs, and pulled her down the alley with him, away from Andromache's apartment. They'd come full circle, back to the abandoned tower overlooking the sea and gate wall where he'd discovered Menelaus and Helen hiding, where Helen had stabbed him after he'd QT'd her husband to Agamemnon's camp. Hockenberry shoved Helen up the narrow, winding staircase all the way to the top, to the mostly open level now atop the tower that had been shattered by the gods bombing months ago. He pushed her toward the open edge, but out of view of anyone on the wall below. Strip, he said. Helen brushed the hair out of her eyes. Are you going to rape me before you throw me over the edge, Hockenberry? Strip. He stood back with his knife ready as Helen slipped out of her few layers of silky garments. This morning was warmer than the day on which he'd left, the wintry day when she'd stabbed him but the breeze up this high was still cool enough to cause Helen's nipples to stand on end and to bring out goosebumps on her pale arms and belly. As she let each layer fall away, he told her to kick them over to him. Watching her carefully, he felt through the soft robes and silky undershift. No other hidden daggers. She stood there in the morning, light, legs slightly apart, not covering her breasts or pubic region with her hands, but just letting her arms hang naturally at her sides. Her head was high, and there was the slightest line of blood visible under her chin. Her gaze seemed to mix calm defiance with a mild curiosity about what was going to happen next. Even now, filled with fury as he was, he saw how she could have set these hundreds of thousands of men to killing one another and it was a revelation to him that he could be so angry, close to killing angry, and still feel sexual desire for a woman. After the seventeen days in the 1.28 Earth gravity acceleration field, he felt strong here on Earth, muscular, powerful. He knew that he could lift this beautiful woman in one arm and carry her wherever he wanted to, do whatever he wanted for as long as he wanted. 
Ockenberry threw her clothes back to her. Get dressed. She watched him warily as she picked up her soft garments. From the wall and sea and gate below came shouts, applause, and the banging of wooden spear shafts on bronze and leather shields as Priam ended his speech. Tell me what's happened in the seventeen days I've been gone, he said gruffly. That's all you've come back for, Hockenberry, to ask me about recent events? She was securing the low bodice across her white breasts. He gestured her to the fallen piece of stone, and when she'd taken a seat, he found another slab for himself, about six feet away. Even with a knife in his hand, Hockenberry did not want to get too close to her. Tell me about the last weeks since I left, he said again. Don't you want to know why I stabbed you? I know, Hockenberry said tiredly. You'd had me QT Menelaus out of the city, but you decided not to follow him. If I was dead and the Achaeans overran the city, which you were sure they were going to do, you could always tell Menelaus I refused to take you with me, or something like that. But he would have killed you anyway, Helen. Man, even Menelaus, who's not the sharpest sword in the armory, can rationalize being betrayed once. Not twice. Yes, he would have killed me. But I hurt you, Hockenberry, so that I would have no choice. So that I had to stay in Ilium. Why? This didn't make any sense to the former Skolik, and his head hurt. When Menelaus found me that day, I realized that I was happy to go with him happy almost to be killed by him if that had been his pleasure. My years here in Ilium as a harlot, as Paris's false wife, as the reason for all this death, had made me mean in every sense of the word, base, brittle, empty inside, common. There are many things, Helen of Troy, he was tempted to say, but common is not one of them. But with Paris dead, continued Helen, I had no husband, no master, for the first time since I was a young girl. My first reaction of being glad to see Menelaus here in Ilium that day, I soon recognized as a slave's happiness at seeing his chains and shackles again. By the time you joined us here in this very tower that night, all I wanted to do was stay in Ilium alone, not as Helen, wife of Menelaus. Not as Helen, wife of Paris, but just as Helen. That doesn't explain why you stabbed me, said Hockenberry. You could have just told me you were staying after I delivered Menelaus to his brother's camp. Or you could have asked me to transport you anywhere in the world. I would have obeyed. That is the real reason I tried to kill you, Helen said softly. Hockenberry could only frown at her. That day I decided to wed my fate not to any man's, but to the cities, to Ilium, she said. And I knew that as long as you were here and alive, I could make you use your magic to carry me anywhere, to safety, even as Agamemnon and Menelaus entered the city and put it to flames. Hockenberry thought about this for a long minute. It made no sense. He knew it never would. He set it aside. Tell me about the last couple of weeks and what has happened, he said for the third time. The days after I left you here for dead were dark ones for the city, said Helen. Agamemnon's attack almost overwhelmed us that very night. Hector had been sulking in his apartments since before the Amazons went out to their doom. After the hole had closed and it was certain that it wasn't opening again, Hector stayed in his apartment, his thoughts his own, closed even to Andromache. I know she considered telling him the secret that their son still lived, but held off, not knowing how to explain the deception in any way that would not cause her own life to be forfeit. And during the next day's battles, Agamemnon's armies and their supporting gods killed many Trojans. Only the city's protector, Phoebus Apollo, lord of the silver bow, firing his always unerring arrows into the Argive multitudes, kept us from being overrun and destroyed on those dark days before Hector rejoined the fray. As it was, Hockenberry, 
the Argives under Diomedes, did breach our walls at their lowest point, where the wild fig tree stands. Three times before in the ten years that did proceed our ill-fated war with the gods had the Argives tried that same spot, our weakness, perhaps revealed to them by some skilled prophet. But three times before Hector, Paris, and our champions had beat them back. Great and little Ajax in their attempts, then Atreus' sons, the third time Diomedes himself. But this time, four days after I tried to kill you and left your body here for the carrion birds, Diomedes led his warriors from Argus on the fourth assault on the point where the wild fig tree stands. Even while Agamemnon's ladders were rising to the western wall and battering rams the size of great trees were splintering the sea and gate in its huge hinges, Diomedes attacked the low point on our wall by stealth and strength, and by sunset that fourth day the Argives were inside the wall. Only the courage of Deiphobus, Hector's brother, Priam's other son, the man who has been chosen by the royal family to be my next husband, only Deiphobus saved the city through his courage. Seeing the threat when others were despairing about Agamemnon's ladders and rams, Deiphobus swept up survivors of his old battalion, and Hellenus and the captain named Asaisu, son of Herticus, and a few hundred of Aeneas' fleeing men, and with the combat veteran Asteropius at his side, Deiphobus formed a counterattack through the overrun city streets, turning the nearby marketplace into a second line. In terrible battle with the winning Diomedes, Deiphobus fought godlike, parrying even Athena's spear cast, for the gods were battling here with as much violence as the men. More! At dawn that day, the Argive line was stopped temporarily, our wall by the wild fig tree breached, a dozen city blocks burned and occupied by the raging Argives. Agamemnon's hordes still trying to scale our western and northern walls, the great Sian gate hanging by splinters and holding only by its iron bands. And that was the morning that Hector announced to Priam and the other despairing royals that he would re-enter the battle. And did he? asked Hockenberry. Helen laughed. Did he? Never has there been such a glorious Aristea, Hockenberry. On the first day of his wrath, Hector, protected by Apollo and Aphrodite from Athena's and Hera's bolts, met Diomedes in a fair fight and killed him, casting his finest spear all the way through the son of Tityus, and sending his Argus fighters fleeing. By sunset that day the city was whole again, and our masons were building up the wall by the old fig tree, making it as tall as the wall near the Sian Gate. Diomedes dead, said Hockenberry. He was shocked. Ten years watching the fighting here, and the Skolik had begun to think that Diomedes was as invulnerable as Achilles or one of the gods. In Homer's Iliad, Diomedes exploits his excursus, his glorious single combat or aristea, had filled Book Five and the beginning of Book Six, second only in length and ferocity in Homer's tale to that of Achilles' unleashed wrath in Books Twenty to Twenty-Two. A wrath that was never to be realized here now, thanks to Hockenberry's own tampering with events. Diomedes is dead, repeated Hockenberry, stunned. And Ajax as well, said Helen. For on the next day, Hector and Ajax met again. You remember that they had once fought in single combat, but parted friends. So valiant was each of their struggles. But this time Hector cut down the son of Telamon, using his sword to beat down the big man's huge rectangular shield, bending its metal back on itself, and when great Ajax cried out, Mercy, show mercy, son of Priam, Hector showed him none, but drove his sword through the hero's spine and heart, sending him down to Hades before the sun had risen a hand's breadth above the horizon that morning. Ajax's men, those famed fighters from Salamis, wept and rent their clothes in mourning that day, but they also fell back in confusion, crashing into Agamemnon and Menelaus' armies as they surged over Thicket Ridge. 
You know that ridge just beyond the city to the west that the gods call the Amazon Marina's mounded tomb? I know it, said Hockenberry. Well, this is where the dead Ajax's fleeing army crashed into the attacking men from Agamemnon and Menelaus' corps. It was confusion, pure confusion. And into the melee swept Hector, leading his Trojan and allied captains. Deiphobus now following his brother, Achimus and old Pyrrhus leading the Thracians close behind, Mestles and Antiphus' son driving the Meonians on with shouts. All the remaining and surviving Trojan heroes, fought beaten just two days before, were part of that charge. I stood on the wall just below here that morning, Hockenberry, and, and for three hours none of us, Trojan women, old Priam, no longer able to walk, but who had been carried there in his litter, we wives and daughters and mothers and sisters and the boys and old men, none of us could see a thing for three hours. So great was the dust cloud kicked up by the thousands of warriors and hundreds of chariots. Sometimes volleys of arrows from one side or the other would shield the sun. But when the dust settled and the gods retreated to Olympus after that morning's fighting, Menelaus had joined Diomedes and Ajax in the house of death, and— Menelaus is dead? Your husband is dead, said Hockenberry. Again he was deeply shocked. These men had fought and prevailed for ten years against each other, another ten months against the gods. Didn't I just say that he was? asked Helen, irritated at being interrupted. Hector didn't kill him. He was brought down by an arrow in the air. An arrow shot by dead Pandora's son, young Palmas, Lycaon's grandson, using the same God-blessed bow that Pandarus had used to wound Menelaus in the hip just a year ago. But this time there was no invisible Athena to flick aside the shaft, and Menelaus received the arrow through the eye circle in his helmet, and it passed through his brain and out the back of the bronze head sheath. Little Palmas, said Hockenberry, aware that he was repeating names like an idiot. He can't be more than twelve years old. Not yet eleven, said Helen with a smile. But the boy used a man's bow. His dead father's, Pandarus, brought low by Diomedes a year ago, and the arrow settled all my husband's debts and resolved all our marital doubts. And I have Menelaus' blood-splashed helmet in my rooms at the palace if you would like to see it. And the boy Palmas kept his shield. My God, said Hockenberry, Diomedes... Big Ajax and Menelaus dead in a single twenty-four-hour period? No wonder you've driven the Argives back to their ships. No, said Helen. The day might well still have gone to the Achaeans if Zeus had not appeared. Zeus! Zeus! said Helen. On the day that had begun with glorious victory, the gods and goddesses on the side of the Argives were so infuriated by the deaths of their champions that Hera and Athena alone murdered a thousand of our valiant Trojans with their fiery bolts. Poseidon, the old earth-shaker himself, bellowed so in anger that a score of strong buildings in Ilium crashed to the ground. Archers tumbled from our walls like falling leaves. Priam was thrown from his throne litter. All our gains that day were lost in minutes, Hector falling back, still fighting, his men falling around him, Deiphobus wounded in the leg, finally having to be carried by his brother, even while our Trojan men beat a retreat back to Thicket Ridge, then from Thicket Ridge to and through the sea and gates. We women actually rushed down to help set the great bar across the splintered gates, so wild was the fighting. Scores of raging Argives had come through into the city with our retreating heroes. And again Poseidon shook the earth, knocking everyone to their knees, even as Athena neutralized Apollo in their sky battles, their chariots whirling and flashing through the sky, while Hera herself cast explosive bolts of energy at our walls. Then Zeus appeared in the east, larger and more impressive than any living mortal has ever seen. More impressive than the day he appeared as a face in the atomic mushroom cloud? asked Hockenberry. Helen laughed. Much more impressive, my Hockenberry. This Zeus was a colossus. 
his legs rising higher than Mount Ida's snowy summit in the east, his huge chest above the clouds, his giant brow so high above us as to be almost invisible, taller than the tops of the tallest stratocumulus piled high one upon another on a summer day before a storm. Whoa, said Hockenberry, trying to imagine it. He'd once tussled with Zeus, well, not tussled exactly, more just a sort of general scuttling away from him during an earthquake on Olympus, culminating in sliding between the lord of all gods' legs to grab the dropped QT medallion so he could teleport away right at the beginning of the human god war. And the father of the gods had been wildly impressive when he was just his usual fifteen feet tall. He tried to imagine this ten-mile-high colossus. Go on, he said. So when this giant Zeus appeared, the armies stopped in their tracks, froze like statues, swords raised, spears poised back, shields high, even the chariots of the gods froze in the sky, Athena and Phoebus Apollo as motionless as all the thousands of mortals below, and Zeus thundered forth. I cannot imitate his voice, Hockenberry for it was all thunder and all earthquake and volcanoes erupting at once. But Zeus thundered, Uncontrollable Hera, you and your treachery yet again. I would be sleeping yet had not your crippled son and a mortal awakened me. How dare you betray me with your warm embrace, seduce me blind so that you can have your way, pursue your will of destroying Troy, in defiance of your lord's command. Your crippled son and a mortal, repeated Hockenberry. The crippled son would be Hephaestus, god of fire, the mortal. That's what he bellowed, said Helen, rubbing her pale neck as if her imitation of the base earthquake rumble had hurt her throat. And then, prompted Hockenberry. And then before Hera could speak in her own defense, before any of the gods could move, Zeus, the king of the black cloud, struck her down with a thunderbolt. It must have killed her, immortal as we all thought she was. The gods have a way of returning after they're killed, muttered Hockenberry, thinking of the huge healing tanks and their roiling blue worms up in the great white building on Olympus, tanks tended by the giant insectoid healer. Yes, we all know that, Helen said in a disgusted tone. Didn't our own Hector kill Ares half a dozen times in the past eight months, only to face him again a few days later? But this was different, Hockenberry. How so? Zeus's lightning bolt destroyed Hera, threw bits of her golden chariot for miles, raining melted gold and steel on the rooftops of Troy, and gibbets of the goddess herself fell in a swath from the ocean to dead Paris's palace. Scorched shards of pink flesh, which none of us were brave enough to touch, but which simmered and smoked for days. Jesus, whispered Hockenberry. And then the mighty Zeus struck down Poseidon, opening a great yawning pit under the fleeing sea god, and dropping him into it, screaming. The screams echoed for hours, until all mortals, Argives and Trojans alike, wept from the sound. Did Zeus... Say anything when he opened this pit? Yes, said Helen. He cried, I am Zeus who drives the storm clouds, son of Cronos, father of man and gods, master of probability space before you were changed from your puny post-human forms. I was the master and keeper of Setebos before you dared to dream of being immortals. You, Poseidon, Shaker of the earth, my betrayer, do you think I don't know that you plotted with my oxide queen for my overthrow? I banish you to Tartarus, deep beneath Hades itself. I send you plunging down to the pit of earth and sea, where Cronos and Iapetus make their beds of pain, where not a ray of the sun can warm their hearts, down to the depths of Tartarus, walled all around by the black-holed abyss itself. 
Hockenberry waited while Helen paused to clear her throat again. Do you have any water, Hockenberry? He handed her the wineskin he'd filled with water from the plaza fountain and waited in silence while she drank. And this is what Zeus spoke as he opened up a pit beneath Poseidon and sent the shaker of the earth screaming into Tartarus. Those soldiers on the wall who saw into the pit could not speak for days, only mumble or scream. Hockenberry waited. And then the father of the gods ordered all the other gods back to Olympus to face their punishment. You will pardon me, Hockenberry, if I do not try to imitate Zeus's bellow. And in an instant the flying chariots were gone, the lord of the silver bow was gone, Athena was gone, red-eyed Hades was gone, that bitch Aphrodite was gone, bloodthirsty Ares was gone. All our pantheon disappeared. Cuteeing back to Olympus like guilty children waiting for their displeased father to use the rod on them. Did Zeus disappear then too? asked Hockenberry. Oh no. The son of Cronos had just begun to play. His towering form strode over Ilium and walked across the miles between here and the shore like a Styanax playing in his sandbox, striding over his toy soldiers. Hundreds of Trojans and Argives died under the giant feet of Zeus that day, Hockenberry, and when he reached Agamemnon's camp, Zeus reached out his palm and burned all the hundreds of black ships pulled up on the sand there. And for those Argive ships still at anchor, or the convoy pulling in from Lemnos bringing wine sent across by Euneus, Jason's son, carrying gifts to Atreides, Agamemnon, and the dead Menelaus, Zeus closed his flaming hand into a fist, and a great wave rose up, dashing the Lemnos ships and the anchored Argive ships ashore, again like toys, like a Styanax splashing in his bath, sinking his slave-carved balsa-wood toy boats in petulance divine. Holy God, whispered Hockenberry. Yes, exactly, said Helen. And then Zeus disappeared in a crack of the loudest thunder yet, louder even than his voice that had deafened hundreds, and the wind howled into the place where giant Zeus had been, ripping up the Achaean tents and swirling them thousands of feet into the air, swirling strong Trojan stallions from their stalls and over our highest walls. Hockenberry looked to the west where the armies of Troy had surrounded the diminished army of the Argives. That was almost two weeks ago. Have the gods returned at all, any of them? Zeus? No, Hockenberry. We have seen no immortals since that day. But that was two weeks ago, said Hockenberry. Why has it taken so long for Hector to besiege the Argive army? Surely with the deaths of Diomedes, Big Ajax, and Menelaus, the Achaeans must have been demoralized. They were, agreed Helen. But both sides were in shock. Many of us could not hear for days. As I said, those on the wall or those Argives too close to the opening pit of Tartarus were little more than drooling idiots for a week. A truce was called without either side declaring it. We gathered our dead, for we had suffered terribly during Agamemnon's assaults, you remember. And for almost a week corpse fires burned both here in the city and along the miles of shore where the terrified Argives still had their camps. Then in the second week, when Agamemnon ordered men to the forests at the base of Mount Ida to begin felling trees, to make new ships, of course, Hector began the assault. The fighting has been slow and heavy work. With their backs to the sea and no ships for their flight, the Argives fight like cornered rats. But this morning, you see, the few thousands left are encircled there at the edge of the water, and today Hector will unleash our final assault. Today ends the Trojan War, with Ilium still standing, Hector the hero of all heroes, and Helen free. For a while the man and woman just sat on their respective great stones and stared out to the west, where sunlight glinted on armor and spears and where horns were sounding. Finally Helen said, what will you do with me now, Hockenberry? He blinked, looked at the knife still in his hand, and set it in his belt. 
You can go, he said. Helen looked at his face, but she did not move. Go, said Hockenberry. She left slowly. The sound of her slippers came up the circular staircase. It remembered the same soft sound from when he lay dying here two and a half weeks ago. Where do I go now? Trained as a skullic in his second life, he had the loyal urge to report these variances from the Iliad to the muse, and thence to all the gods. This thought made him smile. How many of the gods still existed in that other universe where Olympus Mons on Mars had been turned into Olympus? How extensive had Zeus's wrath really been? Had there been a genocidal deicide up there? He might never know. He didn't have the courage to quantum teleport to Olympus again. Hockenberry touched the QT medallion under his tunic. Back to the ship? He wanted to see the Earth, his Earth, even one three thousand years or so in his future. And he wanted to be with the Moravex and Odysseus when they saw it. He had no duty or role here in this Ilium universe now. He brought the QT medallion out and ran his hand over the heavy gold. Not back to the Queen Mab, not yet. He might not be a Skolik any longer. The gods may have abandoned him just as he had betrayed them. But he was still a scholar. Decades of teaching the Iliad, all those memories of wonderful dusty classrooms and very young college students, all those faces, pale, pimply, healthy, tanned, eager, indifferent, inspired, insipid, came flowing back now, filling in the gaps. How could he not see the last act in this new and absurdly revised version? Twisting the medallion, Dr. Thomas Hockenberry, Ph.D., quantum teleported to the center of the besieged and doomed Achaean encampment. Forty. Later, Demon wasn't sure when he decided to steal one of the eggs. It wasn't while he was sliding down the rope to the floor of the dome crater, since he was too busy hanging on and trying not to be seen to plan anything then. It wasn't while he was scurrying across the hot, cracked floor of the crater, since his heart was pounding too loudly during that sprint to allow him to think of anything except reaching the fumarole where he'd seen the eggs. Twice he saw groups of Calibanis scuttling along beyond the nearest smoking vents, and both times Demon threw himself down and lay still until they had hurried off on their business toward the main Setabas nest. The floor of the crater was hot enough that it would have burned his hands if he hadn't been wearing the therm skin under his regular clothes. As it was, a minute lying on his belly caused his shirt and trousers to singe. He sprinted forward and reached the side of the fumarole, crouching and panting in the heat. The walls of the fumarole were about twelve feet high, but rough, made of the same blue ice as everything else. Demon found enough fingerholds and footholds to climb it without using his ice hammers. The fumarole, a hissing crater within the larger crater, one of dozens inside the dome cathedral, was filled with human skulls. These were so heated that some glowed red even while sulfurous vapors hissed around them and rose into the stinking air. At least the steam and vapors gave Demon some cover as he dropped onto the mound of skulls and looked at the Setabos eggs. Oval, gray-white, each pulsing with some internal energy or life, the things were each about three feet long. Demon counted twenty-seven in this nest. Besides the cradling heap of hot skulls, the eggs themselves were surrounded by a ring of sticky blue-gray mucus. Demon crawled closer, fingers and feet scrabbling on skulls, and looked at the tall heap of eggs from as close as he could get without lifting his head above the level of the fumarole crater rim. The shells were thin, warm, almost translucent. Some already glowed brightly, others had only a white gleam at their center. Demon reached out and gingerly touched one. A mild heat, a strange sense of vertigo, as if some instability in the egg itself flowed through his therm-skinned finger. 
He tried to lift one and found it weighed about twenty pounds. Now what? Now he had to beat a retreat, get up the rope, out through the tunnels, back to the Avenue Dominique Crevasse, and back to the guarded Lion fax node. He had to report all this to everyone at Ardis as soon as possible. But why come all this way and risk exposure on the crater floor without taking a souvenir? By dumping everything out of his rucksack except the extra crossbow bolts, he made room for the egg. At first it wouldn't fit, but by pushing gently but insistently, he managed to get the broad end of the oval through the opening and wedge the bolts in around the side of the egg. What if it breaks? Well, he'd have a messy pack, he thought, but at least he'd know what was inside the damned things. I don't want to break one of the eggs here, so close to Setabas and the Calabani. We'll inspect it back at Ardis. Amen, thought Demon. He was finding it very hard to breathe. He'd had his osmosis mask on all this time, but the sulfurous vapors from the fumarole vent and the overwhelming heat made him dizzy. He knew that if he'd come into the dome without the thermskin and mask, he would have lost consciousness long ago. The air in here was poisonous. Then how did the Calabani breathe? The hell with the Calabani, thought Demon. He waited until the steam and vapors were thick as a smoke screen and slid down the side of the fumarole, dropping the last five feet. The egg shifted heavily in his rucksack, almost causing him to fall. Easy? Easy? Seth, what he hates be consecrate, all come to celebrate thee and thy state. Thinketh what I hate be consecrate to celebrate him and what he ate. Caliban's chant hymn was much louder down here. Somehow the acoustics of the giant dome cathedral amplified as well as directed the monster's voice. Either that, or Caliban was closer now. Running in a crouch, dropping to one knee at any hint of motion through the shifting vapors, Demon made it the hundred yards to his rope, still dangling from the blue ice balcony. He looked up at the rope, hanging free. What was I thinking? It must be eighty feet to the balcony. I can never climb that, especially not with this weight on my back. Demon looked around for another tunnel entrance. The nearest one was three or four hundred feet away around the curve of the dome wall to his right, but it was filled with the huge arm stalk of one of Setabas' crawling hands. That hand's up there in the ice tunnels waiting for me with the others. He could see other arm stalks disappearing into tunnel openings now, the slick, gray flesh of the tentacles almost obscene in their wet physicality. Some of them rose three or four hundred feet up the curving wall, hanging down like fleshy tubules, some visibly writhing in a sort of peristalsis as the hands pulled more arm stock in after them. How many hands and arms does this motherfucking brain have? Believeth that with the end of life the pain will stop. Not so. He both plagueth enemies and feasts on friends. He doth his worst in this our life, giving respite only lest we die through pain, saving last pain for worst. It was climb or die. Demon had lost almost fifty pounds in the last ten months, converting some weight to muscle, but he wished now that he'd been on no man's obstacle course in the forest beyond Ardis's north wall, every single day of the last ten months, lifting weights in his spare time. Fuck it, whispered Demon. He jumped, grabbed the rope, got his legs and shins around it, reached higher with his thermskinned left hand, and began dragging himself up, shinnying when he could, resting when he had to. It was slow. It was agonizingly slow, and the slowness was the least part of the agony. A third of the way up, and he knew he couldn't make it. Knew he probably did not have the strength even to hang on while sliding down. But if he jumped, the egg would break. Whatever was inside would get out, and Setabas and Caliban would know at once. 
Something about this image made Demon giggle until his eyes were filled with tears, fogging the clear lenses on the osmosis mask hood. He could hear his breath rasping in the osmosis mask. He could feel the thermskin suit tightening as it labored to cool him off. Come on, Demon, you're almost halfway. Another few feet and you can rest. He didn't rest after ten feet. He didn't rest after thirty feet. Demon knew that if he tried to just hang here, if he paused to wrap the rope around his hands to just cling, he'd never get moving again. Once the rope shifted on its belay pin, and Demon gasped, his heart leaping into his throat. He was more than halfway up the eighty-foot rope. A fall now would break a leg or arm and leave him crippled on the steaming, hissing crater floor. The pin held. He hung there a minute, knowing how visible he was to Calabani anywhere on this side of the crater. Perhaps dozens of the things were standing below him right now, waiting for him to fall into their scaly arms. He did not look down. Another few feet. Demon raised his aching, shaking arm, wrapped rope around his palm, and pulled himself up, his legs and ankles seeking traction. Again. Again. No pause allowed. Again. Finally, he couldn't climb any more. The last of his energy was done. He hung there, his entire body shaking, the weight of his crossbow and the giant egg in his pack, pulling him backward, off balance. He knew that he would fall any second. Blinking madly, Demon freed one hand to wipe the mist from his thermskin lenses. He was at the overhang of the balcony, a foot beneath its edge. One last impossible surge, and he was up and over, lying on his belly, pulling himself up to the belaying pin, and lying on it, lying on the rope, spread-eagled on the blue ice balcony. Don't throw up, don't throw up. Either the vomit would drown him in his own osmosis mask, or he'd have to tug the mask off, and the vapors would render him unconscious in seconds. He'd die here, and no one would even know that he'd been able to climb eighty feet of rope. No, more, perhaps ninety feet. He, pudgy demon, Marina's fat little boy, the kid who couldn't do a single chin-up on the bucky carbon struts. Some time later, Demon returned to full consciousness and willed himself to move again. He pulled off the crossbow, checked to make sure it was still cocked and loaded, safety off now. He checked the egg, pulsing more whitely and brightly than before, but still in one piece. He set the ice hammers on his belt and pulled up the hundred feet of rope. It was absurdly heavy. He got lost in the tunnels. It had been twilight when he'd come in, the last of daylight filtering through the blue ice. But it was deep night outside now, and the only illumination was from the yellow electrical discharges surging through the living tissue all around him. Demon was sure the blue ice was organic, somehow part of Setabaz. He had left yellow fabric markers at the intersections, nailed into the ice. But somehow he missed one of those and found himself crawling to new junctions, tunnels he'd never seen before. Rather than backtrack, the tunnel was too narrow to turn around in, and he dreaded trying to crawl backward in it. He chose the tunnel that seemed to head upward and crawled on. Twice the tunnels ended or pitched steeply downward, and he did have to backtrack to the junction. Finally, a tunnel both rose and widened, and it was with infinite relief that he got to his feet and began moving up the gently sloping ice ramp on his feet, crossbow in his hands. He stopped suddenly, trying to control his panting. There was a junction less than ten feet ahead, another one thirty feet behind, and from one or the other or both, came a scratching, scrabbling sound. Calabani, he thought, feeling the terror like the cold of outer space seeping through the therm skin, but then a colder thought came. One of the hands. It was a hand. Longer than demon, thicker through the middle, pulling itself along on fingernails emerging from the gray flesh like ten inches of sharpened steel. 
with black barbed fiber hairs at the ends of the fingers grabbing ice. The pulsating hand pulled itself into the junction less than ten feet in front of Demon and paused there, the palm rising, the orifice in the center of that palm visibly fluttering open and shut. It's searching for me, thought Demon, not daring to breathe. It senses heat. He did not stir, not even to raise the crossbow. Everything depended upon the slashed and worn old thermskin suit. If he was radiating heat from it, the hand would be on him in a millisecond. Demon lowered his face to the ice floor, not out of fear, but to mask any heat emissions that might be leaking from his osmosis mask. There was a wild scrabbling, and when Demon jerked his head up, he saw that the hand had taken a tunnel to his right. The fleshy, moving arm stalk filled the tunnel ahead, almost blocking the junction. I'll be goddamned if I'm going backwards, thought Demon. He crawled forward to the junction, moving as quietly as he could. The arm stalk was sliding through the junction. A hundred yards of it had already flowed past, but it seemed endless. He could no longer hear the scrabbling of the hand itself. It's probably circled around through the tunnels and is behind me. Listen, white blaze, a tree's head snaps, and there, 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 his thunder follows. Fool to give it him. Lo, lieth flat and loveth set a bus. Caliban's chant was muffled by distance and ice, but it flowed up the tunnel after him. Inches from the sliding arm stalk, Demon weighed the possibilities. The tunnel it slid through was about six feet across and six feet high. The arm stalk filled the width of the junction and tunnel, at least six feet, compressed by the blue ice, but it was broader than it was tall. There was at least three feet of air between the top of the endless sliding mass and the tunnel ceiling. On the other side, the tunnel demon had been following broadened and headed gradually toward the surface. Through the therm skin, he thought his skin could feel a movement of air from the outside. He might be only a few hundred feet from the surface here. How to get past the arm stalk? He thought of the ice hammers, useless, he couldn't hang from the ceiling and cross that six feet. He thought of going back, back into the labyrinth that he'd been crawling through for what seemed like hours, and he put that thought from his mind. Maybe the arm stalk will slide past. That thought showed him how tired and stupid he was. This thing ended in the brain mass that was set upon us, the better part of a mile away in the center of the crater. It's going to fill all these tunnels up with its arms and its scrabbling hands. It's searching for me. Part of Demon's mind noted that pure panic tasted like blood. Then he realized that he'd bitten through the lining of his cheek. His mouth filled with blood, but he couldn't take time to slide the osmosis mask off to spit, so he swallowed instead. To hell with it. Demon made sure the safety was on, and then he tossed the heavy crossbow across the sliding mass of arm stalk. It missed the oily gray flesh by inches and skittered on the ice of the tunnel opposite. The pack and egg were more difficult. It'll break. It will smash open, and the milky glow inside— It's brighter now. I'm sure it's brighter. will spill out, and it'll be one of these hands, small and pink rather than gray, and its orifice will open, and the little hand will scream and scream, and the huge gray hand will come scuttling back, or perhaps straight down the tunnel ahead, trapping me. God damn you, Demon said aloud, not worrying about the noise. He hated himself for the coward he was, for the coward he'd always been. Marina's pudgy little baby, capable of seducing the girls and catching butterflies and nothing else. Demon slipped the pack off, wrapped the top around the egg as best he could, and heaved it sideways over the sliding mass of oily arm. It landed on the pack side rather than the exposed eggshell and slid. The egg looked intact as best Demon could tell. My turn. Feeling light and free without the rucksack and heavy crossbow, 
He backed up 30 feet down the almost horizontal tunnel and then broke into a sprint before he could give himself time to think about it. He almost slipped, but then his boots found purchase and he was moving fast when he reached the arm. The top of his thermskin hood brushed the ceiling as he dove as high as he could, his arms straight ahead of him, his feet coming up, but not quite enough. He felt the toes of his boots grazing the thick, slithering arm. Don't come down on the pack and egg! And then he was landing on his hands, rolling forward, crashing down, the blue ice knocking the wind out of him, rolling over the crossbow, but not firing it by accident because the safety was on. Behind him, the endless arm stopped moving. Not waiting to get his breath back, Demon grabbed the rucksack and crossbow and began running up the gently rising ice slope toward fresh air and the darkness of the exit. He emerged into the fresh, cold night air, a block or two south of the Ile de la Cité crevasse he'd followed into the dome. There was no sight of any of the hands or calabani in the starlight and electric glow from the blue ice nerve flashes. Demon pulled off the osmosis mask and gasped in huge drafts of fresh air. He wasn't out yet. With the pack on his back and the crossbow in his hands again, he followed this crevasse until it ended somewhere near where the Ile Saint-Louis should be. There was an ice wall to his right, tunnel entrances to his left. I'm not going in a tunnel again. Laboriously, his arms shaking with fatigue even before he did anything, Demon took the ice hammers out of his belt, slammed one into the flickering blue ice wall, and began to climb. Two hours later he knew he was lost. He'd been navigating by the stars and rings and by glimpses of buildings rising from the ice or the shapes of masonry, half glimpsed in the shadows of crevasses. He thought he'd been paralleling the crevasse that ran along Avenue Dominil, but he knew now that he must be mistaken. Nothing lay before him but a wide, black crevasse dropping into absolute darkness. Demon lay on his stomach near the edge, feeling the egg shifting in his rucksack as if it were alive, wanting to hatch, and he had to concentrate on not weeping. There had been scrabblings in the tunnel openings and crevasses he'd passed. More hands searching, he was sure. He'd seen none up here in the starlight and ring light atop the ice mass, but the dome behind him was glowing more brightly than ever. Setabas is missing his egg. His, thought Demon, resisting the urge to laugh, since hysteria might be right behind the softest giggle. Something at the edge of the bottomless abyss ahead of him caught his eye. Demon pulled himself forward on his elbows. One of his nails with a tatter of yellow cloth attached. This was the ice chimney, only a hundred and fifty yards from the guarded lion node where he'd faxed into Paris Crater. Weeping openly now, Demon hammered in the last of his ice nails, bent it, secured the rope, not even bothering to knot it in the repelling knot he'd learned so he could slide it free when he reached the bottom. And heaving himself over the edge, he let himself down into the darkness. Leaving the rope behind, Demon staggered and crawled the last hundred yards or so. There was one last junction, marked by his yellow tatters of cloth. Then he had to crawl, and then he was out and sliding into the guarded lion fax pavilion, where he could stand up on a solid floor. The fax pad glowed softly on its pedestal in the center of the circular node. The naked shape hit him from the side, sending him sliding across the floor, his crossbow skittering on tile. The thing, Caliban or Calabani, he couldn't tell in the blue darkness, wrapped long fingers around Demon's throat, even as yellow teeth snapped at his face. Demon rolled again, tried to throw the clinging shape off, but the naked form hung on with his legs and spatulate, prehensile toes, even as it clung tight with its long arms and powerful hands. The egg, thought Demon, trying not to land on his back as the two surged back and forth, crashing into the fax pad pedestal. Then he was free for a second and leaping for the crossbow against the far wall. The amphibian man-shape snarled and grabbed him, throwing Demon up against the ice. The yellow eyes and yellow teeth glowed in the blue gloom. 
Demon had fought Caliban before, and this wasn't Caliban. This fiend was smaller, not quite as strong, not quite as fast, but terrible enough. The teeth snapped at Demon's eyes. The human got his left palm under the Calibani's chin and forced the jaw up, the scaly face with its flat nose arching up and back, the yellow eyes glaring. Demon felt strength flowing in with the rush of the last of his adrenaline, and he tried to snap the creature's neck by forcing its head back. The Calibani's head whipped like a snake, and it bit off two of the fingers on Demon's straining left hand. The man howled and fell away. The Calibani swung its arms wide, paused to swallow fingers, and leaped. Demon swept the crossbow up with his good right hand and fired both bolts. The Calibani was thrown backward, impaled on the ice wall with one of the long, iron, barbed bolts protruding through its upper shoulder into the ice, and the other through its palm, its hand raised next to its howling face. The naked creature writhed, pulled, snarled, and snapped one of the bolts free. Demon also howled. He leaped to his feet, pulled the knife from his belt, and rammed the long blade up through the Calibani's underjaw, up through its soft palate, and into its brain. Then he pressed against the length of the Calibani's long body like a lover, and twisted the blade around, twisted again, again, and then again, and kept twisting until the obscene writhing against him stopped. He fell back onto the tile, cradling his mangled hand. Incredibly, there was no bleeding. The thermskin glove had closed around the stumps of the two amputated fingers, but the pain made him want to vomit. He could do that, and he did, kneeling and throwing up until he could vomit no more. There was a scrabbling from one or more of the tunnels on the opposite wall. Demon stood, jerked the long knife from the Calabani's underjaw, the creature's body sagged but was held up by the bolt through its shoulder, and then he retrieved the other bolt, rocking it loose, picked up the crossbow, and crossed to the fax pad. Something surged out of the glowing tunnel entrance behind him. Demon faxed into daylight at the artist's hall node. He staggered away from the fax pad there, fumbled a bolt out of his pack, dropped it in the groove in his crossbow, and used his foot to cock the massive mechanism. He aimed the crossbow at the fax pad node and waited. Nothing came through. After a long minute, he lowered the weapon and staggered out into the sunlight. It looked to be early afternoon here at the artist node. There were no guards around. The palisade wall here had been pulled down in a dozen places. The carcasses of at least a score of dead Voiniks lay all around the fax pavilion, but other than streaks and smears and trails of human blood leading off to the meadow and into the forest, there was no sign of the humans who had been left behind to guard the pavilion. Demon's hand hurt so terribly that his entire body and skull became only an echo to that throbbing pain. But he cradled his hand to his chest, set another bolt in the crossbow, and staggered out to the road. It was a little less than a mile and a half to Artis Hall. Artis Hall was gone. Demon had approached cautiously, staying off the road and moving through the trees most of the way, wading the narrow river upstream from the bridge. He had approached the palisade and Artis from the northeast, through the woods, ready to call out quickly to the sentries rather than be shot as a Voynix. There were no sentries. For half an hour, Demon crouched at the edge of the woods and watched. Nothing moved except the crows and magpies feeding on the remnants of human bodies. Then he moved carefully around to the left, coming as close to the barracks and east entrance to the artist palisade as he could before coming out of the cover of the trees. The palisade had been breached in a hundred places. Much of the wall was down. Hannah's beautiful cupola and hearth had been burned and then knocked over. The line of barracks and tents where half of the four hundred people of Ardis had lived had all burned down. Ardis Hall itself, the grand hall that had weathered more than two thousand winters, had been reduced to a few carbon-smeared stone chimneys. Burned and tumbled rafters, 
and heaps of collapsed stone. The place stank of smoke and death. There were scores of dead Voynichs on what had been Ada's front yard. More piled where the porch had stood, but mixed in with the shattered carapaces were remains of hundreds of men and women. Demon couldn't identify any of the corpses he could see around the burned ruins of the house. There, a small charred corpse, seemingly too small to be an adult, burned black, the charred and flaking arms raised in a boxer's posture. Here, a ribcage and skull, picked almost clean by the birds. There, a woman lying seemingly unharmed in the sooty grass, but when Demon rushed to her and rolled her over, missing a face. Demon knelt in the cold, bloodied grass and tried to weep. The best he could do was wave his arms to chase away the heavy crows and hopping magpies that kept trying to return to the corpses. The sun was going down. The light was fading from the sky. Demon rose to look at the other bodies, flung here and there like bundles of abandoned laundry on the frozen earth, some lying under Voynich's carcasses, others lying alone, some fallen in clumps as if the people had huddled together at the end. He had to find Ada, identify and bury her and as many of the others as he could before trying to make his way back to the fax pavilion. Where can I go? Which community will take me in? Before he could answer that or reach the other bodies in the quickly falling twilight, he saw the movement at the edge of the forest. At first, Demon thought that the survivors of the artist massacre were coming out of the trees. But even as he raised his good hand to hail them, he saw the glint on gray carapaces and knew that he was wrong. Thirty, sixty, a hundred Voynichs moved out of the forest and across the grass toward him from the road and forest to the east. Sighing, too tired to run, Demon staggered a few yards toward the woods to the southwest, and then saw the movement there, Voynichs scuttling out of the darkness there, more Voynichs dropping from the trees and moving out into the open on all fours. They'd be on him in a few seconds. He knew that it was no use running around the smoldering ruins of the Great Hall toward the north, there would just be more Voynichs there. Demon went to one knee, noticed that the egg in his rucksack was glowing brightly enough now to throw his shadow across the frozen grass, and then pulled the last of the crossbow quarrels out. Six. He had six bolts left, plus the two already loaded. Smiling grimly, feeling something like a terrible elation rise in him, he stood and leveled the weapon at the closest cluster of advancing shapes. They were sixty feet away. He'd let them get closer, knowing that they could close the gap in seconds running at full Voynich's speed. His mangled hand was good enough to level the crossbow with his thumb and remaining two fingers. Something cracked and slapped behind him. Demon whirled, ready to meet the attack, but it was the Sony flying in low from the west, Two people were firing flechette rifles from the rear niches. Voynichs leaped at it, but were slapped away by clouds of flickering flechettes. Jump! yelled Grayogi as the Sony flew in at head height and then hovered next to Demon. The Voynichs rushed in from every side, bouncing and leaping like giant silver grasshoppers. A man, Demon vaguely recognized as Bowman, and a woman with dark hair, not Ada, but the woman named Adide, who had gone with Demon on the fax warning expedition, were firing their flechette rifles in opposite directions on full automatic, pouring out a cloud of crystal darts. Jump, Grayogi yelled again. Demon shook his head, retrieved the rucksack with the egg, tossed it up into the Sony, tossed in his crossbow, and only then jumped. The Sony began to climb, even as he leaped. He didn't quite make it. His good hand found a grip on the inner edge of the Sony, but his mangled left hand banged against metal. The pain blinded him. He released his grip and began to slide away toward the mass of silent Voynichs below. Bowman grabbed him by the arm and pulled him aboard. Demon couldn't speak for most of the fast flight northeast, hurtling several miles above the dark forest, finally circling toward a bare spur of rock 
rising two hundred feet above the skeletal trees. Demon had seen this granite knob years earlier when he'd first visited Ada and her mother here at Ardis Hall. He'd been hunting for butterflies then, and at the end of a long afternoon of meandering, Ada had pointed out the rocky point rising almost vertically from a brambled meadow beyond the forest. Starved rock, she'd said, her teenager's voice sounding almost proud and possessive. Why do they call it that, he'd asked. Young Ada had shrugged. Do you want to climb it? he'd said, thinking that if he got her up there he might be able to seduce her on a grassy summit. Ada had laughed. No one can climb starved rock. Now, in the last of the twilight and the first of the bright ring light, Demon saw what they had done. The summit was not grassy after all. Bare rock stretched a flat hundred feet or so, broken by the occasional boulder, and crowded onto that summit were crude tarps and a half-dozen campfires. Dark figures huddled by those fires, and more figures were posted at all the edges of the granite monolith. Sentries, no doubt. The field below Starved Rock seemed to be moving in the shadows. It was moving. Voynich shuffled and stirred there, stepping over hundreds of shattered carcasses of their own kind. How many people made it from Ardis? asked Demon, as Grey Ogie circled to land. About fifty, said the pilot. His face was soot-streaked and looked infinitely weary in the glow from the virtual controls. Fifty out of more than four hundred, thought Demon numbly. He realized that his body was in shock from losing fingers, and his mind was going into something like shock after seeing what he'd seen back at Ardis. The numbness and disinterest were not unpleasant. Ada, he said hesitantly. She's alive, said Greogi, but she's been unconscious for almost twenty-four hours. The great hall was burning, and she wouldn't leave until everyone else who could be carried off had been. And even then, I don't think she would have left if that section of the burning roof hadn't collapsed and a rafter hadn't knocked her out. We don't know if her baby is still... viable or not. Peter, said Demon. Raymond? He was trying to think of who would lead them with Harmon gone, Ada injured, and so many lost. Dead. Ryogi hovered the Sony and lowered it toward the dark mass of the granite summit. It bumped to a stop. Dark forms from one of the campfires rose and walked toward them. Why are you still here? Demon asked Grayogi, holding him by his shirt front as the others stepped off the grounded Sony. Why are you still here with the Voynix down there? Grayogi easily pulled Demon's hand free. We tried the fax node, but the Voynix were on us before we could get people inside. We lost four people there before we could get away, and we don't have anywhere else to fly. With Ada injured so severely and a dozen others badly hurt, we could never get them all off Starved Rock in time before those fucking animals come up the cliff. We need everyone here just to hold off the Voynix. If we start flying out a few at a time, those staying behind will be overrun. We probably don't have enough flechette ammunition to hold out another night as it is. Demon looked around. The campfires were low, pitiful things, mere burning moss or lichen and a few twigs, nothing more. The brightest thing on the dark rock was the Setabas egg still glowing milkily in his rucksack. Has it come to this? Demon asked, speaking to himself. I guess it has, said Grayogi, sliding off the Sony and staggering slightly. The man was obviously in some state beyond exhaustion. It's full dark now. The Voynix will be coming up the sides any minute. Part 3 41 Harmon fell through darkness with Ariel for what seemed an impossible length of time. When they landed, it wasn't with a fatal crash at the base of the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu but with a soft thump on a jungle floor covered with centuries build-up of leaves and other humus. For a stunned second, Harmon couldn't believe that he wasn't dead. But then he stumbled to his feet, shoved the small aerial figure away, though Ariel had already danced out of range, and then stood blinking in the darkness. Darkness. It had been daytime at the Golden Gate. He was somewhere else. 
Wherever the somewhere else might be, besides on the dark side of the planet, Harmon knew that it was in deep jungle. The night smelled of richness and rot. The thick, humid air clung to his skin like a soaked blanket. Harmon's shirt immediately soaked through and lay limp against him. And all around in the seemingly impenetrable night came the buzz of insects and the rustle of fronds, palms, undergrowth. Insects, small creatures and large. Letting his eyes adapt, his hands raised into fists, hoping that Ariel would come back into striking range, Harmon craned his head back and saw the hint of starlight between tiny gaps in foliage far, far above. In another minute he could see the pale, almost spectral, genderless figure of Ariel glowing slightly ten feet or so from him across the jungle floor. Take me back, growled Harmon. Take thee back where? To the bridge, or to Ardis, but do it now. I cannot. The genderless voice was maddening, insulting. You will, growled Harmon. You will right now. However you got me here, undo it. Take me back, now. Or what consequence ensues? asked the glowing figure in the jungle dark. Ariel's voice sounded mildly amused. Or I'll kill you, Harmon said flatly. He realized that he meant it. He would strangle this green-white flop of a thing, choke the life out of it, and spit on the corpse. And then you'll be left lost in an unknown jungle, warned the last sensible part of Harmon's mind. He ignored it. Oh, my, said Ariel, feigning terror. I shall be pinched to death. Harmon leaped, arms extended. The little figure, not much more than four feet tall, caught him in mid-leap and threw him thirty feet through ripping fronds and tearing vines into the jungle. It took Harmon a minute or two to get his breath back and another minute to get to his knees. He realized at once that if Ariel had done that to him elsewhere, say on the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, where they'd been a minute before, it would have broken his back. Now he stood again on deep humus, willed his vision to see through the encroaching darkness, and shoved and tore his way back through vines and thick vegetation to the small clearing where Ariel waited. The sprite was no longer alone. Oh, look, Ariel said in happy conversational tones, here is more of us. Harmon paused. He could see better now by the starlight filtering down into this little clearing in the jungle, and what he saw made him stare. There were at least fifty or sixty other shapes in the clearing and under the trees and amidst the ferns and vines beyond. They were not human but neither were they Voynix or Calabani or any other bipedal form that Harmon had seen in his ninety-nine years and nine months of life. These humanoid shapes were like rough sketches of people, short, not much taller than little Ariel, and like Ariel with transparent skin and organs floating in greenish liquid. But where Ariel had lips, cheeks, a nose, and the eyes of a young man or woman, with physical features and muscles one associated with the human body. These short green forms had neither mouths nor human eyes. They looked back at Harmon in the starlight from black dots in their faces that could have been lumps of coal. And from their boneless-looking frames to their three-fingered hands, the forms seemed to lack all identity. "'I don't believe you've met my fellow ministers,' Ariel said softly." gesturing with a feminine turn of hand toward the mob of shapes in the shadows. Instruments to this lower world, they were belched up before your kind was born. They have different names. His prosperousness doth feign to call them this and that, as takes his pleasure. But they are more like me than not, descended from chlorophyll and the motes set there in the forest to measure it in time before post-humans. They are the Zex. Helpers and workers and prisoners all, and who of us is not all these things? Harmon stared at the greenish shapes. They stared unblinking back. Seize him, lisped Ariel. Four of the Zex came forward. They moved with a smooth grace that Harmon wouldn't have expected from such gingerbread shapes. And before he could run or fight, two of them seized him with three-fingered grips of iron. The third Zack leaned in close, unbreathing, until its featureless chest touched the tunic above Harmon's chest, and the fourth 
seized Harmon's hand, just as Ariel had seized Hannah's only a short while before, and thrust it through the yielding green skin membrane of the third Zex chest. Harmon felt the soft, hard organ in his hand, almost coming to him like a pet, and then the unspoken words echoed in his brain. Do not irritate Ariel. He will kill you on a whim. Come with us and make no effort to resist. It is to your benefit and to your ladies, Ada's, to come with us now. How do you know about Ada? Harmon shouted aloud. Come. That was the last word transmitted through Harmon's pulsing hand into his aching skull before his hand was wrenched free, the Zek's soft heart still in it, shriveling, dying, and then the Zek itself pitched over backward, falling silently to the jungle floor, there to shrivel and desiccate and die. Ariel and the other Zeks ignored the corpse of the communicator as Ariel turned and led the way down the slightest of trails along the dark jungle floor. The Zeks on either side of Harmon still clung to his arm, but lightly now, and Harmon made no effort to resist, only to keep up as the line of forms moved through the dark wood. Harmon's mind was racing faster than his feet as he stumbled to keep up through the dark jungle. At times, when the foliage overhead was too thick, he couldn't see anything, not even his legs or feet beneath him in the near absolute darkness. So he let the Zex guide him as if he were blind and concentrated on thinking. He knew that if he was ever going to see Ada and Artis Hall again, he'd have to be a lot smarter in the coming hours than he'd been in the last many months. First question, where was he? It had been a stormy morning when he'd been at the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, but it felt very late here in this jungle. He tried to remember his self-taught geography, but the maps and spheres blurred in his mind now. Words like Asia and Europe meaning almost nothing. But the darkness here suggested that Ariel hadn't just whisked him to some jungle on the same southern continent that held the bridge. He couldn't walk back to Machu Picchu and Hannah and Pater and the Sony. Which led to the second question. How had Ariel brought him here? There had been no visible fax node pavilion in the Golden Gate Green Globules. If there had been, if Savi had ever suggested a fax connection to the bridge, he certainly wouldn't have flown the Sony there to get the weapons and ammunition and try to get Odysseus to the healing crash. No, Ariel had used some other means to transport him through space to this dark, rot-smelling, muggy, insect-filled place. Since he was being dragged through the darkness not ten paces behind the biosphere avatar, or so Prospero had once identified Ariel, Harmon realized he could just ask these questions. The worst the pale sprite, his her body visibly glowing in starlight as they crossed the occasional small opening in the jungle, could do was not answer. Ariel answered both questions, the second one first. I shall have thy company for only a few hours more, said the small form. Then I must deliver thee to my master, not long after we hear the strain of the strutting Chanticleer. If strutting Chanticleer there were in this wretched place. Your master Prospero? asked Harmon. Ariel did not answer. So what is the name of this wretched place? Harmon asked. The sprite laughed a sound like the tinkling of small bells, but not altogether a pleasant noise. They should call this wood Ariel's nursery, for here ten times two hundred years ago I came to be, rising into consciousness from a billion little censor transponders, the old, old-style humans, your very ilk guest, called moats. Trees were talking to their human masters and to each other, chatting in the mossy old net that had become the nascent noosphere, gabbling on about temperatures and birds' nests and hatchlings and pounds per square inch of osmotic pressure, and trying to quantify photosynthesis the way a roomy clerk counts his beads and bangles and thinks them treasure. The Zacks, my beloved instruments of action, too many stolen from me for wasteful duty on the red world, by that monster Magus master, rose likewise, yea, but not here, honored guest, not here, no. 
Harmon understood almost none of that, but Ariel was talking, babbling, and he knew that if he could keep the creature engaged in conversation, he'd learn something important sooner or later. Prospero, your master, called you the avatar of the biosphere when I spoke to him, your master, nine months ago on his orbital isle, said Harmon. I, said Ariel, laughing again, and I call Prospero, whom you call my master, Tom Shit. Ariel looked back at him, the small greenish-white face glowing like some phosphorescent tropical plant as they plunged into a section of trail in total darkness under the encroaching leaves. Harmon, husband of Ada, friend of no man, thou art, to mine eyes, a man of sin. A man whose destiny has import in this lower world, at least less for what is int than for its pallid shape. Thou, amongst all men, being most unfit to live, much less to live your full five-twenty, so like one of Brother Caliban's long-baked meals, since time and tides of time hath made you mad. And even with such valor, you know, men hang and drown their proper selves. Harmon understood none of this, and despite his asking many more questions, Ariel did not reply or speak again until dawn some three hours and many miles later. An hour after Harmon was sure that he had no energy left, they allowed him to stop and lean against a huge boulder to catch his breath. As the light came up, he realized that it was no boulder. The boulder was actually a wall. The wall was part of a large building with levels set back as it rose, and the building was something that he guessed from his signaling was called a temple. Then Harmon realized what his hands were touching and what his eyes were seeing. Every inch of the large temple was carved. Some of the carvings were large, as wide as the length of Harmon's arm, but most were small enough that he could cover them with the palm of his hand. In the carvings, each one becoming more clear as the tropical sunrise bled light through the jungle overhead, men and women were making love, having sex, as were a man and more than one woman, men and men, women and women, Women and men and what looked to be horses. Men and elephants, women and bulls, women and women and monkeys, and men and men and men. Harmon could only stare. He'd never seen anything like this in his ninety-nine years. On one level of carvings just at eye height, he could see a man with his head between a woman's legs, while another man, straddling the first, offered his erect penis to the straining woman's open mouth, while behind her, a second woman wearing some sort of artificial penis was entering the first woman from behind, while the first woman servicing the two men and the woman behind her was reaching her arm out to an animal Harmon recognized from the Turin drama as a horse, masturbating the excited stallion. Her other free hand was massaging the genitals of a human male figure standing next to the horse. Harmon stepped away from the temple wall, looking up at the vine-encrusted stone structure. There were thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of variations on this theme, showing Harmon aspects of sex he'd never imagined, could never have imagined. Just some of the elephant images alone. The human figures were stylized, faces and breasts oval, eyes almond-shaped, the women's and men's mouths curling in pleased and decadent smiles. What is this place, he asked. Ariel sang in a falsetto, Above, half seen in the lofty gloom, strange works of a long-dead people loom. What did they mean to those who now are dust, these rioting figures of love and lust? Harmon tried again. What is this place? For once, Ariel answered simply, Conjurajo. The word meant nothing to Harmon. The biosphere sprite gestured. Two of the little, green, largely transparent zecks touched Harmon's arm, and the procession moved away from the temple, following a barely discernible path through the jungle. Looking back, Harmon caught a final glimpse of the stone building. Buildings, he realized now. There was more than one temple there, all of them carved with erotic friezes. And he noticed again how the jungle had all but reclaimed the structures. The coupling figures were bound about by vines, 
partially obscured by grass and tightly constricted by roots and green feelers. Then the place called Kajuraho disappeared in the green growth, and Harmon concentrated on plodding along behind Ariel. As the sunlight illuminated the wild density of the jungle around them, ten thousand shades of green, most of which Harmon had never imagined, all he could think of was how to get back to Ardis and Ada, or at least back to the bridge before Pater flew off in the Sony. He didn't want to wait three days for Pater's return to pick up Hannah and the restored, if that crash could restore life and health, no man Odysseus. Ariel, he said suddenly to the small form that seemed to be floating at the front of the line of Zex ahead of him. Aye, sir, the androgynous quality of the otherwise pleasant voice disturbed Harmon. How did you transport me from the Golden Gate to this jungle? Did I not do my spriting gently enough, O oh man? Yes, said Harmon, fearing that the pale figure was going to launch into more nonsense babble. But how? How dost thou travel from place to place when you are not lying a belly in your sony saucer? We fax, said Harmon. But there was no fax pavilion at the Golden Gate, no fax node. Ariel floated higher, brushing branches and sending a shower of droplets down onto the Zex and Harmon. Did your friend Demon go to a fax pavilion when the Allosaurus ate him ten months ago? Harmon stopped in his tracks. The Zex, still holding his arms, stopped with him, not yet pulling him on. Of course, thought Harmon. It had been in front of him all his life. He'd seen it all his life, but he'd been blind. When someone faxed up to the rings on any of his or her normal four-twenties of life, you went to the nearest fax pavilion. When someone wanted to fax anywhere, you went to the nearest fax node pavilion. But when someone was injured or killed, devoured as demon had been, torn apart in some freak accident, the rings faxed you up. Harmon had been there on Prospero's Isle in the firmary tanks where naked bodies arrived, were fixed by the bubbling nutrient and blue worms and were faxed back. Harmon and Demon had done the faxing themselves on Prospero's instructions, destroying the servitors and setting the virtual dials and levers to fax as many of the bodies under repair home as they could. Humans could be faxed without going to a fax pavilion, without starting from one of the three hundred some known fax nodes. Harmon had seen this his entire life, almost one hundred years, but had never seen what he could see. The thought was too entrenched that the post-humans were calling you home when you were injured or killed before your fifth twenty. Fax nodes were science. Going to the firmary for emergency repair was something like religion. But the firmary on Prospero's Isle had machinery that could fax anyone from anywhere without relying on nodes and pavilions. And Harmon and Demon had destroyed the firmary in Prospero's Isle. The Zex tugged at Harmon's arms to get him moving again, but gently. Harmon did not move quite yet. The intensity of his thoughts made him dizzy. If the Zex had not been clutching him, he might have fallen to the jungle floor. Prospero's Isle was destroyed. He and all the old-style humans had watched the pieces burn through the night sky for months. But Ariel could still fax, a sort of free fax, independent from nodes, portals, and pavilions. Something up on the rings or on earth itself found the sprite, coded him, and faxed him, and today Harmon with him from the bridge to here, wherever here and Kajuraho were on the opposite side of the earth, if nothing else. Harmon might yet be able to fax home to Ada if he could only get Ariel to reveal the secret of this free faxing. The Zex pulled again gently but insistently. Ariel was far ahead, floating toward a patch of bright sunlight in the jungle. Harmon did not want to get the Zex in trouble, nor did he want to lose sight of Ariel. The sprite was his fax stick at home. Harmon rushed, stumbling to catch up with the avatar of Earth's biosphere. When they first emerged into the clearing, the sun was so bright that Harmon squinted and covered his eyes, 
not seeing the structure looming above him for several seconds. When he did see it, he froze in his tracks. The thing, structure, it wasn't quite a building, was gigantic, rising up for what Harmon estimated, and his estimates on the size of things had always been uncannily good, for at least a thousand feet, perhaps a little more. It had no skin, that is, the entire structure was a lacy, open latticework skeleton of dark metal girders rising inward from a huge square base that connected via semicircular metal arches at treetop level, then continuing to curve inward until it became a pure spire, its dark knob of a summit far, far above. A phrase that the metalworking Hannah had once described came to his mind, wrought iron. Harmon felt sure that the trusses, arches, girders, and open latticework he was staring at here in the hot jungle sun were all made of some sort of iron. What is it? he breathed. The Zex had released him and stepped back into the shade of the jungle, as if afraid to go closer to the base of the incredible tower. Harmon realized that nothing grew on the acre or more at the base of the tower, except for low, perfectly manicured grass. It was as if the strength of the structure itself was keeping the jungle at bay. It's seven thousand tons, said Ariel in a voice much more masculine than any the biosphere sprite had used before. Two and a half million rivets, four thousand three hundred and eleven years old, or at least the original of this was. There are more than fourteen thousand of these in Kanho Tep's Eiffelbahn. Eiffelbahn, repeated Harmon. I don't come, snapped Ariel. His voice was powerfully masculine now, deep, threatening not to be disobeyed. There was a sort of wrought iron cage at the base of one of the arched legs. Get in, said Ariel. I need to know. Get in, and you'll learn everything you need to know, said the biosphere avatar, including how to get back to your precious Ada. Stay here and you die. Harmon stepped into the cage. An iron grating slid shut. Gears clanked, metal screeched and the cage began rising on the curve following a series of cables and iron tracks. "'Aren't you coming?' Harmon called down to Ariel. The sprite did not answer. Harmon's elevator continued rising into the tower. 42. The tower seemed to have three major landings. The first and broadest was just above the level of the jungle treetops. Harmon looked across at a solid carpet of green. The elevator did not stop. And the second landing was high enough that the elevator was traveling almost vertically, and Harmon had moved to the center of the small cage. Looking up and out, he could see that a series of cables ran from the top of this tower and disappeared far to the east and west, sagging a bit in the distance. The elevator did not stop at the second landing. The third and final landing was a thousand feet above the ground, just below the domed top of the tower with its spike of antennae. Here, the elevator slowed and stopped. Ancient gears ground and slipped. The elevator cage slipped back six feet, and Harmon grabbed the wrought iron bars of the cage and prepared to die. A break stopped the cage. The wrought iron door slid back. Harmon shakily crossed five or six feet of iron bridge with rotted wood planks. Ahead of him, a much more elaborate door, polished sections of mahogany set into a filigree of wrought iron, clanked, stirred, and then hissed open. Harmon paused only a second before entering the darker interior. Any place was preferable to that exposed little bridge a thousand feet above the latticework of girders disappearing in a vertigo of iron below. He was in a room. When the door hissed and clanked shut behind him, Harmon realized that it was twenty or thirty degrees cooler here in the large room than outside in the sun. He stayed where he was for a few seconds, allowing his eyes to adapt to the relative dimness. He was standing on a small, carpeted and book-lined entry mezzanine as part of a larger room. From the mezzanine, a wrought-iron staircase spiraled down to the main floor of the room and up through the ceiling to what presumably was a second story. Harmon descended. 
He'd never seen furnishings like this, oddly styled furniture tufted with red velour fabric, thick drapes over a wall of windows on the south side of the room, the drapes dragging their gold tassels onto the elaborately designed red and brown carpet. There was a fireplace in the north wall. Harmon stared at the design of black iron and green ceramics. A long table with elaborately carved legs ran for at least eight feet of the fifteen feet of window wall, where the panes near the corners of the window were as complicated as the silk of a spider's web. Other furniture consisted of overstuffed single chairs with overstuffed ottomans, carved chairs of gleaming dark wood with gold metal inlays, and everywhere examples of what Hannah had once told him was polished brass. There was a strange fire hose of a speaking tube with a bell-shaped polished brass snout. There were levers of polished brass set into cherry-colored wooden boxes on the walls. On the long plank table rose several brass instruments, some with brass keys to punch and slowly turning gears. Farther down the table an astrolabe with circles of brass turning within larger circles of brass. A polished brass lamp glowing softly with light. There were maps laid out on the table with small hemispheres of brass holding them down. More maps curled into a brass basket on the floor. Harmon ran forward and stared hungrily at the maps, pulling more out and unfurling them, laying brass hemispheres on them. He'd never seen maps like these before. Everything was on a grid, but within those grid boxes were ten thousand Wrigley parallel lines, some close together where the map ran brown or green, some lines far apart where the map showed expanses of white. There were irregular blobs of blue that Harmon guessed were lakes or seas, and longer, wigglier blue lines that he guessed were rivers with unlikely names penned next to them. Tunga Bhadra, Krishna, Godavari, Normada, Mahanadi, and Ganga. On the east and west wall of the room surrounding smaller but still multi-paned windows were more bookshelves, more books, more brass trinkets, jade statues, brass machines. Harmon ran to the shelf and pulled down three books, smelling the scent of centuries rising from the ancient but still firm paper and the thick leather covers. The titles made his heart pound. The Third Dynasty of Khanhotep, A.D., 2601 to 2939, and Ramayana and Mahabharata scripture revised according to Ganesh the Cyborg, and Eiffelbahn maintenance and AI interface. Harmon laid his right palm on the top book, closed his eyes to bring up the sigil function, and then hesitated. If he had time, he would prefer to read these books sounding out each word and guessing at the definitions of the words from context. It was slow, laborious, painful, but he always gained more from reading than from sigling. He laid the three books reverently on the polished, dust-free tabletop and bounded up the circular stairs to the high second floor. This was a bedroom, the head of the bed made of cylinders of polished brass, the bedspread a rich red velvet with fringes of elaborate swirling designs. There was another chair set next to a brass floor lamp, a broader, comfortable-looking chair with floral designs, a high-tufted leather ottoman pushed against it. There was a smaller room, a bathroom with a strange porcelain toilet under a porcelain tank and a hanging chain with a brass pull, panes of stained glass on the west wall, brass fixtures on faucets and spigots on the sink, a huge, claw-footed white porcelain bathtub with more brass fixtures. Back out in the bedroom again, the north wall here was also made up of windows. No, paned glass doors with wrought iron door handles. Harmon opened two of the doors and stepped out onto a wrought iron balcony a thousand feet above the jungle. The sun and heat hit him like a hot fist. Blinking, he did not trust himself to stand on the iron. He could see the latticework of the tower beneath, but it would take no more than a gentle push to send him out and into nothing but air, a thousand feet of air. Still gripping the door, he leaned out far enough to see some iron furniture, 
red cushions strapped on, a table on the ten-foot-wide balcony. Looking up, he saw the bulge of iron above the two-story room, a huge metal flywheel just under the gold mica dome at the top of the tower, cables thicker than his forearm and thigh, running out to the east and west. Squinting to the east, Harmon could see another vertical line of a dark tower there. How far away? Forty miles, at least, seen from this height. He looked to the west, to where the dozen or so cables disappeared, but there were only blue-black clouds of a storm visible there on the horizon. Harmon stepped back into the bedroom, shut the doors carefully, and walked back to the staircase and down and around, wiping the sweat from his forehead and neck with the sleeve of his tunic. It was so delightfully cool in here that he had no urge to go back down to the jungle yet. Hello, Harmon, said a familiar voice from the gloom near the table and dark drapes. Prospero was far more solid than Harmon remembered from their meeting months earlier on the orbital rock high in the E-ring. The magus's wrinkled skin was no longer slightly transparent as his hologram had been. His robe of blue silk and wool embroidered all about with gold planets, gray comets, and burning stars of red silk, hung in heavier folds now and dragged behind him on the Turkish carpet. Harmon could see the long silver-white hair cascading behind the old man's sharp ears, and noted the age marks on his brow and his hands, as well as the slight claw-like yellowing to his fingernails. Harmon noted the seeming solidity of the carved, twined staff that the old magus clutched in his right hand, and how Prospero's blue slippers seemed to have weight as they shuffled across the wooden floor and thick carpet. Send me home, demanded Harmon, stepping toward the old man. Now! Patience. Patience, human named Harmon, friend of no man, said the magus, showing his yellowed teeth in a slight smile. Fuck patience, said Harmon. He'd had no idea until this instant how deep the fury in him went from being kidnapped from the bridge by Ariel, taken away from Ardis and Ada and his unborn child, almost certainly on the orders of this shuffling figure in the blue robe. He took a step closer to the old man, reached out, grabbed a bit of the magus's flowing sleeve, and was thrown eight feet backward across the room, finally sliding from the carpet to the polished floor and coming to rest on his back, blinking away retinal afterimages of orange circles. I suffer no one's touch, Prospero said softly. Do not make me remonstrate with this old man's stick. He raised his magus's staff ever so slightly. Harmon got to one knee. Send me back, please. I can't leave Ada alone. Not now. You already have chosen that course, have you not? No man made you take no man to Machu Picchu. Yet no man stopped you, either. What do you want, Prospero? Harmon got to his feet, tried unsuccessfully to blink away the last of the red-orange circles in his vision and sat in the nearest wooden chair. And how did you survive the destruction of the orbital asteroid? I thought your hologram was trapped there along with Caliban. Oh, it was, said Prospero, pacing back and forth. A small part of myself, perhaps, taken all for all, but a vital small part. You brought me back to Earth. I began Harmon. The Sony? Somehow you loaded your hologram into the Sony's memory? I? Harmon shook his head. You could have called that Sony up to the orbital aisle any time. Not true, said the Magus. It was Savi's machine and only makes orbital house calls for humankind passengers. I do not qualify. Quite. Then how did Caliban escape? asked Harmon. I know that it wasn't in the Sony with Demon, Hannah and me. Prospero shrugged. Caliban's adventures are now solely Caliban's concerns. The wretch no longer serves me. He serves Setabos again, said Harmon. Yes. But Caliban did survive and return to Earth after centuries, yes. Harmon sighed and rubbed his hand over his face. He suddenly felt very tired and very thirsty. The wooden box beneath the mezzanine is a sort of cold keeper, said Prospero. There is food in there and bottles of pure water. Harmon sat up straight. 
Are you reading my mind, Magus? No, your face. There is no more obvious map than the human face. Go, get a drink. I will take a seat here by the window and await your return, refreshed as interlocutor. Harmon felt how shaky his legs and arms were as he walked to the large wooden box with the brass handle, then stared into the cold a minute at all the bottles of water and heaps of clear-wrapped food. He drank deeply. Returning to the center of the red and tan carpet where Prospero sat at the table with the sunlight behind him, he said, Why did you have Ariel bring me here? Actually, in deference to accuracy, I had my biosphere sprite bring you to the jungle near Kajuraho, since no faxing is allowed within twenty kilometers of the Eiffelbahn. Eiffelbahn, repeated Harmon, still sipping from the ice-cold water bottle. Is that what you and Ariel call this tower? No, no, my dear Harmon. That is what we, or Conhotep, to be precise, since that gentleman built the Eiffelbahn some millennia ago, called this system. This is just one of, oh, let me see, 14,800 towers just like this. Why so many? asked Harmon. It pleased the Khan, said the Magus. And it takes that many Eiffel Towers to connect the cables from the east coast of China to the Atlantic breach on the coast of Spain, what with all the trunk lines, spurs, side branches, and so forth. Harmon had no idea what the old man was talking about. The Eiffel Bahn is some sort of transport system? An opportunity for you to travel in style for a change, said Prospero. Or I should say, for us to travel in style, for I shall travel with you for a small part of the way. I'm not traveling anywhere with you until... began Harmon. Then he stopped, dropped the water bottle to the floor, and clutched the heavy table with both hands. The entire two-story platform one thousand feet atop the tower had lurched. There was a grinding and tearing of metal, an horrendous screech, and then the entire structure tilted, lurched again, tilted further. The tower's falling, cried Harmon. Beyond the many panes of glass in their elaborate iron frames, he could see the distant green horizon tilt, wobble, then tilt again. Not at all, said Prospero. The two-story living unit was falling, sliding right out of the tower, screeching and rending across dry metal as if giant metal hands were pushing it out into thin air. Harmon leaped to his feet, decided to run for the doorway on the mezzanine, but then fell to his hands and knees as the two-story unit fell free of the tower, dropped at least fifteen feet, and then jerked violently before beginning a slide to the west. Heart-pounding, Harmon stayed on his knees while the huge living unit rocked perilously back and forth on its long axis, then steadied. Above them, the screeching turned into a high decibel hum. Harmon stood, found his balance, staggered to the table, and looked out the window. The tower was to their left and receding, an open patch of sky visible where this two-story, one-thousand-foot level apartment had been. Harmon could see the cables overhead and now understood the hum to be connected with some sort of flywheel in the housing above them. The Eiffelbahn was some sort of cable car system, and this large iron house of a uh, structure was the car. The vertical line he'd seen to the east earlier had been another tower just like the one they'd just left, and the car was moving quickly to the west. He turned to Prospero and took a step closer, but stopped before coming within range of the Magus's solid staff. You have to let me get back to Ada, he said, trying for firmness, but hearing the detestable pleading whine in his voice. The Voinics are all around Ardis Hall. I can't let her stay there in danger without me. Please, Lord Prospero, please. It is too late for you to intercede there, Harmon, friend of no man said Prospero in his throaty old man's voice. What's done is done at Ardis Hall. But let us put aside our sea sorrows, sir, and not burden our remembrances with a heaviness that is gone. For we are embarked upon a new voyage now, surely the stuff of sea change, friend of no man. And one of us shall soon be the wiser, the deeper, fuller man, whilst our enemies, namely that darkness I bred and harbored out of Sycorax, 
shall drink of sea water and be forced to eat the withered roots of failure and the husks of scorn. 43. There was a storm brewing on and around Mount Olympus. A planetary dust storm had blanketed Mars in a red shroud, the howling winds swirling around the force field Aegis that the absent Zeus had left in place around the home of the gods. Electrostatic particles so excited the shield that lightning flashed day and night around the summit of Olympus, and thunder rumbled in the subsonic. Sunlight near the top of the mountain was diffused into a dull, bloody glow punctuated by sheets of lightning and the ever-present rumble of the wind and thunder. Achilles, still carrying his beloved but dead Amazon queen, Penthesilea, had quantum teleported to the home of his captive, Hephaestus, god of fire, chief artificer to all the gods, husband of Agla, also known as Charis, the delightfulness of art, one of the loveliest of graces. Some said that the artificer had built his wife as well. Hephaestus had quantum teleported not directly into his home, but to its front door. To the casual glance, the front of the crippled fire god's home looked like other dwelling places of the immortals, white stone, white pillars, white portico. But this was only the entrance. In truth, Hephaestus had built his house and extensive workshops into the steep south slope of Olympus. Far from Caldera Lake and the cluster of so many of the gods' huge temple houses, he lived in a cave. It was quite a cave, Achilles saw, as the foot-dragging Hephaestus led the way in and secured multiple iron doors behind them. The cave had been carved out of the solid black stone of Olympus, and this one room stretched away for hundreds of yards into the gloom. Everywhere were tables, arcane devices, magnifying lenses, tools, and machines in various stages of creation or dismembering. Deep in the cave roared an open hearth with liquid steel bubbling like orange lava. Closer to the front, where various stools, couches, low tables, a bed, and braziers showed Hephaestus's actual living space carved out of the endless workshop, stood, sat, and walked some gold women, Hephaestus's infamous attendants, machine women with rivets, human eyes, metal breasts, and soft synthetic flesh vaginas, but also, so the tales said, with the stolen souls of human beings. "'You can lay her down here,' said the dwarf god, gesturing to a littered bench-top. With one swipe of his hairy forearm, Hephaestus cleared the table. Releasing his grip on the dwarf god, Achilles laid his linen-wrapped burden down with the utmost gentleness and reverence. Penthesilea's face was visible, and Hephaestus stared down for a minute. "'She was beautiful, all right.' and I can see Athena's work in the preservation of the corpse. Several days since death, obviously, and no rot or discoloration at all. The Amazon still has a flush to her cheeks. Do you mind if I roll the linen down just to take a peek at her tits? If you touch her or her shroud, said Achilles, I will kill you. Hephaestus held up his palms. All right, all right, just curious. He slapped his palms together. Food, he said. Then strategy to bring your lady back. The golden female attendants began bringing trays of hot food and large cups of wine to the round table at the center of Hephaestus' circle of couches. Fleet-footed Achilles and Harry Hephaestus both dug in with a will, not speaking, except to demand more food or for the communal wine cup to be passed. The attendants brought steaming fried liver wrapped in lamb intestines as an appetizer. One of Achilles' favorites. They carried in a complete roast piglet stuffed with the flesh of many small birds, raisins, chestnuts, egg yolks, and spiced meats. And they set out bowls of pork stewed with bubbling apples and pears. They brought in pure delicacies such as roasted sow's womb and olives with mashed chickpeas. For the main course, they served huge fish fried to a crispy, flaky brown on the outside. Netted in Zeus's own caldera lake atop Olympus, Hephaestus said with his mouth full. For dessert, and to cleanse the palate between courses, they had a variety of fruits, sweetmeats, and nuts. The golden metal women set out bowls of figs and heaps of almonds, 
More bowls of fat dates and flat plates of the kind of delicious honey cakes that Achilles had tasted only once before when visiting the small city of Athens. Finally came that dessert most loved by Agamemnon, Priam, and other kings of kings, cheesecake. After the meal, the robot attendants swept the table and floor and brought in more casks and double-handed goblets of wine. Ten types of wine, at least. Hephaestus did the honor of mixing the water with the wine and passing the huge cups. The dwarf god and god-man drank for two hours, but neither entered the state that Achilles' people called paroinia, intoxication frenzy. The two males were mostly silent, but the naked golden female attendants celebrated for them, lining up and dancing around the table in the sensuous conga line that aesthetes such as Odysseus called the comas. The man and God took turns going off to use the cave's toilet facilities, and when they were drinking wine again, Achilles said, Is it night yet? Is it time for you to spirit me to the healer's hall? Do you really think that Olympus healing tanks will bring your Amazon doxy back to life, son of wet-breasted Thetis? Those tanks and worms were designed to repair immortals, not some human bitch, however beautiful. Achilles was too drunk and too distracted to take offense. Goddess Athena told me that the tanks would renew life to Penthesilea, and Athena does not lie. Athena does nothing but lie, snorted Hephaestus, lifting the huge two-handled cup and drinking deeply. And a few days ago you were waiting at the foot of Olympus, throwing rocks at Zeus's impenetrable aegis, howling for Athena to come down to fight so you could kill her just as surely as you stuck a spear through this Amazon's lovely tit. What changed, O oh noble man-killer? Achilles frowned at the god of fire. This Trojan War has been complicated, cripple. I'll drink to that, laughed Hephaestus, and lifted the big goblet again. When they were ready to QT to the healer's hall, Achilles dressed in full armor again, his sword sharpened on the fire god's wheel and his shield polished, the son of Peleus walked to the bench to lift Penthesilea's body to his shoulder. Now leave her, said Hephaestus. What are you talking about, growled Achilles. She's the reason we're going to the healer's hall. I can't leave her here. We don't know which of the gods or guards will be there tonight, said the artificer. You may have to fight your way through a phalanx. Do you want to do that with an Amazon's corpse on your shoulder, or were you planning to use her beautiful body as a shield? Achilles hesitated. There's nothing here to harm her body, said Hephaestus. I used to have rats and bats and roaches, but I built mechanical cats and falcons and praying mantises to rid the cave of them. Still, if the healer's hall is empty, it'll take us three seconds to QT back here and fetch her corpse. In the meantime, I'll have the golden girls watch over her, said the artificer god. He snapped his stubby fingers, and six of the metal attendants took up positions around the Amazon's body. Are you ready now? Yes. Achilles gripped Hephaestus' heavily scarred upper arm, and the two men popped out of existence. The healer's hall was empty. No immortals were posted as guards. More surprising even to Hephaestus was that the many glass cylinders were empty. No gods were being healed and resurrected here tonight. In the huge space, lighted by only a few low-burning braziers and the violet light of the bubbling tanks themselves, Nothing moved except the shuffling Hephaestus and the fleet-footed Achilles, shield held high. And then the healer emerged from the shadows of the bubbling vats. Achilles raised his shield higher. Athena had said to him over the corpse of Penthesilea, Kill the healer, a great monstrous centipede thing with too many arms and eyes. Destroy everything in the healer's hall. But Achilles had assumed that Athena was calling the healer a centipede out of insult, not as a literal description. This thing had the segmented body of a centipede, but it rose thirty feet high, its segmented body swaying, its body circling rings of black eyes on the top segment locked on Achilles and Hephaestus. The healer had feelers and segmented arms, too many, 
and spindly hands with spidery fingers on the ends of half a dozen of those upper arms. One body segment near the top wore a vest of many pockets, bulging with tools, and there were straps and bands and black belts holding other tools on other segments of the swaying torso. Healer, called Hephaestus, where is everybody? A huge centipede swayed, waggled arms, and erupted in a stutter of noise from unseen mouths. Did you understand that? Hephaestus asked Achilles. Understand what? It sounded like a boy running a stick along the ribcage of a skeleton. It's all good Greek, said Hephaestus. You just have to slow it down in your mind. Listen more carefully. To the healer, the dwarf god cried, My mortal friend did not understand you. Could you repeat that, O healer? Lord God Zeus's orders are that no mortal shall ever be placed in one of the regeneration tanks without his express command. The Lord God Master Zeus is nowhere to be found, and since his command only on Olympus does the healer obey, I cannot allow a mortal to pass until Zeus returns to his throne on Olympus. Did you understand that? the artificer asked Achilles. Something about this thing obeying only Zeus and not allowing Penthesilea to be put into one of the vats without Zeus's express command. Precisely. I can kill this big bug, said Achilles. Perhaps so, said Hephaestus, although the healer is whispered to be even more immortal than we Johnny-come-lately gods. But if you kill it, Penthesilea will never be brought back to life. Only the healer knows how to operate the machinery and command the blue and green worms that are part of the healing process. You're the artificer, said Achilles, tapping his sword against the rim of his golden shield. You must know how to operate this machinery. The fuck I do, growled Hephaestus. This isn't simple technology like we used when we were mere post-humans. I could never figure out the healer's quantum machines, and if I did, I still couldn't order the blue worms to work. I think they respond only to telepathy and only to the healer. This bug said that he only obeyed Zeus on Olympus, said Achilles, who was perilously close to losing his temper and killing the god of fire, the giant centipede, and every god still left on Olympus. Who else can command it? Kronos, said Hephaestus with a maddening smile. But Kronos and the other titans have been banished to Tartarus forever. Only Zeus in this universe can tell the healer what to do. Then where is Zeus? No one knows, growled Hephaestus. But in his absence the gods are warring with one another for control. The fighting is now mostly centered down on Ilium's earth, where the gods still support their Trojans or their Greeks, and Olympus is largely empty and peaceful now. It's why I ventured out onto this fucking volcano's slopes to survey the damage to my escalator. Why would Athena give me this god-killing knife and order me to kill the healer after the thing brings Penthesilea back to life? asked Achilles. Hephaestus' eyes widened. She told you to kill the healer? The bearded dwarf god's voice was low and puzzled. I have no idea why she would order such a thing. She has some scheme, but it must be a mad one. With the healer dead, the vats here would be useless. All of our immortality would be a joke. We could live a very long time, but we would suffer, son of Peleus. Suffer terribly without nano-rejuvenation. Achilles strode toward the healer, pulling his famous shield tight until his eyes blazed through the slits of his shining war helmet. He pulled back his sword. I'll make this thing activate the vats for Penthesilea. Hephaestus hurried forward to grab Achilles' arm. No, my mortal friend. Believe me when I say that the healer does not fear death, and it will not be moved. It obeys only Zeus. Without the fucking healer, the blue worms will not perform. Without the fucking blue worms, the vats are useless. Without the fucking vats, your Amazon queen will stay fucking dead for fucking ever. Achilles angrily shook off the artificer's hand. This bug has to put Penthesilea in the healing vats. Even while he was saying this, Achilles again is reminded of Athena's command for him to kill the healer. What is that bitch goddess up to? How is she using me? To what purpose? She's not insane, and she certainly has no intention of killing the one creature who can preserve her immortality. 
The healer does not fear you, son of Peleus. You can kill it, but that only means you will never see your queen alive again. Achilles walked away from the dwarf god, brushed past the huge healer, and slammed his beautiful shield, with all its hammered concentric circles of symbols, hard into the clear plastic of the huge regeneration tank. The sound echoed in the dim darkness of the hall. He swung back to Hephaestus. All right. This bug obeys Zeus. Where is Zeus? The god of fire began to laugh and then stopped when he saw Achilles' eyes blazing out through his helmet's eye slits. You serious? Your plan is to bend the god of thunder, the father of all gods, to your will? Where is Zeus? No one knows, repeated Hephaestus. The crippled god walked toward the tall doors, dragging his shorter leg behind. Lightning flashed outside as the dust storm made the force field aegis spark in a thousand places. The pillars cut columns of black out of the silver-white light flooding into the hall of the healer. Zeus has been absent these two weeks and more, shouted the fire god over his shoulder. He tugged at his tangled beard. Most of us suspect some fucking plot of Hera's. Maybe she threw her husband down into the hell pit of Tartarus to join his vanished father Kronos and mother Rhea. Can you find him? Achilles turned his back on the healer and slid his sword into its loop on his broad girdle. He swung his heavy shield over his back. Can you take me to him? Hephaestus could only stare. You'd go down into Tartarus to try to bend the god of gods to your mortal will? There's only one life form in the pantheon of the original gods besides Zeus, who might know where he is. That terrible power also is the only other immortal here on Mars who could send us to Tartarus. You would go to Tartarus if you had to. I'd pass through the teeth of death and back again to bring life back to my Amazon, Achilles said softly. You'd find Tartarus a thousand times worse than death and the shaded halls of Hades, son of Peleus. Take me to this immortal of which you speak, commanded Achilles. His eyes through the eye slits of his helmet were not quite sane. For a long minute, the bearded artificer stood hunched over, panting slightly, eyes unfocused, his hand still tugging absently at his tangled beard. Then he said, so be it dragged his bad leg across the polished marble more rapidly than seemed possible, and clasped both huge hands around Achilles' forearm. 44. Harmon hadn't meant to sleep. As exhausted as he was, he'd agreed only to eat and drink something, warming up an excellent stew and eating it at the table by the window while Prospero sat silently in the overstuffed armchair. The Magus was reading out of a huge, worn, leather-bound book. When Harmon turned to talk to Prospero again, to demand in stronger terms that he be returned to Ardis, the old man was gone, and so was the book. Harmon had sat at the table for some minutes, only half aware of the jungle rolling by nine hundred feet below the moving, creaking, house-sized cable car. Then, just to look at the upstairs again, he told himself, he dragged himself up the iron spiral staircase, stood looking at the large bed for a minute, and then had collapsed on it face first. When he awoke, it was night. Moonlight and ring light flooded through the panes into the strange bedroom, painting velvet and brass in light so rich it appeared to be stripes of white paint. Harmon opened the doors and stepped out onto the bedroom terrace. The air was cool almost a thousand feet above the jungle floor, the breeze constant due to the motion of the cable car, but he still was struck by the humidity, heat, and organic scents of all the green life below. And the top of the jungle canopy was almost unbroken, whitewashed with ring light and moonlight from the three-quarters moon, and occasional strange sounds wafted up, audible even over the steady hum of the flywheels above and the creak of the long cable. Harmon took a minute to orient himself by the E and P rings. He was sure that the car had been headed west when they'd left the first tower hours earlier. He'd slept for ten hours at least. 
but now there was no doubt that the cable car was lumbering north-northeast. He could see the moonlight illuminated tip of one of the Eiffelbahn towers just showing over the horizon to the southwest from the direction he must have come, and another coming closer less than twenty miles to the northeast. Somewhere, while he slapped the car he was traveling in, must have changed direction at a tower junction. Harmon's knowledge of geography was all self-taught, gleaned from books he'd taught himself to read, and he was quite sure that until recent months he was the only old-style human on Earth who had any sense of geography, any knowledge that the Earth was a globe. But he'd never paid much attention to this arrow-shaped subcontinent south of what used to be called Asia. Still, it didn't take a cartographer's knowledge to know that if Prospero had been telling the truth, if his destination was the coast of Europe, where the Atlantic breach began along the 40th parallel, then he was going the wrong way. It didn't matter. Harmon had no intention of staying in this odd device the necessary weeks or months it would take to travel all that distance. Ada needed him now. He paced the length of the balcony, occasionally grabbing the railing when the cable car house rocked slightly. It was on his third turn that he noticed an iron-rung ladder running up the side of the structure just beyond the railing. Harmon swung out, grasped a rung, and pulled himself onto the ladder. There was nothing beneath him and the ground now but a thousand feet of air and jungle canopy. The ladder led onto the roof of the cable car. Harmon swung himself up, legs pinioning for a second before he found a handhold and pulled himself onto the flat roof. He stood carefully, arms extended for balance, when the cable car rocked as it began climbing a ridgeline toward the blinking lights of an Eiffelbahn tower, now only ten miles or so ahead. Beyond the next tower, a range of mountains had just become visible on the horizon, their snowy peaks almost brilliant in the moonlight and ring light. Exhilarated by the night and sense of speed, Harmon noticed something. There was a faint shimmering about three feet out from the leading edge of the cable car. A slight blurring of the moon, rings, and vista below. He walked to that edge, and extended his hand as far as possible. There was a force field there, not a powerful one. His fingers pressed through it as if pushing through a resistant but permeable membrane, reminding Harmon of the entrance to the firmary on Prospero's orbital isle, but strong enough to deflect the wind from the blunt and non-aerodynamic side of the cable car house. With his fingers beyond the force field, he could feel the true force of the wind, enough to bend his hand back. This thing was moving faster than he'd thought. After a half hour or so of pacing and standing on the roof, listening to the cables hum, watching the next Eiffelbahn Tower approach and working out strategies to get back to Ada, Harmon went hand over hand down the rung ladder, jumped onto the balcony, and re-entered the house. Prospero was waiting for him on the first floor. The Magus was in the same armchair, his robed legs not up on the ottoman, the large book open on his lap and his staff near his right hand. "'What do you want from me?' asked Harmon. Prospero looked up. "'I see, young sir, that you are as disproportionate in your manners as our mutual friend Caliban is in his shape.' "'What do you want of me?' repeated Harmon his hands balling into fists. It is time for you to go to war, Harmon of Ardis. Go to war? Yes. Time for your kind to fight, your kind, your kin, your species, your ilk, yourself. What are you talking about? War with whom? With what might be a better phrasing, said Prospero. Are you talking about the Voynichs? We're already fighting them. I brought no man Odysseus to the bridge at Machu Picchu primarily to fetch more weapons. Not the Voynichs, no, said Prospero, nor the Calabani, although all these slave things have been tasked to kill your kin and kind. The minutes of their plot come round at last. I am speaking of the enemy. Said Abbas, said Harmon, oh, yes. 
Prospero placed his aged hand on the broad page of the book, set a long leaf in as a bookmark, closed the book gently, and rose, leaning on his staff. Sedebas, the many-handed as a cuttlefish, is here at last, on your world and mine. I know that. Demon saw the thing in Paris Crater. Sedebas has woven some blue-eyes web over that fax note and a dozen others, including Chome, and— And do you know why the many-handed has come now to earth? interrupted Prospero. No, said Harmon. To feed, Prospero said softly. To feed. On us? Harmon felt the cable car slow, then bump, and he noticed the next Eiffelbahn tower surrounding them for a second, the two-story structure of the car fitting into the landing on the thousand-foot level just as it had on the first tower. He felt the car swivel, heard gears grind and clank, and they slid out of the tower on a different heading, traveling more east than north now. "'Has Setabas come to feed on us?' he asked again. Prospero smiled. "'Not exactly, not directly. "'What the hell does that mean? "'It means, young Harmon human, that Setabas is a ghoul. "'Our many-handed friend feeds on the residues of fear and pain.' The dark energy of sudden terror and rich residue of equally sudden death. This memory of terror lies in the soil of your world, of any warlike sentient creature's world, like so much coal or petroleum, all of a lost era's wild energy sleeping underground. I don't understand. It means that Setebas, the devourer of worlds, that gourmet of dark history, has secured some of your fax nodes in blue stasis, yes, to lay his eggs, to send his seed out across your world, to suck the warmth out of these places like a succubus sucking breath from a sleeping soul. But it's your memory and your history that will fatten him like a many-handed blood tick. I still don't understand, said Harmon. His nest now is in Paris Crater, Chum and these other provincial places where you humans party and sleep and waste your useless lives away, said Prospero. But he will feed at Waterloo, Hotepsa, Stalingrad, Ground Zero, Kursk, Hiroshima, Saigon, Rwanda, Cape Town, Montreal, Gettysburg, Riyadh, Cambodia, Kanstak, Chancellorsville, Okinawa, Tarawa, me lie, Bergen-Belsen, Auschwitz, the Sum. Do any of these names mean anything to you, Harmon? No. Prospero sighed. This is our problem. Until some fragment of your human race regains the memory of your race, you cannot fight Setebos. You cannot understand Setebos. You cannot understand yourselves. Why is that your problem, Prospero? The old man sighed again. If Cenobos eats the human pain and memory of this world, an energy resource I call Umana, this world will be physically alive, but spiritually dead to any sentient being, including me. Spiritually dead? repeated Harmon. He knew the word from his reading and sigling. Spirit, spiritual, spirituality vague ideas having to do with ancient myths of ghosts and religion. It just made no sense, coming from this hologram of a logosphere avatar, the too-cute construct of some set of ancient software programs and communication protocols. Spiritually dead, repeated the Magus. Psychically, philosophically, organically dead. On the quantum level, a living world records the most sentient energies its inhabitants experience, Harmon of Artis. Love, hate, fear, hope. Like particles of magnetite aligning to a north or south pole. The poles may change, wander, disappear, but the recordings remain. The resulting energy field is as real, although more difficult to measure and locate, as the magnetosphere a planet with a hot spinning core produces. 
protecting the living inhabitants with its force field from the harshest realities of space. So does the memory of pain and suffering protect the future of a sentient race. Does this make sense to you? No, said Harmon. Prospero shrugged. Then take my word for it. If you ever want to see Ada alive again, you will have to learn much. Perhaps too much. But after this learning, you will at least be able to join the fight. There may be no hope, there usually is none, when Setabas begins devouring a world's memory, but at least we can fight. Why do you care? asked Harmon. What difference does it make to you whether human beings survive, or their memories? Prospero smiled thinly. What do you take me for? Do you think I am a mere function of old emails, the icon of an ancient internet with a staff and robe? I don't know what the hell you are, said Harmon. A hologram. Prospero took a step closer and slapped Harmon hard across the face. Harmon took a step back, gaping. He raised his hand to his stinging cheek, balled that hand into a fist. Prospero smiled and held his staff between them. If you don't want to wake up on the floor ten minutes from now with the worst headache of your life, don't think about it. I want to go home to Ada, Harmon said slowly. Did you try to find her with your functions, asked the Magus. Harmon blinked. Yes. And did any of your functions work here on the cable car or in the jungle before it? No, said Harmon. Nor will they work until you've mastered the rest of the functions you command, said the old man, returning to his chair and carefully lowering himself into it. The rest of the functions began, Harmon. What do you mean? How many functions have you mastered? asked Prospero. Five, said Harmon. One had been known to everyone for ages, the finder function, which included a chronometer, but Savi had taught them three others, then he had discovered the fifth. Recite them. Harmon sighed. Finder function, proxnet, farnet, allnet, and sigling, reading through one's palm. And have you mastered the allnet function, Harmon of Artis? Not really. There was too much information, too much bandwidth, as Savi had said. And do you think that old-style humans, the real old-style humans, your undesigned and unmodified ancestors, had five such functions, Harmon of Ardis? I... I don't know. He'd never thought about it. They did not, Prospero said flatly. You are the result of four thousand years of gene tampering and nanotech splicing. How did you discover the sigil function, Harmon of Ardis? I... Just experimented with metal images, triangles, squares, circles, until one worked, said Harmon. That's what you told Ada and the others, said Prospero, but that is a lie. How did you really learn to sigil? I dreamt the sigil function code, admitted Harmon. It had been too strange, too precious to tell the others. Ariel helped you with that dream, said Prospero, his thin-lipped smile showing again. We grew impatient. Would you like to guess how many functions each of you, every one of you old-style humans, has in your cells and blood and brain stuff? More than five functions? asked Harmon. One hundred, said Prospero. And even a hundred. Teach them to me, said Harmon, taking a step toward the Magus. Prospero shook his head. I cannot, I would not. But you need to learn them nonetheless. On this voyage you will learn them. We're going the wrong way, said Harmon. What? You said the Eiffel Bond would take me to the coast of Europe, where the Atlantic breach begins. But we're heading east now, away from Europe. We will swing north again, two towers hence, said Prospero. Are you impatient to arrive? Yes. Don't be, said the Magus. All the learning will happen during the trip, not after it. Yours will be the sea change of all sea changes. And trust me, you do not want to take the short route over the old Pakistan passes into the waste called Afghanistan, south along the Mediterranean basin and across the Sahara marshes. Why not, said Harmon. He and Savi and Demon had flown east across the Atlantic and then over the Sahara marshes to Jerusalem, then taken a crawler into the dry Mediterranean basin. It was a place on earth he knew, 
and he wanted to see if the blue tachyon beam still rose from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Savi had said it carried all of the coded information of all her lost contemporaries from fourteen hundred years ago. The Calabani are loosed, said Prospero. They've left the basin? They are freed of their old restraints. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, or at least upon that part of it. Then where are we going? Patience, Harmon of Artists. Patience. Tomorrow we cross a mountain range I believe you will find most enlightening, then into Asia, where you may behold the works of the mighty and the dead, and then west and west enough again. The breach will wait. Too slow, said Harmon, pacing back and forth. Too long. If the functions don't work here, I don't have any way of knowing how Ada is. I need to go. I need to get home. You want to know how your Ada fares? asked Prospero. He was not smiling. The magus pointed to a red cloth draped over the couch. Use that. This one time only. Armin frowned, went to the cloth, studied it. A Turin cloth, he said. It was red. All Turin cloths were tan. Nor was the micro-circuit embroidery the same. There are a myriad of Turin cloth receivers, said Prospero, just as there are a myriad of sensory transmitters. Every person can be one. Harmon shook his head. I don't give a damn about the Turin drama, Troy, Agamemnon, all that nonsense. I'm not in the mood for amusements. This cloth tells you nothing of Ilium, said Prospero. It will show you your Ada's fate. Try it. Trembling, Harmon sat back on the couch, adjusted the red cloth over his face, touched the embroidery to his forehead, and closed his eyes. 45. The Queen Mab decelerated toward Earth on a column of nuclear explosions, the ship kicking out a Coke can-sized fission bomb every thirty seconds, the bomb exploding and driving the pusher plate back up to the stern of the thousand-foot-long ship. The huge pistons and cylinders in the clockwork engine room cycling back and forth, the next can bomb being ejected. Monmut was watching on the stern video channel. If anyone on Earth didn't know we were coming, they must know now, he said to Orfu on their tight beam channel. The two had been invited to the bridge for the first time on the voyage, and they were in the largest lift now, rising toward the bow of the ship, which during deceleration, of course, was aiming back toward space rather than at the rapidly growing Earth. I don't think the idea is to be subtle, tight beamed Orfu. Obviously not, but this is about as subtle as a stomach pump, about as subtle as a pay toilet in the diarrhea ward, about as subtle as— Do you have a point? rumbled Orfu. It's too unsubtle, said Monmut. Too obvious, too visible, too precious. I mean, mid-twentieth century spaceship designs, for God's sake. Fission bombs— Ejection mechanisms from the Atlanta, Georgia, Coca-Cola bottling plant circa 1959. So your point is, interrupted Orfu. In the old days, his eye stocks and video cameras would have tracked toward Monmouth, some of them at least, but those had not been replaced since his optic nerves had been burned out. I have to assume that less obvious Moravec ships, modern ships, stealth-activated and stealth-propelled ships, are following us, sent Monmut. That has been my assumption as well, said the big hard vac Moravec. You never mentioned it, nor have you until now, said Orfu. Why didn't Astigche and the other prime integrators tell us, asked Monmut. If we're being put out ahead of the real fleet as the obvious target, we have a right to know. Orfu sent a subsonic rumble that Monmut had learned was the Ionian's equivalent of a shrug. It wouldn't make any difference, would it? said the big Moravec. If the Earth defenses fire on us and breach our rather modest force field defenses, we'll be dead before we have time to complain. Speaking of Earth defenses, has the voice from the orbital city said anything else since the message two weeks ago? The Mazer broadcast had been succinct. The recorded female human voice had simply said, 
bring Odysseus to me, over and over for twenty-four hours, and then had cut off as quickly as it had begun. The message had not been broadcast at random. It had been aimed precisely at the Queen Mab. I've been monitoring the incoming channels, said Orfu, and I haven't heard anything new. The lift whirred and stopped. The broad cargo doors opened. Monmut stepped onto the bridge for the first time since before their launch from Phobos, and Orfu repellered after him. The bridge was circular with a diameter of thirty meters, the ceiling dome-shaped and ringed with thick windows and holographic screens serving as windows. From a spaceship, spaceship point of view, it was almost completely satisfying to Monmut. Although the unnamed spacecraft that had brought Orfu, the late Koros III, and Repo, and him to Mars, had been centuries more advanced, accelerated to one-fifth light speed by magnetic scissors accelerator wickets, carrying a boron light sail, fusion engines, and other modern, more effective devices, this strangely retro atomic spaceship and spaceship grid looked right. Instead of purely virtual controls and simple jack-in stations, more than a dozen tech Moravex sat in old-fashioned acceleration chairs at even more old-fashioned metal and glass monitoring stations. There were actual switches, real toggles, physical dials, dials, and a hundred other eye and vid camera pleasing details. The floor looked to be of textured steel, perhaps lifted straight out of the hull of some World War II-era seagoing battleship. The usual suspects, Orfu's irreverent term, stood awaiting them near the central navigation table, Astigche, their central prime integrator from Europa, General Bey Bin Adi, representing the belt fighter Moravex, Cho Li, their Callistan navigator, looking and sounding far too much like the dead repo for Monmut's comfort. Summa Four, the brawny, bucky carbon sheathed, fly eyed Ganymedon, and the spidery retrograde Cinepesson. Monmut walked closer to the map table and stepped up onto the metal ledge that allowed smaller Moravex to look down upon the glowing table surface. Monmut floated over. We have a little less than fourteen hours until low Earth orbital insertion, said Astig Che, without greetings or introductions. His voice, that James Mason voice to Monmut's lost era history vid trained ears and audio receivers, was smooth but businesslike. We have to decide what to do. The prime integrator was vocalizing rather than transmitting on the common band. The bridge was pressurized to earth normal, an atmospheric content the European Moravex liked and the others could tolerate, and audible speech was more private than common band chatter and less conspiratorial than tight beaming. Have there been any more broadcasts from that woman asking us to deliver Odysseus? asked Orfu. No, said Cho Li the bulky Callistan navigator. Jolie's voice, as always, was very, very soft. But the orbital construction that was the source of that broadcast is our destination. Jolie ran a manipulator tentacle over the map table, and a large hologram of Earth appeared. The equatorial and polar rings were very bright, countless specks of light moving west to east, along the equator and north to south around the poles. This is the live video feed, said the tiny little silver box amidst the skinny little silver legs that comprise the Amalthean retrograde Cinepesson. I can read the data bars via the common channel, said Orfu of Io, and I can see all of you on my radar return and infrared scans, but there may be subtle aspects of the hollow projections that I miss, being blind and all. I'll give a description via tight beam of everything I see, said Monmut. He connected via tight beam and set up a high-speed squirt feed to the Ionian, describing the holographic image of the blue and white earth hanging in space above the chart table, the bright polar and equatorial rings crisscrossing above the oceans and clouds. 
The rings were close enough that countless discrete objects could be seen gleaming against the black of space. Magnification? asked Orfu. Just ten, said Sinapesson. Small binoculars level. We're approaching the orbit of Earth's moon, although right now Luna is on the back side of the planet from us. We'll cease use of the fission bombs and switch to ion drive as we enter their cislunar space. No reason to antagonize anyone there. Our velocity is down to ten kilometers per second and dropping. You may have noticed our 1.25 Earth G deceleration the last two days. How has Odysseus been taking the added G-load? asked Monmouth. He'd not seen their only remaining human passenger over the past week. Monmouth had hoped that Hockenberry would QT back to the Queen Mab, but so far he hadn't. Fine, rumbled Summa Four, the tall Ganymedon. He tends to stay in his bunk and quarters more than usual, but he was doing that before we raised the deceleration G-load. Has he said anything about the female voice on the Mazer? Or the bring Odysseus to me message? asked Orfu. No, said Astig Chai. He has told us that he doesn't recognize the voice, but he's sure it doesn't belong to Athena, Aphrodite, or any of the Olympian immortals he's met. Where did the broadcast come from? Monmouth asked. Choli activated a laser pen embedded in one of his manipulators and pointed out the speck in the polar ring, currently approaching the south pole on the back side of the transparent earth hollow. Magnify, the navigator ordered the MAB's main AI. The speck seemed to leap forward until it replaced the entire earth hologram. It was a roughly dumbbell-shaped city of metal girders, opaque orange glass and light, tall glass towers, glass bubbles, glass domes, convoluted glass spires and arches. Monmut summarized it all in his tight-beam descriptions to Orfu. This is one of the larger artificial objects in Earth orbit, said retrograde Sinapesson. About twenty kilometers long. Roughly the size of their lost-era city of Manhattan before it was flooded. It seems to be built around a stone and heavy metal core, probably a captured asteroid that gives or gave a little gravity to the inhabitants. How much? asked Orfu of Io. Roughly ten centimeters per second, said the Amalthean. Enough that a human or unmodified post-human wouldn't float away or be able to achieve escape velocity by jumping, but light enough to float pretty much where you want to. Pretty close to Phobos' size and gravity, said Monmouth. Any clue who the voice belongs to or who lives there? The post-humans built these orbital environments more than two thousand standard years ago, said Prime Integrator Astig J. You both know that we assumed the post-humans had died out. Their radio chatter stopped more than a millennia ago, even as the quantum flux between Earth and Mars began to build. We haven't seen their ships in cislunar space through our telescopes. There's been no sign of them on Earth itself, but we can't preclude the possibility that a few have survived. Or evolved. Into what? asked Orfu. Astig J performed that most archaic, arcane, yet expressive of human motions. He shrugged. Monmut started to describe the other Europans shrugged to his friend, but Orfu tight-beamed that he'd picked it up on both radar and infrared sensors. Let me show you some recent activity before we decide if you're going to drop the Dark Lady into Earth's atmosphere, continued Astig Che. He set one very humanoid hand above the chart table. The orbital island hologram was replaced with hollows showing Earth and Mars in scale of size but not in distance with a myriad of blue, green, and white strands connecting near-Earth orbit and the surface of Mars. Columns of holographic data misted into existence. The two planets looked as if they'd been woven into a spider's frenzied web, except in this case the web itself pulsed and grew, strands contracting and expanding, extruding new strands and nodes as if of their own volition. Monmouth rushed to describe it all on the tight-beam channel. It's all right, transmitted Orfu. 
I'm reading the data bands. It's almost as good as seeing the graphics. This is quantum activity of the past ten standard days, said Choli. You'll note that it's almost ten percent more volatile and active than when we launched from Phobos. The instability is reaching a critical stage. How critical? asked Orfu of Io. Astig Jay turned his visored face toward the big Ionian. Critical enough that we have to make a decision in the next week or so. Less time if the volatility continues to grow. This level of quantum instability threatens the entire solar system. What decision? asked Monmut. Whether to destroy the Earth's polar and equatorial rings where the quantum flux originated. Also whether to cauterize Olympus Mons and the other quantum nodes on Mars, said General Bay Binardi, and to sterilize the Earth itself if need be. Orfu whistled, an odd sound on the echoing bridge. Does the Queen Mab have such a military capability? the Ionian asked softly. No, said the general. I guess I was right about the invisible Moravec ships shadowing us, thought Monmouth. On the tight beam, Orfu said, I guess we were right about the invisible Moravec ships shadowing us. If Monmouth had had eyelids, he would have blinked at this similarity in their thought patterns. A silence descended. None of the six Moraveks around the chart table spoke or transmitted again for almost a minute. There are more developments to share with you, Suma Four said at last. The bucky carbon sheathed Ganymedon touched controls, and a different magnified telescopic view of Earth leapt into place. Monmouth recognized what had once been called the British Isles, Shakespeare, and then the view zoomed in on the continent of Europe. Two images filled the hollow cube, an odd city radiating out from a black crater, and then what might have been the same city sheathed in a blue web not so dissimilar from the view of the quantum displacement between Earth and Mars. He described the blue mass to his friend. What the hell is it? asked Orfu. We don't know, said Suma Four, but it's appeared in the last seven standard days. These coordinates match those of the ancient city of Paris in the nation of France. But where our astronomers from Phobos and Martian space had been observing old-style human activity, primitive but visible, now there is just this blue dome, blue webs, blue spires surrounding what was obviously an old black hole crater. What could be spinning that web? asked Monmouth. Again, we don't know, said Suma Four, but look at the measurements coming from inside it. Orfu did not whistle this time, but Monmouth felt the urge to. Temperatures in the blue webbed parts of Paris had dropped below minus one hundred degrees Celsius, where just meters away the temperatures still hovered near Earth normal for that region and time of the year, while just meters away from that the temperatures spiked to levels where lead would melt. Could this be a natural phenomenon? asked Monmouth. Something the post-humans brought about during the demented times when they were fooling with Earth's psychology and life forms? We've never seen or recorded anything like this before, said Ostig J. And we've never stopped monitoring Earth from consortium space. But look at this. A dozen other blue-marked locations appeared in the holocube map, which pulled back until it was a large Earth sphere again. Blue-webbed sites were marked elsewhere in Europe and Asia, in what had been South America, Southern Africa, a dozen in total. Next to the blue circles were data cubes recording measurements similar to the Paris phenomenon, with notes on the day, hour, minute, and second that the blue web had appeared to Moravec sensors. Monmouth raced to tight-beam the image descriptions to Orfu. And this, said Astig Che. Another sphere of Earth appeared showing straight blue lines rising from Paris and the other blue nodes, including one city marked Jerusalem. The thin blue shafts continued straight into space, disappearing beyond the solar system. Well, we've seen that before, said Orfu of Io, after Monmouth described it to him. It's the same kind of tachyon beam that appeared at Delphi on the other Earth, the ancient Earth of Ilium, when the population disappeared. Yes, said Prime Integrator Astig Che. That 
beam didn't seem to be aimed at anything in deep space, said Monmouth. Are these? Not unless you count grazing the lesser Magellanic clouds, said Choli. Plus, there is a quantum component to these tachyon beams. What does that mean, quantum component, asked Orfu. The beams phase shift on the quantum level existing more in Kalabi Yao space than in four-dimensional Einsteinian space-time, said the Callistan navigator. You mean, said Monmut, they're shifting into a different universe? Yes. The Ilium Earth's universe? asked Monmut. His tone was hopeful. When the last brain hole that had connected the current Mars and Ilium Earth universes had collapsed weeks earlier, the Moravex had lost all communication with that ancient Earth of Troy and Agamemnon, but Hockenberry had been able to quantum teleport across the Kalabi Yao universe membrane to the Queen Mab, and presumably to QT back, although no one knew where he'd gone when he'd teleported off the atomic spaceship. Monmut, who knew many of the Greeks and Trojans, had hopes of reconnecting to that universe once again. We don't think so, said Cho Lee. The reasons are as complicated as the multiple membrane Kalabi Yao space map our assumptions are based on, and are guided by what we learned from the device you successfully activated on Mars eight months ago. But we think the tachyon beam's phase shifting is to one or more different universes, not that of the Ilium Earth. Monmouth spread his hands. So what does all this have to do with our mission to Earth? I was supposed to pilot the Dark Lady in Earth's seas or oceans, bringing Summa Four down for his mission, just as I was supposed to bring the late Re Po to Olympus Mons last year. Does the blue web stuff and the tachyon beams change that plan? There was another silence. The dangers and cautionary unknowns of an atmospheric penetration are proliferating, said Summa Four. Could you translate that, said Orfu of Io. Observe, please, said the tall Ganymedon. A holographic astronomical recording began running above the chart table. Monmouth described the visuals to Orfu on tight beam. Please note the date, said Prime Integrator Astig Che. That's more than eight months ago, said Monmouth. Yes, said the European Integrator. Shortly after we used the brain holes to transmit to Mars Ilium space, you notice that the resolution is relatively poor compared to today's observations of the orbital rings. This is because we were observing from Phobos space. The visuals showed an orbital object similar to the one that had broadcast the message to the Queen Map, but not quite the same. This asteroid was visible as a slowly rotating rock, albeit one with glowing glass towers, domes, and structures. This orbital object was smaller, less than two kilometers in length. Suddenly another object came into the visual range of the recording, a three-kilometer-long metal construct, rather like a long silver wand, clustered about with girders, storage tanks, and fuel cylinders, the column ending in a bulbous, shimmering sphere. Thrusters were firing, but Monmut didn't believe the thing was merely a spacecraft. What the hell is that? asked Orfu after hearing Monmut's description and reading the data. An orbital linear accelerator with a wormhole collector at its snout, said Astig J. Notice that someone or something on the asteroid city has sent mazered commands to this unmanned linear accelerator, overriding countless safety protocols, and is driving it right toward the asteroid. Why? asked Orfu. No one answered. The five Moravex watched, and Orfu listened, as the long, girdered orbital machine continued accelerating until it crashed into the asteroid island. Astig Chai slowed the recording. The glowing towers and domes exploded and flew apart in extreme slow motion. Then the asteroid itself broke up as the wormhole accumulator at the end of the linear accelerator exploded with the force of countless hydrogen bombs. There came a final series of slow-motion, silent explosions, 
as the fuel tanks, thrusters, and main drive engines of the linear accelerator ignited themselves. Now watch, said Suma Four. A second telescopic view, then a radar plot joined the holographic explosions. Monmouth tight-beamed a description of the blaze of thruster tails from throughout the plane of the equatorial orbital ring, as dozens, then hundreds of small spacecraft hurried toward the exploding orbital asteroid. "'What's the scale on those?' asked Orfu. "'They're each about six meters long by three meters wide,' said Cho Li. "'Unmanned,' said Orfu. "'More of X?' More like the servitors the humans used centuries ago, said Astig J. Simple AIs with one purpose, as you will see. Monmouth saw, and he described what he saw to Orfu. The hundreds, then thousands of tiny devices rushing toward the expanding asteroid and accelerated debris field were little more than high-powered lasers, each with a brain and aiming device. The recording fast-forwarded, through the next hours with the servitor lasers scooting through, under and over the debris field, zapping every piece of asteroid or accelerator that posed a serious threat of surviving re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere. The post-humans weren't fools, said Astig Chai, at least when it came to engineering. The mass they accumulated in the two rings they built around Earth, if gathered together, would build a sizable fraction of another Luna, more than a million separate objects, some like the one that hailed us, almost as massive as Phobos. But they had near foolproof failsafes for keeping them in orbit, and a defense in depth if they threatened to fall. These high-boost laser hornets that break up any debris are the last line of that defense. Meteors are still falling on Earth, more than eight standard months later, but there have been no catastrophic impacts. Orbital leukocytes, said Orfu of Io. Precisely, said the prime integrator of the Five Moons Consortium. I understand, Monmouth said at last. You're afraid that if we use the dropship carrying the Dark Lady the way we planned, these little robot leukocytes will scurry out and zap us as well. The mass of the dropship and your submersible combined would be a threat to Earth, agreed Astig Chai. We watched the leukocytes, as Orfu put it, laser to plasma or boost uphill much smaller pieces of the destroyed asteroid. Monmouth shook his metal and plastic head. I don't get it. You've had this recording and this knowledge for more than eight months, yet you hauled the lady and us all this way. What's changed? General Bey bin Adi pointed to something in the rerunning hollow recording of the asteroid breakup. The image zoomed. The computers enhanced the grainy, pixelated image. What? Tight beamed Orfu. Monmouth described the enhanced image. There, in the midst of all the explosions and zap debris, was a small craft with three human figures lying prone in what appeared to be an open cockpit. Only the slight shimmer of a force field showed why the three were not dying in a vacuum. "'What is that thing?' asked Monmouth, after he had described it to Orfu. It was Orfu who answered. "'An ancient flying vehicle used by both old-style humans and post-humans millennia ago. It was called an AFV, all-function vehicle, or sometimes they just called it a Sony. The post-humans used them to shuttle to and from the rings.' The recording sped up, paused, sped up again. Monmouth described to Orfu the image of the Sony twisting and turning as segments of the asteroid exploded, were lasered all around it. The hollow showed the trajectory of the Sony as it entered the atmosphere, spiraled across the center of North America, and landed in a region below one of the Great Lakes. That was one of our destinations, said Astig Chai. He tapped some icons, and telescopic still images appeared of a large human home on a hill. The huge house was surrounded by outbuildings and what looked to be a defensive wooden wall. Human beings, or what appeared to be human beings, were visible near the walls and house. Several dozen could be seen in the still photograph. 
That was one week ago as we began decelerating, said General Bey bin Adi. These were taken yesterday. Same telescopic view, but now the house and wall were in ruins, burned. Corpses were visible scattered across a charred landscape. I don't understand, said Monmouth. It looks as if the humans are being massacred there where the Sony landed eight months ago. Who or what killed them? Bey bin Adi brought up another telescope image, then magnified it. Scores of non-human bipeds were visible between bare branches of trees. The things were a dull silver-gray, essentially headless, with a dark hump. The arms and legs were articulated wrong to be either human or known more of X. What are those? asked Monmouth. Servitors of some kind? Robots? We don't know, said Astig Chai. But these creatures are killing old-style human beings in their small communities all over Earth. Monmouth said, This is terrible, but what does it have to do with cancelling our mission? I understand, said Orfu of Io. The issue is how do you get to the surface to see what's going on? And the question is, why didn't the laser leukocytes fire on the Sony in the first place? It was large enough that it might survive re-entry and pose a threat to those on the ground. Why was it spared? Monmouth thought for several seconds. There were humans on board, he said at last. Or post-humans, said Astig Chai. The resolution isn't fine enough for us to tell which. The leukocytes allow a ship with human or post-human life aboard to pass into the atmosphere, Monmouth said slowly. You've known this for more than eight months. That's why you had me kidnap Odysseus for this mission. Yes, said Summa Four. The human was going down to Earth with us. His human DNA was to be our passkey. But now the voice from the other orbital isle is demanding that we deliver Odysseus to her or it, said Orfu, with a deep rumble that may have signified irony or humor or indigestion. Yes, said Astig Chai. We have no idea if our drop ship and your submersible will be allowed to enter Earth's atmosphere if there is no human life on board. We can always just ignore the invitation from the asteroid city in the polar ring, said Monmouth. Bring Odysseus down to Earth with us, maybe send him back up in the drop ship. He thought another few seconds. No, that won't work. Odds are that the asteroid city will fire on us if the Queen Mab doesn't rendezvous as requested. Yes. It seems a real possibility, said Astig Chai. This imperative to deliver Odysseus to the orbital city and the views of a massacre of humans on Earth by non-human creatures are new factors since we planned your dropship excursion. Too bad Dr. Hockenberry QT'd away on us, said Monmouth. His DNA may have been rebuilt by the Olympian gods or whomever, but it probably would have gotten us through the orbital leukocytes. We have a little less than eleven hours to decide, said Astig Chai. At that point we'll be rendezvousing with the orbital city in the polar ring, and it will be too late to deploy the dropship and submersible. I suggest we reconvene here in two hours and make a final decision. As the two stepped and repellered into the cargo elevator, Orfu of Io set one of his larger manipulator pads on Monmouth's shoulder. Well, Stanley, sent the Ionian, this is another fine mess you've gotten us into. 46. Harmon experienced the attack on Ardis Hall in real time. The Turin cloth experience, seeing, hearing, watching from the eyes of some unseen other, had always been a dramatic but irrelevant entertainment for him before this. Now it was a living hell. Instead of the absurd and seemingly fictional Trojan War, it was an attack on Ardis that Harmon felt, knew, was real, either happening simultaneously to his viewing of it or very recently recorded. Harmon sat under the cloth, lost to the real world, for more than six hours. He watched from the time the Voynix attacked a little after midnight until just before sunrise, when Ardis was ablaze and the Sony flew away to the north after his wounded bleeding, unconscious, beloved Ada had been dragged aboard like a sack of suet. Harmon was surprised to see Pater there at Ardis with the Sony. Where were Hannah and Odysseus? 
and he cried aloud in pain when he watched as Pater was struck by a Voynich's thrown rock and fell to his death. So many of his artist friends, dead or dying, young Pein falling, beautiful M.A., having her arm torn off by a Voynich's, and then burning to death in a ditch with Riemann, Salas dead, Lehman struck down. The weapons Pater had brought from the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu had not turned the tide against the rampaging Voynich's. Harmon moaned under the blood-red Turin cloth. Six hours after he activated the micro-circuit embroidery, the Turin images ended, and Harmon rose and flung the cloth from him. The magus was gone. Harmon went into the small bathing room, used the strange toilet, flushed it with the porcelain handle on the brass chain, splashed water on his face, and then drank prodigiously, gulping handfuls of tap water. He came back out and searched the two-story cable car structure. Prospero! Prospero! His bellow echoed in the metal structure. On the second floor, Harmon threw open the doors to the balcony and stepped out. He jumped to the rungs, indifferent to the long fall beneath him, and climbed quickly to the roof of the moving rising car. The air was freezing. He'd turned away the night, and a cold, gold sun was just rising to his right. The cables stretched away due north, and they were rising. Harmon stood at the edge of the roof and looked straight down, realizing that both the cable car and the Eiffelbahn must have been rising, climbing in altitude for hours. He'd left the jungle and the plains behind in the night and climbed first into foothills and now into real mountains. Prospero! Harmon's shout echoed from the rocks hundreds of feet below. He stood atop the cable car until the sun was two hand spans above the horizon, but no warmth came with the rising sun. Harmon realized he was freezing. The Eiffelbahn was carrying him into a region of ice, rock, and sky. All green and growing things had been left behind. He looked over the edge and saw a huge river of ice. He knew the word from his sigling, glacier, winding like a white serpent between rock and ice peaks. The sunlight blinding from it, the great white mass wrinkled with black fissures and pocked with rocks and boulders it was carrying downhill. Ice fell from the cables above him. The turning wheels took on a new cold hum. Harmon saw that ice had formed on the roof of the rocking car, lined the rungs going down the outside wall, gleamed on the cables themselves. Crawling to the edge, hands aching, body shaking, he made his way carefully down the rung ladder, swung to the ice-encrusted balcony, and staggered into the heated room. There was a fire in the iron fireplace. Prospero stood there, warming his hands. Harmon stood by the ice-latticed door panes for several minutes, shaking as much from rage as from the cold. He resisted the urge to rush the magus. Time was precious. He did not want to wake up on the floor ten minutes from now. Lord Prospero, he said at last, forcing his voice to be sweet with reason, whatever you want me to do, I will agree to do it. And whatever you want me to become, I agree to become, or to try my best to do it. I swear this to you on the life of my unborn child, but please allow me to return to Ardis now. My wife is injured. She may be dying. She needs me. No, said Prospero. Harmon ran at the old man. He would beat the fucking old fool's bald head in with his own walking staff. He would— This time Harmon did not lose consciousness. The high voltage threw him back across the room, bounced him off the strange sofa, sent him falling to his hands and knees on the elaborate carpet. His vision still blinded by red circles, Harmon growled and rose again. Next time I will burn your right leg off, the Magus said in a flat, cold, completely convincing tone. If you ever get home to your woman, you'll do so hopping. Harmon stopped. Tell me what to do, he whispered. Sit down, now, there at the table where you can see outside. Harmon sat at the table. The sunlight was very bright as it reflected from vertical ice walls and the rising glacier. Much of the ice had melted from the glass panes. The mountains were growing taller, 
a profusion of the tallest peaks Harmon had ever seen, much more dramatic than the mountains near the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu. The cable car was following a high ridge line, a glacier dropping farther and farther below to their left. At that moment the car rumbled through another Eiffelbahn tower, and Harmon had to grab the table as the two-story car rocked, bounced, ground against ice, and then continued creaking upward. The tower fell behind. Harmon leaned against the cold glass to watch it recede. This tower was not black like the others, but resplendently silver, gleaming in the sunlight, its iron arches and girders standing out like a spider's web in morning dew. Ice, thought Harmon. He looked the other way to his right, in the direction the cables were climbing and rising, and could see the white face of the most amazing mountain imaginable. No, beyond imagination. Clouds massed to the west of it, piling against a ridge as serrated and merciless-looking as a bone knife. The face they were rising toward was striated with rock, ice, more rock, a summit pyramid of white snow and gleaming ice. The cable car was grinding and slipping on icy cables, following a ridge line to the east of this incredible peak. Harmon could see another tower on a swooping ridge high above, the rising cables connecting this mountain ridge to the higher peak. High above that, on and around the summit of the impossibly tall mountain, rose the most perfect white dome imaginable, its surface tinted a light gold from the morning sun, its central mass surrounded by four white Eiffelbahn towers. The entire complex, set on a white base cantilevered out over the sheer face of the mountain, and connected to surrounding peaks by at least six slender suspension bridges, arching out into space to other peaks, each of the bridges a hundred times higher, slimmer, and more elegant than the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu. What is this place? Armin whispered. Chomo Longma, said Prospero, goddess mother of the world. That building at the top, Rongbuk Bumori Chamalanga Feng Dud Kosi Lotse Nupse Kombu Aga Gatmandir Kan Hotep Rauza, said the Magus. Known locally as the Taj Moira. We'll be stopping there. 47. The Voynix didn't come scuttling up starved rock by the hundreds or thousands that first cold, rainy night demon was there. Nor did they attack on the second night. By the third night, everyone was weak from hunger or seriously sick with colds, flu, incipient pneumonia, or wounds. Demon's left hand ached and throbbed with a sick heat where the Calabani at Paris Crater had bitten off two of his fingers, and he felt lightheaded much of the time. But still the Voynix did not come. Ada had regained consciousness that second day on the rock. Her injuries had been numerous. Cuts, abrasions, a broken right wrist, two broken ribs on her left side. But the only ones that had been life-threatening had been a serious concussion and smoke inhalation. She'd finally awakened with a terrible headache, a rough cough, and hazy memories of the last hours of the artist's massacre. But her mind was clear. Voice flat, she had gone through the list of friends she was not sure she'd dreamt she'd seen die, or actually watched die, only her eyes reacting when Greogi responded with his litany. Peter, she said softly, trying not to cough, dead. Raymond? Dead. Emme? Dead with Raymond. Pain? Dead. A thrown rock crushed her chest, and she died here on starved rock. Salus? Dead. Olo? Dead. And so on for another two score names before Ada sagged back onto the dirty rucksack that was her pillow. Her face was parchment white beneath the streaked soot and blood. Demon was there kneeling, the setabas egg glowing unseen in his own backpack. He cleared his throat. Some important people survived, Ada, he said. Bowman's here. And Carmen. 
Carmen was one of Odysseus' earliest disciples and has sigled everything he could find on military history. Layman lost four fingers on his right hand defending Artis, but he's here and still alive. Lois and Stoneman are here, as well as some of the people I sent on my fax warning expedition. Carl, Oko, Ere, and Edide. Oh, and Tom and Ceres both made it. That's good, said Ada and coughed. Tom and Ceres were Artis's best medics. But none of the medical gear or medicines made it here, said Graugi. What did? asked Ada. Graugi shrugged. Weapons we were carrying, but not enough flechette ammunition. The clothes on our back, a few tarps and blankets we've been huddling under during the last three nights of cold rain. Have you gone back to Artis to bury those who fell? asked Ada. Her voice was steady except for the rasp and cough. Graugi glanced at Demon and then looked away out over the edge of the tall rock summit on which they all huddled. Can't, he said, voice full. We tried. Voynix, wait for us. Ambush. Were you able to get any more stores from Ardis Hall? asked the injured woman. Graugi shook his head. Nothing important. It's gone, Ada. Gone. Ada only nodded. More than two thousand years of her family history and pride burned down and gone forever. She was not thinking of Artis Hall now, but of her surviving people, injured, cold, and stranded on this miserable, starved rock. What have you been doing for food and water? We've caught rainwater on plastic tarps and have been able to zip away on the Sony for some fast hunting, said Graogi, obviously glad to change the subject from those who had died. Mostly rabbits, but we got an elk yesterday evening. We're still picking flechettes out of it. Why haven't the Voynix finished us off? asked Ada. Her voice sounded only mildly curious. Now that, said Demon, is a good question. He had his own theory about it, but it was too early to share it. It's not that they're afraid of us, said Graugi. There must be two or three thousand of the damned things down there in the woods— and we don't have enough flechette ammunition to kill more than a few hundred. They can come up the rock any time they want. They just haven't. You've tried the fax node, said Ada. It wasn't really a question. The Voynix ambushed us there, said Graogi. He squinted up at the blue sky. This was the first sunny day they'd had, and everyone was trying to dry clothes and blankets, laying them out like signal sheets on the flat acre of rock that was the summit of starved rock but it was still a bitter winter, worse than any in artist dweller's memory, and everyone was shivering in the thin sunlight. We've done tests, said Demon. We can stack twelve people in the Sony, twice what it's designed for, but more than that, and the machine's AI refuses to fly, and it handles like a pig with twelve. How many of us did you say made it up here? asked Ada. Only fifty? Fifty-three, said Graugi. Nine of those, including you, until this morning, were too sick or injured to travel. Eight now, Ada said firmly. That would be five trips on the Sony to evacuate everyone, assuming that the Voynix don't attack as soon as we start the evacuation, and also assuming we had somewhere to go. Yes, assuming we had somewhere to go, said Graogi. When Ada had fallen asleep again, sleep, Tom assured them, not the semi-coma she'd been in, Demon took his own rucksack, carrying it gingerly away from his body, and walked to the edge of Starved Rock's summit. He could see the Voynix down there, their leathery humps and headless, silvery bodies moving between the trees. Occasionally a group of them would move, seemingly with purpose, across the broad meadow on the south side of Starved Rock. None of them looked up. Graogi Bowman and the dark-haired woman, Edide, came over to see what he was doing. Thinking of jumping? asked Bowman. No, said Demon, but I'm curious about whether you have any rope up here, enough to lower me to just out of reach of the Voynix. We have about a hundred feet of rope, said Graogi, but that leaves you seventy or eighty feet above the bastards. Not that that would slow them down if they want to scramble up and grab you. Why the hell do you want to go down among them? Demon squatted, set the rucksack on the rock, and pulled the Setabas egg out. The others squatted to stare at it. Even before they could ask, Demon told them where he'd gotten it. 
Why? asked Edidier. Demon had to shrug at that. It was one of those it seemed like a good idea at the time things. I always end up paying for those, said the small dark-haired woman. Demon thought that she might have seen four twenties. It was hard to tell because of the firmary rejuvenations, of course, but older old-style humans tended to have a greater sense of confidence than the younger ones. Demon lodged the glowing, slightly pulsing silver-white egg in a crevice in the rock so that it wouldn't roll away, and said, Touch it. Bowman tried first. He set his palm flat on the curved shell as if welcoming the warmth they could all feel flowing from it, but the blonde man pulled his hand away quickly, as if he'd been shocked or nipped. What the hell? Yeah, said Demon. I feel it too when I touch it. It's like the thing sucks some energy out of you. Is pulling something out of your heart or soul. Grayogi and Adide tried touching it. They both pulled their hands away quickly and then moved farther from it. Destroy it, said Adide. What if Setabas comes looking for it, said Grayogi. Mothers do that, you know, when you steal their eggs. They take it personally, especially when the mother is a monster-sized brain with yellow eyes and dozens of hands. I thought of that, said Demon. He fell silent. Aunt, said Adide. Even in the few months he'd known her at Ardis Hall, she'd always seemed like a practical, competent person. It was one of the reasons he'd chosen her as part of his Fax to 300 Nodes warning expedition. Do you want me to destroy it? she asked, standing and pulling on leather gloves. We'll see how far I can hurl the damned thing and whether I can hit a Voynix. Demon chewed his lip. We damned sure don't want it hatching up here on the top of Starved Rock, said Bowman. The man actually had his crossbow out and was aiming it at the milky egg. Even a little set of us thing from your description of what the mummy-daddy thing did at Paris Crater might kill us all up here. Wait, said Demon, it hasn't hatched yet. The cold may not be enough to kill it here to make it non-viable, but it may be slowing its gestation or whatever the hell you call the hatching period with a monster's egg. I want to try something with it before we destroy it. They used the Sony. Grayogi drove. Bowman and Adide knelt in the rear niches, flechette rifles ready. The force field was off. Voynix stirred in the shadows under the trees at the far end of the meadow, less than a hundred yards away. They hovered a hundred feet above the meadow, out of Voynix's leaping range. Are you sure? said Grayogi. They're faster than we are. Not quite sure that he could speak properly, Demon nodded. The Sony swooped down, Demon jumped out, the Sony went up vertically like a silver disc elevator. Demon had a fully loaded flechette rifle hitched over his shoulder, but it was the rucksack he removed, sliding the Setabas egg part of the way out, taking care not to touch it with his bare hands. Even in the bright sunlight, the thing glowed like radioactive milk. As if offering them a gift, Demon began walking toward the Voynix at the far end of the meadow. The things were obviously watching him via the infrared sensors in their metallic chests. Several of them pivoted to keep him centered in their sensor range. More Voynix moved out of the forest shadows to stand at the edge of the meadow. Demon glanced up, seeing the Sony sixty feet above him, seeing Bowman's and Adide's flechette rifles raised and ready, but also knowing that a Voynix running moved at more than sixty miles per hour. The things could be on him before the Sony could drop and hover, and if there were enough of the creatures in the charge, no amount of covering fire would save him. Demon walked on with the glowing Setabas egg half out of his rucksack, like some twenty present, peeking out of its gift wrapping. Once the egg shifted, Demon was so shocked at the internal movement and brighter glow that he almost dropped the thing but hung on through the torn and dirty fabric of his rucksack. But after fumbling for a minute, he continued walking. He was close enough to the mast of Oynix now that he could almost smell the old leather and rust stench of the things. Damon was ashamed to realize that his legs and arms were shaking slightly. I just wasn't smart enough to think of another way, he thought. But there wasn't another way not with the serious condition that so many of the artist's survivors were in, not with starvation and dehydration looming. 
He was less than fifty feet from the cluster of thirty or more Voiniks now. Demon lifted the Setabas egg like a talisman and walked straight toward them. At thirty feet, the Voiniks began to fade back into the forest. Demon picked up his pace, almost running now. Voiniks on all sides were moving away. Afraid that he might stumble and smash the egg, he had the sickening mental image of the egg splitting and a small Setabas brain scuttling out on its dozens of baby hands and stalks. Then the thing leaping for his face, he still forced himself to run toward the retreating Voiniks. The Voiniks dropped to all fours and loped away, hundreds of them fleeing out in all directions, like frightened grazers fleeing predators on some prehistoric plain. And Demon ran until he could run no more. He dropped to his knees, hugging the rucksack to his chest, feeling the Setabos eggs stirring and shifting, feeling energy flowing from him toward the evil thing until he pushed it away from himself, setting it on the ground like the toxic thing it was. Grayogi landed the Sony. My God, said the bald pilot, my God. Demon nodded. Take me back to the base of Starved Rock. I'll wait there with the egg while you ferry down those who can walk the mile or so to the Faxnode Pavilion. I'll lead that procession. You can load the weak and wounded and follow us by air. What? began Adide and fell silent. She shook her head. Yeah, said Demon. I remembered the bodies of the Voiniks frozen in the blue ice at Paris Crater. They had all been frozen in the act of running away from Setabas. He sat on the edge of the Sony, the rucksack on his lap, as they floated back to Starved Rock, a comfortable six feet above the ground. There were no Voiniks in the trees or meadows. "'Where are we going to fax to?' asked Bowman. "'I don't know,' said Demon. He felt very tired. "'I'll figure that out as we walk there down the road from Ardis. Forty-eight. You'll need a therm skin, said Prospero. Why? Harmon's voice was distracted. He was staring out the glass doors at the beautiful triple dome and marble arches of the Taj Moira. The cable car house had clicked into place in the southeast Eiffelbahn Tower. One of four sat at the corners of the giant square of cantilevered marble that held this magnificent building above the summit of Chomolungma. Harman had estimated the Eiffelbahn Tower to be about one thousand feet tall, and the apex of the onion-domed white building was half again taller. The altitude here is eight thousand eight hundred forty-eight meters, said the Magus, more vacuum than air. The temperature out there in the sunlight is thirty degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That gentle breeze is blowing at fifty knots. There's a blue therm skin in the wardrobe next to the bed. Go up and put it on. You'll need your outer clothes and boots. Call down when you have your osmosis mask in place. I need to lower the pressure in the car here before we open the mezzanine door. They took the elevator down from the thousand-foot level platform. Harmon looked at the tower struts, arches, and girders as they passed them on the way down and had to smile. The secret of the whiteness of this tower was as prosaic as white paint over the same dark iron and steel as the other Eiffelbahn structures. He could feel the elevator and the entire tower shaking to the howling winds, and realized that the paint must be scoured away in months or weeks here, rather than years. He tried to imagine the kind of painting crew that would be always at work up here, then gave it up as a silly effort. He was obeying the Magus now because it got him out of the prison of the cable car. Somehow, here in this insane temple or palace or tomb or whatever it was on this insanely tall mountain, he would find a way back to Ada. If Ariel could fax without fax node pavilions, so could he. Somehow. Harmon followed Prospero from the elevator at the base of the tower across the wide expanse of red sandstone and white marble leading to the front door of the domed building. The wind threatened to blow him off his feet, but for some reason there was no ice on the exposed sandstone and marble. Don't Maguses feel the cold or need air? he shouted at the old man in the trailing blue robe. Not in the least, said the Magus. The jet stream strong wind was blowing his robe to one side, 
and sending his fringe of long, gray hair trailing sideways from his mostly bald skull. One of the perquisites of old age, he cried over the wind howl. Harmon veered to his right, arms extended for balance against the wind, and walked toward the low marble railing, not more than two feet high, that ran around the huge square of sandstone and marble like a low bench around a skating rink. Where are you going? called Prospero. Be careful there. Harmon reached the edge and looked over. Later, studying maps, Harmon realized that he must have been looking north from this mountain called Chomolungma, or Chamalangma Fang, or Komolangma Fang, or Hotepma Chinikaurauza, or Everest, depending upon the age and origin of the map, and that when he stood at the railing he was staring out for hundreds of miles, and six miles straight down into lands that had once been called Khan's Ninth Kingdom, or Tibet, or China. It was the down part that struck Harmon viscerally. The Taj Moira was essentially a sandstone marble city block stuck on the summit of the goddess mother of the world, like a tray embedded on a sharp stone, like a piece of paper slammed down onto a spike. As an engineering feat, the bucky carbon cantilevering was impressive to the point of impossibility, a godchild's form of showing off. Harmon stood by the two-foot-high, ten-inch-wide marble railing and stared straight down for more than twenty-nine thousand feet with the full force of the jet stream at his back, trying to shove him off into the endless, empty air. Later, maps would tell him that he had been looking at other mountains with names, on the east and west Rongbuk glaciers with the brown plains of China far beyond toward the curve of the earth. But none of that mattered now. Shoved by the strong arms of the howling wind, windmilling his arms to keep his balance, Harmon was looking six miles straight down from an overhang. He dropped to his hands and knees and began crawling back toward the temple tomb and the waiting magus. Thirty feet in front of the huge doorway, a small, sharp boulder no more than five feet tall rose from the marble squares, ending in a thirty-inch pyramid of ice. With Prospero watching, arms crossed and a small smile on his face, Harmon wrapped his arms around the decorative boulder and used its imperfections to pull himself back to his feet. He continued to lean on the boulder, arms wrapped around it, his chin resting on the icy point, afraid that if he looked back over his shoulder at the distant low wall and vertiginous drop, the urge to run toward that wall and leap would be overpowering. He closed his eyes. "'Are you going to stay there all day?' asked the Magus. "'I might,' said Harmon, eyes still closed. After another minute, he shouted over the rising wind, "'What is this rock, anyway? Some sort of symbol, a monument?' "'It's the summit of Chumolungma.' said Prospero. The Magus turned and walked into the open, elegantly arched entrance of the structure he'd called Rongbuk Pumori Chama Langma Feng Dud Kozi Lutse Nupse Kumbu Aga Gatmandir Kanhotep Rausa. Harman saw that a semi-permeable membrane was guarding that entrance. It had rippled as the Magus passed through another sign that Harmon wasn't dealing with just a hologram this time. Several minutes later, still hugging his boulder summit, the eyepieces and osmosis mask of his thermskin hood almost completely frosted over because of the pelting snow squalls that struck his body like icy missiles, Harmon considered the fact that it was probably warm inside that building, warm beyond that semi-permeable force field. He did not crawl the last thirty feet to the door, but he walked hunched over, face lowered, palms down and extended, ready to crawl. Inside the single huge room under the dome, marble steps rose to a series of mezzanines, each in turn connected to the next mezzanine by another marble staircase that lined the interior of the inward curving dome for a hundred levels, a hundred stories until mist and distance above obscured the apex of the dome itself. What had appeared like tiny apertures in the dome from the cable car during the approach 
and from the Eiffelbahn Tower, hardly more than decorative elements in the white marble, now proved to be hundreds of perspex windows that sent shafts of light down to illuminate the rich bound books with slowly moving squares and rectangles and trapezoids of brightness. How long do you think it would take you to sigil all that? asked Prospero, leaning on his staff and turning in a circle to take in the many mezzanines of books. Harmon opened his mouth to speak and then shut it. Weeks? Months? Even moving from book to book, just setting his palm in place long enough to see the golden words move down his fingers and arms. It might take years to sigil this library. Finally, he said, you told me that the functions didn't work in and around the Eiffelbahn. Have the rules changed? We shall see, said the Magus. He moved deeper into the dome, his staff tapping the white marble and the sound echoing up and around the acoustically perfect dome. Harmon realized that it was warm in this place. He pulled back the thermskin hood and gloves. The interior of the domed building was broken into discrete spaces, if not actual rooms, by a maze of white marble screens that rose only eight feet high and were not a complete barrier to sight because of their lattice-worked, filigreed construction and countless elegant oval, heart- and leaf-shaped openings. Harmon noticed that the walls around the base of the dome up to a height of forty feet or so, where the first mezzanine began, were completely covered with carved designs of flowers, vines, elaborate and impossible plants, all brightened by the presence of inlaid jewels. So were the marble screens. Harmon set his hand against one of the marble partitions as Prospero led the way through the maze, and it was a real maze, and he realized that anywhere he could set his hand, it would cover two or three of the designs at once that there would always be several precious stones under his fingers. Some of the flower designs were less than an inch square and looked to contain fifty or sixty tiny inlays. What are these rocks? asked Harmon. His people had enjoyed wearing precious stones for decoration, baubles always fetched by the robotic servitors, but he'd never wondered where they came from. These rocks, said Prospero, include agate, jasper, lapis lazuli, bloodstone, and cornelians. There are more than thirty-five varieties of cornelian in this simple little carnation leaf where I set my hand on this screen, do you see? Harmon saw. The place made him dizzy. Trapezoids of light moving on the west wall below the books made the marble sparkle, gleam, and shimmer from the thousands of precious stones inlaid there. What is this place? asked Harmon. He realized that he was whispering. It was built as a mausoleum, a tomb, said the Magus, sweeping around another junction of white marble screens and leading the way to the center of the great place as if the maze had yellow arrows painted on the floor. They stopped before an arched entrance to an inner rectangle at the center of the maze of hundreds of screens. Can you read this stele? Harmon of Ardis. Harmon peered at it in the milky light. The letters in the marble were carved strangely. They were squirrely and elaborate rather than the straight lines he was used to from books, but it was written in standard world English. Read it aloud, said the Magus. Enter with awe the illustrious sepulchre of Khanhotep, Lord of Asia and Protector of Earth, and his bride and beloved, Leas Lo Amumja, adored by all the world. She left this transient world on the fourteenth night of the month of Rahab Septem in the year of the Khanate 987. She and her lord dwell now in the starry heaven and watch over you who enter here. What do you think? asked Prospero standing under the elaborate arch where the center of the maze opened to the yet unseen interior. Of the inscription or this place? Both, said the Magus. Harmon rubbed his chin and cheek, feeling the stubble there. This place is... wrong. Too big, too rich, out of scale, except for the books. 
Prospero laughed, and the noise echoed and then re-echoed. I agree with you, Harmon of Artists. This place was stolen. The idea, the design, the inlays, the chessboard design of the courtyard outside, everything stolen except for the mezzanines and books, which were placed there six hundred years later by Rajah Ha the Silent, a distant descendant of the feared Khan Hotep. The Khan had the original Taj Mahal design enlarged by a factor of more than ten. That original building was beautiful, a true testament to love. Nothing remains of that structure because the Khan had it slagged, wanting only this mausoleum to be remembered. This place is a memorial to wretched excess more than anything else. The location is interesting, Harmon said softly. Yes, said Prospero, pulling up his blue sleeves. That bit of wisdom is as true about real estate today as it was in Odysseus' day. Location, location, location. Come. They walked into the center of the marble screen maze, an empty patch of marble perhaps a hundred yards square with what looked to Harmon to be a bright reflecting pool in the center. Prospero's walking staff made echoing taps as they walked slowly to the center. It was no reflecting pool. Jesus Christ, cried Harmon, stepping back from the edge. It seemed to be empty air. To the left, just visible, was the vertical north face of the mountain, but beneath them, perhaps forty feet beneath the level of the floor, a steel and crystal sarcophagus seemed to be floating in midair, high over the jagged glacier six miles below. Inside the sarcophagus lay a naked woman, a narrow white marble spiral staircase snaked down to the level of the sarcophagus, the last step appearing to hang out over that empty air. It can't be open, thought Harmon. There was no blast of the jet stream, no roaring of high-altitude wind up and through the opening in the floor. The sarcophagus had to be resting on something. By squinting, he could make out facets, a multitude of nearly invisible geodesics. The burial chamber was made up of some incredibly transparent plastic or crystal or glass. But why hadn't he seen this sarcophagus and stairway during their ascent in the cable car, or— The burial vault is invisible from the outside, Prospero said softly. Have you looked at the woman yet? The beloved Lias Lo Amumja, said Harmon, not all that interested in staring at a naked corpse, who left this transient world on whenever the hell it was. And where's the Khan? Does he get his own crystal chamber? Prospero laughed. Khan Hotep and his beloved Lias Lo Amumja, daughter of Cesar Amumja of the Central African Empire. She was a stone bitch and a harpy, Harmon of artists. Trust me on this were dumped overboard less than two centuries after they were entombed here. Dumped overboard, said Harmon. Perfectly preserved bodies unceremoniously dumped over the same wall you peered over thirty minutes ago, said Prospero. Tossed overboard like yesterday's garbage from a tramp steamer. Successors to the Khan, each one more minor in his or her own way, liked to be buried here for all eternity that eternity lasting until the next Khan successor wanted the best possible mausoleum space. Harmon could picture it. That is, until fourteen hundred years ago, said Prospero, returning his blue-eyed gaze to the glass and wood sarcophagus four stories below them. This woman was truly the beloved of someone in power, and she has rested here for fourteen centuries undisturbed. Look at her, Harmon of Artis. Harmon had been looking in the general direction of the sarcophagus, but trying not to stare at the body. The woman was too naked for his tastes. She looked too young to be dead. Her body was still pink and pale. Her breasts were too visible. Nipples looking rosy even from forty feet away. The short hair on her head, one comma of black against white satin pillows. The rich triangle of hair at her groin, another black comma. Her dark eyebrows, strong features, broad mouth even from this distance, almost familiar. 
Jesus Christ, cried Harmon for the second time that morning. But this time loud enough that his shout echoed from the dome and bounced back from the mezzanines of books and white marble. She was younger, much younger, hair black rather than gray, body firm and young rather than pulled into tired lines and folds by long centuries, as Harmon had seen with the skin-tight therm skin. But her face had the same strength, the cheekbones the same sharpness, the eyebrows the same bold slash, the chin the same firm set. There was no doubt. It was Savi. Forty-nine. So where is everyone, asks fleet-footed Achilles, son of Peleus, as he follows Hephaestus across the grassy summit of Olympus. The blonde man-killer and Hephaestus, god of fire and chief artificer to all the gods, are walking along the shore of Caldera Lake, between the Hall of the Healer and the Great Hall of the Gods. The other white-pillared god homes seem dark and deserted. There are no chariots in the sky. There are no immortals walking the many paved walkways, illuminated by low, yellow glowing lamps that Achilles notices are not torches. I told you, says Hephaestus. With the cat away, the mice are playing. Almost all of them are down on the Ilium Earth to be players in the last act of your petty little Trojan War. How does the war proceed? asks Achilles. Without you there to kill Hector, your Myrmidons and all the other Achaeans and Argives and whatever you want to call them are getting their asses kicked by the Trojans. Agamemnon and his people are retreating, asks Achilles. Aye, the last time I looked, only a few hours ago, just before I made the mistake of checking out the damage to my crystal escalator and getting into a wrestling match with you, I saw in the hollow pool in the Great Hall that Agamemnon's attack on the city walls had failed, yet again, and the Achaeans were falling back to their defensive trenches near the black ships. Hector was about to lead his army outside the walls, ready to take the offensive again. Essentially, it came down to which of us immortals were tougher than the others in a serious fight. It turns out that even with tough bitches like Hera and Athena fighting for Ilium, and Poseidon shaking the earth for the city, which is his thing, you know, shaking the earth, the pro-Greek team of Apollo, Ares, and that sneaky Aphrodite and her friend Demeter are carrying the day. As a general, Agamemnon sucks. Achilles only nods. His fate now is with Penthesilea, not with Agamemnon and his armies. Achilles trusts his Myrmidons to do the right thing, to flee if they can, to fight and die if they must. Ever since Athena or Aphrodite disguised as Athena, if the goddess of wisdom had told him the truth several days earlier, murdered his beloved Patroclus, Achilles' bloodlust has focused only on vengeance against the gods. Now, even though he knows it is just the result of Aphrodite's perfumed magic, he has two goals, to bring his beloved Penthesilea back to life and to kill the bitch Aphrodite. Without being aware that he is doing so, Achilles adjusts the god-killing dagger in his belt. If Athena was telling the truth about the blade, and Achilles believed her, this bit of quantum-shifted steel will be the death of Aphrodite and any other immortals who get in his way, including this crippled god of fire, Hephaestus, if he tries to flee or block Achilles' will. Hephaestus leads Achilles to a parking area outside the great hall of the gods, where more than a score of golden chariots are lined up on the grass, metal umbilical cords, snaking into some underground charging reservoir. Hephaestus climbs into one of the horseless cars and beckons Achilles aboard. Achilles hesitates. Where are we going? I told you, to visit the one immortal who might know where Zeus is right now, says the artificer. Why don't we just look for Zeus directly, asks Achilles, still not stepping into the chariot. He has driven or been driven in a thousand chariots, but he has never flown in one the way he frequently sees the gods flitting to and fro above Ilium or Olympus. And while the idea does not actively frighten him, he's in no hurry to leave the ground. There is a technology known only to Zeus, says Hephaestus, which can hide him from all of my sensors and spy devices. It's obviously been activated, 
although I guess by his wife Hera rather than by the god of gods himself. Who is this other immortal who can show us where Zeus hides? Achilles is distracted by the howling sandstorm and wild flashes of lightning and static discharge a few hundred yards above them as the planetary storm throws itself against Zeus's Olympus girding Aegis force field. Nix, says Hephaestus. Night, repeats Achilles. The fleet-footed man-killer knows the goddess's name, the daughter of Chaos, one of the first sentient creatures to emerge from the void that was there at the beginning of time before the original gods themselves helped separate the darkness of Erebus from the blue and green Gaia order of Earth. But no Greek or Asian or African city he knew of worshipped the mysterious Nyx Knight. Legend and myth said that Nyx, alone without an immortal male to impregnate her, had given birth to Aris, Discord. The Moirai, Fates. Hypnos, Sleep. Nemesis, Retribution. Thanatos, Death. And the Hesperides. I thought night was a personification, adds Achilles, or just an ox-card load of bullshit. Hephaestus smiles. Even a personification or load of bullshit takes on physical form in this brave new world the post-humans, Sycorax and Prospero, helped make for us, he says. Are you coming? Or shall I QT back to my laboratory and enjoy the uh, pleasures of your sleeping Penthesilea while you dither up here? You know, I'll find you and kill you if you do that, says Achilles, with no threat in his voice, only cool promise. Yes, I do, agrees Hephaestus, which is why I'll ask you one last time. Are you going to get aboard this fucking chariot or not? They fly southeast, halfway around the great sphere of Mars. Although Achilles does not know that it is Mars he is staring at, nor that it is a sphere. But he knows that the steep ascent above Olympus Caldera Lake and the violent penetration of the Aegis into the howling dust storm behind the four horses that had appeared out of nowhere at takeoff, and then the ride through the blinding dust storm and high winds themselves, is not something he would choose to do again soon. Achilles hangs on to the wood and bronze rim of the chariot and works hard not to close his eyes. Luckily, there is some field of energy around the chariot car itself, some minor form of the aegis or variation on the invisible body shields the gods use in combat, Achilles assumes, that protects the two of them from the hurling sand and blasting winds. Then they are above the dust storm, black night sky above them and the stars shining brilliantly, two small moons visibly hurtling across the sky, by the time the chariot crosses the line of three huge volcanoes, they have passed south of the worst of the dust storm, and features are visible far below them in the reflected starlight. Achilles knows that the god's home on Olympus inhabits its own odd world, of course. He has been fighting on the red plain between what his Moravec allies had called the brain hole for eight months, watching the tepid, tideless waves wash in from some northern sea that was not any of Earth's. But he's never before considered that the Olympians' world might be so large. They fly high above an endless, broad, flooded canyon, and darkness is broken only by reflected starlight on water and a few moving lanterns, leagues below, that Hephaestus says are running lights on the little green men's quarry barges. Achilles sees no reason to ask the cripple to elaborate on that cryptic description. They fly above treeless and then forested mountain ranges and countless circular depressions, craters the god of fire calls them, some eroded or forested, many showing central lakes, but most obviously sharp and severe in the moonlight and starlight. They fly higher until the whistle of air around the chariot's mini aegis dies away, and Achilles is breathing a pure air emitted from the chariot car itself. The oxygen content is so high that he feels a little drunk. Hephaestus names some of the rocky mountainous or valleyed features unrolling far beneath them in the night. Achilles thinks the crippled god sounds like a bored bargeman 
announcing stops along a river's way. Shabatana Vallis, says the immortal. And then some minutes later, Margarita for Terra. Meridiania Planum. Terra Sabia. That heavily forested area to the north is Schiaparelli. The foothills dead ahead are called Huygens. We're swinging south now. The chariot car flying behind the four straining, slightly transparent horses does not swing south, it banks south. And Achilles hangs on for dear life, even though the floor of the car always impossibly seems to be down. What's that? asks Achilles a few minutes later. A huge circular lake has appeared, filling much of the southern horizon. The chariot is descending, and while there is no dust storm here, the air still howls. Hallis Basin, grunts the god of fire. It's more than 1,400 miles across, and it has a bigger diameter than Pluto. Pluto, says Achilles. It's a fucking planet, you stupid hick preliterate, growls Hephaestus. Achilles releases his death grip on the chariot rim, freeing his hands for action. He thinks he will pick the crippled god up, snap his back over his knee, and fling him down from the chariot. But then Achilles glances over the side of the car at the mountain peaks and black valleys still many leagues below, and decides he'll let the gimpy dwarf land the vehicle first. The lake looms ahead of them, filling the entire south. Then they cross the arcing northern shoreline and begin descending over starlit water. Achilles realizes that what had seemed like a circular lake from just a few miles higher is really a small round ocean. It varies from two miles deep to more than four, says Hephaestus, as if Achilles had asked or cared. Those two huge rivers flowing in from the east are called Dao and Harmachus. Our original plan was to put a couple of million old-style humans in the fertile valleys there. Just let them fucking go forth and be fertile and multiply. But we never got around to turning the beam this way and defaxing them. Actually, Zeus and the other Pantheon originals just forgot everything before they were gods. It seemed like a dream to all of us. Besides, Zeus was busy overthrowing his parents, the Titan first-generation immortals, Kronos and his sister-bride Rhea and casting them down into the brain-reached world called Tartarus. Hephaestus clears his throat and begins to recite in a minstrel's voice that sounds to Achilles like someone sawing a lyre in half with a rusty blade. A dreadful sound troubled the boundless sea. The whole earth uttered a great cry. Wide heaven shaken groaned. From its foundation far Olympus reeled beneath the onrush of the deathless gods, and trembling seized upon black Tartarus. Achilles can see only dark water to the right and left of them now, water hurtling by beneath at an impossible speed, the cliff-walled edges of the circular lake gone below the rim of the horizons. To the south a single craggy island appears. Zeus only won the war, continues Hephaestus, because he went back to the post-human brain-punching machines in orbit around the original Earth, the real Earth, I mean, not yours, not this fucking terraformed counterfeit, and brought in Setebos and his egg-born ilk to fight Kronos legions. The hundred-handed monsters with their energy weapons and their hunger for eating terror out of the dirt won the day although they were tough as shit stains to get rid of once the war was over. Also, one of the Titans' fucking kids, Iapetus boy Prometheus, turned double agent. And then there was that lab-built, hundred-headed clone monster named Typhon that came through the brain hole in the 424th year of the war. Now that was something to see. I remember the day when... Are we there yet? interrupts Achilles. The island, Hephaestus drones on as they continued descending, is more than eighty of Achilles' leagues across, and is filled with monsters. Monsters, says Achilles. He has little interest in such things. He wants to know where Zeus is, and he wants Zeus to tell the healer to open the rejuvenation tanks, and he wants the Amazon queen Penthesilea alive again. Everything else is beside the point. 
Monsters, repeats the god of fire. The first children of Gaia and Uranus are misshapen fiends, but very powerful. Zeus allowed them to live on here rather than joining Kronos and Rhea in the Tartarus dimension. There are three set of oceans among them. This fact holds no interest for Achilles. He watches the island grow ahead of them and notices the huge dark castle on the crags at its center. The few windows in the upright slags of stone glow orange, as if the interior is on fire. The island also holds the last of the Cyclopes, drones on Hephaestus, and the Arrhenes. Those furies are here, says Achilles. I thought they were a myth as well. No, no myth. The crippled immortal banks the chariot around and lines up the horses' heads with a flat, open space above a black rock shelf at the base of the central castle. Dark clouds twist and writhe around the mountain and its keep. The valleys on either side are filled with furtive movement. When they are released from this place, they will spend the rest of eternity pursuing and punishing sinners. They are truly those who walk in darkness, with writhing snakes for hair and red eyes that weep tears of blood. Bring them on, says the son of Peleus. The chariot lands gently at the base of a gigantic sculpture set on a great ledge made of black stone. The chariot's wooden wheels creak and the horses flick out of existence. The strange glowing panel that the artificer had been using to control the craft disappears. Come, says Hephaestus, and leads Achilles toward the broad, seemingly endless stairway on the other side of the statue. The immortal drags his bad foot along on stone. Achilles cannot help but look up at the sculpture, three hundred feet high at least, a powerful man holding the double sphere of earth and heaven on his powerful shoulders. This is a sculpture of Iapetus, says Achilles. Now, growls the god of fire, it's old Atlas himself, frozen here forever. The four hundredth step is the last. The black castle rises above, its towers and turrets and hidden gables lost in the roiling cloud. The two doors ahead of them are each fifty feet high and fifty feet apart from each other. Nix and Hammer are past each other here every day, night and day, whispers Hephaestus. One going out, one coming in. They are never in the house at the same time. Achilles glances up at the black clouds and starless sky. Then we've come at the wrong time. I have no business with Hemera. You said it was night with whom we need to speak. Patient son of Peleus, grumbles Hephaestus. The god seems nervous. He glances at a small but bulky machine on his wrist. Eos rises. Now. Around the eastern rim of the black island grows an orange glow. It fades. No sunlight penetrates this island's polarized aegis, whispers Hephaestus. But it's almost morning beyond. The sun will be rising over the Dow and Harmachis rivers and the eastern cliffs of Hellas Basin within seconds. A sudden flash blinds Achilles. He hears one of the gigantic iron doors slam shut, then the other one creak open. When he can see again, the second door is closed, and night stands in front of them. Always in awe of Athena, Hera, and the other goddesses, this is the first time that Achilles, son of Peleus, and the sea goddess Thetis, finds himself in terror of an immortal. Hephaestus has gone to both knees and lowered his head in respect and fear for the terrible apparition facing them, but Achilles forces himself to remain standing. Yet he has to fight an overwhelming urge to unstrap the shield from his back and cower behind it, his short god-killing blade in his hand. Torn between fleeing or fighting, he lowers his face in deference as a compromise. While the gods can assume almost any size, Achilles knows nothing of the law of conservation of mass and energy and would not understand the explanation of how the immortals get around this law. Gods and goddesses seem most comfortable at around nine feet tall, tall enough to make mortals feel like children, not so tall that they have to reinforce leg bones or become too awkward even in their own Olympian halls. Night, Nix is fifteen feet tall, wrapped in a roiling, vaporous cloud, dressed in what seems like multiple layers of diaphanous black cloth, strips hanging down in scores of lengths, 
with either a black headdress that includes a veil over her face, or perhaps a face that looks like a molded black veil. Impossibly, her black eyes are perfectly visible through the black veil and vaporous clouds. Before averting his face, Achilles saw that she was incredibly large-breasted, as if she would suckle all the world to darkness. Only her hands glow pale, long-fingered and powerful, as if the fingers are made of solidified moonlight. Achilles realizes that Hephaestus is speaking, almost chanting, Fumigation with torches, Nyx, parent goddess, source of sweet repose from woes, mother from whom gods and men arose, here blessed Nyx decked with starry light, in sleep's sweet silence dwelling ebon night. Dreams and soft ease attend thy dusky train, pleased with lengthened gloom and feastful strain, dissolving anxious care, the friend of mirth with darkling speed riding round the earth, goddess of phantoms and of shadowy play. Enough, says Knight. If I want to hear an Orphic hymn, I'll travel through time. How dare you, god of fire, bring a mere mortal to Hellas and the night-shrouded home of Nyx? Achilles shivers at the sound of the goddess's voice. It is the sound of a violent winter sea crashing on rocks, but understandable nonetheless. Goddess whose natural power divides the natural day, Hephaestus grovels, still on his knees, still bowing. This mortal is the son of immortal Thetis, and is a demigod in his own right on his particular earth. He is called Achilles, son of Peleus, and his prowess. Oh, I know Achilles, son of Peleus, and his prowess. Sacker of cities, raper of women, and killer of men, says Knight in her wave-crashing tones. What possible reason could compel you to bring this foot-soldier to my black door, Artificer? Achilles decides it is time he spoke. I need to see Zeus, goddess. The dark wraith turns more in his direction. It is as if she is floating, not standing, and the large and huge-breasted form swivels without friction. Her veiled face, or face with the meshed face of a black veil, peers down at him with eyes that are blacker than black. The clouds roil and broil around her. You need to see the Lord of Thunder, the God of all gods, the Pelasgian Zeus, Lord of ten thousand temples and Dodona's shrine, Father of all gods and men, Zeus the ultimate king who marshals the storm clouds and who gives all commands? Yeah, says Achilles. What about, asks Nix. It is Hephaestus who speaks up. Achilles seeks to bring a mortal to the healer's tanks, mother of the first black germless egg. He wants to ask Father Zeus to command the healer to bring back to life the Amazon Queen Penthesilea. Night laughs. If her voice had been a wild sea crashing against rocks, Achilles thinks her laugh sounds like a winter wind howling off the Aegean. Penthesilea, says the black-garbed goddess, still chuckling. That brainless, blonde, big-boobed lesbian tart? Why on a million earths would you want to bring that muscle-bound bimbo back to life, son of Peleus? After all, it was you I watched run her and her horse through with your father's great lance, skewering them both like peppers on a kebab. I have no choice, rumbles Achilles. I love her. Knight laughs again. You love her? This from the Achilles who beds slave girls and conquered princesses? and captured queens as indifferently as others eat olives, only to cast them away like spit-out pits? You love her? It's Aphrodite's pheromone perfume, says Hephaestus, still on his knees. Knight quits laughing. Which type, she asks. Number nine, grumbles Hephaestus. Puck's potion. The type with the self-duplicating nanomachines in the bloodstream constantly reproducing more dependency molecules and depriving the brain of endorphins and serotonin if the victim doesn't act on his infatuation. There is no antidote. Knight turns her sculpted veil face toward Achilles. I think that you are well and truly fornicated, son of Peleus. 
Zeus will never agree to rejuvenate a mortal, much less an Amazon, a race he thinks of rarely and thinks precious little of when they do come to his mind. The father of all gods and all men has little use for Amazons and less use for virgins. He would see a resurrection of such a mortal as a desecration of the healer's tanks and skills. I will ask him nonetheless, Achilles says stubbornly. Night regards him in silence. Then the big-bosomed, ebony-ragged apparition turns toward Hephaestus, who is still on his knees. Crippled god of fire, busy artificer to more noble gods, what do you see when you look upon this mortal man? A fucking fool, grunts Hephaestus. I see a quantum singularity, says the goddess Nyx. A black hole of probability, a myriad of equations all with the same single three-point solution. Why is that, Artificer? The god of fire grunts again. His mother, Thetis of the seaweed-tangled breasts, held this arrogant mortal in the celestial quantum fire when he was a pup, little more than a larva. The probability of his death, day, hour, minute, and method, is one hundred percent, and because it cannot be changed, it seems to give Achilles a sort of invulnerability to all other attacks and injury. Yes, hisses shrouded knight, son of Hera, husband of that brainless grace known as Aglaia the Glorious. Why are you helping this man? Hephaestus bows lower on the step. At first he bested me in a wrestling match, beloved goddess of dreadful shade. Then I continued helping him because his interests coincided with mine. Your interest is to find Father Zeus, whispers Knight. Somewhere in the black canyons to their right, someone or something howls. My interest, goddess, is to thwart the growing flood of chaos. Knight nods and raises her veiled face to the clouds roiling around her castle towers. I can hear the stars scream, crippled artificer. I know that when you say chaos, you mean chaos on a quantum level. You are the only one of the gods save for Zeus, who remembers us and our thinking before the change, who remembers little things like physics. Hephaestus keeps his face lowered and says nothing. Are you monitoring the quantum flux artificer? asks Knight. There is a sharp and angry edge to her voice that Achilles does not understand. Yes, goddess. How much time, god of fire, do you think we have left to survive if the vortexes of probability chaos continue to grow at this logarithmic rate? A few days, goddess, grunts Hephaestus, perhaps less. The fates agree with you, Hera Spawn, says Nix. The volume and sea-crash timbre of her voice make Achilles want to clap his calloused hands over his ears. Day and night, the Moirai, those alien entities which mortal men call the fates, toil at their electronic abacuses, manipulating their bubbles of magnetic energy and their mile-long coils of computing DNA. And every day, the Moirai's view of the future becomes less certain, their threads of probability more raveled, as if the loom of time itself is broken. It's that fucking setter boss, grumbles Hephaestus, begging your pardon, ma'am. No, you are correct, Artificer, says the giant Nix. It's that fucking setter boss, let loose at last, no longer contained in this world's arctic seas. The many-handed has gone to earth, you know. Not this mortal's earth, but our old home. No, says Hephaestus, raising his face at last. I didn't know that. Oh, yes, the brain has crossed the brain. She laughs, and this time Achilles does clasp his hands over his ears. This is a sound that no mortal should be made to hear. How long do the Moirai say we have? whispers Hephaestus. Clotha, the spinner says that we have mere hours left before the quantum flux implodes this universe, says Knight. Atropos, she who cannot be turned and who carries the abhorred shears to cut all our threads of life at death's sharp instant, says it may be a month yet. 
And Lachesis? asked the god of fire. The disposer of lots, and she rides the fractal waves of the electronic abacus better than the others, I think, sees chaos triumphant on this world and in this brain within a week or two. Anyway, we cut it. We have little time left, Artificer. Will you flee, goddess? Night stands silent. Howls echo from the crags and valleys beyond her castle. Finally, she says, where can we flee, Artificer? Where can even we few of the originals flee if this universe we were born into collapses into chaos? Any brain hole we can create, any quantum leap we can teleport, will still be connected by the threads of chaos to this universe. No, there is nowhere to flee. What do we do then, goddess? grunts Hephaestus. Just bend over, grab our sandals, and kiss our immortal asses goodbye? Night makes a noise like the Aegean in mirthful storm. We need to confer with the Elder Gods and quickly. The Elder Gods begins the artificer and stops. Kronos, Rhea, Okeanos, Tethys, all those exiled to terrible Tartarus? Yes, says Night. Zeus will never allow it, says Hephaestus. No god is allowed to communicate with... Zeus must face reality, bellows Knight, or all will end in chaos, including his reign. Achilles climbs two steps toward the huge black figure. His shield is on his forearm now, as if he is ready to fight. Hey, do you remember I'm here? And I'm still waiting for an answer to my question. Where is Zeus? Nix leans over him and aims one pale, bony finger like a weapon. Your quantum probability for dying at my hand may be zero, son of Peleus. But should I blast you atom from atom, molecule from molecule, the universe, even on a quantum level, might have a hard time maintaining that axiom. Achilles waits. He has noticed that the gods often babble on in this nonsense talk. The only thing to do is wait until they make sense again. Finally, Nick speaks in the voice of wind-tossed waves. Hera, sister and bride, daughter of Rhea and Kronos, and incestuous bedmate to her divine brother, defender of Achaeans, to the point of treachery and murder, has seduced Lord Zeus away from his duties and his watchfulness, bedding him and injecting him with sleep in the great house where a hero's wife weeps and labors, weaving by day and tearing out her work at night. This hero brought not his best bow to do his bloody work at Troy, but left it on a peg in a secret room with a secret door, hidden away from suitors and looters. This is the bow that no one else can pull, the bow that can send an arrow straight through iron axe-helve sockets, twelve in line, or half again that many guilty or guiltless men's bodies. Thank you, goddess, says Achilles, and backs away down the staircase. Hephaestus looks around, then follows, careful not to turn his back on the huge ebony figure in the flowing robes. By the time both men are standing, night is gone from her place at the head of the stairs. What in Hades was all that about, whispers the artificer as they climb into the chariot and activate the virtual control panel and holographic horses. A hero's wife weeping, hidden, fucking rooms. Axe helv sockets, twelve in line. Nick sounded like your babbling Delphic oracle. Zeus is on the Isle of Ithaca, says Achilles, as they climb away from the castle and the island and the growls and bellows of unseen monsters in the dark. Odysseus himself told me that he had left his best bow at his palace on that rocky isle of his hidden away with herb-scented robes in a secret room. I visited crafty Odysseus there in better days. Only he can bring that huge bow to full pull, or so he says, though I've never tried. And after an evening's drinking, firing an arrow through iron axe-helve sockets twelve in line, is the son of Laertes' idea of entertainment. And if there are suitors there seeking his sexy wife Penelope's hand, he would be even more greatly entertained to put his shafts through their bodies instead. Odysseus home on Ithaca, mutters Hephaestus, a good place for Hera to hide her sleeping lord. 
Do you have any idea, son of Peleus, what Zeus will do to you when you wake him there? Let's find out, says Achilles. Can you quantum teleport us straight from this chariot? Watch me, says Hephaestus. Man and God wink out of sight as the chariot, empty now, keeps flying north and west across Hellas Basin. 50. This isn't Savi. Did you hear me say it was, friend of no man? Harmon stood on the solid metal of the beer seemingly suspended above more than five miles of air, a hundred yards from the north face of Chomolungma. Staring, despite his powerful urge not to stare, at the dead face and naked body of a young Savi. Prospero stood behind him on the iron stairs. The wind was coming up outside. It looks like Savi, said Harmon. He could not slow the beating of his heart. Both the exposure to altitude and to the body in front of him made him almost sick with vertigo. But Savi's dead, he said. You are sure? I'm sure, God damn you! I saw your Caliban kill her. I saw the bloody remnants of what he ate and what he left behind. Savi is dead, and I never saw her this young. The naked woman lying on her back in the crystal coffin could not have been older than three or four years beyond her first twenty. Savi had been ancient. All of them, Hannah, Ada, Demon, and Harmon, had been shocked at the sight of her gray hair, wrinkles, a body that was past its prime. None of the old-style humans had ever seen the effects of aging before Savi. Nor since. But that would all change now that the firmary rejuvenation tanks were gone. Not my Caliban, said Prospero. No, not my monster, then. The goblin was his own master, sick, Sycorax spawn. A lost, enthralled, Satabas slave. When you encountered it in yon orbital isle some nine months past. This isn't Savi, repeated Harmon. It can't be. He forced himself to stride back up the stairs toward the central chamber of the Taj Moira, brushing brusquely past the blue-robed Magus. But he paused before passing up through the granite ceiling. Is she alive? he asked softly. Touch her, said Prospero. Harmon backed another step up the stairs. Now, why? Come down here and touch her, said the Magus. The hologram projection, whatever it was, now stood next to the crystal sarcophagus. It's the only way you can tell if she is alive. I'll take your word for it, Harmon stayed where he was. But I've not given you my word, friend of no man. I've given no opinion on whether this is a sleeping woman or a corpse, or merely a corollary of wax wanting spirit. But I warrant you this, husband of Ada of Ardis, should she wake... Should you wake her? Should she be real? And should you then discourse with this waked and decanted spirit? All your most pressing questions will be answered. What do you mean? asked Harmon, descending the steps in spite of his urge to flee. The Magus remained silent. His only answer was to open the crystal top to the clear sarcophagus. No smell of corruption came forth. Harmon stepped onto the metal beer platform, then came around to stand next to the Magus. Except for glimpses of hairless corpses in the healing tanks on Prospero's Isle, he'd never seen a dead person until recent months. No old-style human had. But now he'd buried people at Ardis Hall and knew the terrible aspects of death, the lividity and rigor mortis, the eyes seeming to sink away from the light, the hard coldness of flesh. This woman, this Savi, showed none of these signs. Her skin looked soft and flushed with life. Her lips were pink, almost to the point of redness, as were her nipples. Her eyes were closed, the lashes long, but it seemed that she could awaken any second. Touch her, said Prospero. Harmon reached a trembling hand and snatched it back before he touched her. There was a slight but firm force field above the woman's body, permeable but palpable, and the air inside the field was much warmer than that above it. 
He tried again, setting his fingers first to the woman's throat, finding the barest hint of pulse, like a butterfly's softest stirring, and then set his palm on her chest, between her breasts. Yes, the slightest beating of her heart, but slow. Soft poundings far too far apart to be the heartbeat of a normal sleeper. This crush is similar to the one your friend No Man sleeps in now, Prospero said softly. It pauses time. But rather than healing and protecting her for three days, as No Man Odysseus' slow time sarcophagus does this very minute, this crystal coffin has been her home for one thousand four hundred and some years. Harmon plucks his hand back as if he'd been bitten. Impossible, he said. Is it? Wake her and ask her. Who is she? demanded Harmon. It can't be Savi. Prospero smiled. Below their feet, clouds had swept into the north face of the mountain and were curling gray around the glass-bottomed shelter in which they stood. No, it can't be Savi, can it? said the Magus. I knew her as Moira. Moira? This place, the Taj Moira, is named after her? Of course. It is her tomb. Or at least the tomb in which she sleeps. Moira is a post-human friend of no man. The posts are all dead, gone. Demon and Savi and I saw their Caliban chewed and mummified bodies floating in the foul air of your orbital isle. Harmon had stepped back from the coffin again. Moira is the last, said Prospero, come down from the P-ring more than fifteen hundred years ago. She was the lover and consort of Amon Ferdinand Mark Alonzo Conhotep. Who the hell is that? The clouds had enveloped the Taj platform now, and Harmon felt on more solid ground with the glass floor showing only gray beneath him. A bookish descendant of the original Khan, said the Magus. He ruled what was left of the earth at the time the Voynix first became active. He had this temporal sarcophagus built for himself, but was in love with this Moira and offered it to her. Here, she's slept away the centuries. Harmon forced a laugh. That doesn't make any sense. Why didn't this Hotep, what's his name, just have a second coffin built for himself? Prospero's smile was maddening. He did. It was set right here on this broad bier next to Moira's. But even a place as hard to get to as the Rongbuk Pumori Chamalangma Feng Dud Kozi Lotse Nupse Kombu Aga Gatmandia Kanhotep Rausa will have its visitors over almost a millennium and a half. One of the early intruders pulled Amon Ferdinand Mark Alonzo Khan's body and temporal sarcophagus out of here and tossed it over the edge to the glacier below. Why didn't they take this coffin? Moira's, asked Harmon. He was skeptical of everything the Magus said. Prospero extended an age-mottled hand toward the sleeping woman. Would you throw this body away? Why didn't they loot the upstairs, then, said Harmon. There are safeguards up there. I will be happy to show you later. Why didn't these early intruders wake? Whoever this is, asked Harmon. They tried, said Prospero, but they never succeeded in opening the sarcophagus. You didn't seem to have any trouble doing that. I was here when Amon Ferdinand Mark Alonzo Khan devised the machine, said the Magus. I know its codes and passwords. You wake her, then. I want to talk to her. I cannot wake this sleeping posthuman, said Prospero. Nor could the intruders had they bypassed the security systems and managed to open her coffin. Only one thing will wake Moira. What's that? Armin was on the lowest step again, ready to leave. For Amon Ferdinand Mark Alonzo Khan, or another human male descended from Amon Ferdinand Mark Alonzo Khan, to have sexual intercourse with her while she sleeps. Harmon opened his mouth to speak, found nothing to say, and simply stood there staring at the blue-robed figure. The Magus had either gone insane or had always been mad. There was no third option. 
You are descended from Amon Ferdinand Marcolanzo Khanhotep from the line of Khans, continued Prospero, his voice sounding as calm and disinterested as someone speculating on the weather. The DNA of your semen will awaken Moira. 51. Monmut and Orfu went outside onto the hull of the Queen Mab where they could talk in peace. The huge ship had ceased setting off its coke can sized atomic bombs upon passing the orbit of Earth's moon. They wanted to announce their arrival but not antagonize anyone or anything in the equatorial or polar rings into firing on them. And now the Mab was decelerating toward orbit under a mild one-eighth the gravity using only its auxiliary ion-drive engines extended on short booms. Monmouth thought that the blue glow beneath them was a pleasant alternative to the periodic smash and glare of the bombs. The little Europan had to take care out in vacuum under deceleration, making sure that he was attached to the ship at all times, staying on the catwalks that ringed the ship, watching his step on the ladders that were everywhere on the thousand-foot-long spacecraft, but he knew that if he did something stupid, Orfu of Io would come after him and save him. Monmouth might be comfortable in full vacuum for only a dozen hours or so before having to replenish air and other requirements, and he'd rarely practiced using the little peroxide thrusters built into his back. But this outside world of extreme cold, terrible heat, raging radiation, and hard vacuum was Orfu's natural environment. So what do we do? Monmouth asked his huge friend. I think it's imperative that we bring the dropship and the dark lady down, said Orfu, as soon as possible. We? said Monmouth. We? The plan had been for Suma Four to pilot the dropship with General Bey bin Adi and thirty of his troopers. The Rockvec soldiers under the direct command of Centurion leader Mapahu in the dropship passenger Nassau while Monmut waited in the Dark Lady down in the dropship's hold. When and if the time came to use the submersible, Suma Four and any other required personnel would climb down into the Dark Lady via an access shaft. Despite Monmut's misgivings about being separated from his old friend, there had never been any planning to include the huge optically blind Ionian in the dropship part of the mission. Orfu was to remain with the Queen Mab as external systems engineer. So what is this we? Monmouth asked again. I've decided that I'm indispensable to this mission, rumbled Orfu. Besides, you still have that comfortable little niche for me in the sub's hold. Air and energy umbilicals, comm links, radar, and other sensor feeds. I could vacation there and be happy. Monmouth shook his head, realized he was doing it in front of a blind Moravec, realized then that Orfu's radar and infrared sensors would pick up the movement and shook his head again. Why should we insist on going down? Trying to land on Earth could jeopardize the rendezvous with the broadcasting asteroid city on the P-ring. Bugger the broadcasting asteroid city on the P-ring, growled Orfu of Io. The important thing right now is to get down to that planet as fast as we can. Why? Why? repeated Orfu. Why? You're the one with the eyes, little friend. Didn't you see those telescope images that you described to me? The burned village, you mean? Yes, the burned village, I mean, rumbled Orfu. And the other thirty or forty human settlements around the world that seem to be under attack by headless creatures that seemed to specialize in slaughtering old-style human beings. Old-style humans, Monmut, the kind that designed our ancestors. Since when has this turned into a rescue mission? asked Monmut. The earth was a big, bright blue sphere now, growing by the minute. The E and P rings were beautiful. Since we saw the photos showing human beings being slaughtered, said Orfu and Monmut, recognized the near subsonic tones in his friend's voice. Those rumbles meant either that Orfu was very amused or very, very serious, and Monmouth knew that he wasn't amused at the moment. 
I thought the idea was to save our five moons, the belt and the solar system, from total quantum collapse, said Monmouth. Orfu growled low tones. We'll do that tomorrow. Today we have a chance to help people down there. How? said Monmouth. We don't know the context. We have no idea what's going on down there. For all we know, those headless metallic creatures are just killer robots that humans have built to kill each other. We'd be meddling in local wars that are none of our business. Do you believe that, Monmouth? Monmouth hesitated. He looked far, far down to where the ion engines out on their booms lanced blue beams in the direction of the growing blue and white sphere. No, he said at last. No, I don't believe that. I think something new is going on down there, just as it is on Mars and on Ilium Earth and everywhere we look. I do too, said Orfu of Io. Let's go in and convince Astigche and the rest of the Prime Integrators that they have to launch the dropship and submersible when we go around the back side of the Earth. With me aboard. Just how do you plan to convince them to do this? asked Monmouth. This time the Ionian's deep rumble was more in the amused spectrum of bone-rattling subsonics. I'll make them an offer they can't refuse. 52. Harmon tried to get as far away from the crystal coffin as he could. He would have returned to the Eiffelbahn car, but the winds outside were roaring easily over a hundred miles per hour, enough to sweep him off the marble tabletop surrounding the Taj Moira. So he climbed through the spiraling levels of books instead. The walkways were narrow and soon very high, each one a little farther out over the low-walled maze far below, as the inside walls of the curved dome pressed the bookshelves and walkways farther in, and Harmon would have been disturbed by the dizzying height beneath his feet on the open iron catwalks if he hadn't been so eager to put distance between himself and the sleeping woman. The books had no titles. They were of uniform size. Harmon estimated that there were hundreds of thousands of volumes in this huge structure. He pulled one out and opened it at random. The letters were small and printed in pre-Rubicon English, older than any book or writing he'd yet encountered, and it took him minutes to sound out and guess at the first couple of sentences he encountered. He slid the book back in and set his palm on the spine, visualizing five blue triangles in a row. It did not sickle. No golden words flowed down his hand and arm to settle in his memory. Either the sigil function did not work in this place, or these ancient books were impervious to sigling. There's a way you can read them all, said Prospero. Armin jumped backward. He'd not heard the Magus approaching across the noisy catwalk. He was just suddenly there, not an arm's length away. How can I read them all? said Harmon. The Eiffelbahn car will be leaving in two hours, said the Magus. If you're not on it, it will be a while until the next one stops here at Taj Moira. Eleven years, to be precise, so if you're going to read Orlby's books, you had best start at once. I'm ready to go now, said Harmon. It's just too damned windy out for me to get to the car. I'll have one of the servitors rig a line when we are ready to leave, said Prospero. Servitor? There are working servitors here? Of course. Do you think the mechanisms of the Taj or the Eiffelbahn repair themselves? The Magus chuckled. Well, of course, in a way they do repair themselves, since most of the servitors are nanotech, part of the structures themselves, and too small for you to detect. All of our servitors at Ardis and the other communities quit working, said Harmon, just crashed, and the power went out. Of course, said Prospero. There are consequences to your destruction of the firmary in my orbital isle, but the orbital and planetary power grid and other mechanisms are still intact. Even the firmary could be replaced if you so choose. Harmon was stunned to hear this. He turned and leaned on the iron railing, taking deep breaths, ignoring the long drop to the marble floor far below. 
when he and Demon, with this Magus' instructions, had directed the huge wormhole collector into Prospero's Isle nine months ago. It had been to destroy the terrible banquet table where Caliban had been feasting for centuries on the bodies and bones of final twenty old-style humans in the firmary. Since that day, since the destruction of the firmary and the knowledge that one would be faxed there after any serious injury, and on every twentieth birthday, mortality had lain heavily on everyone's spirit. Death and aging had become a reality for everyone. If Prospero was telling the truth now, virtual youth and immortality was once again an option. Harmon didn't know what he thought of this new option, but just the thought of choosing made him sick to his stomach. There's another firmary, he said. He had spoken softly, but his voice still echoed under the gigantic dome. Of course. There's another on Sycorax's orbital isle. It merely needs to be activated, as do the orbital power projectors and automated fax systems. Sycorax, said Harmon. The witch you said was Caliban's mother? Yes. Harmon started to ask how they might get up to the orbital rings to activate the firmary, power, and emergency fax system, but then he remembered that Savi's Sony they kept at Ardis could fly to the rings. Harmon took long breaths. Harmon, friend of no man, said Prospero, you need to listen to me now. You can leave this place when the Eiffelbahn commences to run again in one hour and fifty-four minutes or you can go outside and leap to your death on the Kambu Glacier. All choices are yours, but it is as certain that night shall follow day that you shall never see your Ada again, nor return home to what is left of Ardis Hall, nor see your friends Demon, Hannah, and the others survive this war with the Voynix and Calabani, nor ever again see a green earth not turned blue and dead by Setabos hunger, if you do not waken Moira. Harmon stepped away from the Magus and balled both hands into fists. Prospero was leaning on his staff as if it was a walking stick, but Harmon knew that one motion by Prospero with that staff would send him flying over the rail to his death on the jewel-encrusted marble walls hundreds of feet below. There has to be another way to waken her, he said through clenched teeth. There is not. Harmon pounded the iron railing. None of this makes any goddamned sense. Do not infest your mind with beating on the strangeness of this business, said Prospero, his words echoing under the high vault. At picked leisure, which shall be shortly, Moira will resolve you of every one of these happened accidents. But first, you must wake her. Harmon shook his head. I don't believe that I'm descended from this... Aman, what's his name, Kanhotep, he said. How could I be? We old styles were created by the posts centuries after Savi's people disappeared in the final facts, and Prospero smiled precisely. Where do you think your DNA templates and stored bodies were taken from, friend of no man? Myra can explain it all to you and more. She is a post-human, the last of her kind. She knows how you can read all these books before our Eiffelbahn car leaves this station. She may well know how you can defeat the Voynix or the Calabani, or perhaps even defeat Caliban and his lord Setebos himself. But you will have to decide soon whether your Ada's life is worth one small infidelity. We now have one hour and forty-five minutes before the Eiffelbahn starts running again. Fourteen hundred years of sleep and more cannot be shaken off in an instant. Moira will need some time to awaken, to eat, to understand our situation, before she will be ready to travel with us. She'd go with us, Harmon said stupidly, on the Eiffelbahn? Back to Ardis? Almost certainly, said Prospero. Harmon gripped the railing so tightly that his knuckles turned first bright red, then white. Finally he released the iron and turned to the waiting Magus. All right. But you wait here, or better yet, go back to the car, out of sight. I'll do this thing, but I have to be alone. Prospero simply winked out of existence. 
Harmon stood on the high railing for a minute, breathing in the musty leather smell of ancient books, and then he hurried down the nearest flight of steps. 53. It was a ragtag, motley group of forty-five freezing men and women that made the seven-mile walk from Starved Rock to the Fax Pavilion. Demon led the way, carrying the pack with its glowing, occasionally squirming white setabas egg, and Ada walked by his side despite her concussion and cracked ribs. The first few miles through the forest were the worst. The terrain was rough and rocky, the visibility was poor. It had started snowing again, and everyone was braced for the attack of unseen Voynix. When thirty minutes passed, then forty-five minutes, and then an hour with no attack, no sign of the Voynix at all, everyone began to relax a little. A hundred feet above them, Greogi, Tom, and the eight seriously injured survivors of Ardis filled the Sony. Greogi would flit ahead, circle high over the forest, and then come back swooping low just long enough to shout information. Voynix ahead about half a mile, but they're retreating, staying away from you and the egg. Through the pounding headache and the duller ache from her wrist and broken ribs, every breath pained her. Ada found little comfort that the Voynix were only a half mile away. She'd seen them run at full speed, watched them leap into and out of trees. The creatures could be on them in a minute. The group had about twenty-five flechette rifles or pistols with them, but not many extra magazines of ammunition. Because of her broken right wrist and taped-up ribs, Ada didn't carry a weapon, which made her feel all the more exposed as she walked up front with Demon, Adide, Bowman, and a few of the others. The drifts were a foot or more deep here in the woods, and Ada barely had the energy to kick her way through the clinging wet snow. Even after they got out of the rockiest, thickest part of the forest, still heading southeast to intercept the road between Ardis and the Fax Pavilion, the group traveled with excruciating slowness because of those who were ambulatory, but more seriously injured or sick, including some who'd been victims of hypothermia the last two nights. Ceres, their other medic, was walking with them, and she shuttled back and forth constantly, making sure that the ill and injured were getting help and reminding the leaders to slow their pace. I don't understand, said Ada, as they came out into a wide meadow that she remembered from a hundred summer hikes. What's that? asked Demon. He carried the rucksack with the glowing egg in it ahead of him at arm's length, as if it smelled bad. In truth, as Ada had noticed, it did smell bad. A mixture of rotten fish and something sewerish. But it was still glowing, and it vibrated from time to time, so presumably the little setabas inside was still alive. Why do the Voynix stay away while we have this thing, said Ada. They must be afraid of it, said Demon. He slipped the rucksack from his right hand to his left. He was carrying a crossbow in his free hand. Yes, of course, said Ada, speaking more sharply than she'd meant to. The throbbing in her head, ribs and arms, was making her short-tempered. I mean, what is the connection between that thing in Paris Crater and the Voynix? I don't know, said Demon. The Voynix have been around forever, said Ada. This Cenobos monster just arrived a week ago. I know, said Demon, but I feel that somehow they're connected. Maybe they always have been. Ada nodded, winced from the pain of nodding, and trod on. There was very little talking in the rough ranks of the forty-five men and women as they trudged through another patch of thick woods, crossed a familiar stream that was now mostly frozen over and headed down a steep hill of frozen high grass and weeds. The Sony swooped low. Another quarter mile to the road, Greogi called down. The Voynix have moved farther south, two miles at least. When they reached the road, there was a stir among the survivors. Urgent whispers, people clapping one another on the back. Ada looked west toward Ardis Hall. The covered bridge was in sight just before the turn in the road that ran up to the manor house. But there was no sight of the great hall, of course, not even a plume of black smoke. For a minute she thought she was going to be sick to her stomach. Black spots danced in front of her eyes. She paused, put
put her hands on her knees and lowered her head. Are you all right, Ada? It was Lehman speaking. The bearded man wore only rags, including one wrapped around his right hand, where he had lost four fingers during the battle with the Voynix at Ardis. Yes, said Ada. She rose, smiled at Lehman, and hurried to keep up with the small group at the front of the shuffling pack. It was less than a mile to the Fax Pavilion now, and all looked familiar except for the unusual snow. There was not the slightest sign of Voynix. The Sony circled above, disappeared in wider circles, and then swept back, Grayogi giving them a thumbs up as he dipped the machine low and then flew on ahead. Where are we going to fax, Demon? asked Ada. She heard the flatness and lack of affect in her own voice, but was too tired and hurting to put any energy in her tone. I don't know, said the lean, muscled man who had once been the pudgy aesthete who'd tried to seduce her. At least, I don't know where to go for the long run. Chom, Ulaanbaat, Paris Crater, Belenbaat, and the rest of the more populated nodes have probably been covered with blue ice by Setabas. But I do know an unpopulated node I stop by from time to time. It's in the tropics. Warm. Nothing but an abandoned little town, but it's on the ocean. Some ocean somewhere. And has a lagoon. I haven't seen many animals there other than lizards and a few wild pigs. But they don't seem to be afraid of people. We could fish, hunt, make more weapons, take care of our injured. Lay low until we come up with a plan. How will Harmon, Hannah, and Odysseus No Man find us? asked Ada. Demon was silent for a minute, and Ada could almost hear him thinking. We don't even know if Harmon is alive. Pater said that he disappeared with Ariel. But what he finally said was, No problem there. Some of us will fax back here regularly, and we can leave some sort of permanent note at Ardis Hall with the fax note code for our tropical hideout. Harmon can read. I don't think the Voynix can. Ada smiled wanly. The Voynix can do a lot of things none of us ever imagined they were capable of. Yeah, said Demon. And then they were silent until they reached the Fax Pavilion. The Fax Pavilion looked pretty much as Demon had seen it forty-eight hours earlier. The stockade had been breached. There was dried human blood everywhere. But the Voynix or wild animals had carried off the bodies of those artisites who'd fought to the death trying to defend the pavilion. But the pavilion structure itself was still intact, the fax node column still rising in the center of the open circular structure. The band of humans stood awkwardly at the edge of the pavilion floor, looking over their shoulders at the dark forest. The Sony landed and the injured were helped out or carried. Nothing for five miles, said Grayogi. It's weird. The few Voynix I saw were fleeing south, as if you were in pursuit of them. Demon looked at the milkily glowing egg in his backpack and sighed. We're not pursuing them, he said. We just want to get the hell out of here. He told Grayogi and the others of his plan. There was a brief spate of argument. Some of the survivors wanted to fax to familiar locations— and to see if friends and loved ones were alive. Carl was sure that the Loman estate node wouldn't have been invaded by this Setabas thing Demon had told them about. Carl's mother was there. All right, look, Demon called over the rising voices. We don't know where Setabas might be by now. The monster turned the huge city of Paris Crater into a castle of blue ice strands in less than twenty-four hours. It's been more than forty-eight hours since I got back, and I was the last person to fax in. Here's my suggestion. Ada noticed that the babbling stopped. People were listening. They accepted Demon as a leader, just as they had once accepted her leadership and Harmon's. She had to stifle a sudden urge to weep. Let's decide now if we're going to stick together for a while or not, said Demon, his deep voice easily carrying to the edge of the crowd. We can vote, and— What does vote mean? asked Bowman. Demon explained the concept. So if just one more than half of us votes to stay together, said Oka, then we all have to do what the others want? 
Just for a while, said Demon. Let's say a week. We're safer together than traveling apart. And we have people injured, sick, who can't defend themselves. If people all fax different directions right now, how are we ever going to find each other again? Do we let those who want to strike off alone carry the flechette rifles and crossbows? Or do those stay with the larger group who wants to stick together? What do we do in that week if we agree to go with you to this tropical paradise, asked Tom. Just what I said, answered Demon. Recuperate, find or build some more weapons. Build some sort of defensive perimeter there. I remember a little island just beyond the reef. We could make some little boats, set up our homes and defenses on the island. Do you think Voynix can't swim? called Stoman. Everyone laughed nervously, but Ada glanced at Demon. It had been gallows humor, a phrase she'd learned signaling the old books in Artis Hall's library, but it had broken the tension. Demon laughed easily. I have no idea if Voynix can swim. But if they can't, that island would be the perfect place for us. Until we breed so many children that we won't fit on it any more, said Tom. People laughed more easily this time. And we'll send reconnaissance teams out from the fax node there, said Demon, starting the first day we arrive. That way, we'll have some idea of what's going on in the world and which nodes are safe to fax to. And after a week, anyone who wants to leave can. I just think it's better for all of us if we stay together until our sick people are better and until we all get a chance to eat and sleep. Let's vote, said Call. They did, hesitantly, with more laughter at the thought of raising their hands to decide such a serious issue. The vote was forty-three to seven to stay together, with three of the most seriously injured not voting because they were unconscious. All right, said Demon. He approached the fax pad. Wait a minute, said Graogi. What do we do with the Sony? It won't fax, and if we leave it here, the Voinix will get it. It saved our lives more than once. Oh, shit, said Demon. I didn't think about that. He ran his hand over his dirty, blood-streaked face, and Ada saw how pale and tired he was under the thin veneer of energy he'd been projecting. I have an idea about that, said Ada. The crowd looked at her, their faces friendly, and waited. Most of you know that Savi showed some of us how to use new functions last year. Proxnet, Farnet, and Allnet. Some of you have even tried them yourselves. When we get to Demon's Tropical Paradise, we call up the Farnet function, see where the place is, and then someone faxes back here to fetch the Sony and fly it to our island. Harmon, Hannah, Pater, and Noman got to the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu in less than an hour, so it shouldn't take too long to fly to paradise. There was some chuckling, much nodding. I have an even better idea, said Graogi. The rest of you fax off to paradise. I'll stay here and guard the Sony. One of you fax back with the directions, and I'll fly it there today. I'll stay with you, said Layman, holding up a flechette rifle in his good left hand. You'll need someone to shoot Voynix if they come back, and to keep you awake during the flight south. Demon smiled tiredly. All right, he asked the group. People shuffled forward, eager to fax. Wait, said Demon. We don't know what's waiting for us there, so six of you with rifles. Call, Common, L.A., Bowman, Kasman, Adide. You come with me to the pavilion node, and we'll fax through first. If everything's good there, one of us will be back in two minutes or less. Then we should bring the wounded and sick through. Tom, Ceres, could you please organize the stretcher teams? Then Graogi will supervise half a dozen of you back there with rifles to keep watch while the rest fax through, okay? Everyone nodded impatiently. The rifle team walked to the star inlaid on the fax pavilion floor while Demon poised his hand over the keypad. Let's go, he said, and tapped in the code for his uninhabited node. Nothing happened. The usual puff of air and visual flicker as people faxed out of existence simply did not happen. One at a time, said Demon, although fax nodes could easily handle six people faxing at a time. Call. Stand on the star. 
Carl did, shifting his rifle nervously. Demon faxed in the code again. Nothing. The wind made a noise as it blew snow into the open pavilion. Maybe that fax now doesn't work anymore, called a woman named Saez from the crowd. I'll try Lohman's estate, said Demon, and tapped in the familiar code. It did not work. Holy Jesus Christ shit, cried the burly common. He pushed forward. Maybe you're doing it wrong, let me. Half a dozen people had a try. Three dozen familiar fax node codes were tried. Nothing worked. Not Paris Crater, not Chom or Belenbad, or the many circles of heaven code for Ulanbad. Nothing worked. Finally, everyone stood in silence, stunned, speechless. Their faces turned to masks of terror and hopelessness. Nothing in the past year. None of the nightmares of the last months. Not the fall of the meteors, not the failing of electricity and the fall of the servitors. Not the early attacks of Voynix, nor the news from Paris Crater. Not even the Artist Hall massacre or the hopeless situation on Starved Rock had struck these men and women with such a sense of hopelessness. The fax nodes no longer worked. The world, as they had known it since they were born, no longer existed. There was nowhere to flee. Nothing to do now but wait and die. Wait for the Voynix to return, or for the cold to kill them, or for disease and starvation to finish them off one by one. Ada stepped up onto the small base around the fax pad column so that she could be seen as well as be heard. We're going back to Artis Hall, she said. Her voice was strong, brooking no argument. It's only a little more than a mile up the road. We can be there in less than an hour, even in our condition. Grayogi and Tom will bring those too sick to walk. What the fuck is at Artis Hall? asked a short woman whom Ada did not recognize. What's there except corpses and carrion and ashes and voinix? Not everything burned, Ada said loudly. She had no idea if everything had burned or not. She'd been unconscious when they'd flown her away from the flaming ruins. But Demon and Grayogi had described unburned sections of the compound. Not everything burned, she said again. There are logs there, remnants of the tents and barracks. If nothing else, we'll pull down the stockade wall and build cabins out of the wood. And there will be artifacts, things that didn't burn in the ruins, guns, maybe. Things we left behind. Like the Voynix, said a scarred man named Elos. Maybe so, said Ada, but the Voynix are everywhere, and they're afraid of this Setabas egg the demon's carrying. As long as we have it, the Voynix will stay away. And where would you rather face them, Elos? In the darkness of the forest at night, or sitting around a big fire at Ardis in a warm hut while your friends help stand watch? There was silence, but it was an angry silence. Some still tried tapping at the fax pad, then pounding the column in frustration. Why don't we just stay here at the pavilion, said Ellie. It has a roof already. We can close in the sides, build a fire. The stockade is smaller here and would be easier to rebuild. And if the fax starts working again, we could get out fast. Ada nodded. That makes sense, my friend. But what about water? The stream is almost a quarter of a mile from the pavilion here. Someone would always have to be fetching water, risking exposure or Voynix attack to get it. And there's no place to store it here, nor room enough for all of us under this pavilion roof. And this valley is cold. Artis gets more sunlight. We'll have more building material to use there, and Artis Hall had a well under it. We can build our new artist hall around the well, so we'll never have to go outside for water. People shifted their weight from foot to foot, but no one had anything to say. The thought of walking back down that frozen road, away from the salvation of the fax pavilion, seemed too difficult to contemplate. I'm going now, said Ada. It will be dark in a few hours. I want a big fire roaring before ring light sets in. She walked out of the pavilion and headed west down the road. Demon followed, then Bowman and uh, Dide, then Tom, Sirius, Common, and most of the others. Grayogi supervised loading the sick back into the Sony. 
Damon hurried to catch up to her and leaned close to whisper to her. I have good news and bad news, he said. What's the good news? Ada asked tiredly. Her head was pounding so ferociously that she had to keep her eyes closed, opening them only once in a while to stay on the frozen dirt road. Everyone's coming, he said. And the bad news? asked Ada. She was thinking, I will not cry, I will not cry. This goddamned set of us egg is starting to hatch, said Demon. 54. As Harmon took off his clothes in the crystal crypt beneath the marble mass of the Taj Moira, he realized just how damned cold it was in that glass room. It also must have been cold in the huge Taj chamber above, but the therm skin he'd put on in the Eiffelbahn car had kept him from noticing. Now he hesitated at the foot of the clear coffin with the therm skin peeled half down his torso, his regular clothes in a tumble at his feet, and goosebumps rising on his bare arms and chest. This is wrong. This is absolutely, totally wrong. Other than a lifetime awe of the post-humans in their orbital rings, and the almost spiritual belief everyone had that they would rise to the rings and spend eternity with the posts after their final facts, Harmon and his people knew nothing of religion. The closest they had come to understanding religious awe and ceremony had come from the glimpses they'd received of the Greek gods through the turncloth drama. But now Harmon felt that he was about to commit something like sin. Ada's life, the life of everyone I know and care for, may depend on me waking this post-human woman. By having sex with a dead or comatose stranger, he whispered aloud. This is wrong. This is crazy. Harmon glanced over his shoulder and up the stairway, but, as he'd promised, Prospero was nowhere to be seen. Harmon shucked out of the rest of his therm skin. The air was freezing cold. He looked down at himself and almost laughed at how contracted, cold, and shrunken he was. What if this is all the crazy old Magus's idea of a joke? And who was to say whether Prospero was lurking around under some invisibility cloak? or other contrivance of his magusy ways. Harmon stood at the foot of the crystal coffin and shook. The cold was part of it, the unpleasantness of what he was about to do a greater part. Even the idea that he was descended from this Amon Ferdinand Mark Alonzo Conho Tep made him queasy. He remembered Ada injured, unconscious, atop that place called Starved Rock, with the pitifully few other survivors of the massacre at Ardis. Who's to say that was real? Certainly Prospero could make a turn cloth transmit false images. But he had to proceed as if the vision had been real. He had to proceed as if Prospero's emotional statement to him that he had to learn, to change, to enter this fight against Setabas and the Voynix and the Calabani, or all would be lost, was true. But what can one man who's had his five twenties do? Harmon asked himself. As if to answer that, Harmon crawled up over the edge of the massive crush. He lowered himself carefully into the end of the thing, not touching the naked woman's bare feet. The semi-permeable force field made it feel as if he were slipping into a warm bath through a tingling resistance. Now only his head and shoulders were out of the warmth. The coffin was long and wide easily wide enough for him to lie down next to the sleeping female without touching her. The cushioned material she was lying on had looked like silk, but it felt more like some soft metallic fiber under Harmon's knees. Now that he was mostly in the containment of the time crash, he could feel surges and pulses of whatever energy field kept this Savi look-alike young and perhaps asleep. If I lower my head below the force field, thought Harmon, maybe it'll put me into a fifteen hundred year sleep as well and solve all my problems, especially the problem of what to do next here. He did crouch lower, putting his face below the level of the tingling force field the way a timid swimmer might enter the water. He was now on his hands and knees over the woman's legs. The air was much warmer here in the crush and he felt the vibration of energy from the sarcophagus machinery humming throughout his body. 
but it didn't put him to sleep. Now what, he thought. There must have been some time in Harmon's life where he had felt this awkward, but he couldn't recall it. As with the absence of the concept of sin in Harmon's world, so was there little incidence or thought of the idea of rape. There were no laws nor anyone to enforce laws in this now vanished world of the old-style humans, but neither had there been aggression between the sexes or intimacy without permission by both parties. There had been no laws, no police, no prisons. None of the words Harmon had sigiled in the last eight months. But there had been a sort of informal shunning in their tight little communities of parties and cotillions and faxes to this event and that. No one had wanted to be left out. And there had been enough sex for anyone who wanted it, and almost everyone had wanted it. Harmon had wanted it often enough in his almost five-twenties. It was just in the last decade or so since he'd taught himself to read the strange squiggles in books that he had quit the fact-somewhere-bed-someone rhythm of life. He'd gained the odd idea that there was, or could be, or might be, someone special for him, someone with whom, for both of them, sexual intercourse should be an exclusive and shared special experience, separate from all the easy liaisons and physical friendships that made up the old-style human world. It had been an odd thought, one that would have made no sense to almost anyone he would have told, but he told no one. And perhaps it was Ada's youth. She was only seven and first twenty when they first made love and fell in love, which allowed her to share his odd and romantic notions of exclusiveness. They'd even held their own wedding ceremony at Artist Hall and while the four hundred others had mostly humored them, accepting this excuse for yet another party, a few, Pater, Demon, Hannah, a few others, had understood that it meant much more. Thinking about this is not helping you do what Prospero says you have to do, Harmon. He was kneeling naked above a woman who had been sleeping, according to the lying logosphere avatar who called himself Prospero, for almost a millennium and a half, and he was surprised to find that he was not ready for sex. Why did she look so much like Savi? Savi had been perhaps the most interesting person Harmon had ever met, bold, mysterious, ancient, from another age, never quite honest, shrouded in ways that almost no old-style human from Harmon's age could ever be. But he'd never been attracted to her as a woman— he remembered her thin body and its skin-tight thermskin on Prospero's orbital isle. This younger Savi was not thin. Her muscles had not atrophied with the age of centuries. Her hair everywhere was dark, not the black he'd first thought, not the jet black of Ada's beautiful hair, but very dark brown. The clouds had dissipated off the north face of Chomolungma, and in the reflected bright light from the emerging sun, some of this woman's hair glowed coppery red. Harmon could see the tiny pores in her skin. Her nipples, he noticed, were more brown than pink. The set of her chin had Savi's center crease and firmness, but the wrinkles he remembered on her brow and around her mouth and the corners of her eyes were not yet there. Who is she? he wondered for the fiftieth time. It doesn't matter who she really is, Harmon's mind screamed at itself. If Prospero is telling the truth, she's the woman you have to have sex with, so she'll wake up and teach you the things you have to learn to get home. Harmon leaned forward until his weight was partially on the sleeping woman. She was lying on her back with her arms at her sides, palms down against the cushioned material, legs already slightly apart, feeling every inch the violator, Harmon used his right knee to move her left leg farther to the side, and his left knee to open her right leg. She could not have been more open and vulnerable to him. And he could not have been less physically excited. Harmon raised his weight on his hands until he was doing a push-up above the supine form. He forced his head up and out of the only slightly buzzing force field and drew in great gulps of the freezing air there. When he lowered his head into the sarcophagus energy field again, he felt like a drowning man going under for the third time. 
Harmon laid his weight upon the sleeping woman. She did not budge or stir. Her eyelashes were long and dark, but there was not the slightest flutter or sense of her eyes moving under their lids, as he'd seen Ada's do so many times when he lay awake watching her sleeping next to him in the moonlight. Ada. He closed his eyes and remembered her. Not injured and unconscious on starved rock as Prospero's red turn cloth had shown, but the way she had been during their eight months together at Ardis Hall. He remembered waking up next to her in the night just to watch her sleep. He remembered the clean soap and female scent of her next to him in the night in their room with the bay window in the ancient Ardis Manor. Harmon felt himself start to stir. Don't think about it. Don't think about it now. Just remember. He allowed himself to remember that first time with Ada, just nine months, three weeks, and two days ago now. They had been traveling with Savi, Demon, and Hannah, and had just met the reawakened Odysseus at the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu. They each had separate sleeping cubbies that night. The round green spheres clinging to the orange tower of the ancient bridge like grapes on a vine, these hanging beneath the horizontal supports strut some seven hundred feet and more above the ruins far below. After everyone had gone to his or her own sleeping doma, everyone taken aback that the floors were as transparent as the crystal floor of this crypt. Now, don't think about that now. Harmon had slipped out of his room and knocked on Ada's door. She'd let him in, and he'd noticed how lustrous her dark eyes were that night. He'd actually gone to her room to talk to her about something, not to make love to her that night. Or so he thought at the time. He'd already hurt Ada's feelings once. In Paris Crater it was, he remembered now, at Demon's mother's place. Marina's Domai, high on the bamboo three towers at the edge of the red-eyed crater. And Ada had risked her life, or at least a fax to the orbital firmary, by climbing from her balcony to his, teetering over a thousand miles of black hole crater to join him on his balcony that night. And he'd said no. He'd said, let's wait. And she had, although certainly no man had ever turned down or turned away beautiful black-haired Ada from Ardis Hall before. But that night, in the clear-sided sphere domi hanging from the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, with the mountains he later guessed to be the rocky Andes rising around them, and the haunted ruins a thousand feet below, he'd come to talk to her about what? Oh, yes, he'd come to her room to persuade her to remain behind at Ardis Hall with Hannah and Odysseus, while he and Demon went on with Savi to that legendary place called Atlantis, where there might be a spaceship waiting to take them to the rings. He'd been very convincing, and he'd lied through his teeth. He told young Ada that it would be better if she were to introduce Odysseus to everyone at Ardis Hall, that he and Demon would certainly be gone just a few days. In truth, he'd been frightened that Savi would lead them into terrible danger, and she had at forfeit of her own life. And even then Harmon did not want Ada in harm's way. Even then, he felt that it would be his own flesh and soul sundered if harm came to her. She'd been wearing the thinnest of short silk sleeping gowns when she'd ordered the cubby door to Iris open on the night she became his. The moonlight had been pale on her arms and eyelashes while he spoke so earnestly to her about staying at Ardis Hall with this stranger Odysseus. And then he'd kissed her. No. He'd only kissed Ada on the cheek at the end of their conversation, the way a father or friend might kiss a child. It had been she who first kissed him, a full, open, lingering kiss, her arms going around him and pulling him closer as they stood there in the moonlight and starlight. He remembered feeling her young breasts against his chest through the thin silk of her blue nightgown. He remembered carrying her to the small bed that lay against the curved, clear wall of the cubby. She'd helped him off with his clothes, both of them in a clumsy yet elegant hurry now. Had the storm swept down out of the higher mountains and struck just as they began to make love on that narrow bed? Not long after, certainly. He did remember the moonlight on Ada's upturned face and the moonlight illuminating her nipples 
as he cupped each breast and raised it to his lips. But he remembered the wall of wind hitting the bridge, rocking the cubby dangerously, sensuously, just as they began to rock and move themselves, eight under him, her legs rising around his hips, her right hand slipping down and finding him, guiding him. No one guided him now as he stiffened and rose against the sex of this woman in the crystal crush. This won't work, he thought through the surge of his own memories and renewed desire. She'll be dry, I'll have to... But the rest of that thought was lost as he realized that she was not dry against his tentative probes, but soft and opening and even moist as if she had lain there waiting for him all these years. Ada had been ready for him, wet with excitement, her lips as warm as her warm sex, her arms insistent around him, her fingers arched on his bare back as he moved gently into her and with her. They had kissed until the kissing alone would have made Harmon, he of the four twenties and nineteen years that very week, the oldest of the old that Ada knew or had ever known, almost swoon with a teenaged boy's lust and excitement. They'd moved as the cubby rocked to the wild gusts of wind, gently at first, forever it seemed, and then with increasing passion and less restraint, as Ada urged him to lose restraint, as Ada opened to him and urged him deeper, kissing him and holding him within the powerful circle of her arms and squeezing legs and raking fingernails. And when he'd come, Harmon had throbbed in her for what seemed like long moments, and Ada had responded with a series of internal throbs that felt like tremors rising from some infinitely deep epicenter, until he felt as if it was her small hand clenching the core of him tighter, releasing, then clenching again rather than her entire body. Harmon throbbed inside the woman who looked like Savi and couldn't be. He did not linger, but pulled out immediately, his heart pounding with guilt and something like horror, even as he was filled with his love for Ada and his memories of Ada. He rolled aside and lay panting and miserable next to the woman's body on the metallic silken cushions. The warm air stirred around them, trying to lull him to sleep. Harmon felt at that moment that he could sleep, could sleep for a millennium and a half, just as this stranger had sleep through all the danger to his world and to his friends and to his single, perfect, betrayed beloved. Some small movement brought him up out of the fringes of his dozing. He opened his eyes and his heart almost stopped as he realized that the woman's eyes were open. She had turned her head and was staring at him with a cool intelligence, an almost impossible level of awareness after being asleep so long. Who are you? asked the young woman in dead Savi's voice. 55. In the end, it wasn't just Orfu's eloquence, but a myriad of factors that decided the Moravex to launch the atmospheric dropship carrying the Dark Lady. The Moravec meeting on the bridge happened much sooner than the two hours Astig Chai had suggested. Events were occurring too quickly. Twenty minutes after their conference outside on the hull of the Queen Mab, Monmut and Orfu were back on the ship's bridge, conferring verbally in full Earth-standard sea-level atmosphere and gravity with the Callistan Choli, Prime Integrator Astig Chai, General Bey Binadi and his Lieutenant Mapahu, the ominous Summa Four, an agitated retrograde Sinopesson, and half a dozen other Moravac integrators and military Rockvex. This is the transmission we received eight minutes ago, said the navigator Cho Lee. Almost everyone had heard it, but he played it back via tight beam anyway. The Maser broadcast coordinates were the same as the previous transmission, from a Phobos-sized asteroid in Earth's polar ring. But there was no female human voice this time, only a string of rendezvous coordinates and delta V rates. The lady wants us to bring Odysseus straight to her house, said Orfu, and not fool around swinging around the other side of the earth on the way. Can we do that? asked Monmouth. Break straight to her high polar orbit, I mean? We can if we use the fission bombs again for a high G deceleration the next nine hours, said Astig Chai. 
But we don't want to do that for a variety of reasons. Excuse me, said Monmouth, I'm just a submersible driver, no navigator or engineer. But I don't see how we're going to drop our speed anyway, given the weak deceleration we're getting from the ion drive engines. Did we have something special in store for the last bit of braking? Arrow braking, said the many-limbed, bulky little Calliston Cho Lee. Monmouth laughed at the image of the Queen Mab, all three hundred nine meters of bulky, girdered, crane-festooned, non-aerodynamic bulk of her, arrow breaking through the Earth's atmosphere, and then realized that Cho Lee hadn't been joking. You can arrow break this thing, he said at last. Retrograde Cinepesson skittered forward on his spidery silver legs. Of course, we'd always planned to arrow break. The sixty-meter-wide pusher plate with its ablative coating retracts and morphs slightly to serve very nicely as a heat shield. The plasma field around us during the maneuver should not be prohibitive. We can even maser calm through it if we so choose. Our original plans were for a mild aerobraking maneuver at an altitude of 145 kilometers above Earth's sea level, with several passes to regulate our orbit. The difficult part will be passing through the busy artificial P&E rings, since they have nothing comparable to the debris-cleared F-ring Cassini gap around Saturn. But those computations were easy enough. We just have to dodge like a sumbitch. Now, since we seem to have been ordered to make a command appearance at the ladies' asteroid city on the P-ring, we plan to dip to 37 kilometers and burn off velocity much more quickly establishing the proper elliptical orbit for rendezvous on the first attempt. Orfu whistled. Monmouth tried to visualize it. We'll be dropping to within a hundred-some thousand feet of the surface. We'll be able to see individual faces on the humans below. Not quite, said Astig Che, but it will be more dramatic than we had planned. We'll definitely leave a streak in their sky but the old-style humans down there are probably too distracted right now to notice a streak in their sky. What do you mean? asked Orfu of Io. Astig Che transmitted the most recent series of photographs. Monmouth described the elements that Orfu could not get through the accompanying data metrics. More images of slaughter. Human communities destroyed human bodies left out for carrion crows. Infrared imagery showed hot buildings and cold corpses, and the motion of equally cold, humped, and headless creatures who were doing the killing. Fires burned where homes and modest cities had been on the night side of the planet. All over the planet, the old-style humans seemed to be under attack by the gray, metallic, headless creatures, which the Moravec experts could not identify. And on four continents, the blue ice structures were multiplying and growing, and now images appeared of a single, huge creature looking like a human brain with eyes, only the brain the size of a warehouse. Then video, vertical images looking almost straight down on the thing scuttling on what looked like gigantic hands with more stalk-like arms protruding like ganglia. Obscene proboscises extruded from feeding orifices and seemed to be drinking or feeding from the earth itself. I see the data, said Orfu, but I'm having trouble visualizing the creature. It can't possibly be that ugly. We're looking at it, said General Bey Binadi, and we're having trouble believing what we're seeing, and it is that ugly. Is there any theory, asked Monmouth, about what that thing is or where it's from? It's associated with the blue ice sites originally seen at the former city of Paris and the largest blue ice complex, said Cho Li. But that's not what you mean. We simply don't know its origins. Have Moravex ever seen an image of anything like that in all our centuries of observing the Earth through telescopes from Jupiter's space or Saturn's space? asked Orfu. No, asked Dig Che and Summa Four spoke at the same time. The brain hands creature doesn't travel alone, said retrograde Cinepesson bringing up another series of holographic images and flat-plate projections. These things are with it at every one of the eighteen sites we've seen the brain. 
Humans? asked Orfu. The data was confusing. Not quite, said Monmouth. He described the scales, fangs, overly long arms, and webbed feet of the forms in the images. And according to the data metrics, there are hundreds of those things, said Orfu of Io. Thousands, said Centurion leader Mapahu. We've looked at images taken simultaneously at sites thousands of kilometers apart and counted at least 3,200 of the amphibian-looking forms. Caliban, said Monmouth. What? asked Dig Che's softly inflected voice sounded puzzled. On Mars, Prime Integrator, said the little Europan. The little green men talked about Prospero and Caliban from Shakespeare's The Tempest. The stone heads, you remember, were supposed to be images of Prospero. They warned us about Caliban. The thing looks and sounds like some versions of Caliban in the staging of that play over the centuries on Earth. None of the Moravecs had anything to say about that. There are eleven new brain holes on Earth since we began measuring this spike of quantum activity two weeks ago, Bay Bin Adi said at last. As far as we can tell, the brain creature has generated, or at least is using, all of them for transport purposes. It, and the scaled amphibious-looking things you call Caliban. And there is a pattern to where they appear. More holographic images misted into solidity above the chart table, and Monmouth described them on tight beam, but Orfu had already absorbed the accompanying data. All battlegrounds or sites of ancient historical human massacres or atrocities, said Orfu. Precisely, said General Bey Binati. You notice that the city of Paris was the first brain quantum opening. We know that more than 2,500 years ago, during the EU Empire's black hole exchange with the global Islamic Serenate, more than 14 million people died in and around Paris. And the other brain hole sites here fit that category, said Monmouth. Hiroshima, Auschwitz, Waterloo, Hotepsa, Stalingrad, Cape Town, Montreal, Gettysburg, Kahnstock, Okinawa, the Somme, New Wellington, all bloodied historical sites from millennia ago. Do we have some sort of kalabi yao traveling intermembrane tourist brain here? asked Orfu. Or something worse, said Cho Li. The neutrino and tachyon beams rising from the spots this thing visits carry some sort of complex coded information. The beams are interdimensional, not directional in our universe. We just can't tap into the beams to decode the messages or content. I think the brain is a ghoul, said Orfu of Io. Ghoul? asked Prime Integrator Astig Che. Orfu explained the term. I think it's sucking up some sort of dark energy from those places, said the big Ionian. That hardly seems likely, chirped retrograde Cinepesson. I know of no recordable energy left behind by the mere event of violent action. That is metaphysics, nonsense, not science. Orfu shrugged four of his multiple articulated arms. Do you think the large brain creature might be something the post-humans or old styles designed and biofactured during the dementia years after Rubicon? asked Centurion leader Mapahu. And the Caliban creature and headless robotic killer things as well? All artifacts from wildcat RNA engineers, like some of the anachronistic plant and animal life reintroduced to the planet? Not the big thing, said the tall Ganymede and Summa Four. We would have seen it before this. The brain creature with the hands came through brain holes from another universe just a few days ago. We don't know where the Caliban things came from or the hump-backed creatures that are decimating the old-style humans. They might well be artifacts of genetic manipulation. We have to remember that the post-humans designed themselves right out of the human gene pool more than 1,500 standard years ago. And I've seen the hollows of dinosaurs and terror birds and saber-toothed cats roaming this earth, 
said Centurion leader Mapahu. The humpbacked metallic things have killed up to ten percent of the old-style population, asked Monmouth, who was a stickler for the proper use of that word decimate. They have, said General Bay Binardi, probably more. And just since we've been in transit from Mars. So what do we do now? asked Orfu of Io. Although if no one has an immediate answer, I have a suggestion. Go ahead, said Prime Integrator Astig Che. I think you should defrost the thousand Rockvex soldiers we have in cold storage, fire up the drop ship and the dozen atmospheric hornets you have on board, load them to the gunnels with troopers and get into the fight. Get into the fight? repeated the navigator, Calliston Cho Lee. Start by nuking that brain creature into radioactive pus, said Orfu. Then get more of egg boots on the ground and defend the humans. Kill those Calibans and the headless humped things that are killing humans everywhere. Get into the fight. What an extraordinary suggestion, said Cho Lee in a shocked voice. We hardly have enough information to decide on a course of action at this point, said Prime Integrator Astig Che. For all we know, the brain creature, as we so respectfully call it, may be the only peaceful, sentient organism on Earth. Perhaps it's some sort of interdimensional archaeologist or anthropologist or historian. Or ghoul, said Monmouth. Our mission was to carry out surveillance, said Summa Four, in tones that were meant to be final, not start a war. We can do both things for the price of one, said Orfu. We have the firepower aboard the Queen Mab to make a difference in whatever is going on down there. And although you haven't officially told Monmouth or me, we know there must be a host of more modern stealthed Moravec warships following the Mab. This could be a wonderful opportunity to hit that thing, all those things, and cold-cock them before they even know they're in a fight. What an extraordinary suggestion, repeated Cho Lee. Absolutely extraordinary. Right now, said Astig Che in that odd James Mason voice that Monmouth remembered from flat films, our goal is not to start a war but to deliver Odysseus to the Phobos-sized asteroid city in the polar ring, as per the request of the voice. And before that, said Summa Four, we have to decide whether to go ahead with the dropship mission under cover of the arrow-breaking maneuver, or to wait until after rendezvous with the voice's orbital city and delivery of our human passenger. I have a question, said Monmouth. Yes. Prime Integrator Astig Che was also a European, thus almost the same size as the diminutive Monmouth. The two stared visor plate to visor plate while the administrator waited. Does our human passenger want to be delivered to the voice? asked Monmouth. There was a silence broken only by the hum of ventilators, calm reports to and from those Vex monitoring instruments, and the occasional bang of attitude thrusters from the hull. Good heavens, said Cho Lee. How could we have overlooked asking him? We were busy, said General Bay Binardi. I'll ask him, said Summa Four, although it will be embarrassing at this point if Odysseus says no. We have his garments all prepared, said the skittering retrograde Cinepesson. Garments, rumbled Orfu of Io. Is our son of Laertes a Mormon? No one responded. All Moravex had some interest in human history and society. It had been programmed into their evolving DNA and circuits to keep such an interest. But very few were as immersed in human thinking as the huge Ionian. Nor had the others evolved such an odd sense of humor. Odysseus, obviously, has been wearing clothing of our design while he's been aboard the Queen Mab, chirped retrograde Cinepesson but the clothing he will wear during the rendezvous with the voice's orbital asteroid will have every sort of nano-sized recording and transmission device we could conceive of. We will all monitor his experience in real time. 
Even those of us who are going down to Earth on the drop ship? asked Orfu. There was an embarrassed silence. Moraveks were not given to frequent embarrassment, but they were capable of it. You were not chosen for the dropship crew, asked Ig Chase, said at last in his clipped but not unpleasant tones. I know, said Orfu, but I think I can convince you that the dropship mission must be launched during the Mab's arrow breaking, and that I have to be on board. The little corner of the hold on Monmouth's sub will serve me just fine as my passenger space. It has all the connections I need, and I like the view. The submersible bay has no view, said Suma Four, except via video link, which might be interrupted if the dropship were to come under attack. I was being ironic, said Orfu. Arsa, said Choli, making a noise like a small animal clearing its throat. You are, technically, optically, blind. Yes, said Orfu, I've noticed. But beyond proper affirmative action hiring practices, never mind, it's not worth the time to explain, I can give you three compelling reasons why I have to be included on the dropship mission to Earth. We haven't concluded that the mission itself should occur, said Astig Chai, but please proceed with your reasons for being included. Then we prime integrators must make several decisions in the next fifteen minutes. First of all, of course, rumbled Orfu, there's the obvious fact that I will be a splendid ambassador to any and all sentient races we meet after landing on Earth. General Bey Bin Adi made a rude sound. Is that before or after you nuke them into radioactive pus? he asked. Secondly, there is the less obvious but still salient fact that no Moravec on this ship, perhaps no Moravec in existence, knows more about the fiction of Marcel Proust, James Joyce, William Faulkner, and George Marie Wong as well as the poetry of Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman, than I do. Therefore, and ergo, no more of Ek knows more about human psychology than I do. Should we actually speak to an old-style human, my presence will be indispensable. I didn't know you also studied Joyce, Faulkner, Wong, Dickinson, and Whitman, tight being Monmut. It never came up, answered Orfu but I've had time to read out there in the hard vacuum and sulfur of the I.O. Taurus over the last twelve hundred standard years of my existence. Twelve hundred years, tight-beamed Monmouth. Moravex were designed for a long lifespan, but three standard centuries was generous for the average Vex existence. Monmouth himself was less than one hundred fifty years old. You never told me you were that old. It never came up, transmitted Orfu of Io. I did not quite follow all the logical connections there in the verbal part before you tight-beamed your friend, said Astig Chai. But pray continue. I believe you said that you had three compelling reasons why you should be included. The third reason I deserve a chair on the dropship, said Orfu, figuratively speaking, of course, is that I've figured it out. Figured what out? asked Summa Four. The dark, bucky carbon Ganymedon wasn't visibly checking his chronometer, but his voice was. Everything, said Orfu of Io. Why there are Greek gods on Mars, why there's a tunnel through space and time to another Earth where Homer's Trojan War is still being fought, where this impossibly terraformed Mars came from, what Prospero and Caliban two characters from an ancient Shakespearean play, are doing waiting for us on this real earth, and why the quantum basis for the entire solar system is being screwed up by these brain holes that keep popping up. Everything. Fifty-six. The woman who looked like a young Savi was indeed named Moira, although in the next hours Prospero sometimes called her Miranda, and once he smilingly referred to her as Moneta, which added to Harmon's confusion. Harmon's embarrassment, on the other hand, was so great that nothing could add to it. For their first hour together he could not look in Moira's direction, much less look her in the eye. 
As Moira and he ate what amounted to breakfast as Prospero sat at the table, Harmon finally managed to look in the woman's direction, but couldn't raise his gaze to her eye level. Then he realized that this probably seemed as if he was staring at her chest, so he looked away again. Moira seemed oblivious to his discomfort. Prospero, she said, sipping orange juice brought to them by a floating servitor, you foul old maggot. Was this key to my awakening your idea? Of course not, Miranda, my dear. Don't call me Miranda, or I'll start calling you Mandrake. I am not now, nor was I ever, your daughter. Of course you are and were my daughter, Miranda, my dear, purred Prospero. Is there a post-human alive whom I did not help become what they are? Were not my genetic sequencing labs your womb and your cradle? Am I therefore not thy father? Is there another post-human alive today, Prospero? asked the woman. Not to my knowledge, Miranda, dear. Then fuck you. She turned to Harmon, sipped coffee, sliced at an orange with a frighteningly sharp knife, and said, My name is Moira. They were at a small table in a small room, a space more than a room, that Harmon had not noticed before. It was an alcove set within the book-lined wall halfway up the inside of the great inward-curving dome, at least three hundred feet above the marble-walled maze and floor. It was easy to understand why he hadn't seen the space from below. The walls of this shallow alcove were also lined with books. There had been other alcoves along the way up, some holding tables like this one, others containing cushioned benches and cryptic instruments and screens. The iron stairways, it turned out, moved like escalators, or it would have taken much longer for the three of them to climb this high. The exposure. There were no railings, and the narrow marble walkways and the wrought iron escalator steps were more air than iron. It was horrifying. Harmon hated to look down. He focused on the books instead and kept his shoulders against the shelves as he walked. This woman was dressed much as Savi had been the first time he'd seen her. A blue tunic top made of cotton canvas, corded trousers, and high leather boots. She even wore a sort of short wool cape similar to the one he'd seen on Savi when they met, although this cape was a dark yellow rather than the deep red the older woman had worn. However, its complicated many-folded cuts seemed to be the same. The major difference between the two women, besides the vast difference in age, was that the older Savi had been carrying a pistol when they met, the first firearm Harmon had ever seen. This version of Savi, Moira, Miranda, Moneta, he knew with absolute certainty, had not been armed when he first met her. What has happened since I first slept, Prospero? asked Moira. You want a summary of fourteen centuries in as many sentences, my dear? Yes, please. Mara separated the juicy orange into sections and handed a section to Harmon, who ate it without tasting it. The woods decay, intoned the magus Prospero, the woods decay and fall. The vapors weep their burthen to the ground. Man comes and tills the field and lies beneath and after many a summer dies the swan. Me only cruel immortality consumes. I wither slowly in thine arms, here at the quiet limit of the world, a white-haired shadow roaming like a dream, the ever-silent spaces of the east, far-folded mists and gleaming halls of morn. He bowed his balding and gray-haired head a bit, to Thaunus, said Moira, Tennyson before breakfast always makes my bowels ache. Tell me, is the world sane yet, Prospero? No, Miranda. Are my folk all dead or changelinged, then, as you say? She ate grapes and redolent cheese and drank from a large goblet of ice water the floating servitors continued to refill for her. They are dead or changelinged or both. Are they coming back, Prospero? God knows, my daughter. Don't give me God, please, said Moira. What about Savi's 9,113 fellow Jews? Have they been retrieved from the neutrino loop? No, my dear, all the Jews and Rubicon survivors in this universe remain a blue beam rising from Jerusalem and nothing more. 
We did not keep our promise then, did we? asked Moira, pushing her plate away and brushing crumbs and juice from her palms. No, daughter. And you, rapist, she said, turning to the blinking Harmon. Do you have any other purpose in this world than taking advantage of sleeping strangers? Harmon opened his mouth to speak, thought of nothing to say, and shut his mouth. He felt actively ill. Moira touched his hand. Do not reproach yourself, my Prometheus. You had little choice. The air inside the sarcophagus was scented with an aerosol aphrodisiac, so potent that Prospero sent it off with one of the original changelings, Aphrodite herself. Lucky for both of us, its effects are very temporary. Harmon felt a surge of relief, followed by fury. You mean, I had no choice? Not if you carried the DNA of Amon, Ferdinand, Mark Alonzo, Conhotep, said Moira. And all males of your race should. She turned back to Prospero. Where is Ferdinand, Mark Alonzo, or rather, what was his fate? The Magus bowed his head. Miranda, beloved, three years after you entered the Loopfax sarcophagus, he died of one of the wildcat variants of Rubicon that swept through the old population every year as surely as a summer zephyr. He was interred in a crystal sarcophagus next to yours, although all the fax equipment could do was keep his corpse from rotting then, since the firmary tanks had not yet learned how to deal with Rubicon. Before the vats could educate themselves, a score of caliphate mandroids climbed Mount Everest, evaded the security shields, and began looting the Taj. The first thing they looted was poor Ferdinand Mark Alonzo's heavy coffin, throwing it over the side. Why didn't they throw me over as well? asked Moira. Or, for that matter, finish their looting. I noticed all the agate, jasper, bloodstones. Emeralds, lapis, cornelian, and other baubles were still in place on the walls and screen maze. Caliban faxed in and dispatched the twenty caliphate mandroids for you, said Prospero. It took the servitors a month to mop up all the blood. Moira's head came up. Caliban still lives? Oh, yes. Ask our friend Harmon here. She glanced at Harmon, but refocused her attention on the magus. I'm surprised Caliban didn't rape me as well. Prospero smiled sadly. Oh, he tried, Miranda, my dear. He tried many times, but the sarcophagus would not open to him. Had the world bent to Caliban's will and member, he would have long since peopled this island earth with little Calibans by you. Moira shuddered. Finally she turned to Harmon again, ignoring the old man. I need to know your story and your character and your life, she said. Give me your palm. She set her right elbow on the table and held up one hand, palm toward him. Confused, Harmon did the same, but not touching her. No, said Moira. Have the old-style humans forgotten the sharing function? They have, actually, said Prospero. Our friend Harmon here can, or could, until the Eiffelbahn inhibited his access, call up only the finder, allnet, proxnet, and farnet functions, and those only by visualizing certain geometric shapes. Mother of heaven, said Moira. She dropped her hand to the table. Can they still read? Only Harmon and a handful of others he's taught in the last few months, said Prospero. No, I forgot to mention that our friend did learn to sigil some months ago. Sigil? Moira laughed. That was never meant to be used to understand books. That was an indexing function. It must feel like glancing at a recipe in a cookbook and thinking you've actually eaten the dinner. Harmon's people must be the dullest subspecies of Homo sapiens ever to receive a patent. Hey, said Harmon, I'm right here. Don't talk about me as if I'm not even here, and I may not know this sharing function, but I can learn it quickly. In the meantime, we can talk. I have questions to ask, too, you know. Moira looked at him. He noticed the rich gray-green of her eyes. Yes, she said at last, I have been rude. You must have come a long way to waken me, and you took that action against your will, and I am sure you would rather be elsewhere in the world. The least I can do is show you some manners and answer your questions. Can you show me how to do this sharing function you were talking about? asked Harmon. He was determined not to lose his temper with this woman who looked so much like Savi and spoke in her voice. 
or show me how to fax without fax node pavilions, he added, the way Ariel does it. Ah, oh, Ariel, said Moira. She glanced at Prospero. The old styles have forgotten how to free fax? They've forgotten almost everything, said Prospero. They were made to forget by your people, Moira. By Vala, by Terza, by Rahaba, by all your Uras and Beulas. Moira tapped the flat of her knife against her palm. Why did you use this person to wake me, Prospero? Has Sycorax consolidated her power and freed your monster Caliban from your control? She has, and he is free, Prospero said softly. But I felt it was time you woke, because Setabos now walks this world. Sycorax, Caliban, and Setabos, repeated Mora. She drew in a long breath, hissing it between her teeth. Between the witch, the demi-devil, and the thing of darkness, Prospero said softly. They would control the moon and earth, decide all ebbs and flows, and deal all power to their command. Myra nodded and chewed her full lower lip for a moment. When does your Eiffel bond car depart again? In one hour, said the Magus. Will you be on it, Miranda dear, or will you be sleeping in the fax coffin of time again? allowing your atoms and memories to be restored in such a meaningless loop forever. I'll be on your damned car, said Moira, and I'll take from the update banks what I need to know about this brave new world I'm born into yet again. But first young Prometheus has his questions to ask, and then I have a suggestion on what he can do to regain his function status. She glanced toward the apex of the dome. No, Moira, said Prospero. Harmon, she said softly, putting her soft hand on the back of his. Ask your questions now. He licked his lips. Are you really a posthuman? Yes, I am. That is what Savi's people called us before the final facts. Why do you look like Savi? Ah, you knew her then? Well, I will learn her health or fate when I call up the update function. I knew Savi, but more important... Armin Ferdinand Mark Alonso Canhotep was in love with her, and she returned no love for him. They were of separate tribes, so to speak. So I took her form, her memories, her voice, everything, before coming here to the Taj. How did you take her form? asked Harmon. Moira looked at Prospero again. His people do know nothing, don't they? To Harmon, she said. We post-humans had reached the point where we had no bodies of our own, my young Prometheus, at least none that you would recognize as bodies. We needed none. There were only a few thousand of us, but we had bred ourselves out of the human gene pool, thanks to the genetic skills of the avatar of the cyberspace logosphere here. You're welcome, said Prospero. When we wanted to take a human form, always a female human form, I might add, for all of us, we just borrowed one. But how, said Harmon. Moira sighed. Are the rings still in the sky? Of course, said Harmon. Polar and equatorial both? Yes. What do you think they are, Harmon Prometheus? There are more than a million discrete objects up there. What do your people think they are? Harmon licked his lips again. The air here in the great temple tomb was very dry. We know our firmary, where we were rejuvenated, was up there. Most of us think the other objects up there are the posts, your people's homes, and your machines, cities on orbiting islands like Prospero's. I was there last year on Prospero's Isle, Moira. I helped bring it down. You did? She looked at the Magus again. Well, good for you, young Prometheus. But you're wrong in thinking that the million orbiting objects, most of them much smaller than Prospero's Isle, were habitats for my kind or machines serving solely our purposes. There are a dozen or so habitats, of course, and several thousand giant wormhole generators, black hole accumulators, early experiments in our interdimensional travel program, brain hole generators, but most of the orbiting objects up there are serving you. Me? Do you know what faxing is? I've done it all my life, said Harmon. Yes, of course, but do you know what it is? Harmon took a breath. We'd never really thought about it, but on our voyages last year, Savi and Prospero explained that the fax node pavilions 
actually turn our bodies into coded energy, and then our bodies, minds, and memories are rebuilt at another node. Moira nodded. But the facts, pavilions, and nodes are not necessary, she said. They were simply ruses to keep you old-style humans from wandering in places you shouldn't go. This fax form of teleportation was staggeringly heavy on computer memory, even with the most advanced Kalabi Yao DNA and bubble memory machines. Do you have any idea how much memory is required to store the data on just one human being's molecules? Much less the holistic wavefront of his or her personality and memories. No, said Harmon. Myra gestured toward the top of the dome, but Harmon realized that she was actually gesturing toward the sky beyond, and the polar and equatorial rings turning up there now against the dark blue sky. A million orbital memory banks, said the woman, each one dedicated to one of you old-style humans. And in many of the other clumsy orbital machines, the black hole-powered teleportation devices themselves GPS satellites, scanners, reducers, compilators, receivers, and transmitters. Somewhere up there above you every night of your life, my Harmon Prometheus, was a star with your name on it. Why a million? asked Harmon. That was thought to be a viable minimum herd population, said Moira, although I suspect there are far fewer of you than that today, since we allowed each woman to have only one child. In my day, there were only 9,314 of your subspecies of humans, those with nanogenetic functions installed and active, and a few hundred thousand dying old, old-style humans, those like my beloved Amon Ferdinand Mark Alonzo Canho Tap, the last of his royal breed. What are the Voynichs? asked Harmon. Where did they come from? Why did they act as silent servants for so long? and then start attacking my people after Demon and I destroyed Prospero's Isle and the Firmary. How do we stop them? So many questions, sighed Moira. If you want them all answered, you will need context. To gain context, you need to read these books. Armin's head jerked, and he looked up and down at the curving inner dome lined with books. He could not do the mathematics on the square or cubic feet of books here, but he imagined wildly, blindly, that there must be at least a million volumes on these shelves. Which books, he asked. All of these books, said Moira, lifting her hand from his to gesture in a circle toward everything. You can, you know. Moira, no, Prospero said again. You'll kill him. Nonsense, said the woman. He's young. He's ninety-nine years old, said Prospero, more than seventy-five years older than Savi's body was when you cloned it for your own purposes. She had memories then. You carry them now. Harmon is no tabula rasa. Moira shrugged. He's strong, sane. Look at him. You'll kill him, said Prospero, and with him, one of our best weapons against Setabas and Sycorax. Harmon was very angry now, but also excited. What are you talking about? he demanded, pulling his hand back when Moira threatened to touch it again with hers. Are you talking about me sigling all these books? It would take months, years, decades, maybe. Not sigling, said Moira, but eating them. Eating them, repeated Harmon, thinking. Was she mad before she entered the time coffin, or have the centuries of being replicated there cell by cell, neuron by neuron, made her mad? Eating them, agreed Moira, in the sense that the Talmud spoke of eating books. Not reading them, but eating them. I don't understand. Do you know what the Talmud is? asked Moira. No. Mara pointed toward the apex of the dome again, some seventy stories above them. Up there, my young friend, in a tiny little cupola made of the clearest glass, there is a cabinet formed of gold and pearl and crystal, and I have the golden key. Within, it opens into a world and a little lovely moony night. Like your sarcophagus? asked Harmon. His heart was pounding. Nothing like my sarcophagus, laughed Mara. That coffin was just another node on your faxing merry-go-round, replicating me through the centuries until it was time to wake and go to work. I'm talking about a machine that will allow you to read all these books in depth before the Eiffelbahn car leaves the Taj station in 
She glanced at her palm. Fifty-eight minutes. Do not do this, Moira, said Prospero. He will do us no good in the war against Setebos if he is dead or a drooling moron. Silence, Prospero, snapped Moira. Look at him. He's already a moron. It's as if his entire race has been lobotomized since Savi's day. He might as well be dead. This way, if the cabinet works and he survives, he may be able to serve himself and us. She took Harmon's hand again. What do you most want in this universe, Harmon Prometheus? To go home to see my wife, said Harmon. Moira sighed. I can't guarantee that the crystal cabinet, the knowledge and nuance of all these books that my poor dead Armand Ferdinand Mark Alonso accumulated over his centuries, will allow you to free fax home to your wife. What is your name? Ada. The two syllables made Harmon want to weep. It made him want to weep twice, once for missing her, again for betraying her. To Ada, said Moira, but I can guarantee that you will not get home alive to see her unless you take this chance. Harmon stood and stepped out onto the railingless marble ledge three hundred feet above the cold marble floor below. He looked up at the center of the dome almost seven hundred feet above, but could see nothing except a sort of haze there where the last of the metal catwalks converged like black and almost invisibly thin spider webs. Harmon, friend of no man, began Prospero. Shut up, Harmon said to the Magus of the Logosphere. The Moira, he said, let's go. 57. At Quantum teleported us here according to your directions, says Hephaestus, but where in Hades hell are we? Ithaca, says Achilles. A rugged, rocky isle, but a good nurse to boys who would be men. It looks and smells more like a hot, stinking shithole to me, says the god of fire, limping along the dusty, rock-strewn trail that leads up a steep slope past meadows filled with goats and cattle to where the red tiles of several buildings glare in the merciless sun. I've been here before, says Achilles, the first time when I was a boy. The hero's heavy shield is strapped to his back, his sword secure in its scabbard on a belt hanging over his shoulder. The blond young man is not sweating from the climb or heat, but Hephaestus, limping along behind him, is huffing and pouring sweat. Even the immortal artificer's beard is wet with sweat. The steep but narrow trail ends on top of the hill and in sight of several large structures. Odysseus Palace, says Achilles, jogging the last fifty yards. Palace! gasps the god of fire. He limps into the clearing in front of the high gates, sets both hands on his crippled leg and bends over as if he is going to be sick. It's more like a fucking vertical pigsty. The remnant of a small abandoned fortress rises like a squat stone stump, fifty yards to the right of the main house, on the promontory overlooking the cliff. The home itself, Odysseus Palace, is made of newer stone and newer wood, although the main doors open are comprised of two ancient stone slabs. Terracotta paving tiles on the terrace are made of expensive tile set neatly in place, obviously the work of the best craftsmen and stonemasons, although equally obviously not dusted or swept recently. And all the outside walls and columns are brightly painted, Faux painted vines filled with images of birds and their nests spiral around the white columns on either side of the entry. But real vines have also grown there, their tangle inviting real birds and becoming home to at least one visible nest. Achilles can see colorful frescoes gleaming from the walls of the shadowy vestibule beyond the main doors which have been left ajar. Achilles starts forward but halts when Hephaestus grabs his arm, there's a force field here, son of Peleus. I don't see it. You wouldn't until you walked into it. I'm sure it would kill any other mortal man. But even though you're the fleet-footed man-killer with what Nix called your singularity probability quotient, the field would knock you on your ass. My instruments measure at least 200,000 volts in it and enough amperage to do real damage. Stand back. 
The bearded dwarf god fiddles with boxes and corkscrewed metallic shapes hanging from the various leather straps and chest bands on his heavy vests. Checks little dials. Uses a short wand with alligator clip jaws to attach something that looks like a dead metallic ferret to some terminus in the invisible field. Then links four rhomboid devices together with colored wire before pushing a brass button. There, says Hephaestus, god of fire. Fields down. That's what I like about high priests, says Achilles. They do nothing and then brag about it. You wouldn't have fucking thought it was fucking nothing if you'd walked into that force field, growls the god. It was Hera's work based on my machines. Then I thank you, says Achilles, and strides through the archway between the stone slabs of the open doorway and into the vestibule in Odysseus' home. Suddenly there is a growling noise and a dark animal lunges snarling from the shadows. Achilles' sword is in his hand in an instant, but the dog is already collapsed on the dusty tiles. This is Argus, says Achilles, patting the head of the prostrate and panting animal. Odysseus trained this hound from a pup more than ten years ago, but told me that he had to leave for Troy before he ever took Argus hunting for boar or wild deer. Our crafty friend's son, Telemachus, was supposed to be his master in Odysseus' absence. No one's been his master for weeks, says Hephaestus. The mud is all but starved to death. It is true. Argus is too weak to stand or move his head. Only his large, imploring eyes follow Achilles' hand as the hero pets the animal. The dog's ribs stand out against his slack, lusterless hide, like the hull timbers of an unfinished ship against old canvas. He can't get outside here as force field, mutters Achilles, and I'll wager that there was nothing to eat inside. He's probably had water from the rains and gutters, but no food. He pulls several biscuits from the small bag he's been carrying with his shield, biscuits purloined from the artificer's hum, and feeds two to the dog. The animal can just barely chew them. Achilles sets three more biscuits next to the dog's head and stands. Not even a corpse to feed on, says Hephaestus. What with the humans gone everywhere on your earth now except around Ilium? Just disappeared like fucking smoke. Achilles rounds on the limping god. Where are our people? What have you and the other immortals done with them? The artificer holds both palms high. It wasn't our doing, son of Peleus. Not even great Zeus's. Some other force emptied out this earth, not us. We Olympian gods need our worshippers. Living without our mortal grovelers, idolaters, and altar builders would be like narcissists. And I know Narcissus well. Living in a world without mirrored surfaces. This wasn't our deed. You expect me to believe there are other gods? Asks Achilles, sword still half-raised. Big fleas have little fleas, and little fleas have littler fleas to bite them. And littler fleas have even smaller fleas, and so on ad infinitum. Or some doggerel like that, says the bearded immortal. Be silent, says Achilles. He pats the now actively chewing dog on the head one last time and turns his back on Hephaestus. They pass through the vestibule into the main hall, the throne room, as it were, where Achilles had been received years earlier by Odysseus and his wife Penelope. Odysseus' son, Telemachus, had been a shy boy of six then, barely up to the task of bowing to the assembled Myrmidons, and then hurriedly being led away by his nurse. The throne room is now empty. Hephaestus is consulting one of his instrument boxes. This way, he says, leading Achilles from the throne room back across the brightly frescoed vestibule to a longer, darker room. It is the banquet hall dominated by a low table thirty feet long. Zeus is sprawled supine on the table, his arms and legs thrown akimbo. He is naked and he is snoring. The banquet hall is a mess. Cups, bowls, and utensils thrown everywhere. Arrows spilled out all over the floor from where a great quiver had fallen from the wall. Another wall missing a tapestry that was bunched up under the snoring father of the gods. It's absolute sleep, all right, grumbles Hephaestus. It sounds like it, says Achilles. I'm surprised the timbers don't collapse from the snores and snorts. 
The man-killer is stepping carefully over the heads of barbed arrows that are scattered on the floor. Although few Greek warriors admit it, most use deadly substances for poison on their spear tips and arrowheads, and the only thing Achilles, son of Peleus, knows from the oracles and his mother Thetis's predictions of his own death is that a poisoned arrowhead piercing the only mortal part of his body will be the cause of his demise. But neither his immortal mother nor the fates had ever told him exactly where or when he will die or who will fire the deadly arrow. It would be too absurdly ironic, Achilles thinks now, to prick a toe on one of Odysseus' ancient fallen arrows and die in agony even before he can waken Zeus to demand that Penthesilea be saved. No, I mean absolute sleep was the fucking drug Hera used to knock him out, says the artificer. It was a potion I helped develop into aerosol form, although Nix was the original chemist. Can you wake him? Oh, I think so, yes, yes, I think so, says Hephaestus, pulling small bags and boxes off the ribbons laced to his leather vest and harnesses. Peering into the boxes, rejecting some things, setting other vials and small devices on the tapestry rumpled table next to Zeus's giant thigh. While the bearded dwarf god fusses and assembles things, Achilles takes his first close up gaze at Zeus, the father of all gods and men. He who marshals the storm clouds. Zeus is fifteen feet tall, impressive even as he sprawls on his back spraddle-legged on the tapestry and table. Heavily muscled and perfectly formed, even his beard oiled into perfect curls. But other than the minor matters of size and physical perfection, he is just a big man who has enjoyed a great fuck and gone to sleep. The divine penis, almost as long as Achilles' sword, still lies swollen, pink, and flaccid on the Lord God's oily divine thigh. The god who gathers storms is snoring and drooling like a pig. This should wake him up, says Hephaestus. He holds up a syringe, something Achilles has never seen before, ending in a needle more than a foot long. By the gods, cries Achilles, are you going to stick that into Father Zeus? Straight into his lying, lusting heart, says Hephaestus with a nasty cackle. This is one thousand cc's of pure divine adrenaline, mixed with my own little recipe of various amphetamines, the only antidote to absolute sleep. What will he do when he wakes, asks Achilles, pulling his shield in front of him. Hephaestus shrugs. I'm not going to hang around to find out. I'm QTing out of here the second I inject this cocktail. Zeus's response to being wakened with a needle in his heart is your problem, son of Peleus. Achilles grabs the dwarf god by the beard and pulls him closer. Oh, I guarantee it will be our problem if it is a problem, crippled artificer. What do you want me to do, mortal? Wait here and hold your hand? It was your fucking idea to wake him up. It's also in your interest to awaken Zeus, god of one short leg, says Achilles, not relinquishing his grip on the immortal's beard. How so? Hephaestus squints out of his good eye. You help me with this, whispers Achilles, leaning closer to the grungy god's misshapen ear. And in a week, it could be you who sits on the golden throne in the Hall of the Gods. Not Zeus. How can that be? asks Hephaestus. But he is also whispering now. He still squints, but suddenly there is an eagerness in that squinting. Still whispering, still holding Hephaestus's beard in his fist, Achilles tells the artificer his plan. Zeus awakens with a roar. As good as his word, Hephaestus has fled the instant he injected the adrenaline into the father of the god's heart, pausing only to pull the long needle free and fling the syringe from him. Three seconds later, Zeus sits up, roars so loudly that Achilles has to clasp his hands over his ears, and then the father leaps to his feet, overturns the thirty-foot-long heavy wooden table, and smashes out the entire south wall of Odysseus' house. Hera! booms Zeus. God damn you! Achilles forces himself not to cringe and cower, but he does step back while Zeus rips out the last of the wall, uses a timber to smash the overhanging chariot wheel, candle chandelier to a thousand pieces, 
destroys the heavy, tumbled table with one smash of his giant fist and paces wildly back and forth. Finally, the father of all gods seems to notice Achilles standing in the doorway to the vestibule. You! Me, agrees Achilles, son of Peleus. His sword is in its belt loop, his shield politely strapped over his shoulder rather than on his forearm. His hands are empty and open. The god-killing long knife that Athena had given him for use in murdering Aphrodite is in his broad belt, but out of sight. What are you doing on Olympus, growls Zeus. He is still naked. He holds his forehead with his huge left hand, and Achilles can see the headache pain throbbing through Zeus the father's bloodshot eyes. Evidently, absolute sleep leaves a hangover. You are not on Olympus, Lord Zeus, Achilles says softly. You're on the Isle of Ithaca, under a golden cloud of concealment, in the banquet hall of Odysseus, son of Laertes. Zeus squints around him, then he frowns more deeply. Finally, he looks down on Achilles once again. How long have I been asleep, mortal? Two weeks, father, says Achilles. Mew, Argive, fleet-footed man-killer, you couldn't have awakened me here from whatever potion charm white-armed hero used to drug me. Which god revived me and why? Oh, Zeus, who marshals the thunderheads, says Achilles, lowering his head and eyes almost meekly, as he has seen the meek do so many times. I will tell you all you seek to know. And it is true that while most of the immortals on Olympus abandoned you, at least one god remained your loyal servant. But first, I must ask for a boon. A boon? roars Zeus. I'll give you a boon you won't forget if you speak again without permission. Stand there and be silent. The huge figure gestures in one of the three remaining walls, the one that had held the quiver of poison arrows and the outline of a great bow, mists into a three-dimensional vision surface, much like the hollow pool in the great hall of the gods. Achilles realizes that he is looking at an aerial view of this very house, Odysseus' palace. He can see the dog Argus outside. The starved hound has eaten the biscuits and revived enough to crawl into the shade. Hera would have left a force field beneath my cloaking golden cloud, mutters Zeus. The only one who could have lifted it is Hephaestus. I will deal with him later. Zeus moves his hand again. The virtual display shifts to the summit of Olympus. Empty homes and halls, the abandoned chariots. They have gone down to play with their favorite toys, mumbles Zeus. Achilles sees a daylight battle in front of the walls of Ilium. Hector's forces seem to be pushing the Argives and their siege machines back to Thicket Ridge and beyond. The air is filled with volleys of arrows and a score or more of flying chariots. Thunderbolts and bright red beams lash back and forth above the mortal battlefield. Explosions ripple across the battlefield and fill the sky as the gods do battle with each other, even as their champions fight to the death below. Zeus shakes his head. Do you see them, Achilles? They are as addicted as cocaine addicts, as gamblers at their tables. For more than five hundred years since I conquered the last of the Titans, the original changelings, and through Kronos, Rhea, and the other monstrous originals, down into the gaseous pit of Tartarus, we have been evolving our godly Olympian powers, settling into our divine roles, for what? Achilles, who has not been explicitly asked to speak, keeps his mouth shut. Damned children at their games, bellows Zeus. And again Achilles has to cover his ears. Useless as heroin junkies are lost era teenagers in front of their video games. After this long decade of their conniving and conspiring and secret fighting, though I forbid it, and slowing time so they can arm their pet heroes with nanotech powers. They simply have to see it all to the bitter end and make sure their side wins. As if it makes one goddamned bit of difference. Achilles knows that a lesser man, and all men are lesser men in Achilles' view, 
would be on his knees screaming from the pain of the divine bellow by now, but the ultrasonic boom and roar of it still makes him weak inside. Addicts all, says Zeus, his roar more bearable now. I should have made them all sign up for Ilium Anonymous five years ago and avoided this terrible reckoning which now must come. Hera and her allies have gone too far. Achilles is watching the carnage on the wall. The image is so deep, so three-dimensional, that it is as if the wall has opened onto the crowded killing fields of Ilium itself. The Achaeans, under Agamemnon's clumsy leadership, are visibly falling back. Apollo of the Silver Bow is obviously the most lethal god on the field, driving the flying chariots of Ares, Athena, and Hera back toward the sea. But it is not a rout, none yet, neither in the air nor on the ground. The view of the fighting gets Achilles' blood up and makes him want to rush into the fighting, leading his myrmidons in a swath of counterattack and killing that would end only with Achilles' chariot and horses scarring the marble in Priam's palace preferably with Hector's body being dragged behind it, leaving a bloody smear. Well, roars Zeus, speak up. About what, O father of all gods and men? What is this boon you want from me, son of Thetis? Zeus has been pulling on his garments as he's watched the events on the vision wall. Achilles steps closer. In exchange for finding you and awakening you, Father Zeus, I would ask that you restore the life of Penthesilea in one of the healing vats and... Penthesilea, booms Zeus. That Amazon tart from the North Regions? The blonde bitch who murdered her sister Hippolyte to gain that worthless Amazon throne? How did she die? And what does she have to do with Achilles or Achilles with her? Achilles ground his molars, but kept his gaze, now murderous, turned downward. I love her, Father Zeus, and... Zeus bellows in laughter. Love her, you say, son of Thetis? I've watched you on my vision walls and floors and in person since you were a baby, since you were a snot-nosed youth being tutored by the patient centaur Chiron. And never have I seen you love a woman. Even the girl who fathered your son was left behind like excess baggage whenever you felt the urge to go off to war, or whoring and rape. You love Penthesilea, that brainless blonde pussy with a spear. Tell me another tale, son of Thetis. I love Penthesilea, and wish her restored to health, grits Achilles. All he can think of at this second is the god-killing blade in his belt. But Athena has lied to him before. If she lied about the abilities of that knife, he would be a fool to move against Zeus. Achilles knows that he is a fool at any rate, coming here to beseech the father for this gift. But he perseveres, eyes still lowered, but his hands balled into powerful fists. Aphrodite gave the Amazon queen a scent to wear when she went into combat with me, he begins. Zeus roars laughter again. Not number nine. Well, you are well and truly screwed, my friend. How did this Penthesilea twat die? Now wait, I will see for myself. The Lord Father moves his right hand again, and the wall screen blurs, shifts, leaps back across time and space. Achilles looks up to see the doomed Amazon charge against him and his men, on the red plains at the base of Olympus. He watches Clonia, Bermusa, and the other Amazons fall to men's arrows and blades. He watches again as he casts his father's unfailing spear completely through Queen Penthesilea and the thick torso of her horse behind her, pinning her on her fallen steed's horse like some wriggling insect on a dissecting tray. Oh, well done, booms Zeus. And now you want her brought back to life again in one of my healer's vats? Yes, Lord, says Achilles. I don't know how you know about the Hall of Healing, says Zeus, pacing back and forth again. But you should know that even the healer's alien arts cannot bring a dead mortal back to life. Lord, says Achilles, his voice low but urgent, Athena cast a spell of no corruption, of no encroaching death over my beloved's body. 
It might be possible to... Silence! roars Zeus, and Achilles is physically driven back to the hollow wall by the blast of noise. No one in the original pantheon of immortals tells Zeus the father what is possible or what should be done, much less some mere mortal, over-muscled spearman. No, father, says Achilles, raising his gaze to the giant bearded form, but I hoped that... Silence, says Zeus again, but at a level that allows Achilles to remove his hands from his ears. I'm leaving now to destroy Hera, to cast down her accomplices into the bottomless pit of Tartarus, to punish the other gods in ways they will never forget, and to wipe out this invading Argive army once and for all. You Greeks, with your arrogance and your oily ways, really get on my tits. Zeus begins to stride for the door. You're on Ilium Earth here, son of Thetis. It may take you many months, but you can find your way home by yourself. I would not recommend you return to Ilium. There will be no Achaeans left alive there by the time you reach that place. No, says Achilles. Zeus whirls. He's actually smiling through his beard. What did you say? I said no. You must grant my wish. Achilles unlimbers his shield and sets it in place on his forearm, as if he is heading to the front. He pulls his sword. Zeus throws his head back and laughs. Grant your wish or... What, bastard son of Thetis? Or else I will feed Zeus's liver to that starving dog of Odysseus in the courtyard, Achilles says firmly. Zeus smiles and shakes his head. Do you know why you are alive this very day, insect? Because I am Achilles, son of Peleus, says Achilles, stepping forward. He wishes he had his throwing spear. The greatest warrior and noblest hero on earth. Invulnerable to his enemies. Friend of the murdered Patroclus. Slave and servant to no man or god. Zeus shakes his head again. You're not the son of Peleus. Achilles stops advancing. What are you talking about, Lord of Flies, Lord of Horse Dung? I am the son of Peleus, who is the son of Aeacus, son of the mortal who mated with the immortal sea goddess Thetis, a king myself descended from a long line of kings of the Myrmidons. No, says Zeus, and this time the giant god is the one who steps closer, towering over Achilles. You are the son of Thetis but the bastard son of my seed, not the seed of Peleus. You! Achilles tries to laugh, but it comes out a hoarse bark. My immortal mother told me in all truth that... Your immortal mother lies through her seaweed-crusted teeth, laughs Zeus. Almost three decades ago, I desired Thetis. She was less than a full goddess then, although more beautiful than most of you mortals. But the fates those accursed bean counters with the DNA memory abacuses, warned me that any child I spawned with Thetis could be my undoing, could cause my death, could bring down the reign of Olympus itself. Achilles stares hate and disbelief through his helmet eye holes. But I wanted Thetis, continues Zeus, so I fucked her. But first I morphed into the form of Peleus, some common mortal boy-man, with whom Thetis was mildly infatuated at the time. But the sperm that conceived you is Zeus's divine seed, Achilles, son of Thetis. Make no mistake about that. Why else do you think your mother took you far away from that idiot Peleus and had you raised by an old centaur? You lie, growls Achilles. Zeus shakes his head almost sadly, and you will die in a second, young Achilles says the father of all gods and men. But you will die knowing that I told you the truth. You can't kill me, Lord of Crabs. Zeus rubs his beard. No, I can't, not directly. Thetis saw to that, when she learned that I had been the lover who knocked her up, not that dickless worm Peleus. She also knew of the fate's prediction, and that I would kill you as surely as my father Cronos ate his offspring rather than risk their revolts and vendettas when they grew up. 
And I would have done that, young Achilles, eaten you when you were a babe, had not Thetis conspired to dip you in the probability flames of the pure quantum celestial fire. You are a quantum freak, unique unto the universe, bastard son of Thetis and Zeus. Your death and even I do not know the details of it, the fates will not share them, is absolutely appointed. Then fight me now, god of feces, shouts Achilles, and begins to advance, sword and shield ready. Zeus holds up one hand. Achilles is frozen in place. Time itself seems to freeze. I cannot kill you, my impetuous little bastard, mutters Zeus, as if to himself. But what if I blast your flesh from your bone, and then rip that very flesh into its constituent cells and molecules? It might take a while for even the quantum universe to reassemble you. Centuries, perhaps. And I don't think it could possibly be a painless process. Frozen in mid-stride, Achilles knows that he is still able to speak, but does not. Or perhaps I could send you somewhere, says Zeus, gesturing toward the ceiling, where there is no air to breathe. That will be an interesting conundrum for the probability singularity of the celestial fire to solve. There is no place outside the oceans with no air to breathe, snarls Achilles. But then he remembers his gasping and weakness on the high slopes of Olympus just the day before. Outer space would give the lie to that assertion, says Zeus with a maddening smile. Somewhere beyond the orbit of Uranus, perhaps, or out in the Kuiper belt. Or Tartarus would serve. The air there is mostly methane and ammonia. It would turn your lungs to burned twigs. But if you survived a few hours in terrible pain, you could commune with your grandparents. They eat mortals, you know. Fuck you, shouts Achilles. So be it, says Zeus. Have a good trip, my son. Short, agonizing, but good. The king of the gods moves his right hand in a short, easy arc, and the paving tiles beneath Achilles' feet begin to dissolve. A circle opens in the floor of Odysseus' banquet hall until the fleet-footed man-killer seems to be standing on flame-lighted air. From beneath him, from the horrific pit below filled with surging, sulfurous clouds, black mountains rising like rotten teeth, lakes of liquid lead, the bubble and flow of hissing lava, and the shadowy movement of huge, inhuman things, comes the constant roar and bellow of the monsters once called titans. Zeus moves his hand again ever so slightly, and Achilles falls into that pit. He does not scream as he disappears. After a minute of gazing down at the flames and roiling black clouds so far below, Zeus moves his palm from left to right, the circle closes, the floor becomes solid, and is made up of Odysseus' handset tiles once again. And silence returns to the house, except for the pathetic baying of the starving hound named Argus out in the courtyard somewhere. Zeus sighs, and Quantum teleports away to begin his reckoning with the unsuspecting gods. 58. Prospero stayed behind as Moira led Harmon around the marble balcony with no railing, up a moving flight of open iron stairs, then around again, up again, and so until the floor of the Taj became a circle seemingly miles below. Harmon's heart was pounding. There were a few small round windows set into the book-lined wall of the endlessly rising and inward-curving dome. Harmon had not seen them from below or from outside, but they allowed light in and gave him an excuse to pause for breath and courage. They stood in the light for a minute as Harmon stared out at the distant mountain peaks shining icily in the late morning light. Masses of clouds had filled the valleys to the north and east, hiding the ripple-crevassed glaciers from view. Harmon wondered how far he was looking beyond the peaks and glaciers and massing clouds, to the dusty and nearly curved horizon beyond. A hundred miles? Two hundred miles? More? It's all right, Moira said softly. Harmon turned. 
What you did to wake me, she said. It's all right. We're sorry. You really did have no choice. The mechanisms to incite you were in place before your father's, father's great-great-grandfather was born. But what are the odds that I would be descended from this Ferdinand Marcalonzo Canho Tep of yours, said Harmon. He could not hide the regret in his voice, nor did he want to. Surprisingly, Moira laughed. It was Savi's laugh, quick and spontaneous, but lacking the edge of bitterness Harmon had heard in the older woman's amusement. The odds are one hundred percent, said Moira. Harmon could only show his confusion in silence. Ferdinand Mark Alonso made sure that when the next line of old-style humans were being readied and decanted, said Moira, that some of his chromosomes would be in all males of the line. No wonder we're feeble and stupid and inept, said Harmon. We're all a bunch of inbred cousins. He'd sigled a book on basic genetics less than three weeks earlier, although it seemed like years ago. Ada had been sleeping next to him while he watched the golden words flow from the book down his hand, wrist, and arm. Moira laughed again. Are you ready to go the rest of the way up to the crystal cabinet? The clear cupola at the top of the Taj Moira was much larger than it had appeared from below. Harmon guessed it was at least sixty or seventy feet across. There were no marble walkways here and the iron stairway escalators and black iron catwalks all ended at the center of the dome, everything glowing in the sunlight from the clear windows encircling the Taj's pointed cupola. Harmon had never been so high, not even on the tower of the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, seven hundred feet above the suspended roadway, and he'd never been overwhelmed by such a fear of falling. This platform was so high that he could look down and hide the entire circle of the marble floor of the Taj with his outstretched hand. The maze and the crypt entrance on the main floor were so far below that they looked like the micro-circuit embroidery on a Turin cloth. Harmon forced himself not to look down as he followed Moira up the last stairway, out onto the web of catwalks to the wrought iron platform in the cupola itself. Is that it? he asked nodding toward a ten- or twelve-foot-tall structure in the center of the platform. Yes. Harmon had expected this so-called crystal cabinet to be another version of Moira's crystal sarcophagus. But this thing looked nothing like a coffin. It was faceted with glass and metal geodesic struts the color of old pewter. The word dodecahedron came to mind. But Harmon had learned that from sigling rather than from reading, and wasn't sure if it was the correct term. The crystal cabinet was a multifaceted, twelve-sided object, roughly spherical except for the flat faces, made of a dozen or so slabs of clear glass or crystal framed by thin struts of burnished metal. Scores of multicolored cables and pipes ran from the walls of the cupola into the black metal base of the thing. Scattered on the platform near the cabinet were metal mesh chairs, odd instruments with dark screens and keyboards, and micro-thin slabs of vertical clear plastic, some five or six feet high. What is this place? asked Harmon. The nexus of the Taj. She activated several of these screened instruments and touched a vertical panel. The plastic disappeared as a holographic virtual control panel took its place. Moira's hands danced on the virtual images. There was a deep sound from the walls of the Taj, and a golden liquid, not yellow, but liquid gold, apparently no thicker than water, began pouring into the base of the crystal cabinet. Harmon walked closer to the dodecahedron. It's filling with liquid, yes. That's crazy. I can't go in there now. I'd drown. No, you won't, said Moira. You expect me to be in that cabinet when it has ten feet of this golden liquid in it? Yes. Harmon shook his head and backed away, stopping six feet from the edge of the metal platform. No, no, no. That's too crazy. As you will. But it is the only way you can gain the knowledge of these books, said Moira. The fluid is the medium which allows the transmission of the contents of these million volumes. 
Knowledge you will need if you are to be our Prometheus in the struggle against Setebos and his kind. Knowledge you will need if you are to educate your own people. Knowledge you will need, my Prometheus, if you are to save your beloved Ada. Yes, but if the water fills it, whatever the liquid is, it'll be ten feet deep or deeper. I'm not a good swimmer, began Harmon. Suddenly Ariel was standing next to them on the platform, although Harmon hadn't heard his steps on the metal floor. The small figure was carrying something bulky wrapped in what looked to be a red turin cloth. Ariel, my darling, cried Mora. Her voice carried a tone of delight and excitement that Harmon had not yet heard from her, nor even from Savi in the time he'd known her. Greetings to Miranda, said the sprite, removing the red cloth and handing Moira some sort of antique instrument with strings. Harmon's people played and sang some music, but knew few instruments and made none. A guitar, said the post-human woman, taking the oddly shaped instrument from the greenish glowing sprite and touching the strings with her long fingers. The notes that issued forth reminded Harmon of Ariel's own voice. Ariel bowed low and spoke in formal tone. Take this slave of music for the sake of him who is the slave of thee, and teach it all the harmony in which thou canst, and only thou. Make the delighted spirit glow till joy defines itself again, and too intense is turned to pain. For by permission and command of thine own Prince Ferdinand, poor Ariel sends this silent token of more than ever can be spoken. Moira bowed toward the sprite, set the resonating instrument on a table, and kissed Ariel on his green glowing forehead. I thank thee, friend. Sometimes friendly servant, never slave. How has my Ariel fared since I went to sleep? And said, When you died, the silent moon in her interlunar swoon is not sadder in her cell than deserted Ariel. When you live again on earth like an unseen star of birth, Ariel guides you o'er the sea of life from your nativity. Mara touched his cheek, then looked at Harmon, then back to the sprite avatar of the biosphere. Have you two encountered one another before? We've met, said Harmon. How is the world, Ariel, since I left it? asked Moira, turning away from Harmon again. Ariel said, Many changes have been run since Ferdinand and you begun your course of love, and Ariel still has tracked your steps and served your will. In a less formal voice, as if concluding some official ceremony, the biosphere sprite said, And how is it with you, my lady, now that you are born unto us again? Now it seemed to be Moira's turn to sound more formal and cadenced than Harmon had ever heard in Savi's voice. This temple, sad and lone, is all spared from the thunder of a war fought in long since by giant hierarchy against rebellion. This old image chair, whose carved features wrinkled as he fell, is prosperous. I, Miranda, left supreme sole priestess of this desolation. To his horror, Harmon saw that both the post-human woman and inhuman biosphere entity were openly weeping. Ariel stepped back, bowed again, swept his hand in Harmon's direction, and said, This mortal man who's done no harm, despite all the contrary his name implies, has he come to the crystal cabinet to be executed? No, said Moira, to be educated. 59. The Cenobos egg hatched during their first night back at the ruins of Ardis Hall. Ada was shocked to see the devastation at her former home. She'd been unconscious when flown away on the Sony the night of the attack, and because of her concussion and other injuries, had only partial memories of the horrible hours before. Now she saw the ruins of her life and home and memories in stark daylight. It made her want to fall to her knees and weep until she slept, but because she was leading the group of forty-four other survivors as they came up the last hill toward Ardis, Masoni hovering with eight of the most severely ill and wounded above, she kept her head up and her eyes dry as she walked past the scorched ruins, 
glancing left and right only to point out articles and remnants that could be salvaged for their new camp. Her home, the great manor of Ardis Hall, two thousand years of her family's pride, was all but gone. Only soot blackened timbers and the stone remnants of the many fireplaces left. But there was a surprising amount to salvage elsewhere. There were also the rotting bodies of their friends, at least bits and pieces of them, left in the fields. Ada conferred with Demon and a few others, and they agreed that the first priority was creating a fire and shelter. First a rough lean-to and warm place for the ill and injured to be treated and brought to before the short winter day was over. A shelter large enough for all of them to make it through the night without freezing. While Ardis Hall was lost to them, segments of several of the barracks, sheds, and other outbuildings erected in the last nine months before the sky fell were partially intact. They might have crowded into one of these shacks, but they were too near the forest, too hard to defend, and too far from the well that had been right outside Ardis Hall. They found heaps of kindling and dry wood and used what Ada thought was too many matches from their dwindling supply to start a large fire. Greogi landed the Sony and they unloaded the unconscious and semi-conscious injured and made them as comfortable as they could on makeshift cots and bedrolls near the fire. A work detail kept carrying more firewood from the various ruins. No one wanted to go as far as the shadowy forest, and Ada had forbidden such adventures for that day. The Sony took off and orbited in a mile-wide circle, the exhausted Greogi at the controls and Bowman with his rifle, both men watching for Voynich's. One of the barracks, the one Odysseus built by hand for his followers months before, yielded a treasure trove of blankets and rolls of canvas, all smelling of smoke but usable. And in another tumbled but only partially burned shed near Hannah's burned-out cupola, Call found shovels, picks, crowbars, hoes, hammers, nails, spikes, nylon rope, carabiners, and other former servitor tools that might now save their lives. With the unscorched wood from the barracks and logs scavenged from large parts of the former palisade, a work party began erecting a structure, part tent, part log cabin around the deep water well next to the still smoldering ruins of Ardis. A temporary shelter good enough for that night and a few more nights at least. Bowman had more elaborate plans for a permanent lodge with a tower, gun slits, and close-in palisade but Ada told him to help build the survival lean-to first and plan the castle later. There still was no sign of the Voynix, but it was only afternoon and night would be coming quickly enough. So Ada and Demon assigned Common and ten of his best marksmen to set up a perimeter defense. Other men and women with flechette weapons, they'd counted twenty-four working weapons and one that seemed defective with fewer than one hundred and twenty magazines of crystal flechettes were detailed to provide guard closer to the fire and lean-to. It took a little more than three hours to get the basic structure hammered together and raised. Walls only about six feet high, made from palisade logs, a cobbled-together arched roof made of wood planks from the barracks, and a canvas roof. It was important to put something between the wounded and the cold ground, but there was no time to fit a floor, so multiple layers of canvas were laid down atop straw brought in from the former hay barn near the north wall. The cattle themselves had disappeared, killed by Voynich's or simply run off. No one was going into the forest hunting for them that particular afternoon, and the circling Sony had its own duties to perform. By late afternoon, the temporary lean-to was completed. Ada, who had been working on new buckets and ropes for the well and leading burial parties with picks and shovels digging shallow graves in the frozen earth, returned to inspect the structure and found it large enough for at least forty-five people to crowd in close together to sleep. The others, presumably on guard duty outside, and for all fifty-three of them to crowd into for meals if necessary, although it would be crowded. Three of the walls were of wood, but the fourth wall, facing the well and two fires now burning, was only canvas, with most of it open to the heat. 
Maiman and Adide had scrounged metal and ceramic from Ardis Hall to build a stovepipe, if not an actual chimney, for the lean-to, but that modification would have to wait for the next day. There was no glass for windows, only small openings at different heights on each of the wood walls with sliding wood slats and covering canvas. Demon agreed they could retreat to the lean-to and lay down a withering field of flechette fire from those slits, but one look at the canvas roof and the canvas fourth wall told everyone there that the Voiniks could not be held off long once they leaped to the attack. But the Setabas egg seemed to be keeping the Voiniks at bay. It was almost dark when Demon took Ada, Tom, and Layman away from the warmth of the fires to the ashes of Hannah's cupola to open his rucksack and show them the hatching egg. The thing was glowing even more brightly, shedding a sick milky light, and there were tiny cracks everywhere in the shell, but no openings yet. How long until it hatches? asked Ada. How the hell should I know? said Demon. All I know is that the little setaboss inside is still alive and trying to get out. You can hear the squeals and chewing sounds if you put your ear to the shell. No thanks, said Ada. What happens when it hatches? asked Layman, who had been in favor of destroying the egg from the beginning. Demon shrugged. What exactly did you have in mind when you stole the thing from Setabas Nest in the Paris Crater Blue Ice Cathedral? asked the medic Tom, who'd heard the whole story. I don't know, said Demon. It seemed like a good idea at the time. At least we could find out what sort of creature this Setabas is. What if Mommy comes looking for her baby? asked Layman. It was not the first time that Demon had been asked this. He shrugged again. We can kill it right after it hatches, if we have to, he said softly, looking at the growing winter darkness under the trees beyond the ruins of the old palisade. Can we? said Layman. He put his left hand on the many-fissured eggshell, and then pulled it away quickly as if the surface were hot. All those who had touched the egg had remarked on the unpleasantness of the experience, as if something on the inside of the shell were sucking energy through their palm. Before Demon could answer again, Ada said, Demon, if you hadn't brought that thing back with you, most of us would probably be dead now. It's kept the Voiniks away this long. Maybe it will after it hatches as well. If it, or its Mama Papa, doesn't eat us in our sleep, said Layman, cradling his mangled right hand. Later, just after dark, Ceres came and whispered to Ada that Sherman, one of their more seriously wounded, had died. Ada nodded rounded up two others, a D-Day and a still portly man named Rollum, and they quietly carried the body out beyond the edge of the fire, setting it under lumber and stones near the tumbled barracks so that they could properly bury Sherman in the morning. The wind was cold. Ada did a four-hour shift of guard duty in the dark with a loaded flechette rifle, the warming fire a distant glow and the nearest other sentry fifty yards away her concussion causing her head to pound so fiercely she really couldn't have seen a Voinix or Setabas if it had sat on her lap. Her broken wrist required her to prop the weapon on her forearm. And then when Call relieved her from duty, she stumbled back to the crowded, snore-filled lean-to and fell into a deep sleep stirred only by terrible nightmares. Demon awakened her just before dawn, bending to whisper in her ear, The egg is hatched. Ada sat up in the dark, feeling the press and breathing of bodies all around her, and for a moment she knew she was still in the nightmare. She wanted Harmon to touch her shoulder and wake her into sunlight. She wanted his arm around her, not this freezing dark and press of strange bodies and flickering, fading firelight through canvas. It hatched, repeated Demon. His voice was very low. I didn't want to wake you, but we have to decide what to do. Yes. Ada whispered back. She'd slept in her clothes, and now she slipped out of her nest of damp blankets and carefully picked her way over sleeping forms, following Demon out through the canvas, past the low but still tended fire south, away from the lean-to toward another much smaller fire. I slept out here away from the others, said Demon, speaking in a more normal tone as they got farther away from the main lean-to. 
His voice was still soft, but each syllable roared in Ada's aching head. Far overhead, the E and P rings whirled as they always whirled, turning and crossing in front of the stars and a fingernail moon. Ada saw something move up there, and for a minute her heart pounded before she realized it was the Sony, orbiting silently in the night. Who's flying the Sony? she asked dully. Oko. I didn't know she knew how to fly it. Greogi taught her yesterday, said Demon. They were approaching the smaller campfire, and Ada saw the silhouette of another man standing there. Good morning, Ada Or, said Tom. Ada had to smile at the formal honorific. It had not been used much in recent months. Good morning, Tom, she whispered. Where is this thing? Demon pulled a long piece of wood out of the fire and extended it into the darkness like a torch. Ada stepped back. Demon and Tom had obviously piled up palisade logs on three sides to cage the thing in the triangular space, but it was scurrying to and fro in that space, obviously ready and soon capable of climbing the two-foot-high flimsy wooden barricades. Ada took the torch from Tom and crouched lower to study the Setabos thing in the flickering light. Its multiple yellow eyes blinked and closed at the glare. The little Setabos, if that is what it was, was about a foot long, already larger in mass and length than a regular human brain, Ada thought, but still with the disgustingly pink wrinkles and folds and appearance of a living, disembodied brain. She could see the gray strip between the two hemispheres, a mucousy membrane covering it and a slight pulsing, as if the whole thing was breathing. But this pink brain also had pulsating mouths, or orifices of some kind, and a myriad of tiny, pink baby hands beneath it and protruding from orifices. It scrabbled back and forth on those pudgy little pink fingers that looked like a mass of wriggling worms to Ada. The yellow eyes opened, stayed open, and locked on Ada's face. One of the orifices opened, and screeching, scratching sounds came out. Is it trying to talk? Ada whispered to both men. I have no idea, said Demon, but it's only a few minutes old. I wouldn't be surprised if it's talking to us by the time it's an hour old. We shouldn't let it get an hour old, Tom said softly but firmly. We should kill the thing now, blow it apart with flechettes, and then burn its corpse and scatter the ashes. Ada looked at Tom in surprise. The self-trained medic had always been the least violent and most life-affirming person she'd known at Ardis. At the very least, said Demon, watching the thing successfully trying to climb the low wooden barrier, it needs a leash. Wearing heavy canvas and wool gloves they'd designed at Ardis early in the winter for work with livestock, Demon leaned forward and plunged a sharp, thin spike that he'd curved to form a hook into the solid band of fibers. Corpus Colossum, Ada remembered it was called, connecting the two hemispheres of the little Setabos's brain. Then, moving quickly, Demon tugged to make sure the hook was secure, snapped a carabiner to it, and rigged twenty feet of nylon rope to the carabiner. The little creature screamed and howled so loudly that Ada looked over her shoulder at the main cap, sure that everyone would come boiling out of the lean-to. No one stirred except one sentry near the fire who looked over her way sleepily, and then went back to contemplating the flames. The little Setabos writhed and rolled, running against the wooden barriers and finally clambering over them like a crab. Demon tugged it up short on six feet of leash. More tiny hands emerged from their folded state in the pink brain's orifices and pulled themselves along on elastic stalks a yard or more long. The hands leaped at the nylon rope and tugged at it wildly, other hands exploring the hook and carabiner, trying to pull them free. The hook held. Demon was pulled forward for a second, but then jerked the scrabbling creature back onto the frozen grass of its cage. Strong little bastard, he whispered. Let it wander, said Ada. Let's see where it goes, what it does. Are you serious? Yes. Not far, but let's see what it wants. Tom kicked the low post wall down, and the Setabos baby scurried out, the baby fingers under it working in unison, blurring like some obscene centipede's legs. 
Demon allowed himself to be tugged along behind it, keeping the leash short. Ada and Tom walked beside Demon, ready to move quickly if the creature turned toward them. It moved too quickly and too purposefully for any of the humans not to sense the danger from it. Tom's flechette rifle was being held at the ready, and Demon had another rifle strapped over his shoulder. The thing didn't head for the campfire or the lean-to. It tugged them twenty yards into the darkness of the west lawn. Then it scurried down into one of the former defensive trenches, a flame trench Ada had helped to dig, and seemed to squat on its spraddled hands. Two new orifices opened at either ends of the little creature, and stalks without hands, pulsing proboscises, emerged, wavered, and suddenly attached themselves to the ground. There came a sound that was a mixture of a pig rooting and a baby suckling. What the hell? said Tom. He had the rifle aimed, the plastic metal stock set firmly against his shoulder. The first shot Ada knew would slam several thousand crystal barbed flechettes into the pulsing pink monstrosity at a velocity greater than the speed of sound. Ada started shivering. Her constant pulsing headache turned to a wave of nausea. I know this spot, she whispered, her voice shaking. It's where Riemann and M.A. died during the Voynich's attack. They burned to death here. A Setabos spawn continued loudly rooting and suckling. Then it's... began Demon and stopped. Eating, finished Ada. Tom put his finger on the trigger. Let me kill it, Ada, or please. Yes, said Ada, but not yet. I have no doubt that the Voynich's will return as soon as this thing dies, and it's still dark, and we're nowhere near ready. Let's go back to your camp. They walked back to the campfire together, Demon tugging the reluctant and finger-dragging Setabos thing along behind them. Sixty. Harmon drowned. His last thoughts before the water filled his lungs were, the bitch more relied to me, and then he gagged and choked and drowned in the swirling golden liquid. The crystal dodecahedron had filled only to within a foot of its multifaceted top while Harmon had been watching the golden liquid flow into it. Savi Moira Miranda had called the rich golden fluid the medium by which he would sigil, although that had not been her term, the Taj's gigantic collection of books. Harmon had stripped down to his thermskin lair. That has to come off too, said Moira. Ariel had stepped back into the shadows, and now only the young woman stood in the bright light from the cupola windows with him. The guitar was on a nearby tabletop. Why, said Harmon. Your skin has to be in contact with the medium, said Moira. The transfer can't work through a bonded molecular layer like a therm skin. What transfer, Harmon had asked, licking his lips. He was very nervous. His heart was pounding. Myra gestured toward the seemingly infinite rows of shelved books lining the hundred curved stories of inner dome wall widening out below them. How do I know that there's anything in those old books that will help me get back to Ada, said Harmon. You don't. You and Prospero could send me home right now if you wanted, said Harmon, turning away from the filling crystal tank. Why don't you do that so we can skip all this nonsense? It's not that easy, said Moira. The hell it isn't, shouted Harmon. The young woman went on as if Harmon had not spoken. First of all, you know from the Turan and from what Prospero told you that all of the planet's fax nodes and fax pavilions have been shut off. By whom, said Harmon, turning back to look at the crystal cabinet again. The golden fluid was swirling to within a foot of the top, but it had stopped filling. Moira had opened a panel on the top, one of the multifaceted glass faces, and he could see the short metal rungs that would allow him to climb up to that opening. By Setabas or his allies, said Moira. What allies? Who are they? Just tell me what I need to know. Moira shook her head. My young Prometheus, you've been told things for the better part of a year now. Hearing things means nothing unless you have the context in which to place the information. It is time for you to gain that context. Why do you keep calling me Prometheus, he barked at her. Everyone seems to have ten names around here. Prometheus, I don't know that name. Why do you call me that? 
Moira smiled. I guarantee that you will understand that, at least, after the Crystal Cabinet. Harmon took a deep breath. One more smug smile out of this woman, he realized, and he might hit her in the face. Prospero said that this thing could kill me, he said. He looked at the cabinet rather than the post-human thing in Savi's human form. Moira nodded. It could. I do not believe it will. What are my chances, said Harmon. His voice sounded plaintive and weak to his own ears. I don't know, very good, I think, or I would not suggest you go through this unpleasantness. Have you done it? Undergone the crystal cabinet transfer, said Moira. No, I had no reason to. Who has, demanded Harmon. How many lived? How many died? All of the chief librarians have experienced the crystal cabinet transfer, said Moira. All the many generations of the keepers of the Taj, all the linear descendants of the original Kanhotep, including your beloved Ferdinand Mark Alonso, yes. And how many of these keepers of the Taj survived the cabinet transfer? asked Harmon. He was still wearing the therm skin, but his exposed hands and face felt the terrible chill in the air up there near the top of the dome. He concentrated on not shivering. Harmon was afraid that if Moira merely shrugged, he'd just walk away forever. And he didn't want to do that, not yet. Not until he knew more. This awkward crystal cabinet with its glowing gold liquid might kill him, but it might also return him to Ada sooner. Moira did not shrug. She looked him in the eye. She had Savi's eyes and said, I don't know how many died. Sometimes the flow of information is simply too much for lesser minds. I do not believe you have a lesser mind, Prometheus. Don't call me that again. Harmon's freezing hands were tightened into fists. All right. How long does it take, he asked. The transfer itself? Less than an hour. That long, said Harmon. The Eiffelbahn car leaves in forty-five minutes. We'll make it, said Moira. Harmon hesitated. The medium fluid is warm, said Moira, as if reading his mind. It was more likely, he realized, she was reading his shivers and shaking. That may have decided the issue for Harmon. He had peeled off the therm skin, embarrassed to be naked in front of this stranger with whom he had had a strange sort of sex less than two hours earlier. And it was cold. He had quickly clambered up the side of the dodecahedron, using the short rungs for hand and footholds, feeling how cold the metal was against the bare soles of his feet. It had been a relief when he lowered himself through the open panel and actually dropped into the golden liquid. As she'd promised, the fluid was warm. It had no scent, and the few drops that landed on his lips had no taste. And then Ariel had levitated from the shadows and closed and locked the panel above Harmon's head. And then Moira had touched some control on the vertical and virtual control panel where she stood. And then a pump chugged to life again somewhere in the base of the crystal cabinet, and more fluid began to fill the closed container. Harmon had screamed at them then, screamed at them to let him out. And then, when both post-human and biosphere non-human ignored him, Harmon had pounded and kicked, trying to open the panel, trying to shatter the crystal. The fluid continued to rise. For some seconds, Harmon found the last inch of air at the top facet of the dodecahedron, and he breathed it in deeply, still pounding on the overhead panels. And then the fluid rose until there was no more inch of air, no more air bubbles, except those escaping from Harmon's lips and nose. He held his breath for as long as he could. He wished that his last thought could have been of Ada and his love for Ada, and his sorrow for having betrayed Ada. But although he thought of her, his last thoughts while holding his breath until his lungs were afire were a confused jumble of terror and fury and regret. And then he could hold his breath no more, and, still pounding on the unyielding crystal panel above him, he exhaled, coughed, gagged, cursed, gagged more, breathed in the thickening fluid, felt darkness flowing over his mind even as overwhelming panic continued to fill his body with useless adrenaline. And then his lungs held no air at all. But Harmon did not know this. 
Heavier, without air in his lungs, his body no longer kicking, moving, or breathing, Harmon sank to the center of the dodecahedron.